Summary of the Books of the Old and New Covenants by John Calvin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Books of the Old Testament teach us that the God adored by Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, David, and our other fathers is the only true God, all-powerful and eternal, who of the infinite goodness which is in him created by his eternal word the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, from whom all things proceed without whom nothing exists, who executes justice and mercy and all other things entirely as seemeth him good, and suffers not that any one presumptuously ask why that which he has done is thus or thus. Beyond this, these books give us to understand that the very high and the all-powerful God, after he had created all things, formed Adam the first man, and that in his own image and likeness, appointing and establishing him Lord over all creatures of the earth, which Adam, through the hatred and deceit of the devil, fell into disobedience, doing and striving in opposition to the commandment of his Creator, and by his sin so brought into the world the infection and poison of sin, that all we who descend from him are, from our birth, deserving of the wrath and punishment of God, partakers of death and damnation, enslaved under the power and tyranny of the devil. We learn also in these very excellent books that of old God promised to Adam, Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, David, and others of those of old time that he would send the blessed seed, his son Jesus Christ, our Savior, who should deliver from sin and from the tyranny and slavery of the devil, those who, with a living and fruit-producing faith, should believe that promise and should trust in Jesus Christ, expecting the promised deliverance and liberty of him and by him alone. Also they show us and cause us to understand that notwithstanding that the old Israelitish fathers waited for the promised salvation and deliverance, yet man is of a nature so naughty and corrupted that of his own will he does not acknowledge himself a sinner such as is concerned in the promised Saviour. God the Creator gave by Moses his law written on two tables of stone, that by it men might learn how great is the depravity and malice of the human heart, to the end that they might therefore more ardently desire the coming of Jesus Christ, who was to redeem them and deliver them from sin, which could not be done by the law, nor by the victims and sacrifices of the law, which only served to represent and typify the real offering that Jesus Christ would make of his own body, by which oblation all sins should be blotted out and abolished. The books of the New Testament inform us that the great King and promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is very God, worthy of praise over all forever, typified and represented in the books of the Old Testament, was at last sent from his Father in the time that the Father had ordained and settled in himself, that is to say, when iniquity and abomination abounded in the world. And the Saviour, Jesus Christ, was thus sent and took upon him human flesh and suffered death and returned to life, not on account of good works that any one had done, for all were sinners, but in order that God our Father, whose word is truth, might give us the great riches of his grace, which he had promised, and might save us by his mercy. It is then clearly shown to us in the New Testament that Jesus Christ, the real Lamb and the true victim, wiping away the sins of men, came into the world to make peace between his Father and us, and to restore us to his favor and love, cleansing us from our sins by his blood to the end that he might deliver us from the slavery of the devil by whom we were made captives and slaves whenever we fell into sin, and might adopt us and make us children of God to be fellow heirs with himself of so beautiful and so noble a kingdom. But to the end, that we may know this singular and excellent benefit which God has done for us, he gives us his Holy Spirit, the fruit and effect of which is to make us believe in God and in the King and Messiah whom he has sent. For certainly without the operation of the Holy Spirit, by which we are taught and as with a seal affixed to them are made certain and sure of the things which we believe, we cannot believe that God sent the Messiah into the world, nor that Jesus Christ is that Messiah. For, as St. Paul says, no one can confess that Jesus is God and Lord, having power to save, unless it be by the might and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This same Spirit is the witness to our spirit and makes it believe that we are children of God and fills us with that great charity and love which St. Paul describes to the Corinthians. Besides faith and charity, this same Spirit gives us the vigor of hope which is a certain looking forward to the life eternal and indestructible of which life it becomes our pledge like a good security in a matter of loan, 
It gives us also other favors and spiritual gifts of which St. Paul writes to the Galatians. We must not deem the fruits of faith to be trifling or of slight efficacy, for by trust and faith in Jesus Christ, which shows itself in works of love and constrains man to do them, we are made just and holy, that is to say, God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is also our Father, because of the adoption of us by Jesus Christ our brother, esteems us just and holy, purely of his favor and goodness, through the merit and satisfaction of his Son, Jesus Christ, making no reckoning of our sins and not accounting them to us as sins, and not condemning us to eternal death and misery because of them. Lastly, Jesus Christ came into this world in order that, after we are purged from our sins and made holy by faith in him, we should take from him an example of well-doing, following his will in doing good works and renouncing all carnal works, and of a free will, serving him in living justly and holily all the days of our life, that, through good works, which before our calling God hath made ready and prepared to be done by us, we should show that we are called to that favor and gift of faith, and... Whoever does not these good works shows that he has not that faith in Jesus Christ which he requires of us. To this Saviour we must come out and go and with great boldness follow him that he may instruct us. For he is our master, tender and lowly of heart, our example and model from whom we must take pattern how to live. Still further, he is the bishop and shepherd of our souls, the great priest and offering maker, who himself offered his own blood for us, the mediator and atonement between God and us men, who is now set down at the right hand of God, his Father, being our advocate and intercessor, praying for us, who will undoubtedly obtain from the Father that which we ask of him, or of his Father in his name, provided that in asking we firmly believe it will be so, because he has promised it. Through him, when we have sinned, let us not fear with true repentance, to which Jesus Christ invites and urges us from the very beginning of his preaching, and with firm and lively faith to go to the throne and royal seat, where he ever sits, not to exercise vengeance, but to show favor to those who ask it. And he will be merciful, for he came into the world that, by his grace, he might save sinners. Jesus Christ verily will come after the time settled by his own Father, and will sit upon his throne with great majesty, and will judge all men, and will render to every one according to his deeds, whether good or evil, and will say to those on his right hand, who in this world looked forward to good things to come, that is, to life eternal, come you who are chosen of my Father to life eternal, take possession of the kingdom which is prepared for you, and assigned to you from before the creation of the world." And, on the contrary, to those on his left hand he will say, Depart from me, ye cursed and reprobate creatures, into the eternal fire which is prepared and made ready for the devil and his angels. Then, to a certainty, will be the end of the world, when Jesus Christ, after having triumphed over all his enemies, shall give up and restore to God his Father the kingdom which now he holds of him. In order that we might learn all this, which is here set forth, the goodness of God has willed that through his Holy Spirit the books of the Bible should be given to us in writing, and has ordained the preaching of the doctrine contained in them. He has also given us his sacraments, by which the truth of this same doctrine is, as it were, sealed, that we might know and believe that there is but one true God, and one soul, Jesus Christ, whom he has sent as he promised, and that in believing we might have eternal life through the same Jesus Christ. Other foundation than this can no man lay in the church of Christ. Upon it she is based, so that St. Paul desired that whoever should proclaim any other faith and salvation than that through Jesus Christ, even though he were an angel from heaven, might be lost, cast out, and rejected of God. To God the Father then, of whom and by whom and to whom are all things, and to Jesus Christ our Lord, who redeemed the world to the Father and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory eternally. Amen. End of Summary of the Books of the Old and New Testaments by John Calvin Prayers or Meditations by Catherine Parr This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prayers or meditations wherein the mind is stirred patiently to suffer all afflictions here, to set at naught the vain prosperity of this world, and always to long for the everlasting felicity, collected out of certain holy works by the most virtuous and gracious Princess Catherine, Queen of England, France and Ireland, A.D. 1546, 
If ye be risen again with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things that are above, and not on the things which are on the earth. Colossians 3 Most benign Lord Jesus, grant me thy grace, that it may always work in me, and persevere with me unto the end. Grant me that I may ever desire and will that which is most pleasant and most acceptable to thee. Thy will be my will, and my will be to follow always thy will. Let there be always in me one will and one desire with thee, and that I have no desire to will or not to will, but as thou wilt. Lord, thou knowest what thing is most profitable and most expedient for me. Give therefore what thou wilt, as much as thou wilt, and when thou wilt. Do with me what thou wilt, as it shall please thee, and shall be most to thine honour. Put me where thou wilt, and freely do with me in all things after thy will. Thy creature I am, and in thy hands lead and turn me where thou wilt. Lo, I am thy servant, ready to do all things that thou commandest, for I desire not to live to myself but to thee. Lord Jesus, I pray thee, grant me grace that I may never set my heart on the things of this world, but that all worldly and carnal affections may utterly die and be mortified in me. Grant me above all things that I may rest in thee, and finally quiet and pacify my heart in thee. For thou, O Lord, art the very true peace of heart, and the perfect rest of the soul, and without thee all things are grievous and unquiet. My Lord Jesus, I beseech thee, be with me in every place and at all times, and let it be to me a special solace, gladly for thy love to lack all worldly solace. And if thou withdraw thy comfort from me at any time, Keep me, O Lord, from desperation, and make me patiently to abide thy will and ordinance. O Lord Jesus, thy judgments are righteous, and thy providence is much better for me than all that I can imagine or devise. Wherefore, do with me in all things as it shall please thee, for it may not but be well all that thou doest. If thou wilt that I be in light, be thou blessed. If thou wilt that I be in darkness, be thou also blessed. If thou vouchsafe to comfort me, be thou highly blessed. If thou wilt, I live in trouble and without comfort. Be thou likewise ever blessed. Lord, give me grace gladly to suffer whatsoever thou wilt shall fall upon me, and patiently to take at thy hand good and bad, bitter and sweet, joy and sorrow, for all things that shall befall unto me heartily to thank thee. Keep me, Lord, from sin, and I shall dread neither death nor hell. O oh, what thanks ought I to give unto thee, who hast suffered the grievous death of the cross, to deliver me from my sins, and to obtain everlasting life for me. Thou gavest us most perfect example of patience, fulfilling and obeying the will of thy Father, even unto the death. Make me, wretched sinner, obediently to use myself after thy will in all things, and patiently to bear the burden of this corruptible life. For though this life be tedious, and as a heavy burden for my soul, Yet, nevertheless, through thy grace and by example of thee, it is now made much more easy and comfortable than it was before thy incarnation and passion. Thy holy life is our way to thee, by following of thee we walk to thee who art our head and saviour. And yet, except thou hadst gone before and showed us the way to everlasting life, who would endeavour to follow thee, seeing we are yet so slow and dull, having the light of thy blessed example and holy doctrine to lead and direct us? O Lord Jesus, make that possible by grace, which is impossible to me by nature. Thou knowest well that I may little suffer, and that I am anon cast down and overthrown with a little adversity. Wherefore I beseech thee, O Lord, to strengthen me with thy spirit, that I may willingly suffer for thy sake all manner of trouble and affliction. Lord, I will acknowledge unto thee all mine unrighteousness, and I will confess unto thee all the unstableness of my heart. Oftentimes a very little thing troubleth me sore, and maketh me dull and slow to serve thee. And sometimes I purpose to stand strongly, but when a little trouble cometh, it is to me great anguish and grief, and of a very little thing riseth a grievous temptation to me. Yea, when I think myself to be sure and strong, and that, as it seemeth, I have the upper hand, suddenly I feel myself ready to fall with a little blast of temptation." Behold, therefore, good Lord, my weakness, and consider my frailness best known to thee. Have mercy on me, and deliver me from all iniquity and sin, that I be not entangled therewith. Oftentimes it grieveth me sore, and in a manner confoundeth me, that I am so unstable, so weak, and so frail in resisting sinful motions, which, although they draw me not always to consent, yet nevertheless their assaults are very grievous unto me. 
and it is tedious to me to live in such battle, albeit I perceive that such battle is not unprofitable unto me. For thereby I the better know myself and mine own infirmities, and that I must seek help only at thy hands. O Lord God of Israel, the lover of all faithful souls, vouchsafe to behold the labor and sorrow of me, thy poor creature. Assist me in all things with thy grace, and so strengthen me with heavenly strength, that neither my cruel enemy, the fiend, neither my wretched flesh, which is not yet subject to the spirit, have victory or dominion over me. Oh, what a life may this be called, where no trouble nor misery lacketh, where every place is full of snares of mortal enemies. For one trouble or temptation overpassed, another cometh speedily, and the first conflict enduring a new battle suddenly ariseth. Wherefore, Lord Jesus, I pray thee, give me grace to rest in thee above all things, and to quiet me in thee above all creatures, above all glory and honor, above all dignity and power, above all cunning and policy, above all health and beauty, above all riches and treasure, above all joy and pleasure, above all fame and praise, above all mirth and consolation, that man's heart may take or feel besides thee. For thou, Lord God, art best, most wise, most high, most mighty, most sufficient, and most full of all goodness, most sweet and most comfortable, most fair, most loving, most noble, most glorious, in whom all goodness most perfectly is. And therefore, whatsoever I have besides thee, it is nothing to me, for my heart may not rest, nor fully be pacified, but only in thee. O Lord Jesus, most loving spouse, who shall give me wings of perfect love, that I may fly up from these worldly miseries, and rest in thee. O when shall I ascend to thee, and see, and feel how sweet thou art? When shall I wholly gather myself in thee so perfectly, that I shall not for thy love, feel myself but thee only above myself and above all worldly things that thou mayest vouchsafe to visit me in such wise as thou dost visit thy most faithful lovers. Now I often mourn and complain of the miseries of this life and with sorrow and great heaviness suffer them, for many things happen daily to me which oftentimes trouble me, make me heavy and darken mine understanding. They hinder me greatly and put my mind from thee, and so encumber me many ways that I cannot freely and clearly desire thee, or have thy sweet consolations, which with thy blessed saints are always present. I beseech thee, Lord Jesus, that the sighings and inward desires of my heart may move and incline thee to hear me. O Jesus, King of everlasting glory, the joy and comfort of all Christian people that are wandering as pilgrims in the wilderness of this world, my heart crieth to thee by still desires, and my silence speaketh unto thee, and saith, How long tarrieth my Lord God to come to me? Come, O Lord, and visit me, for without thee I have no true joy. Without thee my soul is heavy and sad. I am in prison and bound with fetters of sorrow, till thou, O Lord, with thy gracious presence, vouchsafe to visit me, and to bring me again to liberty and joy of spirit and to show thy favorable countenance unto me. Open my heart, Lord, that I may behold thy laws, and teach me to walk in thy commandments. Make me to know and follow thy will, and to have always in my remembrance thy manifold benefits, that I may yield due thanks to thee for them. But I acknowledge and confess for truth that I am not able to give thee worthy thanks for the least benefit that thou hast given me. O Lord, all gifts and virtues that any man hath in body or soul, natural or supernatural, are thy gifts, and come of thee, and not of ourselves, and they declare the great riches of thy mercy and goodness unto us. And though some have more gifts than others, yet they all proceed from thee, and without thee the least cannot be had. O Lord, I account it for a great benefit not to have many worldly gifts, whereby the Lord and praise of men might blind my soul and deceive me. Lord, I know that no man ought to be abashed or miscontent that he is in a lower state in this world and lacketh the pleasure of this life, but rather to be glad and rejoice thereat. For so much as thou hast chosen the poor and meek persons and such as are despised in the world to be thy servants and familiar friends. Witness thy blessed apostles whom thou madest chief pastors and spiritual governors of thy flock, who departed from the council of the Jews, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer rebuke for thy name. Even so, O Lord, grant that I, thy servant, may be as well content to be taken as the least as others are to be greatest, and that I be as well pleased to be in the lowest place as in the highest, and as glad to be of no reputation in the world for thy sake as others are to be noble and famous 
Lord, it is the work of a perfect man never to sequester his mind from thee, and among many worldly cares to go without care, not after the manner of an idle or dissolute person, but by the prerogative of a free mind, always minding heavenly things, and not cleaving by inordinate affection to any creature. I beseech thee, therefore, my Lord Jesus, keep me from the superfluous care of this world, that I be not disquieted with bodily necessities, and that I be not taken with the voluptuous pleasures of the world or of the flesh. Preserve me from all things which hinder my soul's health, that I be not overthrown with them. O Lord God, who art sweetness unspeakable, turn into bitterness to me all worldly and fleshly delights, which might draw me from the love of eternal things to the love of short and vile pleasure. Let not flesh and blood overcome me, nor yet the world with his vain glory deceive me, nor the fiend with his manifold crafts supplant me, but give me spiritual strength in resisting them, patience in suffering them, and constancy in persevering to the end. Give me for all worldly delectations the most sweet consolation of thy Holy Spirit, and for all fleshly love endue my soul with fervent love of thee. Make me strong inwardly in my soul, and cast out thereof all unprofitable cares of this world, that I be not led by unstable desires of earthly things, but that I may repute all things in this world as they are, transitory and soon vanishing away, and myself also with them drawing towards an end. For nothing under the sun may long abide, but all is vanity and affliction of spirit. Give me, Lord, therefore heavenly wisdom, that I may learn to seek and find thee, and above all things to love thee. Give me grace to withdraw me from them that flatter me, and patiently to suffer them that unjustly grieve me. Lord, when temptation or tribulation cometh, vouchsafe to succor me, that all may turn to my spiritual comfort, and patiently to suffer, and always to say, Thy name be blessed. Lord, trouble is now at hand. I am not well, but I am greatly vexed with this present affliction. O most glorious Father, what shall I do? Anguish and trouble are on every side. Help me, I beseech thee, in this hour. Thou shalt be lauded and praised when I am perfectly made meek before thee. The Lord is strong enough to take this trouble from me, and to assuage the cruel assaults thereof, that I be not overcome with them, as thou hast oftentimes done before this time, that, when I am clearly delivered by thee, I may with gladness say, The right hand of him that is highest hath made this change. Lord, grant me thine especial grace, that I may come thither where no creature shall hinder me, nor keep me from the perfect beholding of thee. For as long as any transitory thing keepeth me back, or hath rule in me, I may not truly ascend to thee. O Lord, without thee nothing may long delight or please, for if anything should be liking and savoury, it must be through help of thy grace, seasoned with the spirit of thy wisdom. O everlasting light, far passing all things, send down the beams of thy brightness from above, and purify and lighten the inward parts of my heart. Quicken my soul and all the powers thereof, that it may cleave fast and be joined to thee in joyful gladness of spiritual desires. O oh, when shall that blessed hour come, that thou shalt visit me and gladden me with thy blessed presence? When shalt thou be to me all in all? Verily, until that time come, there can be no true joy in me. But alas, the old man, that is my carnal affections, live still in me and are not crucified nor perfectly dead. For yet striveth the flesh against the spirit, and moveth great battle inwardly against me, and suffereth not thy kingdom of my soul to live in peace. But thou, good Lord, who hast the lordship over all, and power of the sea to assuage the rages and surges of the same, arise and help me, destroy the power of mine enemies, which always make battle against me. Show forth the greatness of thy goodness, and let the power of thy right hand be glorified in me, for there is to me none other hope nor refuge, but in thee only, my Lord, my God. To thee be honor and glory everlasting. O Lord, grant me that I may wholly resign myself to thee, and in all things to forsake myself, and patiently to bear my cross, and to follow me. O Lord, what is man that thou vouchsafest to have mind of him, and to visit him? Thou art always one, always good, always righteous, and holily, justly, and blessedly disposing all things after thy wisdom. But I am a wretch, and of myself always ready and prone to evil, and do never abide in one state, but many times do vary and change. Nevertheless it shall be better with me when it shall please thee, for thou, O Lord, only art he that mayest help me, and thou mayest so confirm and establish me that my heart shall not be changed from thee, but be surely fixed and finally rest and be quieted in thee. 
I am nothing else of myself but vanity before thee, an unconstant creature and a feeble, and therefore whereof may I rightfully glory, or why should I look to be magnified? Whoso pleaseth himself without thee displeaseth thee, and he that delighteth in men's praisings loseth the true praise before thee. The true praise is to be praised of thee, and the true joy is to rejoice in thee. Wherefore thy name, O Lord, be praised, and not mine. Thy works be magnified, and not mine, and thy goodness be always lauded and blessed. Thou art my glory and the joy of my heart. In thee shall I glory and joy in thee, and not in myself, nor in any worldly honor or dignity which compared to thy eternal glory is but a shadow and very vanity. O Lord, we live here in great darkness, and are soon deceived with the vanities of this world, and are soon grieved with a little trouble. Yet if I could behold myself well, I should plainly see that what trouble soever I have suffered, it hath justly come upon me, because I have sinned and grievously offended thee. To me, therefore, confusion and despite is due, but to thee, Lord, honour and glory. Lord, send me help in my troubles, for man's help is little worth. How often have I been disappointed, where I thought I should have found friendship, and how often have I found it where I least thought. Wherefore, it is a vain thing to trust in man, for the true trust and health of man is only in thee. Blessed be thou, Lord, therefore, in all things that happen unto us, for we are weak and unstable, soon deceived and soon changed from one thing to another. O Lord God, most righteous judge, strong and patient, who knowest the frailty and malice of man, be thou my whole strength, comfort in all necessities, for mine own conscience, Lord, sufficeth not. Wherefore, to thy mercy I do appeal, seeing no man may be justified nor appear righteous in thy sight, if thou examine him after thy justice. O blessed mansion of thy heavenly city, O most clear day of eternity, which the night may never darken. This is the day always clear and joyful, always sure and never changing its state. Would to God this day might shortly appear and shine upon us, and that these worldly fantasies were at an end. This day shineth clearly to thy saints in heaven with everlasting brightness, but to us pilgrims on earth it shineth obscurely, and as through a mirror or glass. The heavenly citizens know how joyous this day is, but we outlaws, the children of Eve, weep and wail the bitter tediousness of our day, that is, of this present life, short and evil, full of sorrow and anguish, where man is oftentimes defiled with sin, encumbered with affliction, disquieted with troubles, wrapped in cares, busied with vanities, blinded with errors, overcharged with labors, vexed with temptations, overcome with vain delights and pleasures of the world, and grievously tormented with penury and want. Oh, when shall the end come of all these miseries? When shall I be clearly delivered from the bondage of sin? When shall I, Lord, have only mind on thee and fully be glad and joyful in thee? When shall I have peace without trouble, peace within and without, and on every side steadfast and sure? When shalt thou be to me all in all, and when shall I be with thee in thy kingdom, that thou hast ordained for thine elect people from the beginning? I am left here poor, and as an outlaw, in the land of mine enemies, where daily are battles and great misfortunes. Comfort mine exile, assuage my sorrow, for all my desire is to be with thee. It is to me an unpleasant burden, whatsoever pleasure the world offereth me here. I desire to have inward fruition in thee, but I cannot attain thereto. I covet to cleave fast to heavenly things, but worldly affections pluck my mind downward. I would subdue all evil affections, but they daily rebel and rise against me, and will not be subject unto my spirit. Thus I, wretched creature, fight in myself, and am grievous to myself, while my spirit desireth to be upward, and contrary, my flesh draweth me downward. O oh, what suffer I inwardly! I go about to mind heavenly things, and straight a great rabble of worldly thoughts rush into my soul. Therefore, Lord, be not long away, nor depart in thy wrath from me. Send me the light of thy grace, destroy in me all carnal desires. Send forth the hot flames of thy love to burn and consume the hot fantasies of my mind. Gather, O Lord, my senses and the powers of my soul together in thee, and make me to despise all worldly things, and by thy grace strongly to resist and overcome all motions and occasions of sin. Help me, thou everlasting truth, that no worldly guile nor vanity hereafter have power to deceive me. Come also, thou heavenly sweetness, and let all bitterness of sin flee far from me. Pardon me, and forgive me as oft as in my prayer my mind is not surely fixed on thee. For many times I am not there, 
where I stand or sit, but rather there whither my thoughts carry me. For there I am where my thought is, and there as customably is my thought, there is that I love. And that oftentimes cometh into my mind, which by custom pleaseth me best, and delighteth me most to think upon, accordingly as thou dost say in thy gospel, where a man's treasure is, there is his heart. Wherefore, if I love heaven, I speak gladly thereof, and of such things as are of God, and of that which appertaineth to his honour, and to the glorifying of his holy name. And if I love the world, I love to talk of worldly things, and I joy anon in worldly felicity, and sorrow and lament soon for worldly adversity. If I love the flesh, I imagine oftentimes that which pleaseth the flesh. If I love my soul, I delight much to speak and to hear of things that are for my soul's health. And whatsoever I love, of that I gladly hear and speak, and bear the images of them still in my mind. Blessed is that man who for the love of the Lord setteth not by the pleasures of this world, and learneth truly to overcome himself, and with the fervour of spirit crucifieth his flesh, so that in a clean and pure conscience he may offer his prayers to thee, and be accepted to have company of thy blessed angels, all earthly things being excluded from his heart. Lord and Holy Father, be thou blessed now and ever. For as thou wilt, so is it done, and that thou dost is always best. Let me, thy humble and unworthy servant, joy only in thee, and not in myself, nor in anything else beside thee. For thou, Lord, art my gladness, my hope, my crown, and all mine honour. What hath thy servant but that he hath of thee, and that without his desert? All things are thine, thou hast created and made them. I am poor, and have been in trouble and pain ever from my youth, and my soul hath been in great heaviness through manifold passions that come of the world and of the flesh. Wherefore, Lord, I desire that I may have of thee the joy of inward peace. I ask of thee to come to that rest which is ordained for thy chosen children, that are fed and nourished with the light of heavenly comforts, for without thy help I cannot come to thee. Lord, give me peace, give me inward joy, and then my soul shall be full of heavenly melody, and devout and fervent in lauding and praising thee. But if thou withdraw thyself from me, as thou hast sometimes done, then may not thy servant run the way of thy commandments as I did before. For it is not with me, as it was when the lantern of thy spiritual presence did shine upon my head, and I was defended under the shadow of thy wings from all perils and dangers. O merciful Lord Jesus, ever to be praised, the time is come that thou wilt prove thy servant, and rightful it is that I shall now suffer somewhat for thee. Now is the hour come that thou hast known from the beginning that thy servant for a time should outwardly be set at naught, and inwardly to lean to thee, and that he should be despised in the sight of the world, and be broken with affliction, that he may after arise with thee in a new light, and be clarified, and made glorious in thy kingdom of heaven. O Holy Father, thou hast ordained it so to be, and it is done as thou hast commanded. This is thy grace, O Lord, to thy friend, to suffer him to be troubled in this world for thy love, how often soever it be, and of what person soever it be, and in what manner soever thou wilt suffer it to fall unto him. For without thy will or sufferance what thing is done upon earth? It is good to me, O Lord, that thou hast meekened me, that I may thereby learn to know thy righteous judgments, and to put from me all manner of presumption and stateliness of heart. It is very profitable for me that confusion hath covered my face, that I may learn thereby rather to seek to thee for help and succour than to man. I have thereby learnt to dread thy secret and terrible judgments, who scourgest the righteous with the sinner, but not without equity and justice. Lord, I yield thanks to thee that thou hast not spared my sins, but hast punished me with scourges of love, and hast sent me affliction and anguish within and without. No creature under heaven may comfort me but thou, Lord God, the heavenly physician of man's soul, who strikest and healest, who bringest a man nigh to death, and afterward restorest him to life again, that he may thereby learn to know his own weakness and imbecility, and the more fully to trust in thee, O Lord. Thy discipline is laid upon me, and thy rod of correction hath taught me, and under that rod I wholly submit me. Strike my back and my bones as it shall please thee, and make me to bow my crooked will unto thy will. Make me a meek and a humble disciple, as thou hast sometimes done with me, that I may walk after thy will. To thee I commit myself to be corrected, for better it is to be corrected by thee here than in time to come. Thou knowest all things, and nothing is hid from thee that is in man's conscience. Thou knowest all things to come before they befall, and it is not needful that any man teach thee or warn thee of anything that is done upon the earth. 
Thou knowest what is profitable for me, and how much tribulations help to do away the rust of sin in me. Do with me after thy pleasure, I am a sinful wretch, to none so well known as to thee. Grant me, Lord, to know that which is necessary to be known, to love that which is to be loved, to desire that which pleaseth thee, to regard that which is precious in thy sight, and to refuse that which is vile before thee. Suffer me not to judge thy mysteries after my outward senses, nor to give sentence after the hearing of the ignorant, but by true judgment to discern things spiritual, and above all things always to search and follow thy will and pleasure. O Lord Jesus, thou art all my riches and all that I have, I have it of thee. But what am I, Lord, that I dare speak to thee? I am thy poor creature and a worm most abject. Behold, Lord, I have naught, and of myself I am naught worth. Thou art only God, righteous and holy. Thou orderest all things, thou givest all things, and thou fulfillest all things with goodness. I am a sinner, barren and void of all godly virtue. Remember thy mercies and fill my heart with plenty of thy grace, for thou wilt not that thy works in me should be made in vain. How may I bear the misery of this life except thy grace and mercy do comfort me? Turn not thy face from me, defer not the visiting of me, withdraw not thy comforts, lest haply my soul be made as dry earth without the water of grace. Teach me, Lord, to fulfill thy will, to live meekly and worthily before thee. For thou art all my wisdom and knowledge, thou art he that knowest me as I am, that knewest me before the world was made and before I was born or brought into this life. To thee, O Lord, be honour and glory, and praise for ever and ever. Amen. Praise be to the God eternal. Amen. End of Prayer or Meditations by Catherine Parr The Martyrdom of the Blessed Servant of God, Walter Mill By John Knox This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Among the rest of the martyrs of Scotland, the marvellous constancy of Walter Mill is not to be passed over in silence, out of whose ashes sprang thousands of his opinion and religion in Scotland, who altogether chose rather to die than to be any longer overtrodden by the tyranny of the Romish ecclesiastics, and so began the Congregation of Scotland to debate the true religion of Christ. In the year of our Lord, 1558, in the time of Mary, Queen Regent of Scotland, John Hamilton, being Bishop of St. Andrews and Primate of Scotland, Walter Mill, who in his youth had been a papist, after that he had been in Germany and had heard the doctrine of the gospel, returned again into Scotland, and, setting aside all papistry and compelled chastity, married a wife, which thing made him to be suspected of heresy by the bishops of Scotland. After long watching of him, he was taken by two popish priests, one called Sir George Strachan, and the other Sir Hugh Turry, servants to the said bishop for the time, within the town of Dysart in Fife, and brought to St. Andrews and imprisoned in the castle thereof. He being in prison, the papists earnestly laboured to seduce him, and threatened him with death and corporal punishments, to the intent they would cause him to recant and forsake the truth. But seeing they could profit nothing thereby, and that he remained still firm and constant, they laboured to persuade him by fair promises, and offered unto him a monk's portion for all the days of his life in the abbey of Dunfermline, if that he would deny the things he had taught and grant that they were heresy, but he, continuing in the truth, even unto the end, despised their threatenings and fair promises. Then assembled together many of the Romish prelates and ecclesiastics with diverse others, as sundry friars black and grey. These being assembled and having consulted together, Mill was taken out of prison and brought to the cathedral, where he was put in a pulpit before the bishops to be accused the twentieth day of April. Being brought into the church and climbing up to the pulpit, they, seeing him so weak and feeble of person, partly by age and travail, and partly by evil treatment, that without help he could not climb up, supposed that they should not have heard him for weakness of voice. But when he began to speak, he made the church to ring and sound again, with so great courage and stoutness that the Christians who were present were no less rejoiced than the adversaries were confounded and ashamed. He being in the pulpit and on his knees at prayer, Sir Andrew Oliphant, one of the bishop's priests commanded him to arise and to answer to his articles, saying on this manner, Sir Walter Mill, arise and answer to the articles, for you hold my lord here over long. To whom Walter, 
After he had finished his prayer, answered, saying, We ought to obey God more than men. I serve one more mighty, even the omnipotent Lord. And where you call me Sir Walter, they call me Walter, and not Sir Walter. I have been over long one of the Pope's knights. Now say what thou hast to say. Oliphant. What think you of priests' marriage? Mill. I hold it a blessed band. For... Christ himself maintained it, and approved the same, and also made it free to all men. But ye think it not free to you, ye abhor it, and in the meantime take other men's wives and daughters, and will not keep the band that God hath made. Ye vow chastity, and break the same. St. Paul had rather marry than burn, the which I have done, for God never forbade marriage to any man, of what state or degree soever he were. Oliphant, thou sayest there are not seven sacraments. Mill. Give me the Lord's Supper and baptism, and take you the rest, and part them among you. For if there are seven, why have you omitted one of them to wit marriage, and give yourselves to slanderous and ungodly whoredom? Oliphant, thou art against the blessed sacrament of the altar, and sayest that the mass is wrong and is idolatry. Mill, suppose that a lord or a king sent and called many to a dinner, and when the dinner is in readiness he caused to ring a bell, and the men come to the hall and sit down to be partakers of the dinner, but the lord, turning his back unto them, ate all himself and mocked them. So do ye. Oliphant, thou deniest the sacrament of the altar to be the very body of Christ, really in flesh and blood. Mill, the scripture of God is not to be taken carnally, but spiritually, and standeth in faith only. And as for the mass, it is wrong, for Christ was once offered on the cross for man's trespass, and will never be offered again, for then he ended all sacrifice. Oliphant, thou deniest the office of a bishop. Mill, I affirm that they whom ye call bishops do no bishop's works, nor use the office of bishops, as Paul biddeth, writing to Timothy, but live after their own sensual pleasure, and take no care of the flock, nor yet regard they the word of God, but desire to be honoured and called my lords. Oliphant, thou speakest against pilgrimage, and callest it a pilgrimage to harlotry. Mill, I affirm that, and say that it is not commanded in the scripture, and that there is no greater harlotry in any places than at your pilgrimages, except it be in common brothels. Oliphant, thou preachest secretly and privately in houses and openly in the fields. Mill, yea, man, and on the sea, also sailing in ship. Oliphant, wilt thou not recant thy erroneous opinions? And if thou wilt not, I will pronounce sentence against thee. Mill, I am accused of my life. I know I must die once, and therefore, as Christ said to Judas, what thou doest, do quickly. Ye shall know that I will not recant the truth, for I am corn, I am no chaff. I will not be blown away with the wind, nor burst with the flail, but I will abide both. These things rehearsed they of purpose, with other like trifles, to augment their final accusation, and then Sir Andrew Oliphant pronounced sentence that he should be delivered to the temporal judge, and punished as a heretic, which was to be burnt. Notwithstanding, his boldness and constancy moved so the hearts of many that the bishop's steward of his regality, provost of the town called Patrick Lermont, refused to be his temporal judge, to whom it appertained if the cause had been just. Also the bishop's chamberlain, being therewith charged, would in no wise take upon him so ungodly an office. Yea, the whole town was so offended with his unjust condemnation that the bishop's servants could not get for their money so much as one cord to tie him to the stake or a tar-barrel to burn him, but were constrained to cut the cords of their master's own pavilion to serve their turn. Nevertheless, one servant of the bishop, more ignorant and cruel than the rest, called Alexander Simoel, enterprising the office of a temporal judge, in that part, conveyed him to the fire, where, against all natural reason of man, his boldness and hardiness did more and more increase, so that the Spirit of God working miraculously in him made it manifest to the people that his cause and articles were just, and he innocently put down. Now, when all things were ready for his death, and he conveyed with armed men to the fire, Oliphant bade him pass to the stake, and he said, Nay, but wilt thou put me up? With thy hand, and take part of my death, thou shalt see me pass up gladly, for by the law of God I am forbidden to put hands upon myself. Then Oliphant put him up with his hand, and he ascended gladly, saying, I go up to the altar of God, and desired that he might have space to speak to the people, the which Oliphant and other of the burners denied, saying that he had spoken overmuch, for the bishops were altogether offended that the matter was so long continued.' 
Then some of the young men said that they believed the burners and the bishops, their masters, should lament that day, and desired the said Walter to speak what he pleased. And so, after he had made his humble supplication to God on his knees, he arose, and, standing upon the coals, spake thus, Dear friends, the cause why I suffer this day is not for any crime laid to my charge, albeit I be a miserable sinner before God, but only for the defense of the faith of Jesus Christ, set forth in the New and Old Testament unto us, for which, as the faithful martyrs have offered themselves gladly before, being assured after the death of their bodies of eternal felicity, so this day I praise God that he hath called me of his mercy among the rest of his servants to seal up his truth with my life which, as I have received it of him, so willingly I offer it to his glory. Therefore, as you will escape eternal death, be no more seduced with the lies of priests, monks, friars, priors, abbots, bishops, and the rest of the sect of Antichrist, but depend only upon Jesus Christ and his mercy, that ye may be delivered from condemnation. The multitude that looked on made a great lamentation, for they were exceedingly moved with his words. When the fire was kindled and began to flame, he cried, Lord, have mercy on me. Pray, good people, while there is time, and thus departed, showing a wonderful courage and resolution of spirit. The citizens took his death so grievously that, lest it should be forgotten, they made up a great heap of stones in the place where he was burned, and when the priests had caused the heap twice or thrice to be carried away, denouncing a curse upon such as should bring any stones thither, Still it was renewed, until a watch was set to see who brought stones to the place and to apprehend them. Walter Mill was the last martyr that died in Scotland for religion at the time of the Reformation, and his death was the death of popery in the realm, for it much tended to excite the subsequent proceedings of the Protestants against the persecuting tyranny of the Romish prelates. See Fox's Acts and Monuments and Spottiswood's History. End of The Martyrdom of the Blessed Servant of God, Walter Mill, by John Knox. The godly exhortation of Holy Father Bradford, which he gave to his wife, children, and friends a little before his death, by John Bradford. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An exhortation, which a learned father of the church gave to his friends and relations a little before his martyrdom. The words or advice of a person departing are generally very taking. No wife so willful, no son so stubborn, or daughter dull in my apprehension, but would willingly watch for the words of him that is leaving the world, more specially they would, or at least wise, should be attractive and attentive, to the sententious speeches of a sober, solid, suffering servant of Jesus Christ. But although godliness be the greatest gain, it hath few followers, because so many fools. Persecution is the thorn in you, ye messengers of Satan. Must piety be punished? What a pity it is! That which is the garland of glory, the gate of heaven, should be so slighted, it increases my sorrow. But why should I be singular? Solomon saith, and what he said was true, that there is no new thing under the sun, for since sin entered into the world, by consequence there must be sorrow and suffering. Persecution is not only a legacy, but is entailed on the godly and to their heirs, whilst godly, so long as sun and moon shall endure, for all that will live godly must suffer persecution. Therefore, my dear friends, wonder not at the prosperity of the wicked, for they have only theirs here, but not hereafter, and though there be no bonds in their death, yet are they curses from the cradle, and their punishment will be perpetual. My advice to you is, if you love me, yourselves and your souls, strive with all your strength to secure that good part which can never be taken from you. So shall you be blessed, and your prayers be presented as sweet perfumes in the presence of him who rewardeth every man according to his deeds. I, who was once zealous for the papists, have, through grace, my eyes enlightened, and see my errors and sorrow for my simplicity, and am now ready to offer myself as a sweet sacrifice to and for my dearest Saviour. Father Bradford's last speech or sayings in prison, and at the place of execution, to his wife and children and his friends, fit to be remembered. Give ear, my friends, relations dear, whom in the flesh I love. Of all things whatsoever sin fear, 
and trust in God above. My dying words hark well unto, let each of them conduce, and highly be esteemed by you, observe for a good use. Since I must suffer for the truth in furious flames of fire, I you advise from lusts of youth, you strive now to aspire. In these distracting times provide and save yourselves from sin, your souls securely safely hide, beware of Satan's gin. He waits and watches to devour, it is his whole delight, to that intent each day and hour his bait hides from your sight. Sit not admiring at world's splendor, nor bear it in esteem, for in the end twill no more render than doth the vainest dream. Pleasures and treasures all are vain, no comfort could I find, they nothing but distract the brain, likewise perplex the mind. If that you would hark unto me, I'd learn you somewhat more, the which would profitable be, which you never heard before. Now therefore unto me attend, and let my dying words prevail, in that I draw unto my end, and from this world lanch with fresh gall. In ways of piety proceed, and fear not frowns of popish party, and so shall you be blessed indeed, if that you love God's law most hearty. The word of God, take that for rule, there lies the touchstone for to try. Learn therefore by no other school that shows the faults of popery. And furthermore I advise you that if you mean your soul to save, never to trust that bloody crew to do with them, oh, never have. If that before them you they call to give a ransom of your faith, be fearful not in judgment hall, but tell them thus the scripture saith. And if that reason won't take place, and she persists in acts of ill, by cheerful countenance let your face declare that you your blood will spill. Rather than that you any way the laws of God for to condemn or heavenly master disobey, you value not the wrath of men. Fear not the furious flames of fire, therein to broil be well contented, of heaven's honours none theirs higher, of martyrdom none e'er repented. To seal the truth with dearest blood, flinch not, nor fearful be at all, I it esteem as chiefest good and glory in that God doth call. Me unto martyrdom that those who love the truth and live therein, and likewise to confute my foes which in dark ignorance live in. When that unto the stake I come, I trust that fear will take its flight. I hope converted will be some, although it be a fearful sight. Christians to see in fire to fry, disdaining pardons which they bring away with them, will then say I, I fear not death, no, nor his sting. I have a life to lose, tis true, and I must breath in truth resign. What thought it be by wicked crew, the breath I have is none of mine." My loving friends, relations who have heard these words of mine, you'll likewise such a pattern show, declaring a power divine. The time is short, I must live in, therefore my words pray mark, of all things fearful be of sin, and mind God's word to hark. So shall you in the end attain to perfect bliss and joy, although it be through fiercest pain the which will seem a toy, when to your master's house you come, and a royal throne attain, Repent you won't the work you've done, no sufferings with great pain. For there all tears are wiped away, and sorrows they are fled. No night is there, but always day, with bliss to be bestead. Therefore me follow, nothing fear, disdain the world's grand glory, for gospel promises shall cheer, and mind not lying story. Thus you have, reader, by my scant capacity, a catalogue of very choice sayings and expressions, the which you should lay up in your heart, that you may be able to lay it out in your life when such sad occasions shall call you to it. It is usual with the world to wonder at everything that is not wicked, but alack, poor souls, when they shall, as I hope they will come, to have a sense of their sin, which is the cause of sufferings here and hereafter to all eternity. I heartily wish that that word eternity was more minded and more made of than it is at this day. To tell you what is minded, which you cannot but mind, the pride of your looks, the pride of your locks, the pride of your gait and gesture, the pride of your garb and vesture, the pride of your outward enjoyments, the pride of your inward endowments, and what follows poverty, a punishment, who hath no pity. This good man met with many conflicts in the world, yet waded through the worst of them all. 
and is now launched into the ocean of eternal bliss, the which is possible for you likewise to enjoy following his directions. And as they are the advice of so grave a pattern, I hope they will not be slighted, but seriously sought for by all serious, sober, solid servants of our Saviour Jesus Christ. End of the godly exhortation of Holy Father Bradford, which he gave to his wife, children, and friends a little before his death. By John Bradford. A Certain Godly Supplication by Certain Inhabitants of Norfolk and Suffolk This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Certain Godly Supplication Exhibited by Certain Inhabitants of the County of Norfolk to the Commissioners Come Down to Norfolk and Suffolk, April A.D. 1556, Fruitful to be Read and Marked of All Men. In most humble and lowly wise, we beseech your honours, right honourable commissioners, to tender and pity the humble suit of us poor men and true, faithful and obedient subjects, who, as we have ever heretofore, so intend we, with God's grace, to continue in Christian obedience unto the end, and according to the holy word of God, with all reverent fear of God, to do our bounden duty to all those superior powers whom God hath appointed over us, doing, as St. Paul saith, let every soul be subject to the superior powers, for there is no power but of God, and those powers that are, are ordained of God. Wherefore, whosoever resisteth the powers, the same resisteth God, and they that resist get themselves judgment. Romans 13. These lessons, right honourable commissioners, we have learnt of the holy word of God in our mother tongue. First, that the authority of a king, queen, lord, or other their officers under them is no tyrannical usurpation, but a just, holy, lawful, and necessary estate for man to be governed by, and that the same is of God, the fountain and author of righteousness. Secondly, that to obey the same in all things not against God is to obey God, and to resist them is to resist God. Therefore, as to obey God in his ministers and magistrates bringeth life, so to resist God in them bringeth punishment and death. The same lesson we have learnt of St. Peter, saying, Be ye subject to all human ordinances for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king, as to the most highest, or to the lieutenants sent from him to the punishment of evildoers, but to the praise of such as do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye should stop the mouths of foolish and ignorant men, as free, and not as having the liberty to be a cloak to malice, but as the servants of God. 1 Peter 2 Wherefore, considering with ourselves both that the magistrate's power is of God, and that for the Lord's sake we are bound to Christian obedience unto them, having now a commandment, as though it were from the Queen's Majesty, with all humble obedience, due to the regal power and authority ordained of God, which we acknowledge to stand holy and perfectly in her grace, and with due reverence unto you, her grace's commissioners, we humbly beseech you with patience and pity to receive this our answer unto that commandment given unto us. First, right honourable commissioners, we have considered ourselves to be not only Englishmen, but also Christians, and therefore bound to the holy vow made to God in our baptism, to prefer God's honour in all things, and that all obedience, not only of us mortal men, but even of the very angels and heavenly spirits, is due unto God's word. Insomuch that no obedience can be true and perfect, either before God or man, that wholly and fully agreeeth not with God's word. Then have we weighed the commandment concerning the restitution of the late abolished Latin service given unto us to dissent and disagree from God's word and to command manifest impiety and the overthrow of godliness and true religion and to import a subversion of the regal power of this our native country and realm of England with the bringing in of the Romish bishop's supremacy with all errors, superstitions and idolatry wasting of our goods and bodies, destroying of our souls, bringing with it nothing but the severe wrath of God which we already feel, and fear, lest the same shall be more fiercely kindled upon us. Wherefore we humbly protest that we cannot be persuaded that the same wicked commandment should come from the Queen's Majesty, but rather from some other, abusing the Queen's goodness and favour, and studying to work some feat against the Queen, her crown and the realm, to please with it the Roman bishop at whose hands the same thinketh hereafter to be advanced 
They refer to Haman and others as examples of evil counselors and urge that every Christian man must needs, if God will so call them, gladly suffer all manner of persecution and lose their lives in the defense of God's word and truth. We humbly beseech the Queen's Majesty and you, her honorable commissioners, be not offended with us for confessing this truth of God so straightly given us in charge of Christ neither bring upon us that great sin that never shall be forgiven, and shall cause our Saviour, Jesus Christ, in the great day of judgment before his heavenly Father and all his angels to deny us, and to take from us the blessed price and ransom of his bloodshedding, wherewith we are redeemed. Matthew 10. For in that day neither the Queen's Highness, neither you nor any man, shall be able to excuse us, nor to purchase a pardon of Christ for this horrible sin and blasphemy of casting aside and condemning his word. We cannot agree or consent unto this so horrible a sin, but we beseech God for his mercy to give us, and all men, grace, most earnestly to flee from it, and rather, if the will of God be so, to suffer all extremity and punishment in this world than to incur such damnation before God. They then refer to the scriptures which state that the introduction of idolatry by Jeroboam and Manasseh brought wrath upon the Jews. This most heinous offense is now offered unto us, although the same be pained and coloured with the name of Reformation, restoring of religion, ancient faith, with the name of the Catholic Church of Unity, Catholic Truth, and with the cloak of feigned holiness. These are sheepskins, under the which, as Christ saith, ravening wolves cover themselves. But Christ willeth us to look upon their fruits, whereby we may know them. And truly that is no good fruit to cast aside God's word and to banish the English service out of the churches and in the place of it to bring in a Latin tongue unknown unto the people, which, as it edifieth no man, so it hath been occasion of all blindness and error among the people. For before the blessed Reformation it is known what blindness and error we were all in, when not one man in all this realm unlearned in the Latin could say in English the Lord's Prayer, or knew any one article of his belief, or rehearse any one of the Ten Commandments. And that ignorance, mother of mischief, was the very root and wellspring of all idolatry, monkery, licentious unchastity of unmarried priests, of all whoredom, drunkenness, covetousness, swearing and blasphemy, with all other wicked, sinful living. These brought in the severe wrath and vengeance of God, plaguing sin with famine and pestilence, and at last the sword consumed and avenged all their impiety and wicked living. As it is greatly to be feared, the same or more grievous plagues shall now again follow. We cannot therefore consent nor agree that the word of God and prayers in our English tongue, which we understand, should be taken away from us, and for it a Latin service, we wot not what, for none of us understand it, be again brought in amongst us, especially seeing that Christ hath said, My sheep hear my voice and follow me, and I give to them everlasting life. John 10. The service in English teaches us that we are the Lord's people and the sheep of his pasture, and God commandeth that we harden not our hearts, as when they provoked the Lord's wrath in the wilderness, lest he swear unto us, as he did swear unto them, that they should not enter into his rest. The service in Latin is a confused noise, which, if it be good, as they say it is, yet unto us that lack understanding what goodness can it bring. St. Paul commandeth that in the churches all things should be done to edifying, which we are sure is God's commandment. But in the Latin service nothing is done to edifying, but, contrarily, all to destroy those that are already edified, and to drive us from God's word and truth, and from believing of the same, and so to bring us to believe lies and fables, that, tempting and provoking God, we should be brought into that judgment which blessed Paul speaketh of, saying, Antichrist shall come according to the working of Satan, with all manner of power and signs and lying wonders in all deceivableness of unrighteousness in those that perish, because they have not received the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And therefore God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe lies and be damned, as many as have not believed the truth, but have approved unrighteousness. Thus altogether drawn from God, we shall fall into his wrath through unbelief, till he swears unto us, as to the unfaithful Jews, that such infidels shall not enter into his rest. In the administration of the Lord's Supper, which we confessed to be the Holy Communion, and partaking with Christ and his holy congregation, we have learnt God's holy commandments, and at the rehearsal of every one of them to ask God for mercy for our most grievous transgressions against them, and to ask grace of God to keep them in time to come. 
that the same may not only outwardly sound in our ears, but also inwardly by the Holy Ghost be written in our hearts. We have learnt the holy prayer made for the Queen's Majesty, wherein we learn that her power and authority is of God. Therefore we pray to God for her, that she and all magistrates under her may rule according to God's word, and we, her subjects, obey according to the same. Truly, most honorable commissioners, we cannot think these things evil, but think them most worthy to be retained in our churches, and we would think ourselves not to have true subjects' hearts if we should go about to put away such godly prayers as put us perpetually in memory of our bounden obedience and duty to God and our rulers. For, as we think at this present, the unquiet multitude had more need to have these things more often and earnestly beaten and driven into them, now given in many places to stir and trouble, than to take from them that blessed doctrine whereby only they may, to their salvation, be kept in quiet. They then urged the superior spiritual advantages of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, as lately administered in English, compared to the sacrament of the Latin Mass. The priests complain that we laymen love them not, nor have them in honour, but it is their own fault. For how should we love them that only seek to keep us in blindness and ignorance, to damn our souls, to destroy our bodies, to rob and spoil our goods and substance under a colour of pretended holiness? We know, right honourable commissioners, what honour is due to such wolves, and how, by the authority of God's word, such are to be fled, as pestilences to the Lord's lambs, whom they miserably daily murder. But we have rather chosen, by this our meek supplication, humbly to desire the Queen's Majesty and you, her honourable commissioners, to render God's word again unto the churches, and to permit us freely to enjoy the same. For we certainly know that the whole religion lately set out by the holy saint of God, our late most dear King Edward, is Christ's true religion, written in the holy scripture of God, and by Christ and his apostles taught unto his church. Wherefore we cannot allow with safe consciences this refusal of it and casting of it out of our churches, forasmuch as to refuse, cast off, and to reject it is to cast off Christ himself and to refuse our part in his blessed body broken for our sins and his blood shed for our redemption. Which thing, whoso doth the same without repentance, can look for no sacrifice for his sins, but most fearfully waits for the judgment and for that vehement fire that shall destroy Christ's adversaries. For if he that despised the law of Moses was without mercy put to death under two or three witnesses, how much more grievous torments shall he suffer that treadeth under foot the Son of God, and esteemeth the blood of the testament, whereby he was sanctified as a profane thing, and contumulously useth the Spirit of grace? Wherefore we most humbly pray and beseech the Queen's gracious majesty to have mercy and pity upon us her poor and faithful subjects, and not to compel us to do that which is against our consciences, and so incurably wound us in heart by bringing into the church the Latin mass and service that nothing edifieth us, and casting out of Christ's holy communion and English service, so causing us to sin against our redemption. For such as willingly and wittingly against their consciences shall so do, as it is to be feared many do, they are in a miserable state until the mercy of God turn them which, if he do not, we certainly believe that they shall eternally be damned, and as in this world they deny Christ's holy word and communion before men, so shall Christ deny them before his heavenly Father and his angels. And whereas it is very earnestly required that we should go in procession, as they call it, at which time the priests say in Latin such things as we are ignorant of, the same edifieth nothing at all unto godliness. And we have learnt that to follow Christ's cross is another matter, namely to take up our cross and to follow Christ in patient suffering for his love, in tribulations, sickness, poverty, prison, or any other adversity, whensoever God's holy will and pleasure is to lay the same upon us, the triumphant passion and death of Christ, whereby in his own person he conquered death, sin, hell, and damnation, hath most lively been preached unto us, and the glory of Christ's cross declared by our preachers whereby we learnt the causes and effects of the same more lively in one sermon than in all the processions that ever we went or shall go in. When we worship the Divine Trinity kneeling and in the litany invocating the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, asking mercy for our sins and desiring such petitions as the need of our frail estate and this mortal life requires, we were edified both to know unto whom all Christian prayers should be directed and also to know that of God's hand we receive all things as well to the salvation of our souls as to the relief of our mortal necessities. And we humbly beseech the Queen's Majesty that the same most holy prayers may be continued amongst us, that our ministers pray in our mother tongue, and we, understanding their prayers and petitions, may answer, Amen, unto them. 
At evening service we understand our minister's prayers. We were taught and admonished by the scriptures then read, which in the Latin evensong is all gone. At the ministration of holy baptism we learnt what league and covenant God had made with us, and what vows and promises we upon our part had made, namely to believe in him, to forsake Satan and his works, and to walk in the way of God's holy word and commandments. The Christian catechism continually taught and called to remembrance the same, whereas before no man knew anything at all. And many good men of sixty years that had been godfathers to thirty children knew no more of the godfather's office than to wash their hands ere they departed the church, or to fast five Fridays on bread and water. O merciful God, have pity upon us. Shall we be altogether cast from thy presence? We may well lament our miserable estate to receive such a commandment, to reject and cast out of our churches all these most godly prayers, instructions, admonitions, and doctrines, and thus to be compelled to deny God and Christ our Saviour, His holy word and all His doctrine of our salvation, the candle to our feet and the light to our steps, the bread coming down from heaven, the water that giveth life, which whoso drinketh it shall be in him a wellspring streaming unto eternal life, whereby we have learnt all righteousness, all true religion, all true obedience towards our governors, all charity one towards another, all good works that God would have us to walk in, what punishment abideth the wicked, and what heavenly reward God will have to those that reverently walk in his ways and commandments. Wherefore, right honourable commissioners, we cannot without impiety refuse and cast from us the holy word of God, which we have received, or condemn anything set forth by our most godly late King Edward and his virtuous proceedings, so agreeable to God's word. And our most humble suit is that the commandment may be revoked, so that we be not constrained thereunto. For we protest before God, we think if the holy word of God had not taken some root amongst us, we could not in times past have done that poor duty of ours, which we did in assisting the Queen, our most dear Sovereign, against her Grace's mortal foe, that then sought her destruction. It was our bounden duty, and we thank God for that knowledge of his word and grace, that we then did some part of our bounden service. And we meekly pray and beseech the Queen's Majesty for the dear passion of Jesus Christ, that the same word be not taken away out of her churches, nor from us her loving, faithful, and true subjects, lest, if the like necessity should hereafter befall, which God for his mercy's sake forbid, and ever save and defend her grace, and us all, the want of knowledge and due remembrance of God's word may be occasion of great ruin to an infinite number of her grace's true subjects. And truly, we judge this to be one subtle part of the devil, that enemy to all godly peace and quietness, that by taking God's word from amongst us and planting ignorance, he may make a way to all mischief and wickedness, and by banishing the holy gospel of peace, he may bring upon us the heavy wrath of God with all manner of plagues, as death, strange sickness, pestilence, moraine, and most terrible uproars, commotions, and seditions. They then refer to the judgments Isaiah 6, Micah 7. The same plagues, we are afraid, will also fall upon us, for whereas heretofore, with the receiving of Christ's word and peaceable gospel, we had great benedictions of God, especially this Christian concord and holy peace, so that all were at full and perfect stay in religion, no man offended with another, but as the sons of peace, each of us with Christian charity embraced each other. Now, alas for piety, the devil, riding upon the red horse, showed unto St. John in the Revelation, is come forth, and power is given unto him to take peace from the earth. For now a man can go to no place, but malicious busybodies curiously search out his deeds, mark his words, and if he agrees not with them in despising God's word, then will they spitefully and hatefully rail against him and it, calling it error and heresy, and the professors thereof heretics and schismatics, with other odious and despiteful names, as traitors and not the queen's friends, not favourers of the queen's proceedings, as if to love God's word were heresy, and as though to talk of Christ were to be schismatics, as though none could be true to the queen that were not false to God as though none were the queen's friends, but such as despitefully rail on her grace's father and brother, and on God's word that they set forth, as though none favoured the queen's majesty, but such as hate all godly knowledge. They describe the things urged as inventions of popes. And we, poor subjects, for speaking of that which is truth and our bounden allegiance, are daily punished, railed upon, and noted for seditious, and not the queen's friends. But God, who is blessed forever, knoweth that they slander us, and pull the thorn out of their own foot, 
and put it in ours. For the searcher of hearts knoweth that we bear a faithful and true heart unto her grace, and unto all her proceedings that are not against God and his holy word. And we pray daily unto the Heavenly Father to lighten her grace's royal heart with the glorious light of his gospel, that she may establish and confirm that religion that her grace's brother, our most dear king, did set out amongst us, and so governing and ruling this her realm in the fear and true way of God, she may long live and with prosperity, peace, and honor reign over us. But we cannot think that those men do seek either God's honor or her grace's prosperity or wealth of the realm that take God's word from her grace's faithful subjects, which only is the root of all love and faithful obedience under her grace, and of all honesty, good life, and virtuous concord among her commons. And this we fear, lest the root being taken away, the branches will soon wither and be fruitless. And when the Philistines have stopped up the wellspring, the fair streams that should flow shall soon be dried up. All our watchmen, our true preachers, have taught us that as long as we retained God's word, we should have God, our gracious, merciful Father. But if we refused and cast off the Lord's yoke of his doctrine, then shall we look for the Lord's wrath and severe visitation to plague us, as he did the Jews for the like offences. And Paul saith, God gave to them the spirit of unquietness and uproar, eyes wherewith they should not see, and ears wherewith they should not hear, until this day. Romans 11. And as David said, let their table be made a snare to take themselves withal, a trap to catch them, and a stumbling block to fall at. Let their eyes be blinded that they see not, and bow thou down their backs always. Psalm 69. O merciful God, all this is now come upon us, and daily more and more increased, and we fear at last it will so bow down our backs that we shall utterly be destroyed. The troublesome spirit of uproars and unquietness daily troubleth men's hearts, and worketh such unquietness in all places, that no man that loveth quietness can tell where to place himself. Men have eyes, and see not how grievous offence it is, to cast off the yoke of God's doctrine, and to bear the heavy burden that unfaithful hypocrites lay upon us. We have ears and hear not the warning of God's word, calling us to true repentance, nor his threats against our impiety. Our most sweet table of Christ's word and most holy communion is taken away and turned to a most perilous snare through the brawling disputations of men. And as the idol of abomination betokened final subversion unto the Jewish nation, so we fear this setting aside of the gospel and holy communion of Christ, and the placing in of Romish religion betokens desolation to be had at hand of this noble realm of England. For the plagues of hunger, pestilence, and sword cannot long tarry, but except we repent and turn again to the Lord, our backs shall be so bowed that the like horrible plagues were never seen. And no marvel, for the like offence was never committed, as to reject and cast off Christ and his word, and in plain English to say, we will not have him to reign over us. O Lord, how terrible is it that followeth in the gospel! Those mine enemies that would not have me to reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. God be merciful unto us, and move the Queen's Majesty's heart, and the hearts of her Honourable Council, and your hearts, right Honourable Commissioners, to weigh these dangers in due time, and to call God's word into your counsel, and then you shall see how it agreeeth with this bishop-like commandment, and be as wary to avoid the contempt of the eternal God and dangers of the same, as you are prudent and wise in matters of this world, lest if the Almighty be condemned... He stretched forth his arm, which no man can turn and kindle his wrath, that no man can quench. We have humbly opened unto you our consciences, doubtless sore wounded and grieved by this commandment, and we meekly pray and beseech the Queen's Majesty for the precious death and bloodshedding of Jesus Christ our Saviour, to have mercy and pity upon us, her gracious poor commons, faithful and true subjects, members of the same body politic, whereof her grace is supreme head. All our bodies, goods, lands, and lives are ready to do her grace faithful obedience and true service of all commandments that are not against God and his word, but in these things that import a denial of Christ and refusal of his word and holy communion, we cannot consent or agree unto it. For we have bound ourselves in baptism to be Christ's disciples and to keep his holy word and ordinances, and if we deny him before men, he will deny us before his heavenly Father and his holy angels in the day of judgment, which we trust her benign grace will not require of us. And we humbly beseech her majesty that we be not enforced unto it, but as we serve her grace with body and goods and due obedience according to God's commandment, so we may be permitted freely to serve God and Christ our Saviour, and keep unto him our souls, which he hath with his precious blood redeemed, 
so that, as Christ teacheth, we may render to Caesar that which is due to Caesar, and to God that which is due to God. For we think it no true obedience unto the Queen's Highness, or to any other magistrate ordained of God under her, to obey in things contrary to God's word, although the same be ever so straitly charged in her grace's name. The Bishop of Winchester hath truly taught in that point, in his book of true obedience, that true obedience is in the Lord, and not against the Lord. As the apostles answered before the council at Jerusalem, commanding them no more to preach in the name of the Lord Jesus, judge you, said they, whether it be right in the sight of God, to hear you rather than God. And again they said, we must obey God rather than man. Wherefore, we learn that true obedience is to obey God, King of all kings and Lord of all lords, and for him, in him, and not against him and his word, to obey the princes and magistrates of this world, who are not truly obeyed when God is disobeyed, nor yet disobeyed when God is faithfully obeyed. They then refer to the examples of Daniel and others. Wherefore, we humbly beseech the Queen's Majesty, with pity and mercy, to tender the lamentable suit of us, her poor subjects, who are by this commandment sorely hurt, and wounded in our consciences, and driven to many miseries, and by the malicious attempts of wicked men, suffer great wrongs and injuries, slanders, loss of goods, and bodily vexations. We think not good by any unlawful stir or commotion to seek remedy, but intend by God's grace to obey Her Majesty in all things not against God and His Holy Word. But unto such ungodly bishop-like commandments as are against God, we answer with the Apostle, God must be obeyed rather than man. If persecution shall ensue, which some threaten us with, we desire the Heavenly Father, according to his promise, to look from heaven, to hear our cry, to judge between us and our adversaries, to give us faith, strength, and patience, to continue faithfully unto the end, and to shorten these evil days for the sake of his chosen, and so we faithfully believe he will. They then fervently beseech the Queen to permit the holy word of God and true religion set forth by King Edward to be restored again unto our churches, to be frequented amongst us. So shall we grow and increase in the knowledge of God and of Christ, in true repentance and amendment of life. So shall we exhibit true obedience to our lawful magistrates and all superiors ordained of God. So shall love and charity, of late through this commandment so decayed, be again restored, the honour of her regal estate the more confirmed and established, and godliness and virtuous life among her loving subjects increased and maintained. And we most heartily pray you, right honourable commissioners, to be means unto the Queen's Highness and to her honourable council, that this our humble suit may be favourably tendered and graciously heard and granted. And we shall not cease day and night to pray unto the Heavenly Father long to preserve her grace and all other magistrates in his fear and love and in prosperous peace and wealth with long life and honour. Amen. Your poor suppliants, the lovers of Christ's true religion in Norfolk, and Suffolk. End of A Certain Godly Supplication by Certain Inhabitants of Norfolk and Suffolk Examination Before the Commissioners, September 30, 1555, by Hugh Latimer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Now, after Master Ridley was committed to the mayor, then the Bishop of Lincoln commanded the bailiffs to bring in the other prisoner, who, Eftsons, as he was placed, said to the lords, Latimer, My lords, if I appear again, I pray you not to send for me until you be ready, for I am an old man, and it is great hurt to mine old age to tarry so long, gazing upon the cold walls. Then the Bishop of Lincoln Master Latimer, I am sorry you are brought so soon, although it is the bailiff's fault and not mine, but it shall be amended. Then Master Latimer bowed his knee down to the ground, holding his hat in his hand, having a kerchief on his head, and upon it a nightcap or two, and a great cap, such as townsmen use, with two broad flaps to button under the chin, wearing an old threadbare Bristow frieze gown girded to his body with a penny leather girdle at the which hanged by a long string of leather his testament and his spectacles without case, depending about his neck upon his breast. After this the Bishop of Lincoln began on this manner. Lincoln, Master Latimer, you shall understand that I and my lords here have a commission from my lord Cardinal Pole's grace, legate al latere, 
to this realm of England from our most reverend Father in God, the Pope's Holiness, to examine you upon certain opinions and assertions of yours, which you, as well here openly in disputations in the year of our Lord 1554, as at sundry and at diverse other times, did affirm, maintain, and obstinately defend. In the which commission be specially two points, the one which we must desire you is, that if you shall now recant, revoke, and disannul these your errors, and together with all this realm, yea, all the world, confess the truth, we, upon due repentance of your part, shall receive you, reconcile you, acknowledge you no longer a strayed sheep, but adjoin you again to the unity of Christ's church, from the which you in the time of schism fell." so that it is no new place to the which I exhort you, I desire you but to return thither from whence you went. Consider, Master Latimer, that without the unity of the church is no salvation, and in the church can be no errors. Therefore, what should stay you to confess that which all the realm confesseth, to forsake that which the king and queen, their majesties, have renounced, and all the realm recanted? It was a common error, and it is now of all confessed, it shall be no more shame to you than it was to us all. Consider, Master Latimer, that within these twenty years this realm also, with all the world, confessed one church, acknowledged in Christ's church an head, and by what means and for what occasion it cut off itself from the rest of Christianity, and renounced that which in all times and ages was confessed, it is well known, and might be now declared upon what good foundation the sea of Rome was forsaken, save that we must spare them that are dead, to whom the rehearsal would be appropriate. It is no usurped power, as it hath been termed, but founded upon Peter by Christ, a sure foundation, a perfect builder, as by diverse places, as well of the ancient fathers, as the express word of God may be proved. With that, Master Latimer, which before leaned his head to his hand, began somewhat to remove his cap and kerchief from his ears. The bishop proceeded, saying, for Christ spake expressly to Peter, saying, Pasque ovus meas, et rege ovus meas, the which word doth not only declare a certain ruling of Christ's flock, but includeth also a certain preeminence and government, and therefore is the king called, called Rex Aregendo, so that in saying Rege, Christ declared a power which he gave to Peter, which jurisdiction and power Peter by hand delivered to Clement, and so in all ages hath it remained in the sea of Rome. This, if you shall confess with us and acknowledge with all the realm your errors and false assertions, then shall you do that which we most desire, then shall we rest upon the first part of our commission, then shall we receive you, acknowledge you one of the church, and according to the authority given unto us, minister unto you, upon due repentance, the benefit of absolution, to the which the king and queen, their majesties, were not ashamed to submit themselves, although they of themselves were unspotted, and therefore needed no reconciliation. Yet, lest the putrefaction and rottenness of all the body might be noisome, and do damage to the head also, they, as I said, most humbly submitted themselves to my lord cardinal his grace, by him as legate to the pope's holiness, to be partakers of the reconciliation." But if you shall stubbornly persevere in your blindness, if you will not acknowledge your errors, if you, as you now stand alone, will be singular in your opinions, if by schism and heresy you will divide yourself from your church, then must we proceed to the second part of the commission, which we would be loath to do, that is, not to condemn you, for that we cannot do, that the temporal sword of the realm, and not we, will do, but to separate you from us, acknowledge you to be none of us, to renounce you as no member of the church, to declare that you are filius perditionis, a lost child, and as you are a rotten member of the church, so to cut you off from the church, and so to commit you to the temporal judges, permitting them to proceed against you according to the tenor of their laws. Therefore, Master Latimer, for God's love, consider your estate. Remember, you are a learned man. You have taken degrees in the school, borne the office of a bishop. Remember, you are an old man. Spare your body, accelerate not your death, and specially remember your soul's health, quiet of your conscience. Consider that if you should die in this state, you shall be a stinking sacrifice to God, for it is the cause that maketh the martyr and not the death. Consider that if you die in this state, you die without grace, for without the church can be no salvation. Let not vainglory have the upper hand, humiliate yourself. Captivate your understanding, subdue your reason, submit yourself to the determination of the church. Do not force us to do all that we may do. Let us rest in that part which we most heartily desire, and I for my part, 
Then the bishop put off his cap, again with all my heart exhort you. After the bishop had somewhat paused, then Master Latimer lifted up his head, for before he leaned on his elbow, and asked whether his lordship had said, and the bishop answered, Yea, Latimer, then will your lordship give me leave to speak a word or two? Lincoln, Yea, Master Latimer, so that you use a modest kind of talk without railing or taunts. Latimer, I beseech your lordship, license me to sit down. Lincoln, at your pleasure, Master Latimer, take as much ease as you will. Latimer, your lordship gently exhorted me, in many words, to come to the unity of the church. I confess, my lord, a Catholic church spread throughout the world, in the which no man can be saved, but I know perfectly by God's word that this church is in all the world, and hath not his foundation in Rome only, as you say, and methought your lordship brought a place out of the scriptures to confirm the same, that there was a jurisdiction given to Peter, in that Christ bade him regere, govern his people. Indeed, my lord, St. Peter did well and truly his office, in that he was bid regere, but since the bishops of Rome have taken a new kind of regere. Indeed, they ought regere, but how, my lord? Not as they will themselves, but this regere must be hedged in and ditched in. They must regere, but, but secundum verbum dei. They must rule, but according to the word of God. But the bishops of Rome have turned regere secundum verbum dei into regere secundum voluntate suam. They have turned the rule according to the word of God into the rule according to their own pleasures, and as it pleaseth them best, as there is a book set forth which hath diverse points in it, and amongst others this point is one which your lordship went about to prove by this word regere, and the argument which he bringeth forth for the proof of that matter is taken out of Deuteronomy, where it is said, if there ariseth any controversy among the people, the priests, Levitici generis, of the order of Levi, shall decide the matter secundum legum dei, according to the law of God, so it must be taken. Deuteronomy 21. This book, perceiving this authority to be given to the priests of the old law, taketh occasion to prove the same to be given to the bishops and others, the clergy of the new law. But in proving this matter, whereas it was said there, as the priests of the order of Levi shall determine the matter according to God's law, that according to God's law is left out, and only is recited as the priests of the order of Levi shall decide the matter, so it ought to be taken of the people, a large authority, I assure you. What gelding of scripture is this, what clipping of God's coin, with which terms the audience smiled. This is much like the regere which your lordship talked of. Nay, nay, my lords, we may not give such authority to the clergy to rule all things as they will. Let them keep themselves within their commission. Now I trust, my lord, I do not rail yet. Lincoln. No, Master Latimer, your talk is more like taunts than railing, but in that I have not read the book which you blame so much, nor know not of any such, I can say nothing therein. Latimer. Yes, my lord, the book is open to be read, and is entitled to one which is Bishop of Gloucester, whom I never knew, neither did at any time see him to my knowledge. With that the people laughed, because the Bishop of Gloucester sat there in commission. Then the Bishop of Gloucester stood up and said it was his book. Latimer. Was it yours, my lord? Indeed, I knew not your lordship, neither ever did I see you before, neither yet see you now through the brightness of the sun shining betwixt you and me. Then the audience laughed again, and Master Latimer spake unto them, saying, Latimer, why, my masters, this is no laughing matter, I answer upon life and death. Voe vorbus qui ridetis nunc, quoniam flebitis. The bishop of Lincoln commanded silence, and then said, Lincoln, Master Latimer, if you had kept yourself within your bounds, if you had not used such scoffs and taunts, this had not been done. After this, the Bishop of Gloucester said, in excusing of his book, Master Latimer, hereby every man may see what learning you have. Then Master Latimer interrupted him, saying, Latimer, lo, you look for learning at my hands, which have gone so long to the school of oblivion, making the bare walls my library, keeping me so long in prison, without book or pen and ink, and now you let me loose to come and answer to articles. You deal with me as though two were appointed to fight for life and death, and overnight the one through friends and favour is cherished, and hath good counsel given him how to encounter with his enemy, the other, for envy or lack of friends, all the whole night is set in the stocks. 
In the morning, when they shall meet, the one is in strength and lusty, the other is stark of his limbs and almost dead for feebleness. Think you that to run through this man with a spear is not a goodly victory? But the Bishop of Gloucester, interrupting his answer, proceeded, saying, Gloucester, I went not about to recite any place of scripture in that place of my book, for then, if I had not recited it faithfully, you might have had just occasion of reprehension, but I only in that place formed an argument a majori, in this sense, that if in the old law the priests had power to decide matters of controversy, much more then ought the authority to be given to the clergy in the new law, and I pray you in this point, what availeth their rehearsal, secundum legem dei. Latimer, yes, my lord, very much, for I acknowledge authority to be given to the spirituality to decide matter of religion, and as my lord said even now, regere, but they must do it secundum verbum dei, and not secundum voluntatem suam, according to the word and law of God, and not after their own will, after their own imaginations and fantasies. The Bishop of Gloucester would have spoken more, saving that the Bishop of Lincoln said that they came not to dispute with Master Latimer, but to take his determinate answers to their articles, and so began to propose the same articles which were proposed to Master Ridley. But Master Latimer interrupted him, speaking to the Bishop of Gloucester. Latimer, well, my lord, I could wish more faithful dealing with God's word, and not to leave out a part, and to snatch a part here and another there, but to rehearse the whole faithfully. But the Bishop of Lincoln, not attending to this saying of Master Latimer, proceeded in the rehearsing of the articles, in form and sense, as I declared before, in the examination of the articles proposed to Master Ridley, and required Master Latimer's answer to the first. Then Master Latimer, making his protestation that notwithstanding these his answers, it should not be taken that thereby he would acknowledge any authority of the Bishop of Rome, saying that he was the King and Queen, their Majesty's subject, and not the Pope's, neither could serve two masters at one time, except he should first renounce one of them, require the notaries so to take his protestation that whatsoever he should say or do, it should not be taken as though he did thereby agree to any authority that came from the Bishop of Rome. The Bishop of Lincoln said that his protestation should be so taken, but he required him to answer briefly, affirmatively or negatively, to the first article, and so recited the same again, and Master Latimer answered as follows. Latimer, I do not deny, my Lord, that in the sacrament by spirit and grace is the very body and blood of Christ, because that every man, by receiving bodily that bread and wine, spiritually receiveth the body and blood of Christ, and is made partaker thereby of the merits of Christ's passion. But I deny that the body and blood of Christ is in such sort in the sacrament as you would have it. Lincoln, then, Master Latimer, you answer affirmatively. Latimer, yea, if you mean of that gross and carnal being which you do take. The notaries took his answer to be affirmatively. Lincoln, what say you, Master Latimer, to the second article, and recited the same? Latimer, there is, my lord, a change in the bread and wine, and such a change as no power but the omnipotency of God can make, in that that which before was bread should now have the dignity to exhibit Christ's body, and yet the bread is still bread and the wine still wine, for the change is not in the nature but in the dignity, because now that which was common bread hath the dignity to exhibit Christ's body. For whereas it was common bread, it is now no more common bread, neither ought it to be so taken, but as holy bread, sanctified by God's word. With that, the Bishop of Lincoln smiled, saying, Lincoln, lo, Master Latimer, see what steadfastness is in your doctrine, that which you abhorred and despised most, you now most establish, for whereas you most railed at holy bread, you now make your communion holy bread. Latimer, tush, a rush for holy bread, I say the bread in the communion is a holy bread indeed. But the Bishop of Lincoln interrupted him and said, Lincoln, oh, you make a difference between holy bread and holy bread. With that, the audience laughed. Well, Master Latimer, is not this your answer, that the substance of bread and wine remaineth after the words of consecration? Latimer, yes, verily, it must needs be so, for Christ himself calleth it bread. St. Paul calleth it bread, the doctors confess the same, the nature of the sacrament confirmeth the same, and I call it holy bread, not in that I make no difference betwixt your holy bread and this, but for the holy office which it beareth, that is, to be a figure of Christ's body, and not only a bare figure, but effectually to represent the same. So the notaries penned his answer to be affirmatively. Lincoln, what say you to the third question? And recited the same. 
Latimer, no, no, my lord, Christ made one perfect sacrifice for all the world. Neither can the priest offer up Christ again for the sins of man, which he took away by offering himself once for all, as St. Paul saith, upon the cross. Neither is there any propitiation for our sins, saving his cross only. So the notaries penned his answer to this article also to be affirmatively. Lincoln, and what say you after the fourth Master Latimer, and recited it? After the recital whereof, when Master Latimer answered not, the bishop asked him whether he heard him or no. Latimer, yes, but I do not understand what you mean thereby. Lincoln, marry only this, that your assertions were condemned by Master Dr. Weston as heresies. Is it not so, Master Latimer? Latimer, yes, I think they were condemned, but how unjustly he that shall be judge of all knoweth. So the notaries took his answer to this article also to be affirmatively. Lincoln, what say you, Master Latimer, to the fifth article, and recited it? Latimer, I know not what you mean by these terms. I am no lawyer. I would you would propose the matter plainly. Lincoln, in that we proceed according to the law, we must use their terms also. The meaning only is this, that these your assertions are notorious, evil spoken of, and yet common and recent in the mouths of the people. Latimer, I cannot tell how much nor what men talk of them. I come not so much among them in that I have been secluded a long time. When men report of them, I know not nor care not. This answer taken, the Bishop of Lincoln said, Master Latimer, we mean not that these your answers shall be prejudicial to you. Tomorrow you shall appear before us again, and then it shall be lawful for you to alter and change what you will. We give you respite till tomorrow, trusting that after you have pondered well all things against tomorrow, you will not be ashamed to confess the truth. Latimer, now, my lord, I pray you give me license in three words to declare the causes why I have refused the authority of the Pope. Lincoln, nay, Master Latimer, tomorrow you shall have license to speak forty words. Latimer, nay, my lords, I beseech you to do with me now, as it shall please your lordships. I pray you, let not me be troubled tomorrow again. Lincoln, yes, Master Latimer, you must needs appear again tomorrow. Latimer, truly, my lord, as for my part, I require no respite, for I am at a point. You shall give me respite in vain. Therefore, I pray you, let me not trouble you tomorrow. Lincoln, yes, for we trust God will work with you against tomorrow. There is no remedy. You must needs appear again tomorrow at eight of the clock in St. Mary's Church. And forthwith the bishop charged the mayor with Master Latimer and dismissed him and then break up their session for that day about one of the clock at afternoon. End of Examination Before the Commissioners, September 30, 1555 by Hugh Latimer. The Last Hours of the Duke of Suffolk by John Fox This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last Hours of the Dukes of Northumberland and Suffolk present a striking contrast. The Duke of Northumberland professed himself a papist and besought his life in the most abject terms, intimating that he never had really approved the Protestant doctrines, but had promoted the Reformation only to forward his political designs. The Duke of Suffolk died openly professing his belief in the doctrines of truth, as appears from the account of his last hours given by Fox. On Friday, the 23rd of February, 1554, about nine of the clock in the forenoon, the Lord Henry Grey, Duke of Suffolk, was brought forth of the Tower of London, under the scaffold on the Tower Hill, with a great company, etc., and in his coming thither, there accompanied him Dr. Weston, Dean of Westminster, as his spiritual father, notwithstanding, as it should seem, it was against the will of the said Duke. For when the Duke went up to the scaffold, Weston, being on his left hand, pressed to go up with him. The Duke, with his hand, put him down again off the stairs, and Weston, taking hold of the Duke, forced him down likewise. And as they ascended the second time, the Duke again put him down. Then Weston said it was the Queen's pleasure he should so do, wherewith the Duke, casting his hands abroad, ascended up the scaffold and paused some time after. And then he said, Masters, I have offended the Queen and her laws, and thereby am justly condemned to die, and am willing to die, desiring all men to be obedient, 
and I pray, God, that this my death may be an example to all men, beseeching you all to bear me witness that I die in the faith of Christ, trusting to be saved by his blood only, and not by any trumpery, the which died for me, and for all them that truly repent and steadfastly trust in him. And I do repent, desiring you all to pray to God for me, that, when you see my breath depart from me, you will pray to God that he may receive my soul. And then he desired all men to forgive him, saying that the queen had forgiven him. Then Master Weston declared with a loud voice that the queen's majesty had forgiven him. With that, diverse of these standers by said with audible voices, Such forgiveness God send thee, meaning Dr. Weston. Then the duke kneeled down upon his knees and said the psalm, Miserere mei Deus, Psalm 51, to the end, holding up his hands and looking up to heaven. And when he had ended the psalm, he said, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Then he arose and stood up and delivered his cap and his scarf unto the executioner. Then the executioner kneeled down and asked the duke's forgiveness. And the duke said, God forgive thee, and I do. And when thou dost thine office, I pray thee, do it well, and bring me out of this world quickly, and God have mercy to thee. Then stood there a man and said, My lord, how shall I do for the money that you do owe me? And the duke said, Alas, my good fellow, I pray thee, trouble me not now, but go thy way to my officers. Then he knitted a handkerchief about his face, and kneeled down, and said the Lord's Prayer unto the end. And then he said, Christ, have mercy upon me, and laid down his head on the block, and the executioner took the axe, and at the first chop struck off his head, and held it up to the people. Hollenshed observes, Such was the end of this Duke of Suffolk, a man of high nobility by birth and of nature, to his friends gentle and courteous, more easy indeed to be led than was thought expedient, of stomach stout and hard, hasty and soon kindled, but pacified straight again, and sorry if in his heat aught had passed him otherwise than reason might seem to bear, upright and plain in his private dealings, no dissembler, nor well able to bear injuries, but yet forgiving and forgetting the same, if the party would seem but to acknowledge his fault, and to seek reconcilement. Bountiful he was, and very liberal, somewhat learned himself, and a great favourer of those that were learned, so that to many he showed himself a very masonous, as free from covetousness, as void of pride, and disdainful haughtiness of mind, more regarding plain meaning men than clawback flatterers. And this virtue he had, that he could patiently hear his faults told him by those whom he had in credit for their wisdom and faithful meaning towards him. He was a hearty friend unto the gospel, and professed it to the last. End of The Last Hours of the Duke of Suffolk by John Fox An Effectual Prayer Made in Time of Trouble by Lady Jane Grey this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. O Lord, Thou God and Father of my life, hear me, poor and desolate woman, which flieth unto Thee only in all troubles and miseries. Thou, O Lord, art the only defender and deliverer of those that put their trust in Thee, and therefore I, being defiled with sin, encumbered with affliction, unquieted with troubles, wrapped in cares, overwhelmed with miseries, vexed with temptations, and grievously tormented with the long imprisonment of this vile mass of clay, my sinful body, do come unto thee, O merciful Saviour, craving thy mercy and help, without which so little hope of deliverance is left, that I may utterly despair of any liberty. Albeit it is expedient that, seeing our life standeth upon trying, we should be visited sometime with some adversity, whereby we might both be tried whether we are of thy flock or no, and also know thee and ourselves the better. Yet thou that saidst thou wouldst not suffer us to be tempted above our power, be merciful unto me, now a miserable wretch, I beseech thee, who with Solomon do cry unto thee, humbly desiring thee that I may neither be too much puffed up with prosperity, neither too much pressed down with adversity, lest I, being too full, should deny thee, my God, or being too low brought, should despair and blaspheme thee, my Lord and Saviour. O merciful God, consider my misery, which is best known unto thee, and be thou now unto me a strong tower of defence, I humbly require thee. Suffer me not to be tempted above my power, but either be thou a deliverer unto me out of this great misery, or else give me grace patiently to bear thy heavy hand and sharp correction. 
It was thy right hand that delivered the people of Israel out of the hands of Pharaoh, who for the space of four hundred years did oppress them and keep them in bondage. Let it therefore likewise seem good to thy fatherly goodness to deliver me, sorrowful wretch, for whom thy son Christ shed his precious blood on the cross, out of this miserable capacity and bondage wherein I am now. How long wilt thou be absent, for ever? O Lord, hast thou forgotten to be gracious, and hast thou shut up thy loving kindness in displeasure? Wilt thou be no more entreated? Is thy mercy clean gone for ever, and thy promise come utterly to an end for evermore? Why dost thou make so long tarrying? Shall I despair of thy mercy, O God? Far be that from me. I am thy workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Give me grace, therefore, to tarry thy leisure, and patiently to bear thy works, assuredly knowing that, as thou canst, so thou wilt deliver me, when it shall please thee, nothing doubting or mistrusting thy goodness towards me, for thou knowest better what is good for me than I do. Therefore do with me in all things what thou wilt, and plague me what way thou wilt. Only in the meantime arm me, I beseech thee, with thy armour, that I may stand fast, my loins being girded about with verity, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and shod with the shoes prepared by the gospel of peace, above all things taking to me the shield of faith, wherewith I may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is thy most holy word, praying always with all manner of prayer and supplication, that I may refer myself wholly to thy will, abiding thy pleasure and comforting myself in those troubles that it shall please thee to send me, seeing such troubles are profitable for me, and seeing I am assuredly persuaded that it cannot be but well all that thou doest. Hear me, O merciful Father, for his sake, whom thou wouldst should be a sacrifice for my sins, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory. Amen. End of an effectual prayer made in time of trouble by Lady Jane Grey. Confession or prayer composed and used by Knox after the death of Edward the Sixth by John Knox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hereafter followeth a confession by John Knox, minister of Christ's most sacred evangel, upon the death of that most virtuous and most famous king, Edward the Sixth, king of England, France, and Ireland, in which confession the said John doth accuse no less his own offences than the offences of others to be the cause of the taking away of that most godly prince now reigning with Christ while we abide plagues for our unthankfulness. Omnipotent and everlasting God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who by thy eternal providence disposest kingdoms, as seemeth best to thy wisdom, we acknowledge and confess thy judgments to be righteous, in that thou hast taken from us, for our ingratitude and for abusing of thy most holy word, our native king and earthly comforter. Justly mayest thou pour forth upon us the uttermost of thy plagues, for that we have not known the days and time of our merciful visitation. We have condemned thy word and despised thy mercies. We have transgressed thy laws, for deceitfully have we wrought. Every man with our neighbors, oppression and violence we have not abhorred. Charity hath not appeared among us, as our profession requires. We have little regarded the voices of thy prophets. Thy threatenings we have esteemed vanity and wind, so that in us of ourselves remains nothing worthy of thy mercy. For all are found fruitless, even the princes with the prophets, as withered trees apt and meet to be burned in the fire of thy eternal displeasure. But, O Lord, behold thy own mercy and goodness, that thou mayest purge and remove the most filthy burden of our most horrible offences. Let thy love overcome the severity of thy judgments, even as it did in giving to the world thy only Son, Jesus, when all mankind was lost and no obedience was left in Adam nor in his seed. Regenerate our hearts, O Lord, by the strength of the Holy Ghost. Convert thou us, and we shall be converted. Work thou in us unfeigned repentance, and move thou our hearts to obey thy holy laws. Behold our trouble and apparent destruction, and stay the sword of thy vengeance before it devour us. Place above us, O Lord, for thy great mercy's sake, such a head with such rulers and magistrates as fear thy name, and will the glory of Christ Jesus to spread. Take not from us the light of thy gospel, and suffer thou no papistry to prevail in this realm. Illuminate the heart of our sovereign lady, Queen Mary, 
with fruitful gifts of thy Holy Ghost, and inflame the hearts of her counsel with thy true fear and love. Repress thou the pride of those that would rebel, and remove from all hearts the contempt of thy word. Let not our enemies rejoice at our destruction, but look thou to the honor of thy own name, O Lord, and let thy gospel be preached with boldness in this realm. If thy justice must punish, then punish our bodies with the rod of thy mercy. But, O Lord, let us never revolt nor turn back to idolatry again. Mitigate the hearts of those that persecute us, and let us not faint under the cross of our Saviour, but assist us with the Holy Ghost, even to the end. End of A Confession or Prayer Composed and Used by Knox After the Death of Edward VI by John Knox The prayer of King Edward the Sixth, which he made three hours afore his death, to himself, his eyes being closed and thinking none had heard him, by King Edward the Sixth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The prayer of King Edward the Sixth, which he made the sixth of July. Anno 1553, and the seventh of his reign, three hours afore his death, to himself his eyes being closed, and thinking none had heard him, the sixteenth year of his age. Lord God, deliver me out of this miserable and wretched life, and take me among thy chosen, howbeit not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, I commit my spirit to thee. O Lord, thou knowest how happy it were for me to be with thee, Yet, for thy chosen's sake, send me life and health, that I may truly serve thee. O my Lord God, bless thy people, and save thine inheritance. O Lord God, save thy chosen people of England. O my Lord God, defend this realm from papistry, and maintain thy true religion, that I and my people may praise thy holy name. Then turned he his face, and seeing who was by him, said unto them, Are ye so nigh? I thought ye had been further off. Then Dr. Owen said, we heard you speak to yourself, but what ye said we know not. He then, after his fashion, smiling, said, I was praying to God. The last words of his pangs were these, I am faint, Lord have mercy upon me and take my spirit. And so he yielded up his ghost. Witness hereof present were Sir Thomas Roth, Sir Henry Sidney, two of the chief gentlemen of the privy chamber, Dr. Owen, Dr. Wendy, Christopher Salmon Groom, God Save the Queen. End of The Prayer of King Edward the Sixth, which he made three hours afore his death, to himself, his eyes being closed and thinking none had heard him, by King Edward the Sixth. Thanksgiving for Deliverance with Prayers by John Knox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Parliament was to begin the 20th of July, 1560, and to be continued till the 1st of August, and therefore the Lords made haste and diligence that all things should be put in convenient order. But before all things the preachers exhorted them, for then in Edinburgh were the most part of the chief ministers of this realm to be thankful unto God, and next to provide that the ministers should be distributed as the necessity of the country required. A day was appointed when the whole nobility and the greatest part of the congregation assembled in St. Giles's Church in Edinburgh, where, after the sermon made for that purpose, public thanks were given unto God for his merciful deliverance in form as followeth. Knox, History O eternal and everlasting God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath not only commanded us to pray and promised to hear us, but also willest us to magnify thy mercies and to glorify thy name when thou showest thyself pitiful and favorable unto us, especially when thou deliverest us from desperate dangers. For so did thy servants Abraham, David, Jehoshaphat, and Hezekiah. Yea, the whole people of Israel omitted not the same, when thou by thy mighty hand didst confound their enemies, and didst deliver them from fear and danger of death intended. We ought not, nor can we forget, O Lord, in how miserable a state stood this poor country, and we, 
the just inhabitants of the same, not many days past, when idolatry was maintained, when cruel strangers did bear rule, when virgins were deflowered, matrons corrupted, men's wives violently and villainously oppressed, the blood of innocence shed without mercy, and finally, when the unjust commandments of proud tyrants were obeyed as law. Out of these miseries, O Lord, neither our wit, policy, nor strength could deliver us, Yea, thou didst show to us how vain was the help of man, where thy blessing giveth not victory. In these our anguishes, O Lord, we sobbed unto thee, we cried for thy help, and we proclaimed thy name, as thy troubled flock, persecuted for thy truth's sake. Mercifully hast thou heard us, O Lord, mercifully, we say, because that neither in us, neither yet in our confederates, was there any cause why thou shouldst have given unto us so joyful and sudden a deliverance. For none of us cease to do wickedly, even in the midst of our greatest troubles, and yet hast thou looked upon us so pitifully, as though we had given unto thee most perfect obedience. For thou hast disappointed the counsels of the crafty, thou hast bridled the rage of the cruel, and thou hast of thy mercy set this our perishing realm at a reasonable liberty. O thou, Lord, that only givest all good gifts— Give us hearts with reverence and fear to meditate on thy wondrous works lately wrought in our eyes. Let not the remembrance of the same unthankfully slip from our wavering minds. We grant and acknowledge, O Lord, that whatsoever we have received shall fall into oblivion with us, and so turn to our condemnation, unless thou, by the power of thy Spirit, keep and retain us in recent and perpetual memory of the same. We beseech thee, therefore, O Father of mercies, that, as of thy undeserved grace thou hast partly removed our darkness, suppressed idolatry, and taken from above our heads the devouring sword of merciless strangers, so that it would please thee to proceed with us in this thy grace begun. And albeit that in us there is nothing that may move thy majesty to show us this favour, yet for Christ Jesus, thy only well-beloved Son's sake, whose name we bear and whose doctrine we profess, we beseech thee never to suffer us to forsake or deny this verity which now we profess, but seeing that thou hast mercifully heard us and hast caused thy verity to triumph in us, so we crave of thee continuance to the end, that thy godly name may be glorified in us thy creatures." And seeing that nothing is more odious in thy presence, O Lord, than ingratitude and violation of an oath and covenant made in thy name, and seeing thou hast made our confederates of England the instruments by whom we are now set at this liberty, and to whom, in thy name, we have promised mutual faith again, let us never fall to that unkindness, O Lord, that either we declare ourselves unthankful unto them, or profaners of thy holy name. Confound thou the counsel of those that go about to break that most godly league contracted in thy name, and retain thou us so firmly together by the power of thy Holy Spirit that Satan may have no power to set us again at variance or discord. Give us thy grace to live in that Christian charity which thy Son, our Lord Jesus, hath so earnestly commended to all the members of his body, that other nations, stirred up by our example, may set aside all ungodly war, contention and strife, and study to live in tranquility and peace, as becometh the sheep of thy pasture, and the people that daily look for our final deliverance by the coming again of our Lord Jesus, to whom with thee and the Holy Spirit be all honour, glory, and praise, now and ever. Amen. End of Thanksgiving for Deliverance with Prayers by John Knox A Treatise on Prayer by John Knox this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A declaration what true prayer is, how we should pray, and for what we should pray, set forth by John Knox, preacher of God's holy word. Unto the small and dispersed flock of Jesus Christ. How necessary is the right invocation of God's name, otherwise called perfect prayer. It becomes no Christian to misknow, seeing it is the very branch which springs forth of true faith, whereof, if any man be destitute, notwithstanding he is endued with whatsoever other virtues, yet in the presence of God is he considered as no Christian at all. Therefore it is a manifest sign that such as are always negligent in prayer do understand nothing of perfect faith, for if the fire be without heat, or the burning lamp without light, then true faith may be without fervent prayer." But because in times past there was, and yet, alas, there still is, no small number who reckon that to be prayer which in the sight of God was and is nothing less, I intend shortly to touch upon the circumstances thereof. 
what prayer is. Who will pray must know and understand that prayer is an earnest and familiar talking with God to whom we declare our miseries, whose help we implore and desire in our adversities, and whom we laud and praise for our benefits received. So that prayer contains the exposition of our dullers, footnote, troubles, sorrows, end footnote, the desire of God's defense and the praising of his magnificent name, as the Psalms of David clearly teach. What is to be observed in prayer? The consideration in whose presence we stand, to whom we speak, and what we desire should excite us to the greatest reverence in doing this, standing in the presence of the omnipotent Creator of heaven and earth, and of all that is therein, whom a thousand thousand angels assist and serve, giving obedience to his eternal majesty, and speaking unto him who knoweth the secrets of our hearts, before whom dissimulation and lies are always odious and hateful, and asking those things which may be most to his glory and to the comfort of our conscience. But we should attend diligently that such things as may offend his godly presence may be removed to the uttermost of our power. And first, that worldly cares and fleshly cogitations, such as draw us from contemplation of our God, be expelled from us, that we may freely, without interruption, call upon God. But how difficult and hard this one thing is to perform in prayer, none know better than such as in their prayers are not content to remain within the bands of their own vanity, but are, as it were, enwrapped and do intend to a purity allowed of God, asking not such things as the foolish reason of man desires, but that which may be pleasant and acceptable in God's presence. Our adversary Satan, at all times, compassing us about, is never more busy than when we address and bend ourselves to prayer. Oh, how secretly and subtly he creeps into our breasts, and, calling us back from God, causes us to forget what we have to do. So that frequently, when we with all reverence should speak to God, we find our hearts talking with the vanities of the world, and with the foolish imaginations of our own conceit. How the Spirit maketh intercession for us. So that, without the Spirit of God supporting our infirmities, mightily making intercession for us with unceasing groans, which cannot be expressed with tongue, there is no hope that we can desire anything according to God's will. I mean not that the Holy Ghost doth mourn or pray, but that he stirreth up our minds, giving unto us a desire or boldness to pray, and cause us to mourn when we are extracted or pulled therefrom. Which thing to conceive no strength of man suffices, neither is able of itself, but hereof it is plain that such as understand not what they pray or expound or declare not the desire of their hearts clearly in God's presence and in time of prayer as far as they are able and do not expel vain cogitations from their minds, they profit nothing in prayer. Why should we pray and also understand what we do pray? But some will object and say, Although we understand not what we pray, yet God understandeth, who knoweth the secrets of our hearts. He knoweth also what we need, although we explain not or declare not our necessities unto him. Such men verily declare themselves never to have understood what perfect prayer meant, nor to what end Jesus Christ commanded us to pray, which is, first, that our hearts may be inflamed with continual fear, honor, and love of God, to whom we run for support and help, whensoever danger or necessity requires that we so learning to mollify our desires in his presence, he may teach us what is to be desired and what not. Also that we, knowing our petitions to be granted by God alone, to whom only we must render and give laud and praise, and that we ever having his infinite goodness fixed in our minds may constantly abide to receive that which with fervent prayer we desire. For sometimes God defers or prolongs to grant our petitions for the exercise and trial of our faith, and not that he sleepeth or is absent from us at any time, but that with more gladness we might receive what with long expectation we have abided for, that thereby we, assured of his eternal providence, so far as the infirmity of our corrupt and most weak nature will permit, doubt not, but that his merciful hand shall relieve us in most urgent necessity and extreme tribulation. Therefore such men as teach us that necessarily it is not required that we understand what we pray, because God knoweth what we need, would also teach us that we neither honor God, nor yet refer or give unto him thanks for benefits received, for how shall we honor and praise him, whose goodness and liberality we know not? And how shall we know unless we receive and sometimes have experience? And how shall we know that we have received unless we know verily what we have asked? 
The second thing to be observed in perfect prayer is that standing in the presence of God, we be found such as reverence his holy name, earnestly repenting our past iniquities and intending to lead a new life. For otherwise all our prayers are in vain, as it is written, Whoso withdraweth his ear that he may not hear the law of God, his prayer shall be abominable. Likewise Isaiah and Jeremiah say this, You shall multiply your prayers, and I shall not hear, because your hands are full of blood, that is, of all cruelty and mischievous works. Also the Spirit of God appeareth by the mouth of the blind, whom Jesus Christ illuminated by these words, We know that God heareth not sinners, that is, such as do glory and continue in iniquity. So that of necessity true repentance must needs be had and go before perfect prayer or sincere invocation of God's name. And unto these two things must be annexed the third, which is the dedication of ourselves in God's presence, utterly refusing and casting off our own justice with all cogitations and opinions thereof. And let us not think that we shall be heard for anything proceeding purely of our own mind, or depend anything upon our own justice, which from the presence of his mercy repelleth or holdeth with the high proud Pharisee, and therefore we find the most holy men most dejected and humbled in prayer. David saith, O Lord our Saviour, help us. Be merciful to our sins for thy own sake. Remember not our old iniquities, but haste thee, O Lord, and let thy mercy prevent us. Jeremiah saith, If our iniquities bear testimony against us, do thou according to thy own name. And behold, Isaiah, thou art angry, O Lord, because we have sinned, and are replenished with all wickedness, and our justice is like a defiled cloth. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are clay, Thou art the workman, and we the workmanship of thy hands. Be not angry, O Lord, remember not our iniquities for ever. And Daniel, greatly commended of God, in his prayer made most humble confession in these words, We are sinners, and have offended. We have done ungodly, and fallen from thy commandment. Therefore not in our own righteousness make we our prayers before thee, but thy most rich and great mercies bring we forth for us. O Lord, hear, O Lord, be merciful and spare us. O Lord, attend, help, and cease not. My God, even for thy own name's sake, do it. For thy city and thy people are called after thy own name. Observe that in these prayers is no mention of their own justice, their own satisfaction, or their own merits, but most humble confession proceeding from a sorrowful and penitent heart, having nothing whereupon it might depend but the sure mercy of God alone, who had promised to be their God, that is, their help, comfort, defender, and deliverer, as he hath also done to us by Jesus Christ in time of tribulation. And therefore they despaired not, but after the acknowledging of their sins, called for mercy and obtained the same. Wherefore it is plain that such men, as in their prayers, have respect to any virtue proceeding of themselves, thinking their prayers are accepted thereby, never prayed aright. What fasting and alms deeds are without prayer. And although to fervent prayer are joined fasting, watching, and alms deeds, yet are none of these the cause that God will accept our prayers, but they are spurs which make us not to vary, but make us more able to continue in prayer which the mercy of God doth accept. But here it may be observed that David prayeth, Keep my life, O Lord, for I am holy. O Lord, save my soul, for I am innocent, and suffer me not to be confounded. Also Hezekiah, Remember, Lord, I beseech thee, that I have walked righteously before thee, and that I have wrought that which is good in thy sight. These words are not spoken of men out of vain glory, neither yet trusting in their own works, but herein they testify themselves to be the sons of God by regeneration, to whom he promises always to be merciful, and at all times to hear their prayers. The cause of their boldness was Jesus Christ. And so their words spring from a wanted, constant, and fervent faith, surely believing that, as God of his infinite mercy had called them to his knowledge, not suffering them to walk after their own natural wickedness, but had partly taught them to conform themselves to his holy law, and that for the promised seed's sake he would not leave them destitute of comfort, consolation, and defense in so great and extreme necessity, and so they allege not their justice to glory thereof, or to put trust therein, but to strengthen and confirm them in God's promises." And this consolation I would wish all Christians in their prayers, the testimony of a good conscience to assure them of God's promises. But to obtain what they ask must only depend upon him, all opinion and thought of our own justice being laid aside. And moreover David in the words above compares himself with King Saul, 
and with the rest of his enemies who wrongfully persecuted him, desiring of God that they prevail not against him, as though he would say, Unjustly do they persecute me, and therefore, according to my innocence, defend me. For otherwise he confesses himself most grievously to have offended God, as in the preceding places he clearly testifies. Hypocrisy is not allowed with God. Thirdly, in prayer is to be observed that what we ask of God, that we must earnestly desire, acknowledging ourselves to be indigent and void thereof, and that God alone can grant the petitions of our hearts when it is his good will and pleasure. For nothing is more odious before God than hypocrisy and dissimulation, that is, when men do ask of God things whereof they have no need, or that they believe to obtain by others than by God alone. As if a man ask of God the remission of his sins, thinking nevertheless to obtain the same by his own works, or by other men's merits, he mocks God and deceives himself. And in such cases a great number do offend, principally the mighty and rich of the earth, who for a common custom will pray this part of the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, that is, a moderate and reasonable sustenance, and yet their own hearts will testify that they need not so to pray, seeing they abound in all worldly solace and felicity. I mean not that rich men should not pray this part of the Lord's Prayer, but I would they understood what they ought to pray in it, whereof I intend to speak afterwards, and that they ask nothing whereof they feel not themselves marvellously indigent and needy, for unless we call in verity he will not grant, and except we speak with our whole heart, we shall not find him. The fourth rule necessary to be followed in prayer is a sure hope to attain what we ask, for nothing more offends God than when we ask doubting whether he will grant our petitions, for in so doing we doubt if God be true, and if he be mighty and good. Such, saith St. James, can obtain nothing of God, and therefore Jesus Christ commands that we firmly believe to obtain whatsoever we ask, for all things are possible to him that believeth, and therefore in our prayers desperation always is to be expelled. I mean not that any man in extremity of trouble can be without a present dollar, and without a greater fear of trouble to follow. Trouble and fear are the very spurs to prayer, for when man compassed about with vehement calamities and vexed with continual solicitude, having by help of man no hope of deliverance, with sorely oppressed and punished heart, fearing also greater punishment to follow, doth call to God for comfort and support from the deep pit of tribulation, such prayer ascendeth into God's presence and returneth not in vain. God delivereth his chosen from their enemies." As David, in the vehement persecution of Saul, hunted and chased from every hold, fearing that one day or other he should fall into the hands of his persecutors, after he had complained that no place of rest was left to him, vehemently prayed, saying, O Lord, which art my God, in whom only I trust, save me from them that persecute me, and deliver me from mine enemies. Let not this man, meaning Saul, devour my life as a lion doth his prey, for of none seek I comfort but of thee alone." In the midst of these anguishes the goodness of God sustained him so that the present tribulation was tolerable, and the infallible promises of God so assured him of deliverance that his fear was partly mitigated and gone, as plainly appears to such as diligently mark the process of his prayers. For after long menacing and threatening made to him by his enemies, he concludes with these words, The dollar which he intended to me shall fall upon his own pate, and the violence wherewith he would have oppressed me shall cast down his own head. But I will magnify the Lord according to his justice, and shall praise the name of the Most High. This is not written for David only, but for all such as shall suffer tribulation to the end of the world. For I, the writer hereof, let this be said to the praise and Lord of God alone, in anguish of mind and vehement tribulation and affliction, called to the Lord, when not only the ungodly, but even my faithful brethren, yea, and my own self, that is, all natural understanding, judged my cause to be irremediable. Footnote. Knox here alludes to his severe confinement on board the French galleys. End footnote. And yet in my greatest calamity, and when my pains were most cruel, his eternal wisdom would that my hands should write far contrary to the judgment of carnal reason, but which his mercy hath proved true. Blessed be his holy name. And therefore I dare be bold in the verity of God's word to promise that, notwithstanding the vehemence of trouble, the long continuance thereof, the desperation of all men, the fearfulness, danger, dolour, and anguish of our own hearts, yet if we call constantly to God, beyond the expectation of all men, he shall deliver. 
Let no man think himself unworthy to call and pray to God, because he hath grievously offended his majesty in times past. But let him bring to God a sorrowful and repenting heart, saying with David, Heal my soul, O Lord, for I have offended against thee. Before I was afflicted, I transgressed, but now let me observe thy commandments. To mitigate or ease the sorrows of our wounded consciences, our most prudent physician hath provided two plasters to give us encouragement to pray, notwithstanding the knowledge of offences committed, that is, a precept and a promise. The precept or commandment to pray is universal, frequently inculcated and repeated in God's scriptures. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Call upon me in the day of trouble. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. I command that ye pray ever without ceasing. Make deprecations incessantly and give thanks in all things. The commandment is, Whoso contemns or despises prayer sins equally with him that doth steal. For as this commandment, Thou shalt not steal, is a precept negative, so thou shalt pray is a precept affirmative, and God requires equal obedience of all and to all his commandments. Yet more boldly will I say, he who, when necessity constrains, desires not support and help of God, provokes his wrath, no less than such as make false gods or openly deny God. Whoso prayeth not in tribulation denieth God. For like as it is to know no physician or medicine, or in knowing them to refuse to use and receive the same, so not to call upon God in thy tribulation is as if thou didst not know God, or else utterly denied him. Not to pray is sin most odious. Oh, why cease we then to call instantly to his mercy, having his commandments so to do, above all our iniquities? We work manifest contempt and despising of him, when, by negligence, we delay to call for his gracious support. Whoso doth call upon God, obeys his will, and finds therein no small consolation, knowing that nothing is more acceptable to his majesty than humble obedience. To his commandment he addeth his most undoubted promise in many places. Ask, and ye shall receive, seek, and ye shall find. And by the prophet Jeremiah God saith, Ye shall call upon me, and I shall hear you. Ye shall seek, and ye shall find me. And by Isaiah he saith, The father may forget his natural son, and the mother her own child, and although they do, yet shall I not forget such as call upon me. And here too the words of Jesus Christ correspond and agree, saying, If ye, being wicked, can give good gifts to your children, much more my heavenly Father shall give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him. And that we should not think God to be absent, or not to hear us, observeth Moses, saying, There is no nation that have their gods so adherent, or near unto them as our God, who is present at all our prayers. Also the psalmist, near is the Lord to all that call upon him in verity. And Christ saith, Wheresoever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The readiness of God to hear sinners, that we should not think God does not hear us, Isaiah saith, Before ye cry, I shall hear, and while they yet speak, I shall answer. And also, if at even come sorrow or calamity, before the morning spring I shall reduce and bring gladness. And these most comfortable words doth the Lord speak not to Israel after the flesh only, but to all men sorely oppressed, abiding God's deliverance. For a moment and a little season have I turned my face from thee, but in everlasting mercy shall I comfort thee. The hope to obtain our petitions should depend upon the promises of God. O oh, hard are the hearts whom so manifold, most firm and sure promises do not mollify, whereupon should depend the hope to obtain our petitions. The indignity or unworthiness of ourselves is not to be regarded, for although in holiness and purity of life we are far inferior to the chosen which are departed, yet in that respect we are equal, in that we have the same commandment to pray and the same promise to be heard. For our gracious God esteems not the prayer, neither grants the petition for any dignity of the person that prayeth, but for his promise sake only. And therefore saith David, Thou hast promised unto thy servant, O Lord, that thou wilt build a house for him, wherefore thy servant hath found in his heart to pray in thy sight, now even so. O Lord, thou art God, and thy words are true. Thou hast spoken these good things unto thy servant. Begin therefore to do according to thy promise, the household of thy servant." Behold, David altogether depended upon God's promise, as also did Jacob, after he had confessed himself unworthy of all the benefits received, yet dare he boldly ask greater benefits in times subsequent, and that because God had promised. In the like manner let us be encouraged to ask whatsoever the goodness of God hath freely promised, 
What we should principally ask, we shall hereafter declare. Observation in Godly Prayer The first observation which godly prayer requires is the perfect knowledge of the Advocate, Intercessor, and Mediator. Of necessity we must have a Mediator, for seeing no man is of himself worthy to compare or appear in God's presence by reason that sin continually remaineth in all men, which by itself doth offend the majesty of God, raising also debate, strife, and division betwixt his inviolable justice and us, for the which, unless satisfaction be made by another than by ourselves, so little hope remaineth that we can attain anything from him, that we can have no surety with him at all. To exempt us from this horrible confusion, our most merciful Father has given unto us his only beloved Son, to be unto us justice, wisdom, sanctification, and holiness." If in him we faithfully believe, we are so clad that we may with boldness appear before the throne of God's mercy. Doubting not but whatsoever we ask by our mediator, we shall obtain most assuredly that same. Here is most diligently to be observed that without our mediator, forespeaker, and peacemaker, we enter not into prayer, for the incallings of such as pray without Jesus Christ are not only vain, but also they are odious and abominable before God. And which thing in the Levitical priesthood was most evidently prefigured and declared, for as within the most holy place no man entered but the high priest only, and as all sacrifices offered by any other than by priests only provoked the wrath of God upon the sacrifice maker, so whoever intends to enter into God's presence or to make prayers without Jesus Christ shall find nothing but fearful judgment and horrible damnation. Wherewith it is plain that Turks and Jews, notwithstanding they do, apparently most fervently pray unto God, who created heaven and earth, who guideth and ruleth the same, who defendeth the good and punisheth the evil, yet their prayers are never pleasing unto God. Neither honour they his holy majesty in anything, because they acknowledge not Jesus Christ, for whoso honoureth not the Son, honoureth not the Father. When we be not heard... For as the law is a statute that we shall call upon God, and as the promise is made that he shall hear, so are we commanded only to call by Jesus Christ, by whom alone we obtain our petitions, for in him alone are all the promises of God confirmed and complete. Whereof, without all controversy, it is plain that such as have called or do call upon God by any other name than by Jesus Christ alone, nothing regard God's will but obstinately prevaricate and do against his commandments." and therefore they obtain not their petitions, neither yet have entrance to his mercy. For no man cometh to the Father, saith Jesus Christ, but by me. He is the right way, whoso declineth from him goes wrong. He is our leader, whom unless we follow we shall walk in darkness. He alone is our captain, without whom neither praise nor victory shall we ever obtain. Intercession to Saints Again, such as depend upon the intercession of saints, no otherwise will I contend but will shortly touch the properties of a perfect mediator. First, the words of Paul are most sure. A mediator is not a mediator of one, that is, wheresoever is required a mediator. There are also two parties, to wit, one party offending and the other party who is offended, which parties in themselves can in no wise be reconciled. Secondly, the mediator which takes upon him the reconciling of these two parties must be such a one as having trust and favour of both parties, yet in some things must differ from both, and must be clear and innocent also of the crime committed against the party offended. Let this be more plain by this subsequent declaration. The eternal God standeth upon the one part, and all natural men descending of Adam upon the other part. The infinite justice of God is so offended with the transgressions of all men that in no wise can amity be made, except such a one be found as fully may make satisfaction for man's offences. Among the sons of men none was found able, for they all were found criminal in the fault of one, and God's infinite justice must abhor the society and sacrifice of sinners. Angels may not be mediators. And unto the angels what prevailed the prevarication of man, who, even if they would have interposed themselves as mediators, yet they had not the infinite justice. Who then shall here be found the peacemaker? Surely the infinite goodness and mercy of God might not suffer the perpetual loss and repudiation of his creatures, and therefore his eternal wisdom provided such a mediator, having wherewith to satisfy the justice of God, differing also from the Godhead, his only Son, clad in the nature of manhood, who interposed himself a mediator, not as man only. Jesus Christ, God and man, is mediator. 
for the pure humanity of Christ of itself might neither make intercession nor satisfaction for us, but God and man, in that he is God, he might complete the will of the Father, and in that he is man, pure and clean, without spot or sin, he might offer sacrifice for the taking away of our sins, and satisfaction of God's justice. So, unless saints have these two, Godhead equal with the Father, and humanity without sin, saints may not usurp the office of mediator. But here will be objected, who knoweth not Jesus Christ to be the only mediator of our redemption, but that impedes or hinders not saints and holy men to be mediators and to make intercession for us, as though Jesus Christ had been but one hour our mediator, and afterwards had resigned the office unto his servants. Who maketh other mediators than Jesus Christ, taketh honor from him. Do not such men gently, footnote, respectfully, spoken ironically, end footnote, entreat Jesus Christ, detracting from him such portion of his honor, Otherwise the scriptures of God testify him to have been made man and to have proved our infirmities, to have suffered death willingly, to have overcome the same, and all to this end that he might be our perpetual high sovereign priest in whose place or dignity none other might enter. As John saith, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the just. Mark well these words, John saith, we have presently a sufficient advocate, whom Paul affirms to sit at the right hand of God the Father, and to be the only mediator between God and man. For he alone, saith Ambrose, is our mouth by whom we speak to God, he is our eyes by whom we see God, and also our right hand by whom we offer anything to the Father, who, unless he make intercession, neither we nor any of the saints may have any society or fellowship with God. What creature may say to God the Father, Let man be received unto thy favor, for the pain of his transgressions I have sustained in my own body. For his cause was I encompassed with all infirmities, and so became the most contemned and despised of all men. And yet in my mouth was found no guile nor deceit, but I was always obedient to thy will, suffering most grievous death for mankind. And therefore behold not the sinner, but me, who by my infinite justice have perfectly satisfied for his offenses. May any other Jesus Christ accepted in these words make intercession for sinners? If they may not, then are they neither mediators nor yet intercessors. For although, saith Augustine, Christians do commend one another unto God in their prayers, yet they make not intercession, neither dare they usurp the office of a mediator, not Paul, although under the head he was a principal member, because he commendeth himself to the prayers of faithful men. But if any do object, such is not the condition of the saints departed, who now have put off mortality, and bear no longer the fragility of the flesh, which although I grant to be most true, yet are they all compelled to cast their crowns before him that sitteth on the throne, acknowledging themselves to have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and therefore none of them do attempt to be a mediator, seeing they neither have being nor justice of themselves. But in the great light of the gospel which now is beginning, Praise be to the Omnipotent, it is not necessary upon such matters long to remain. Some say we will use but one mediator, Jesus Christ, to God the Father, but we must have saints, and chiefly the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, to pray for us unto him. Against such as would have mediators to Jesus Christ, alas, whosoever are so minded, show plainly themselves to know nothing of Jesus Christ rightly. Is he who descended from heaven and vouchsafed to be conversant with sinners, commanding all sorely vexed and sick to come unto him, who, hanging upon the cross, prayed first for his enemies? Is he become now so untractable that he will not hear us without a person to be a means? O Lord, open the eyes of such that they may clearly perceive thy infinite kindness, gentleness, and love towards mankind. Above all these things is to be observed that, what we ask of God ought to be profitable to ourselves and to others, and hurtful or dangerous to no man. Secondly, we must also consider whether our petitions extend to spiritual or temporal things. Spiritual things, such as deliverance from impiety, remission of sins, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and of life everlasting, we should desire absolutely, without any condition, by Jesus Christ, in whom alone all these are promised. And in asking hereof, we should not pray thus, O Father, forgive our sins if thou wilt, for he hath expressed his will, saying, As I live, I desire not the death of a sinner, but rather that he convert and live, which immutable and solemn death, whoso calleth in doubt, maketh God a liar, and so far as in him lies, would spoil him of his Godhead. For he cannot be God except he be eternal and infallible verity. 
And John saith, This is the testimony which God hath testified of his Son, that whoso believeth in the Son hath eternal life, to the verity whereof we should steadfastly cleave, although worldly dullah apprehend us. As David, exiled from his kingdom and deprived of all his glory, secluded not from God, but steadfastly believed reconciliation by the promise made, notwithstanding that all creatures in earth had refused, objected, and rebelled against him. Happy is the man whom thou shalt inspire, O Lord. In asking for temporal things, first let us inquire if we be at peace with God in our conscience by Jesus Christ, firmly believing our sins to be remitted in his blood. Secondly, let us inquire of our own hearts if we know that temporal riches or substance do not come to man by accident, fortune, or chance, neither yet by the industry and diligence of man's labor, but they are the liberal gift of God alone, whereof we ought to lord and praise his goodness, wisdom, and providence alone. What should be prayed for? And if we truly acknowledge and confess this, let us boldly ask of him whatsoever is necessary for us, as sustenance of this body, health thereof, defense from misery, deliverance from trouble, tranquility and peace to our commonwealth, prosperous success in our vocations, labors and affairs, whatsoever they are, which God wills we should ask all of him to certify to us that all things stand in his regimen and disposition. And also by asking and receiving these bodily commodities we have a taste of his sweetness and are inflamed with his love, that thereby our faith of reconciliation and remission of our sins may be exercised and increase. But in asking such temporal things we must observe first that if God deferreth or prolongeth to grant our petitions, even so long that he seems apparently to reject us, yet let us not cease to call, prescribing him neither the time nor the manner of deliverance, as it is written, if he prolong time, abide patiently upon him. And also, let not the faithful be too hasty, for God sometimes deferreth and will not quickly grant for probation of our continuance, as the words of Jesus Christ testify, and also that we may receive with greater gladness that which with ardent desire we long have looked for, as Hannah, Sarah, and Elizabeth, after their barrenness and sterility, receive children with joy. Secondly, because we know the church at all times to be under the cross in asking temporal commodities, and especially deliverance from trouble. Let us offer unto God obedience, if it shall please his goodness we be longer exercised, that we may patiently abide it. As David, desiring to be restored to his kingdom, when he was exiled by his own son, offered unto God obedience, saying, If I have found favor in the presence of the Lord, he shall bring me home again. But... If he shall say, Thou pleasest me not longer to bear authority, I am obedient. Let him do what seemeth good unto him. Better it is to obey God than men. The three children said to Nebuchadnezzar, We know that our God, whom we worship, may deliver us, but if it shall not please him so to do, let it be known to thee, O king, that we will not worship thy gods. Here they gave a true confession of their perfect faith, knowing nothing was impossible to the omnipotence of God, affirming also themselves to stand in his mercy, for otherwise the nature of man could not willingly give itself to so horrible a torment, but they offer unto God most humble obedience to be delivered at his good will and pleasure, as we should do in all afflictions, for we know not what to ask or desire as we ought, that is, the frail flesh, oppressed with fear and pain, desires deliverance, ever abhorring and drawing back from giving obedience. O Christian brethren, I write by experience, but the Spirit of God calleth back the mind to obedience, that, although it doth desire and abide for deliverance, yet should it not repine against the good will of God, but incessantly ask that it may abide with patience. How hard this battle is, no man knoweth but he who in himself hath suffered trial. It is to be noticed that God sometimes doth grant the petition of the Spirit, while he yet defers the desire of the flesh. The Petition of the Spirit As who doubteth but God did mitigate the heaviness of Joseph, although he sent not hasty deliverance in his long imprisonment, and that he gave him favor in the sight of the jailer, so inwardly also he gave him consolation in spirit wherein he utterly repels the desire of the flesh, for the petition of the Spirit always is that we may attain to the true felicity whereunto we must needs enter by tribulation, and the final death which the nature of man ever abhors, and therefore the flesh under the cross and at the sight of death calls and thirsts for hasty deliverance. But God, who alone knows what is expedient for us, sometimes prolongs the deliverance of his chosen, and sometimes permits them to drink, before the maturity of age, the bitter cup of bodily death, that thereby they may receive medicine and cure from all infirmity. 
For who doubts that John the Baptist desired to have seen the days of Jesus Christ more, and to have been longer with him in conversation, or that Stephen would not have laboured more days in preaching Christ's gospel, whom nevertheless he suffered speedily to taste of this general sentence? And although we see therefore no apparent help to ourselves, nor yet to others who are afflicted, let us not cease to call, thinking that our prayers are vain. For whatsoever come of our bodies, God shall give unspeakable comfort to the spirit, and shall turn all to our good, beyond our own expectation. Impediments come of the weakness of the flesh. The cause why I am so long and tedious in this matter is, for that I know how hard the battle is betwixt the spirit and the flesh under the heavy cross of affliction where no worldly defence but present death doth appear. I know the grudging and murmuring complaints of the flesh, I know the wrath, anger, and indignation which it conceives against God, calling all his promises in doubt and being ready every hour utterly to fall from God, against which only faith remains, provoking us to call earnestly and to pray for assistance of God's Spirit wherein if we continue he shall turn our most desperate calamities to gladness and to a prosperous end to thee alone o lord be praise for with experience i write this and speak it where for whom and at what time we ought to pray is not to be passed over with silence private prayer such prayers as men secretly offer unto God by themselves require no separate place, although Jesus Christ commandeth, when we pray, to enter into our chamber and close the door, and so to pray unto our Father secretly, whereby he would that we should choose for our prayers such places as might offer least occasion to call us back from prayer, and also that we should expel forth from our minds in time of our prayer all vain cogitations, for otherwise Jesus Christ himself doth observe no special place of prayer, for we find him sometimes pray in Mount Olivet, sometimes in the desert, sometimes in the temple and in the garden. And Peter desired to pray upon the top of the house. Paul prayed in prison and was heard of God, who also commandeth men to pray in all places, lifting up to God pure and clean hands, as we find that the prophets and most holy men did, whensoever danger or necessity required. Appointed places to pray in may not be neglected. But public and common prayers should be used in the place appointed for the assembly, from whence whosoever negligently withdraw themselves are in no wise excusable. I mean not that to be absent from that place is sin, because that place is more holy than another, for the whole earth created by God is equally holy. But the promise made that, Wheresoever two or three are met together in my name, there shall I be in the midst of them, condemns all such as contemn the congregation gathered in his name. But mark well this word gathered, I mean not to hear piping, singing, or playing, nor to patter upon beads or books whereof they have no understanding, nor to commit idolatry, honouring that for God which is no God indeed. For with such I will neither join myself in common prayer nor in receiving external sacraments, for in so doing I should affirm their superstition and abominable idolatry, which I by God's grace will never do nor counsel others to do to the end. What it is to be gathered in the name of Christ. The congregation which I mean should be gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, that is to lord and magnify God the Father for the infinite benefits they have received by his only Son, our Lord. In this congregation the mystical and last supper of Jesus Christ should be distributed without superstition or any more ceremonies than he himself used and his apostles after him. And in distribution thereof in this congregation should inquiries be made of the poor among them and support provided during the time of their convention and it should be distributed amongst them. Also in this congregation should be made common prayer such as all men hearing might understand that the hearts of all subscribing, footnote, agreeing, end footnote, to the voice of one might, with unfeigned and fervent mind, say Amen. Whosoever withdraws himself from such a congregation, but alas, where shall it be found, he declares himself to be no member of Christ's body. For whom and at what time we should pray. Now there remains for whom and at what time we should pray. Paul commands that we should pray for all men and at all times, and principally for such of the household of faith as suffer persecution, and for commonwealths tyrannically pressed, incessantly should we call, that God of his mercy and power will withstand the violence of such tyrants. God's sentence may be changed. And when we see the plagues of God as hunger, pestilence, or war coming, or appearing at hand, 
Then should we with lamentable voices and repenting hearts call unto God that it would please his infinite mercies to withdraw his hand, which thing, if we do unfeignedly, he will without doubt revoke his wrath, and in the midst of his anger think upon mercy, as we are taught in the scripture, by his infallible and eternal verity. As in Exodus God saith, I shall destroy this nation from the face of the earth, and when Moses addressed himself to pray for them, the Lord proceeded, saying, Suffer me, that I may utterly destroy them. And then Moses falleth down upon his face, and forty days continued in prayer for the safety of the people, for whom at the last he obtained forgiveness. David, in the vehement plague, lamentably called unto God, and the king of Nineveh saith, who can tell God may turn and repent and cease from his fierce wrath that we perish not, which examples and scriptures are not written in vain but to certify us that God of his own nature and goodness will mitigate his plagues by our prayers offered by Jesus Christ, although he has threatened to punish, or even now doth punish, which he testifies by his own words, saying, If I have prophesied against any nation or people that they shall be destroyed, if they repent of their iniquity, it shall repent me of the evil which I have spoken against them. This I write, lamenting the great coldness of men, who under such long scourges of God are nothing kindled to pray by repentance, but carelessly sleep in a wicked life, even as though the continual wars, urgent famine, and daily plagues of pestilence, and other contagious, insolent, and strange maladies, were not the present signs of God's wrath provoked by our iniquities." A plague threatened to England. O England, that thy intestine battle and domestic murder provoke thee to purity of life, according to the word which openly hath been proclaimed in thee, otherwise thou shalt drink the cup of the Lord's wrath. The multitude shall not escape, but shall drink the dregs, and have the cup broken upon their heads. For judgment beginneth in the house of the Lord, and commonly the least offender is first punished, to excite the more wicked to repentance. But, O Lord, infinite in mercy, if thou shalt punish, make not consummation, but cut away the proud and luxuriant branches which bear no fruit, and preserve the commonwealths of such as give succor and harbor to thy contemned messengers, which long have suffered exile in deserts. And let thy kingdom shortly come, that sin may be ended, and death devoured, that sin may be ended, death devoured, thy enemies confounded, that we, thy people, being delivered by thy majesty, may obtain everlasting joy and felicity, through Jesus Christ our Saviour, to whom be all honour and praise for ever. Amen. Hasten, Lord, and tarry not. John Knox. End of A Treatise on Prayer by John Knox. A Most Wholesome Counsel how to Behave Ourselves in the Midst of This Wicked Generation by John Knox This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In 1556, Knox, who was then in Scotland, received letters from the Church of English Exiles at Geneva, which stated that they had appointed him to be one of their ministers. He considered it to be his duty to accede to their request, and in July proceeded thither. Previously to his leaving Scotland, he gave his brethren such directions as he considered suitable to their circumstances at that time, and wrote the following letter to be circulated amongst such as had heard his preaching. The state of the Protestants in Scotland at that period was very similar to their situation in England, which is thus described by Stripe in his Memorials of the Reign of Queen Mary. When the learned preachers and ministers were most of them burnt or fled, and the flocks left destitute of their faithful pastors, some of the laity, tradesmen or others, endued with parts and some learning, used in that distress to read the scriptures to the rest in their meetings, and the letters of the martyrs and prisoners, and other good books, also to pray with them and exhort them to stand fast, and to establish them in the confession of Christ to the death. Such a one was that excellent pious man and confessor, John Carolus, who was a weaver of Coventry, and Clement, a wheelwright, who, speaking of the warnings of the preachers that were then dead, and had confirmed their sayings with their blood, said thus of himself, Myself, when I was with you, did with my simple learning and knowledge the best I could, 
to call you from those things that will surely bring the wrath of God upon you, except ye repent in time and turn to the Lord with your whole heart. But how the preacher's warnings and my poor admonitions have been and are regarded, God and you do know. Volume 3, page 364. In another place, Stripe says, The course they took in these sad times was the same which the primitive Christians did when they were under their persecutions, namely prayers and tears. They continued to assemble together even in the hottest times, and in these assemblies sometimes they only prayed together. Volume 3, page 245. A most wholesome counsel to his brethren in Scotland after he had been quiet among them. The comfort of the Holy Ghost for salutation. Not so much to instruct you as to leave with you, dearly beloved brethren, some testimony of my love I have thought good to communicate with you in these few lines my weak counsel, how I would ye should behave yourselves in the midst of this wicked generation, touching the exercise of God's most holy and sacred word, without which neither shall knowledge increase, godliness appear, nor fervency continue among you. For as the word of God is the beginning of spiritual life, without which all flesh is dead in God's presence, and as it is the lantern to our feet, without the brightness whereof all the posterity of Adam walk in darkness, and as it is the fountain of faith, without which no man understands the good will of God, so it is also the only organ and instrument which God uses to strengthen the weak, to comfort the afflicted, to reduce to mercy by repentance such as have slidden, and finally to preserve and keep the very life of the soul in all assaults and temptations. Therefore, if that ye desire your knowledge to be increased, your faith to be confirmed, your consciences to be quieted and comforted, or finally your soul to be preserved in life, let your exercise be frequent in the law of your Lord God. Despise not the precepts which Moses, who by his own experience had learnt what comfort lies hid within the word of God, gave to the Israelites, saying, These words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt exercise thy children in them. Thou shalt talk of them when thou art at home in thy house, and as thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be papers of remembrance between thy eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and upon thy gates. And Moses in another place commands them to remember the law of the Lord God, to do it, that it may be well with them and with their children in the land which the Lord shall give them meaning that as frequent memory and repetition of God's precepts is the means whereby the fear of God, which is the beginning of all wisdom and felicity, is kept recent in mind, so is negligence and oblivion of God's benefits received, the first evidence of defection from God. Now if the law, which by reason of our weakness can work nothing but wrath and anger, was so effectual that, being remembered and rehearsed of purpose to do it, it brought to the people a corporeal benediction, what shall we say? that the glorious gospel of Christ Jesus doth work, so that it be with reverence entreated. St. Paul calls it the sweet odor of life unto those that should receive life, borrowing his similitude from odiferous herbs or precious ointments, whose nature is, the more they are touched or moved, to send forth their odor more pleasing and delectable. Even such, dear brethren, is the blessed gospel of our Lord Jesus for the more it is treated of, the more comfortable and more pleasant it is to such as to hear, read, and exercise the same. I am not ignorant that as the Israelites loathed the manna because that every day they saw and ate but one thing, so some there are nowadays who will not be holden of the worst sort that, after once reading some parcels of the scripture, do turn themselves altogether to profane authors and human letters, because that the variety of matters therein contained brings with it a daily delectation, where contrariwise, within the simple scriptures of God, the perpetual repetition of a thing is fascious, footnote, tiresome, end footnote, and wearisome. This temptation, I confess, may enter into God's very elect for a time, but it is impossible that they continue therein to the end. For God's election, besides other evident signs, hath this ever joined with it, that God's elect are called from ignorance, I speak of those that are come to the years of knowledge, to some taste and feeling of God's mercy, of which they are never satisfied in this life, but from time to time they hunger to eat the bread that descended from heaven, and they thirst to drink the water that springeth unto life everlasting, which they cannot do but by the means of faith, and faith looks ever to the will of God revealed by his word so that faith 
hath both her beginning and continuance by the word of God, and so I say that it is impossible that God's chosen children can despise or reject the word of their salvation for any long continuance, neither yet loathe it to the end. Often it is that God's elect are holden in such bondage and thraldom that they cannot have the bread of life broken unto them, neither yet liberty to exercise themselves in God's holy word. But then God's dear children do not loathe, but most greedily do they covet the food of their souls. Then do they accuse their former negligence. Then they lament and bewail the miserable affliction of their brethren. And then they cry and call in their hearts and openly where they dare for free passage to the gospel. This hunger and thirst doth argue and prove the life of their souls. But if such men, as having liberty to read and exercise themselves on God's holy scripture, yet begin to weary, because from time to time they read but the same thing, I ask why weary they not also every day to drink wine, to eat bread, every day to behold the brightness of the sun, and so to use the rest of God's creatures, which every day do keep their own substance, course, and nature. They shall answer, I trust, because such creatures have a strength as oft as they are used to expel hunger and quench thirst, to restore strength and to preserve life. O miserable wretches who dare attribute more power and strength to the corruptible creatures in nourishing and preserving the mortal carcass than to the eternal word of God in nourishment of the soul which is immortal. To reason with their abominable unthankfulness at the present, it is not my purpose, but to you, dear brethren, I write my knowledge and do speak my conscience that so necessary as meat and drink are to the preservation of bodily life, and so necessary as the heat and brightness of the sun are to the quickening of the herbs, and to expel darkness, so necessary also to life everlasting, and to the illumination and light of the soul, are the perpetual meditation, exercise, and use of God's holy word. And therefore, dear brethren, if ye look for a life to come, of necessity it is that you exercise yourselves in the book of the Lord your God. Let no day slip over without some comfort received from the mouth of God. Open your ears, and he will ever speak pleasing things to your heart. Close not your eyes, but diligently let them behold what portion of substance is left within your Father's testament. Let your tongues learn to praise the gracious goodness of him who of his mere mercy hath called you from darkness to light and from death to life. Neither yet may ye do this so quietly that ye will admit no witnesses. Nay, brethren, ye are ordained of God to rule and govern your own houses in his true fear, according to his holy word. Within your houses, I say, in some cases, ye are bishops and kings. Your wives, children, and family are your bishopric and charge. Of you it shall be required how carefully and diligently you have instructed them in God's true knowledge, how you have studied to plant virtue in them and to repress vice. And therefore I say... You must make them partakers in reading, exhortation, and in making common prayers, which I would in every house were used once a day at least. But above all things, dear brethren, study to practice in life that which the Lord commands, and then be ye assured that ye shall never hear nor read the same without fruit, and do this much for the exercises within your houses. Considering that St. Paul calls the congregation the body of Christ, whereof every one of us is a member, teaching us thereby that no member is of sufficiency to sustain and feed himself without the help and support of any other. I think it necessary that, for the conference of Scripture, assemblies of brethren be had. The order therein to be observed is expressed by St. Paul, and therefore I need not to use many words in that behalf, only willing that when ye convene, which I would were once a week, your beginning should be by confessing of your offences and invocation of the Spirit of the Lord Jesus to assist you in all your godly enterprises. Then let some place of Scripture be plainly and distinctly read, so much as shall be thought sufficient for the day or time, which ended, if any brother have exhortation, interpretation, or doubt, let him not fear to speak and move the same, so that he do it with moderation either to edify or be edified, and hereof I doubt not, but that great profit shall shortly ensue. For, first by hearing, reading, and conferring the scriptures in the assembly, the whole body of the scriptures of God shall become familiar, the judgment and spirits of men shall be tried, their patience and modesty shall be known, and finally their gifts and utterance shall appear. Multiplication of words, perplexed interpretations, and willfulness in reasoning are to be avoided at all times and in all places, but chiefly in the congregation, where nothing ought to be respected except the glory of God and comfort and edification of our brethren.
if anything occur within the text or yet arise in reasoning which your judgments cannot resolve or capacities apprehend, let the same be noted and put in writing before you depart the congregation, that when God shall offer unto you any interpreter, your doubts being noted and known may have the more expeditious resolution, or else that when ye shall have occasion to write to such as with whom ye would communicate your judgments, your letters may signify and declare your unfeigned desire that ye have of God and of his true knowledge, and they, I doubt not, according to their talents, will endeavour and will bestow their faithful labours to satisfy your godly petitions. Of myself I will speak as I think. I will more gladly spend fifteen hours in communicating my judgment with you, in explaining as God pleases to open to me any place of scripture, than half an hour in any other matter beside. Further, in reading the scriptures, I would... He should join some books of the Old and some of the New Testament together, as Genesis and one of the Evangelists, Exodus with another, and so forth, ever ending such books as you begin as the time will suffer, for it shall greatly comfort you to hear that harmony and well-tuned song of the Holy Spirit speaking in our fathers from the beginning. It shall confirm you in these dangerous and perilous days to behold the face of Christ Jesus and his loving spouse and church from Abel to himself and from himself to this day in all ages to be one. Be frequent in the prophets and in the epistles of St. Paul, for the multitude of matters therein contained require exercise and good memory. Like as your assemblies ought to begin with confession and invocation of God's Holy Spirit, so would I that they were never finished without thanksgiving and common prayers for princes, rulers, and magistrates, for the liberty and free passage of Christ's gospel, for the comfort and deliverance of our afflicted brethren in all places now persecuted, but most cruelly within the realm of France and England, and for such other things as the Spirit of the Lord Jesus shall teach unto you to be profitable, either to yourselves or yet to your brethren, wheresoever they be. If thus or better, dear brethren, I shall hear that ye exercise yourselves, then will I praise God for your great obedience." as for them that not only have received the word of grace with gladness, but also that, with care and diligence, do keep the same as a treasure and most precious jewel. And because I cannot expect you will do the contrary at the present, I will use no threatenings, for my good hope is that ye shall walk as the sons of light in the midst of this wicked generation, that ye shall be as stars in the night season, which yet are not changed into darkness, that ye shall be as wheat amongst the cockle, and yet that... He shall not change your nature, which ye have received by grace, through the fellowship and participation which we have with the Lord Jesus in his body and blood. And finally, that ye shall be of the number of the prudent virgins, daily renewing your lamps with oil, as they that patiently abide the glorious appearance and coming of the Lord Jesus, whose omnipotent spirit rule and instruct, illuminate and comfort your hearts, in all assaults, now and ever. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus rest with you. Remember my weakness in your daily prayers. Your brother unfeigned, John Knox, the 7th of July, 1556. End of A Most Wholesome Counsel How to Behave Ourselves in the Midst of This Wicked Generation by John Knox. A Short Rule of Life for Each Man in General by John Wycliffe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A short rule of life for each man in general and for priests and lords and labourers in particular, how each shall be saved in his degree. First, when thou risest or fully wakest, think upon the goodness of thy God, how for his own goodness and not for any need he made all things out of nothing, both angels and men and all other creatures, good in their kind. The second time think on the great sufferings and willing death that Christ suffered for mankind, when no man might make satisfaction for the guilt of Adam and Eve and others more, neither any angel might make satisfaction therefore, then Christ of his endless charity suffered such great passion and painful death that no creature could suffer so much. Think the third time how God hath saved thee from death and other mischief, and suffered many thousands to be lost that night, some in water, some in fire, and some by sudden death, and some to be damned without end. And for this goodness and mercy thank thy God with all thine heart. 
and pray him to give thee grace to spend in that day and evermore all the powers of thy soul as mind, understanding, reason, and will, and all the powers of thy body as strength, beauty, and thy five senses in his service and worship, and in nothing against his commandments but in ready performance of his works of mercy, and to give good example of holy life both in word and deed to all men about thee. Look afterward that thou be well occupied and no time idle for the danger of temptation. Take meat and drink in measure, not too costly nor too liquorous, and be not too curious thereabout, but such as God sendeth thee with health. Take it in such measure that thou be fresher in mind and understanding to serve God, and always thank him for such gifts. Besides this, look thou do right and equity to all men, thy superiors, equals, and subjects, or servants, and stir all to love truth and mercy and true peace and charity, and suffer no men to be at dissension, but accord them, if thou canst, in any good manner. Also, most of all fear God and his wrath, and most of all love God and his law and his worship, and ask not principally for worldly reward, but in all thine heart desire the bliss of heaven in mercy of God, and thine own good life and think much of the dreadful doom of pains of hell to keep thee out of sin, and on the endless great joys of heaven to keep thee in virtuous life, and according to thy skill teach others the same doing. In the end of the day think wherein thou hast offended God, and how much and how oft, and therefore have entire sorrow, and amend it while thou mayest. And think how many God hath suffered to perish that day, many ways, and to be damned everlastingly, and how graciously he hath saved thee, not for thy desert, but for his own mercy and goodness, and therefore thank him with all thine heart. And pray him for grace, that thou mayest dwell and end in his true and holy service and real love, and to teach other men the same doing. If thou art a priest, and especially a curate, live thou holily, surpassing other men in holy prayer, desire, and thinking, in holy speaking, counselling, and true teaching, and that God's commands, his gospel, and virtues be ever in thy mouth, and ever despise sin to draw men therefrom, and that thy deeds be so rightful that no man shall blame them with reason, but that thy open deeds be a true book to all subjects and unlearned men, to serve God and do his commands thereby. For example, a good life, open and lasting, more stirreth rude men than true preaching by word only. And waste not thy goods in great feasts of rich men, but live a humble life, of poor men's alms and goods, both in meat and drink and clothes, and the remainder give truly to poor men that have not of their own, and may not labor for feebleness or sickness, and thus thou shalt be a true priest both to God and man. If thou art a lord, look that thou live a rightful life in thine own person, both in respect to God and man, keeping the commands of God, doing thee works of mercy, ruling well thy five senses, and doing reason and equity, and good conscience to all men. In the second place, govern well thy wife, thy children, and thy household attendants in God's law, and suffer no sin among them, neither in word nor in deed, that they may be examples of holiness and righteousness to all others. For thou shalt be condemned for their evil life and their evil example, unless thou amend it according to thy might. In the third place, govern well thy tenants, and maintain them in right and reason, and be merciful to them in their rents and worldly merciments and suffer not thine officers to do them wrong, nor be extortionate to them. And chastise in good manner them that are rebels against God's commands and virtuous life, more than for rebellion against thine own cause, or else for that thou lovest more thine own cause than God's, and thyself more than God Almighty, thou wert then a false traitor to God. And love, reward, praise, and cherish the true and virtuous of life more than if thou sought only thine own profit and reverence and maintain truly according to thy skill and might god's law and true preachers thereof and god's servants in rest and peace for thereby thou holdest the lordship of god and if thou failest of this thou misdoest against god and all thy lordship in body and soul and principally if thou maintainest antichrist's disciples in their errors against christ's life and his teaching for blindness covetousness and worldly friendship and help us to slander and pursue true men that teach Christ's gospel and his life, and warn the people of their great sins and of false prophets and hypocrites that deceive Christian men in faith, virtuous life, and worldly goods. If thou art a laborer, live in meekness, and truly and willingly do thy labor, that thy Lord or thy master, if he be a heathen man, by thy meekness, willing, and true service, may not have to grudge against thee, 
nor slander thy God, nor thy Christian profession, but rather be stirred to come to Christianity, and serve not Christian lords with grudgings, not only in their presence, but truly and willingly, and in absence, not only for worldly dread or worldly reward, but for dread of God and conscience, and for reward in heaven. For God, that putteth thee in such service, knoweth what state is best for thee, and will reward thee more than all earthly lords may, if thou dost it truly and willingly for his ordinance. And in all things beware of grudging against God and his visitation, in great labor, and long or great sickness, and other adversities. And beware of wrath, of cursing, of speaking evil, of banning man or beast, and ever keep patience, meekness, and charity both to God and man. And thus each man in the three states ought to live to save himself and to help others, and thus should good life, rest, peace, and love be among Christian men, and they be saved and heathen men soon converted, and God magnified greatly in all nations and sects that now despise him and his law for the false living of wicked Christian men. End of A Short Rule of Life for Each Man in General by John Wycliffe Prologues upon the Gospels by William Tyndale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prologue upon the Gospel of St. Matthew Here hast thou, most dear reader, the New Testament or covenant made with us of God in Christ's blood, which I have looked over again now at the last with all diligence and compared it with the Greek and have weeded out of it many faults which lack of help at the beginning and oversight did so therein. If aught seem changed or not altogether agreeing with the Greek, let the finder of the fault consider the Hebrew phrase or manner of speech left in the Greek words, whose preterperfect tense and present tense are oft both one, and the future tense is the optative mood also, and the future tense oft the imperative mood in the active voice and in the passive ever. Likewise, person for person, number for number, and interrogation for a conditional, and such like, is with the Hebrews a common usage. I have also in many places set light in the margin to understand the text by. If any man find faults either with the translation or aught beside, which is easier for many to do than so well to have translated it themselves of their own understanding, at the beginning without an example, to the same it shall be lawful to translate it themselves, and to put what they please thereto. If I shall perceive, either by myself or by information of other, that aught has escaped me, or might more plainly have been translated, I will shortly after cause it to be amended. Howbeit in many places methinks it better to put a declaration in the margin than to run too far from the text. And in many places where the text seemeth at the first hard to be understood, yet the circumstances before and after, and often reading together, make it plain enough. Moreover, because the kingdom of heaven, which is the scripture and word of God, may be so locked up that he which readeth it or heareth it cannot understand it, as Christ testifies that the scribes and Pharisees had so shut it up, Matthew 23, and had taken away the key of knowledge, Luke 11, that the Jews who thought themselves within were so locked out, and are so to this day, that they can understand no sentence of the scripture unto their salvation, though they can rehearse the text everywhere and dispute thereof, as subtly as the popish doctors of Dunce's dark learning, who with their sophistry serve us as the Pharisees did the Jews. Therefore, that I might be found faithful to my Father and Lord in distributing unto my brethren and fellows of one faith their due and necessary food, so dressing it and seasoning it, that the weak stomachs may receive it also, and be the better for it. I thought it my duty, most dear reader, to warn thee before, and to show thee the right way in, and to give thee the true key to open it, and to arm thee against false prophets and malicious hypocrites, whose perpetual study is to blind the scripture with glosses, and there to lock it up, where it should save the soul, and to make us shoot at a wrong mark, to put our trust in those things that profit their bellies only and slay our souls. The right way, yea, and the only way to understand the scripture unto salvation, is that we earnestly and above all things search for the profession of our baptism or covenants made between God and us. As for an example, Christ saith, Matthew 5, Happy are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Lo, here God hath made a covenant with us to be merciful unto us, if we will be merciful one to another. 
so that the man who showeth mercy unto his neighbor may be bold to trust in God for mercy at all needs. And contrariwise, judgment without mercy shall be to him that showeth not mercy. So now, if he that showeth no mercy trust in God for mercy, his faith is carnal and worldly, and but vain presumption, for God hath promised mercy only to the merciful. And therefore, the merciless have not God's word, that they shall have mercy, but contrariwise, that they shall have judgment without mercy. And, Matthew 6, If ye shall forgive men their faults, your heavenly Father shall forgive you. But, if ye shall not forgive men their faults, no more shall your Father forgive you your faults. Here also, by the virtue and strength of this covenant, wherewith God of his mercy hath bound himself to us unworthy, he that forgiveth his neighbor may be bold, when he returneth and amendeth, to believe and trust in God for remission of whatsoever he hath done amiss. And contrariwise, he that will not forgive cannot but despair of forgiveness in the end, and fear judgment without mercy. The general covenant, wherein all others are comprehended and included, is this, if we meek ourselves to God to keep all his laws after the example of Christ, then God hath bound himself unto us to keep and make good all the mercies promised in Christ in all the scripture. All the whole law which was given to utter our corrupt nature is comprehended in the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments are comprehended in these two, Love God and thy neighbor, and he that loveth his neighbor in God and Christ fulfilleth these two, and consequently the Ten and finally all the other. Now, if we love our neighbors in God and Christ, that is, if we be loving, kind, and merciful to them, because God hath created them unto his likeness, and Christ hath redeemed them, and bought them with his blood, then may we be bold to trust in God, through Christ and his deserving, for all mercy. For God hath promised and bound himself to us, to show us all mercy, and to be a Father Almighty to us, so that we shall not need to fear the power of all our adversaries. Now if any man that submitteth not himself to keep the commandments do think that he hath any faith in God, the same man's faith is vain, worldly, damnable, devilish, and plain presumption, as is above said, and is no faith that can justify or be accepted before God. And that it is that James meaneth in his epistle. For how can a man believe, saith Paul, without a preacher? Romans 10. Now read all the scripture, and see where God sent any to preach mercy to any, save unto them only that repent, and turn to God with all their hearts, to keep his commandments. Unto the disobedient, that will not turn, is threatened wrath, vengeance, and damnation, according to all the terrible acts and fearful examples of the Bible. Faith now in God the Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the covenants and appointment made between God and us, is our salvation. Wherefore, I have ever noted the covenants in the margins, and also the promises. Moreover, where thou findest a promise and no covenant expressed therewith, there must thou understand a covenant, that we, when we be received to grace, know it to be our duty to keep the law. As for an example, when the scripture saith, Matthew 7, Ask, and it shall be given you, seek, and ye shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. It is to be understood that, if, when thy neighbor ask, seek, or knock unto thee, Thou then show him the same mercy which thou desirest of God, then hath God bound himself to help thee again, and else not. Also ye see that two things are required to be in a Christian man. The first is a steadfast faith and trust in Almighty God, to obtain all the mercy that he hath promised us, through the deserving and merits of Christ's blood only, without any respect to our own works. And the other is that we forsake evil and turn to God, to keep his laws and to fight against ourselves and our corrupt nature perpetually, that we may do the will of God every day better. This have I said, most dear reader, to warn thee, lest thou shouldst be deceived, and shouldst not only read the scriptures in vain and to no profit, but also unto thy greater condemnation. For the nature of God's word is that whosoever reads it, or hears it reasoned and disputed before him, it will begin immediately to make him every day better and better, till he be grown into a perfect man in the knowledge of Christ and the love of the law of God, or else make him worse and worse, till he be hardened, that he openly resist the Spirit of God, and then blaspheme after the example of Pharaoh, Korah, Abiram, Balaam, Judas, Simon Magus, and such others. This to be even so, the words of Christ, John 3, do well confirm. This is condemnation, saith he, the light is come into the world, but the men loved darkness more than light, for their deeds were evil. Behold, when the light of God's word cometh to a man, whether he read it or hear it preached or testified, and 
he yet have no love thereto to fashion his life thereafter, but consenteth still unto his old deeds of ignorance, then beginneth his just damnation immediately, and he is henceforth without excuse, in that he refused mercy offered him. For God offereth mercy upon the condition that he will mend his living, but he will not come unto the covenant, and for that hour forward he waxeth worse and worse, God taking his spirit of mercy and grace from him for his unthankfulness's sake. And Paul writes, Romans 1, that the heathen, because when they knew God, they had no desire to honor him with godly living, therefore God poured his wrath upon them, and took his spirit from them, and gave them up to their own heart's lusts to serve sin, from iniquity to iniquity, till they were thoroughly hardened and passed repentance. And Pharaoh, because when the word of God was in his country, and God's people scattered throughout all his land, and yet he neither loved them nor it, therefore God gave him up, and in taking his spirit of grace from him, so hardened his heart with covetousness, that afterward no miracle could convert him. Hereunto pertaineth the parable of the talents, Matthew 25. The Lord commandeth the talent to be taken away from the evil and slothful servant, and to bind him hand and foot, and to cast him into utter darkness, and to give the talent unto him that had ten, saying, To all that hath, more shall be given, but from him that hath not, that which he hath shall be taken from him. That is to say, he that hath a good heart towards the word of God, and to garnish it with godly living, and to testify it to others, the same shall increase daily more and more in the grace of Christ. But he that loveth it not, to live thereafter and to edify others, the same shall lose the grace of true knowledge, and be blinded again, and every day wax worse and worse, and blinder and blinder, till he be an utter enemy to the word of God, and his heart so hardened that it shall be impossible to convert him. And, Luke 15, the servant that knoweth his master's will, and prepareth not himself, shall be beaten with many stripes, that is, shall have greater damnation. And, Matthew 7, all that hear the word of God, and do not thereafter, build on sand, that is, as the foundation laid on sand cannot resist violence of water, but is undermined and overthrown, even so the faith of them that have no desire nor love to the law of God, being builded upon the sand of their own imaginations, and not on the rock of God's word, according to his covenants, turneth to desperation in time of tribulation, and when God cometh to judge. And the vineyard, Matthew 21, planted and hired out to the husbandman, who would not render to the Lord of the fruit in due time, and therefore it was taken from them, and hired out to others, confirms the same. For Christ saith to the Jews, The kingdom of heaven shall be taken from you, and given to a nation that will bring forth the fruits thereof, as it is come to pass. For the Jews have lost the spiritual knowledge of God and of his commandments, and also all the scripture, so that they can understand nothing godly. And the door is so locked up that all their knocking is in vain, though many of them take great pains for God's sake. And, Luke 13, the fig tree that beareth no fruit is commanded to be plucked up. And finally, here too pertaineth with infinite others the terrible parable of the unclean spirit, Luke 11, who, after he is cast out, when he cometh and findeth his house swept and garnished, taketh to him seven worse than himself, and cometh and entereth in, and dwelleth there, and so is the end of the man worse than the beginning." The Jews, they had cleansed themselves with God's word from all outward idolatry and worshipping of idols, but their hearts remained still faithless to Godward and toward his mercy and truth, and therefore also without love and desire to his law and to their neighbor for his sake, and through false trust in their own works, to which heresy the child of perdition, the wicked bishop of Rome with his lawyers, hath brought us Christians, were more abominable idolaters than before, and became ten times worse in the end than at the beginning." For the first idolatry was soon espied and easy to be rebuked of the prophets by the scripture, but the latter is more subtle to beguile withal, and a hundred times more difficult to be weeded out of men's hearts. This also is a conclusion than which there is nothing more certain or more proved by the testimony and examples of the scripture, that if any who favors the word of God be so weak that he cannot chasten his flesh, him will the Lord chastise and scourge every day, sharper and sharper with tribulation and misfortune, that nothing shall prosper with him, but all shall go against him, whatever he takes in hand. And the Lord will visit him with poverty, with sicknesses and diseases, and shall plague him with plague upon plague, each more loathsome, terrible, and fearful than the other, till he be at utter defiance with his flesh. Let us, therefore, that have now at this time our eyes opened again, through the tender mercy of God, keep a mean. Let us so put our trust in the mercy of God through Christ, that, 
we know it to be our duty to keep the law of God and to love our neighbors for their father's sake who created them and for their Lord's sake who redeemed them and bought them so dearly with his blood. Let us walk in the fear of God and have our eyes open unto both parts of God's covenants, being certified that none shall be partaker of the mercy save he that will fight against the flesh to keep the law. And let us arm ourselves with this remembrance that as Christ's works justify from sin and set us in the favor of God, so our own deeds, through working of the Spirit of God, help us to continue in the favor and the grace into which Christ hath brought us, and that we can no longer continue in favor and grace than our hearts are set to keep the law. Furthermore, concerning the law of God, this is a general conclusion that the whole law, whether they be ceremonies, sacrifices, yea, or sacraments either, or precepts of equity between man and man throughout all degrees of the world, all were given for our profit and necessity only, and not for any need that God hath of our keeping them, or that his joy is increased thereby, or that the deed, for the deed itself doth please him. That is, all that God requireth of us, when we be at one with him, and to put our trust in him and love him, is that we love every man his neighbor, to pity him and to have compassion on him in all his needs, and to be merciful unto him. This to be even as Christ testifieth in the seventh of Matthew. This is the law and the prophets, that is, to do as thou wouldst be done to, according, I mean, to the doctrine of Scripture, and not to do that which thou wouldst not have done to thee, is all that the law requireth and the prophets. And Paul to the Romans, chapter 13, affirmeth also that love is the fulfilling of the law, and that he who loveth doth of his own accord all that the law requireth. And, 1 Timothy 1, Paul saith that the love of a pure heart and good conscience and faith unfeigned is the end and fulfilling of the law. For faith unfeigned in Christ's blood causeth to love for Christ's sake, which love is the only pure love and the only cause of a good conscience. For then is the conscience pure when the eye looketh to Christ in all her deeds to do them for his sake and not for her own singular advantage or any other wicked purpose. And John, both in his gospel and also in his epistles, never speaketh of any other law than to love one another purely, affirming that we have God himself dwelling in us, and all that God desireth if we love one another. Seeing then that faith to God and love and mercifulness to our neighbor is all that the law requireth, of necessity the law must be understood and interpreted by them so that all inferior laws are to be kept and observed as long as they be servants to faith and love, and then to be broken immediately if through any occasion they hurt either the faith which we should have to Godward in the confidence of Christ's blood or the love which we owe to our neighbors for Christ's sake. And therefore when the blind Pharisees murmured and grudged at him and his disciples that they break the Sabbath day and traditions of the elders, and that he himself did eat with publicans and sinners, he answered, Matthew 9, alleging Isaiah the prophet, Go rather and learn what this meaneth, I require mercy, and not sacrifice. And Matthew 12, O oh, that ye wist what this meaneth, I require mercy, and not sacrifice. For only love and mercifulness understandeth the law, and nothing else. And he that hath not that written in his heart shall never understand the law. No, though all the angels of heaven went about to teach him, and he who hath that graven in his heart shall not only understand the law, but also shall do of his own inclination all that is required of the law, though no law had been given, as all mothers do of themselves without law unto their children all that can be required by any law, love overcoming all pain, grief, tediousness, or loathsomeness. And even so, no doubt, if we had continued in our first state of innocence, we should ever have fulfilled the law without compulsion of the law. And because the law, which is a doctrine that, through teaching every man his duty, doth utter our corrupt nature, is sufficiently described by Moses, therefore little mention is made thereof in the New Testament, save of love only, wherein all the law is included, as seldom mention is made of the New Testament in the old law, save here and there are promises made unto them that Christ should come, and bless them and deliver them, and that the gospel and New Testament should be preached and published unto all nations. The gospel is glad tidings of mercy and grace, and that our corrupt nature shall be healed again for Christ's sake, and for the merits of his deservings only, and yet that on condition that we turn to God to learn to keep his laws spiritually, that is to say, of love for his sake, and will also suffer the curing of our infirmities. 
The New Testament is as much to say as a new covenant. The Old Testament is an old temporal covenant made between God and the carnal children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, otherwise called Israel, upon the deeds and the observing of a temporal law, where the reward of the keeping is temporal life and prosperity in the land of Canaan, and the breaking is rewarded with temporal death and punishment. But the New Testament is an everlasting covenant made under the children of God through faith in Christ upon the deservings of Christ, where eternal life is promised to all that believe and death to all that are unbelieving. My deeds, if I keep the law, are rewarded with temporal promises of this life, but if I believe in Christ, Christ's deeds have purchased for me the eternal promise of the everlasting life. If I commit nothing worthy of death, I deserve to my reward that no man kill me. If I hurt no man, I am worthy that no man hurt me. If I help my neighbor, I am worthy that he help me again, etc. So that with outward deeds, with which I serve other men, I deserve that other men do the like to me in this world, and they extend no further. But Christ's deeds extend to life everlasting unto all that believe, etc. These are sufficient in this place concerning the law and the gospel, New Testament and Old, so that, as there is but one God, one Christ, one faith, one baptism, even so understand thou that there is but one gospel, though many write it and many preach it. For all preach the same Christ and bring the same glad tidings, and thereto Paul's epistles with the gospel of John and his first epistle and the first epistle of St. Peter are most pure gospel and most plainly and richly describe the glory of the grace of Christ, if ye require more of the law, seek in the prologue to the Romans, and in other places where it is sufficiently treated of. Concerning this word repentance, or as they used penance, the Hebrew hath, in the Old Testament generally, sob, turn, or be converted, for which the translation that we take for St. Jerome's, footnote, the Vulgate, end footnote, hath for the most part converti, to turn, to be converted, and sometimes agere penitentiam, and the Greek in the New Testament hath perpetually metanoeo, to turn in the heart and mind and to come to a right knowledge and to a man's right wit again, for which metanoeo, St. Jerome's translation, hath sometimes ago penitentiam, I do repent, sometimes peniteo, I repent, sometimes peniteo, I am repentant, sometimes habeo penitentiam, I have repentance, sometimes Poenitet me, it repenteth me. And Erasmus uses much this word, repisco, I come to myself, or to my right mind again. And the very sense and signification both of the Hebrew and also of the Greek word is to be converted and to turn to God with all the heart, to know his will and to live according to his laws, and to be cured of our corrupt nature with the oil of his spirit and wine of obedience to his doctrine. Which conversion or turning, if it be unfeigned, these four do accompany it, and are included therein. Confession, not in the priest's ear, for that is but man's invention, but to God in the heart and before all the congregation of God, that we are sinners and sinful, and that our whole nature is corrupt and inclined to sin and all unrighteousness, and therefore evil, wicked, and damnable, and his law holy and just, by which our sinful nature is rebuked and also to our neighbors, if we have offended any person particularly. Then contrition, sorrowfulness, that we are such damnable sinners, and not only have sinned, but are wholly inclined to sin still. Thirdly, faith, of which our old doctors have made no mention at all in the description of their penance, that God, for Christ's sake, doth forgive us and receive us to mercy, and is at one with us and will heal our corrupt nature. And fourthly, satisfaction, or amends-making, not to God with holy works, but to my neighbor whom I have hurt, and the congregation of God whom I have offended, if any open crime be found in me, and submitting of a man's self unto the congregation or church of Christ, and to the officers of the same, to have his life corrected and governed henceforth of them according to the true doctrine of the church of Christ. And note this, that as satisfaction or amends making is counted righteousness before the world, and a purging of sin, so that the world, when I have made full amends, hath no further to complain, even so faith in Christ's blood is counted righteousness and purging of all sin before God. Moreover, he that sinneth against his brother, sinneth also against his father, almighty God, and as the sin committed against his brother is purged before the world with making amends or asking forgiveness, even so is the sin committed against God purged through faith in Christ's blood only. For Christ saith, John 13, Except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. 
That is to say, if ye think that there is any other sacrifice or satisfaction toward God than me, ye ever remain in sin before God, howsoever righteous ye appear before the world. Wherefore now, whether ye call this metanua, repentance, conversion, or turning again to God, either amending, etc., or whether ye say, repent, be converted, turn to God, amend your living, or what ye please, I am content, so ye understand what is meant thereby, as I have now declared. A prologue made upon the Gospel of St. John. What John was is manifest by the three first evangelists, first Christ's apostle, and that one of the chief, then Christ's nigh kinsman, and for his singular innocence and softness singularly beloved, and of singular familiarity with Christ, and ever one of the three witnesses of most secret things. The cause of his writing was certain heresies that arose in his time, namely two, of which one denied Christ to be very God, and the other to be very man, and to become in the very flesh and nature of man, against which two heresies he wrote both his gospel and also his first epistle. And in the beginning of his gospel he saith that the word or thing was at the beginning, and was with God, and was also very God, and that all things were created by it, and that it was also made flesh, that is to say, became very man, and he dwelt among us, saith he, and we saw his glory. And in the beginning of his epistle he saith, We show you of the thing that was from the beginning, which also we heard, saw with our eyes, and our hands handled. And again, we show you everlasting life, which was with the Father, and appeared to us, and we saw, and we heard, and saw it, etc. In that he saith that it was from the beginning, and that it was eternal life, and that it was with God, he affirms him to be very God. And that he saith, We heard, saw, and felt, he witnesses, that he was very man also. John also wrote, last, and therefore touched not the history that the others had compiled, but he wrote most of faith and promises and of the sermons of Christ. End of Prologues Upon the Gospels by William Tyndale The Archbishop's Notes for a Homily Against Rebellion by Thomas Cranmer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sentences of the Scripture Against Sedition 1 Corinthians 3 Cum sit inter vos zelus et contentio, non carnalis estis et sincut homines ambulantis? 1 Corinthians 6 Que non magis injuriam assipitis? Quare non magis fraudum patimini? James 3 Si zelum amarum habitis et contentionis sint in cordibus vestris, etc. Non est ista sapientia de sursum descendes a pater luminum, sed terrena animalis diabolica. Ubi enim zelus et contentio ibi inconstantia et omni opus malum, etc. James 4. Hunde bella et lites inter vos, non ex concupiscentis vestris, quae militantin membris vestris. How God hath plagued sedition in time past. Numbers 16. Dathan and Abiram, for their sedition against Moses and Aaron, did miserably perish in God's just judgment, the earth opening and swallowing them down quick. Second Samuel 15 and 18. Absalom, moving sedition against David, did miserably perish likewise. Second Samuel 20. Seba, for his sedition against David, lost his head. 1 Kings 1 and 2. Adonias, also for his sedition against Solomon, was slain. Acts 8. Judas and Thoidas for their sedition were justly slain. Acts 21, an Egyptian likewise, which moved the people of Israel to sedition, received that he deserved. Tumults in England. Jack Cade, Jack Straw. In Germany, for their sedition, were slain almost in one month about 200,000. The sword, by God's word, pertaineth not to subjects, but only to magistrates. Though the magistrates be evil and very tyrants against the commonwealth and enemies to Christ's religion, Yet the subjects must obey in all worldly things, as the Christians do under the Turk, and ought so to do, so long as he commandeth them not to do against God. How ungodly, then, it is for our subjects to take the sword, 
where there reigneth a most Christian prince most desirous to reform all griefs. Subjects ought to make humble suit to their prince for reformation of all injuries, and not to come with force. The sword of the subjects at this present cometh not of God, nor for the commonwealth of this realm, but of the devil, and destroyeth the commonwealth. First, for that it is against the word of God. Secondly, for that they raise so many lies, whereof the devil is ever the author. Quia mendax est et parte ejus. Thirdly, for that they spoil and rob men, and command every man to come to them, and to send to them what they please. Fourthly, for that they let the harvest, which is the chief sustenation of our life, and God of his goodness hath sent it abundantly, and they by their folly do cause it to be lost and abandoned. Fifthly, for that they be led by rage and fury without reason, have no respect neither of the king's authority, nor of the papists in the west country, nor of our affairs in France, nor Scotland, which by their sedition is so much hindered that there could not be imagined so great a damage to the realm. Sixthly, that they give commandments in the king's name and in pain of death, having none authority so to do. Ever against God the devil hath raised sedition, as appeareth by the sedition of Dathan and Abiram, and all the murmurations of the children of Israel against Moses and Aaron, also of the conspiracy against Zerubbabel in the re-edifying of the temple, also against Christ and his apostles in sundry parts of the world, also in Germany lately and now among us, for the devil can abide no right reformation in religion. Civil war is the greatest scourge that can be, and most certain argument of God's indignation against us for our ingratitude, that we either will not receive his true word, or that they which receive the same dishonor God in their living when they pretend to honor him with their mouths, which in gratitude and contumely God can in no wise bear at our hands. The remedies to avert God's indignation from us is to receive his word, and to live according thereunto, returning unto God with prayer and penance, or else surely more grievous affliction shall follow, if more grievous may be than civil war among ourselves. The chief authors of all these tumults be idle and naughty people, which nothing have, nor nothing or little will labor to have, that will riot in expending, but not labor in getting. And these tumults first were excitated by the papists and others which came from the western camp, to the intent that by sowing division among ourselves we should not be able to impeach them. End of The Archbishop's Notes for a Homily Against Rebellion by Thomas Cranmer A Sermon Concerning the Time of Rebellion by Thomas Cranmer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The common sorrow of this present time, dearly beloved brethren in Christ, if I should be more led thereby than by reason and zeal to my country, would move me rather to hold my peace than to speak. For the great evils which we now suffer at this present time are to be bewailed with tears and silence rather than with words. And hereunto I might allege for me the example of Job, who when he came to his extreme misery, he lying upon a dunghill and three of his friends sitting upon the ground by him for the space of seven days for great sorrow, not one of them opened his mouth to speak a word to another. If then the miserable state of Job, like a most hard and sharp bit, stopped his mouth from speaking, and the lamentable case of their friend stayed those three men, being of speech most eloquent, that they could not utter their words, surely it seemeth that I have a much more cause to be still and hold my peace. For there was a piteous lamentation of no more but of one man, or one household, and that only concerning temporal and worldly substance, but we have cause to bewail a whole realm, and that most noble, which lately being in that state, that all other realms envied our wealth and feared our force, is now so troubled, so vexed, so tossed and deformed, and that by sedition among ourselves, of such as be members of the same, that nothing is left unattempted to the utter ruin and subversion thereof. And besides this, the eternal punishment of God threateneth sore as well the authorers and procurers of these seditions as all other that join themselves unto them. So that we be constrained day and night to bewail the decay not only of a worldly kingdom and most noble realm, but also the eternal damnation of innumerable souls. These reasons perchance might move some men to be quiet and hold their peace. But me they do not so much move, which know right well that our common sorrow and lamentable state cannot be remedied with silence, nor good counsel can be given with holding my peace. Now therefore in this common sorrow I know nothing that is more able to assuage our griefs and to comfort our heaviness 
than is the word of God. For as the sun many times with his beams driveth away great thick and dark clouds, and stayeth great storms of wind, so doth the light of God's word stay men's minds, bringing them from trouble to quietness, from darkness to brightness, from heaviness and desperation to gladness, joy, and comfort. Wherefore I most humbly beseech Almighty God to grant me by his Spirit, that out of Holy Scripture I may plainly set out before your eyes the principal causes of all these tumults and seditions. For if the causes be once known, it shall be more easy to provide remedy therefore. The general cause of all these commotions is sin and under Christian profession unchristian living. But there be also certain special causes, of the which some pertain both to the high and lower sort, as well to the governors as to the common people, some appertain only to the people, and some again only to the governors and rulers. And of them I will first begin to speak. The governors and rulers be ordained of God, as St. Paul declareth in his epistle to the Romans, for this intent and purpose, that they should be God's officers and ministers here in earth, to encourage and advance them that be good, and to rebuke and correct those that be evil. But herein, O good Lord, be merciful unto us, for we have been too remiss in punishing offenders, and many things we have winked at. We have suffered perjury, blasphemy, and adultery, slandering and lying, gluttony and drunkenness, vagabonds and idle persons, either lightly punished or else not punished at all, either thinking this clemency for the time expedient for the commonwealth, or else not duly weighing how grievous those offences be in the sight of God. And whilst we lacked this right judgment of God's wrath against sin, lo, suddenly cometh upon us this scourge of sedition, the rod of God's wrath, to teach us how sore God hateth all wickedness, and is displeased with his ministers that wink thereat. For except we be duller than stocks and stones, we must needs feel that this plague is the grievous scourge of God for our offences, that we have suffered too much them that have offended against his most holy name. We have dissimulated the matter, we have been cold in God's cause, and have rather winked at than punished the contempt both of God and his laws. And this surely is one great cause, wherefore we suffer worthily this plague of God. Eli suffered his children too much, and was too soft in chastising of them, when they sinned against God, but that his softness was the destruction of him, his children, and of a great number also of the people of Israel. David, because in time he did not correct his three sons, Ammon, Absalom, and Adonias, he lost them all three, and was in great danger to be destroyed by them himself. And if the perils of this most chosen king of God do little move us, let us call to our remembrance, I pray you, the plague of God against the whole tribe of Benjamin, because they let pass unpunished the abominable abusing of the Levite's wife whereof followed that the whole tribe of Benjamin was almost utterly destroyed, for there was slain of them about twenty-five thousand, and there was left alive of the whole tribe no more but six hundred. Consider, I pray you, by this example, how certain and present destruction cometh to commonwealths, because offenders against God are unpunished. And whensoever the magistrates be slack in doing their office herein, let them look for none other but that the plague of God shall fall in their necks for the same." which thing not only the foresaid examples, but also experiences within ourselves, doth plainly teach us. For whensoever any member of our body is diseased or sore, if we suffer it long to continue and fester, do we not see that at length it doth infect the whole body, and in process of time utterly corrupteth the same? But for what purpose, brethren, do I speak so much of this matter? Verily, for none other intent, but that when we know one of the causes of these evils, we may duly repent and amend the same. But peradventure, some will say, if the governors offend because they do not justly punish offenders, what doth that pertain to us, the common people, which have not offended? Let them repent that have offended, let them be sorry for their slackness in punishment, and more sharply correct from henceforth, such as by their horrible offences provoke God's indignation against us all. Nay, not so, my friends, let no men charge the governors and excuse themselves. We have offended God both high and low. We have deserved this plague at God's hands, and much more. Therefore let every man search his own conscience, and, like as Daniel did, let every man confess and bewail as well his own sins as the sins of the heads and rulers. And let every man for his own part correct and amend himself, forasmuch as he knoweth that our offences be the causes not only of private, but also of public and common calamities. Now the time requireth to declare another cause of our sedition, which is the greedy desire and, as it were, worshipping of riches, wherewith both the high and low sort, being too much blinded, have brought our realm to this point. 
and surely nothing more hath caused great and puissant armies, realms, and empires to be overthrown than hath done the insatiable covetousness of worldly goods. For hereby, as by a most strong poison, whole realms many times have come to ruin, which seemed else to have endured for ever. Sundry commonwealths, which before were conserved in unity, have by incurable disorder been divided and separated into many parts. This manner of vice, if it be unseemly unto other people, to them surely that profess Christ, it is utterly shameful and detestable, which above all nations should be the true esteemers and lovers of pure godly things, which be eternal and immortal, and ought to seek for right judgment and estimation of things only at their own profession. For as many of us as be truly called Christians of Christ do confess that we be redeemed by him, not through the vain and uncertain riches of this world, but through the strong and perfect obedience whereby he submitted himself unto his Father to be obedient even unto the death of the cross. Worldly wise men esteem worldly riches and wealth above all other things. But the wisdom of God esteemeth obedience above all things, that is to say, that a man should submit his will to God's will, that he should not desire to use anything in this world, no, not his own life, but as it shall please God and be to his glory, and to be content with that state, place, and degree that God, the author of all good things, hath called him unto. With this sacrifice of obedience, Christ did reconcile us unto his Father, humbling himself to his Father's will, even to the death of the cross. And he hath commanded all them that profess to be his disciples to follow this his example." But alas, how far be all they from this rule and example which come with force of arms in the king's majesty's realm without his license and authority, mustering themselves in unlawful assemblies and tumults to the disorder and disquietness of the whole realm and of a greedy and covetous mind to spoil and rob and take from others, or they also, which through covetousness of joining land to land and enclosures to enclosures have wronged and oppressed a great multitude of the king's faithful subjects. I speak of both these sorts of people together, because both of them be diseased with a like sickness. But are they so ignorant in godly religion, that they know not that God is the distributor and giver of the goods of the world? And if they know this, why then do they go about to get goods of this world by unlawful means, contrary to God's will and commandment? Wherein what other thing else do they, than forsake their master Christ, and yield themselves unto Satan, worshipping him for their God, because he promises to give them the lands and goods of this world? But, Almighty God, I beseech thee, open the eyes of these blind persons, that they may once see and perceive that the true riches of Christian men be not gold, silver, or great possessions, but those things which neither the eye hath seen, nor the ear hath heard, nor man's heart can comprehend." Is it not a great wonder that the devil should so rob these men of their wits, that either oppress the poor or stir these commotions, that they do forget death? For if they did call to their remembrance that death every day and hour hangeth over their heads, they would not be so greedy of worldly goods, that for the same they would either do injury to their neighbor, or confound all things upside down with seditious uproars and unquietness, seeing that of all the goods in this world they shall carry with them, when they die, not the value of one farthing, no, he that dieth in the displeasure of God, were he never so rich, shall not in the world to come be able to buy one drop of water to quench the flames of everlasting fire, wherewith he shall be tormented in hell. We came naked into this world, and naked we shall depart hence again. What madness is it then, so to labor and toil both day and night, yea, to adventure both body and soul, for these things that be so transitory, which we be sure we shall not possess after this life, and be unsure whether we shall keep them so long or no. For we see by common experience that many which have had great possessions and riches are suddenly by diverse chances brought to great lack and extreme poverty. For the which cause St. Paul doth teach us that we ought not to put our confidence in riches which are uncertain and unstable. For riches be like an untrusty servant which runneth from his master when he has most need of him. The wretched man, saith the prophet David, doth hoard up great treasures, but he cannot tell for whom. We see by daily experience that men be so mad, when they once give themselves to covetousness, that they less esteem the loss of their honesty, wealth, liberty, religion, yea, of God himself, and everlasting life, than the loss of their riches. But here me thinketh I hear some of these unlawful assemblers mutter and say, Sir, it is truth that you have said, covetousness is it that undoeth all this realm, and this was the cause of our assemblies, to have the covetousness of the rich men and gentlemen reformed, and that the poor might be provided for. But to this I answer on this wise, that gentlemen were never poorer than they be at this present, for the more part, and 
in what cause soever the gentleman be in, yet who gave subjects authority to levy armies in a king's realm without his leave and consent, or when had ever such commotion good success or came to a good end? Who did ever see the feet and legs divide themselves from the head and other superior parts? Doth it then become the lower sort of the people to flock together against their heads and rulers, and specially now at this time in the king's majesty's tender age, when we be round about environed with other enemies, outward with Scots and Frenchmen, and among ourselves with subtle papists, who have persuaded the simple and ignorant Devonshire men, under pretense and colour of religion, to withstand all godly reformation? Shall we now destroy our realm and make it a prey to our adversaries? Remember the fable of Aesop, that when the frog and the mouse did fight together, the puttock came and snatched them up both. What greater pleasure can we do to the Scots and Frenchmen than to be at variance within ourselves and so make our realm a prey for them? What joy is this to the Bishop of Rome to hear that the blood of Englishmen, for the which he hath so long thirsted, is now like to be shed by their own brethren and countrymen? But let us be joined together like members of one body, and then we shall have less need to fear our foreign enemy." It is an easy thing to break a whole faggot when every stick is loosed from another, but it is hard to break the faggot when it is fast bound together. But peradventure, some will say, the gentlemen have done the commons great wrong, and things must needs be redressed. But is this the way, I pray you, to reform that is amiss, to redress one injury with another? Is it the office of subjects to take upon them the reformation of the commonwealth without the commandment of common authority? To whom hath God given the ordering and reformation of realms? To kings or to subjects? Hearken and fear the saying of Christ, He that taketh the sword shall perish with the sword. To take the sword is to draw the sword without authority of the prince. For God in his scriptures expressly forbiddeth all private revenging, and hath made this order in commonwealths, that there should be kings and governors to whom he hath willed all men to be subject and obedient. Those he hath ordained to be common revengers, correctors, and reformers of all common and private things that be amiss. And he hath forbidden all private persons to presume to take any such thing upon them, because he would not that his godly order should be broken or troubled of any man. Christ refused to divide the inheritance between two brethren, because he would not intermeddle with that office unto the which he was not sent of his father. How presumptuous, then, be they that enterprise to be judges in the limits and bands of lands, not being called thereunto, neither having any commission to do it. Among the Israelites, when they had entered into the land of Canaan, none durst be so bold as to usurp unto himself either house, city, or land, but they tarried till Joshua, their governor, had divided the same, and every man was contented with his appointment. And why, then, do not our people patiently tarry till our Joshua, that is the king's majesty, and his council do make just reformations, as they intend to do? but will take upon themselves to be reformers and judges of their own causes, and so by uproars and tumults hinder the most godly purposes and proceedings of him and his counsel. But poverty, they say, constrained them to do as they have done. So might the thief say that poverty constraineth him to rob, if that would excuse him. But this is no sufficient cause of their disobedience, for our Saviour Christ was so poor that he saith of himself, Foxes have berries, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath no place where he may lay his head. And Peter also forsook all that he had, and followed Christ's poverty. And yet they both paid quietly tribute to Caesar, and we read not that they made any business or gathered numbers of people together to stir a commotion, crying as heaven and earth should go together, that it was not justly ordered, that they which were most godly had no possessions, and yet were compelled to pay tribute to Caesar." They said no such words, but paid their tribute without murmuring or grudging. They to whom God hath sent poverty and goods, let them also be poor and humble in spirit, and then be they blessed in heaven, howsoever they be here in earth. Christ himself saith, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For no poverty can move such men to do anything against God's commandments, or to disquiet the commonwealth. But although they pretend that poverty constraineth them thus to do, be they so blind that they cannot see that this sedition doth not remedy but increase their poverty? Be their eyes so hard shut in their heads that they cannot see what evil they have done to their own commonwealth, what victuals they have consumed, how they have hindered the harvest upon the ground which God sent them to be their living the next year, and so they destroy their own livings themselves? They nothing consider how many men they have undone, how many they have spoiled and robbed, how many children they have caused to be fatherless and wives to be widows." And what be they the better therefore? What have they gotten thereby but only loaded themselves with the burden of the spoil and robbery of other men, whom they be never able to satisfy, 
and yet they may be assured that God will be satisfied of them for their evil doings, even unto the uttermost farthing. And although their offences be as great as may be thought, thus to consume and annoy their country, their own friends and neighbours, yet the mercy of God is never consumed to them that will repent and amend. Wherefore let us pray God for them, that he will give them eyes to see and ears to hear, and hearts to understand their own misdemeanour and folly. But the great part of them that be the chief stirrers in these insurrections be ruffians and sturdy idle fellows, which be the causes of their own poverty, commonly resorting to tippling and to alehouses, much drinking and little working, much spending and little getting, and yet will they be clad gorgeously, fare daintiously, and lie softly, which, neither caring for God nor man, seek now nothing else but to get something by spoil and robbing of other men. These fellows make all this hurly-burly in every place, and when the rage of the people is quieted in one place, then they run to another, never quiet themselves, nor ceasing to disquiet other, until at length they hope to come to their prey. Happy is that place where none such be, and in great danger be they where many such be. This realm had never so many, and that evidently appeareth at this present time. All the Holy Scripture exhorteth to pity and compassion upon the poor, and to help them, but such poor as be oppressed with children, or other necessary charges, or by fire, water, or other chance, come to poverty, or for age, sickness, or other causes, be not able to labor. But to such as be poor by their own folly, that be able to labor and will not, the Scripture commandeth in no wise to aid them or help them, but chargeth utterly all men to abhor them. But these men, repugning against God, gape at nothing else, but unjustly and by force to take from other men that which God hath given unto them by their just labor. And yet they pretend that they mean nothing else but a reformation of things that be amiss, and they complain much of rich men and gentlemen, saying that they take the commons from the poor, that they raise the prices of all manner of things, that they rule the poverty and oppress them at their pleasure. Thus they excuse their own outrageous presumption by charging the gentlemen. But whilst they look so earnestly at other men's faults, they do not see their own. They speak much against Ahab that took from Naboth his vineyard, but they follow not the example of Naboth, who would rather lose his vineyard than he would make any commotion or tumult among the people. They make exclamations against Ahab, and yet follow him rather than the patience of Naboth. We never read that any just man, which is praised in the scripture, did take sword in his hand as against his prince or nobility, although he suffered never so much wrong or oppression. And yet now they accuse the gentlemen of taking commons, which take from the gentlemen both the common and proper. They charge the rich men that they enhance the prices, but in this unseemly commotion they take from the rich man what they list without any price. They say that the gentlemen rule the poor and oppress them at their pleasure, but they so say that it be out of all rule and order, and rule the gentlemen as pleaseth them, except they will have their goods spoiled, their houses brent, and further be in danger of their lives. They say gentlemen have ruled aforetime, and they will rule now another while. A goodly realm shall that be, that shall be ruled by them that never had experience to govern, nor cannot rule themselves. A prentice must learn seven years before he can be a good merchant, no less time were required to be a good governor. But if God were so offended with our realm, and by our ingratitude and wickedness were so much provoked to indignation against us, that he would make them governors and rulers over us, O oh Lord, what a realm should this be! What fruit should we see of their governance? What end or measure would be of their covetousness? What justice should be looked for at their hands, if they were rulers which now, being but private persons without law or justice, take from every man at their pleasure? How would they temper themselves, being in authority, that now without authority be ruled by their own affections, without the fear of God or respect to reason or honesty? It is a common and true saying that authority showeth what every man is, and a gentleman will ever show himself a gentleman, and a villain a villain. We see daily by experience that a gentleman in authority hath a respect to his reputation and worship, but a villain called to office and authority commonly regardeth neither God, worship, nor honesty, but to catch what he can by right or by wrong, for unto him all is fish that cometh to the net. And yet it is reported that there be many among these unlawful assemblies that pretend knowledge of the gospel, and will needs be called gospelers, as though the gospel were the cause of disobedience, sedition, and carnal liberality and the destruction of those policies, kingdoms, and commonwealths where it is received. But if they will be true gospelers, let them then be obedient, meek, patient in adversity and long-suffering, and in no wise rebel against the laws and magistrates. 
These lessons are taught in the gospel, both by evident scriptures and also by the examples of Christ and his apostles. Christ himself was poor and pronounced himself them to be blessed that patiently suffer poverty. The apostles forsook all that they had and followed Christ. The prophets oftentimes refused great riches offered unto them, and can they say that they have the spirit of the prophets and the apostles, which, having no possessions of their own, go about by force, violence, and sedition to get other men's? No, this spirit is not of Christ, but of the devil, and such a spirit, as among the Romans, Cathegus, and Manlius, were inspired with all, and here in England, Jack Straw, Jack Cade the blacksmith, Captain Ask, and diverse other rebels who have suffered just punishment after their deserving. And although here I seem only to speak against these unlawful assemblers, yet I cannot allow those, but I must needs threaten everlasting damnation unto them, whether they be gentlemen or whatsoever they be, which never cease to purchase and join house to house and land to land, as though they alone ought to possess and inhabit the earth. For to such Isaiah the prophet threateneth everlasting woe and the curse of God, except they repent and amend their lives in time." But yet their fault excuseth not those which, without the commandment of the king and his laws, have taken harness upon their backs, and refused to lay it down, when they were by the king's authority commanded so to do. What other reward can I promise to them than the anger and vengeance of God, which they shall feel both in this life and in the life to come, both sorer and sorer than they look for, except they acknowledge their fault and amend by time? But let us now compare these two destructions of the commonwealth together, the covetous men, which, as they say, do enclose and possess unjustly the commons, and these mutineers, which rashly and without all reason will be both the hearers, judges, and reformers of their own causes. And, that is most unjustice of all, and against all man's law and God's law, this they will do, the other parties, neither heard nor called, and thereunto they take the king's power upon them, the authority of the magistrate and the sword, which they never had by no law. Which of these two is the greater injury? Which is the more intolerable robbery? Which is the more pernicious confusion? Is this a remedy to their griefs? Is this to bring in justice? I am sure themselves, being quiet from their furor and rage, cannot think so. Foolishness is not healed by madness. Theft is not amended with spoil and ravine. Neither is the commonwealth stayed and made strong by the breach of laws, orders, and states. Wherefore, let both parties lay away this so furious and excessive desire of vain and worldly things, which, as we have now learned by experience, and as the Apostle saith, is the root of all evils. But now I will go further to speak somewhat of the great hatred which diverse of these seditious persons do bear against the gentlemen, which hatred in many is so outrageous that they desire nothing more than the spoil, ruin, and destruction of them that be rich and wealthy. For this thing many of them do cry and openly profess. Oh, a goodly purpose and benefit to the realm, this declareth what spirit they be led withal. If these devilish spirits might have their wills, what destruction should hang over this realm? What miserable state should this commonwealth come unto? This noble realm, which yet is feared of all nations, should then be a prey to all nations, to the Frenchmen, to the Scots, to every realm that would spoil them, and among ourselves should be such confusion that every man should spoil other if he were stronger. For take away gentlemen and rulers, and straightway all other falleth clearly away, and followeth barbarical confusion." Oh, how far be these men from all fear of God! For God commandeth all inferiors most readily to obey their superiors. But these, more like beasts than men, bend themselves clearly against God, not only to disobey, but also to destroy their superiors which God hath appointed over them. The scripture saith, He that hateth his brother is a murderer before God. But these men not only mortally hate, but also threaten the destruction not only of one man, but of one whole state, and that, next to the king's majesty, the chief state of the whole realm. And not only this, but that which is more wonderful and to be lamented, part of them do despise and openly refuse the king's majesty's pardon. He is loath to shed his subjects' blood, although they be unworthy the name of his subjects. But they seek to shed the blood of them which have hitherto defended their blood from shedding. He, like a merciful prince, is loath to cut off the members of his body, although many of them are so rotten and corrupt that... If they might, they would infect the whole body. And what madness is it that diseased members refuse to be anointed with the most soft and gentle ointment of his majesty's mercy? He is as careful of their health and life as it were possible if they were his children. Although by these seditions and uproars he hath been more grievously offended than the gentlemen have offended them with whom they be angry. 
For the gentlemen, in case those things be true wherewith they be charged, yet they have only done wrong to the poor commons in their enclosures and such like matters. But by these seditions the majesty of a most high and godly king is hurt and wronged, for so much as they take upon them his office, and as it were pulleth the sword out of his hands. For he is ordained of God to have the hearing and decision of such causes, and to have the administration and distribution of these worldly goods. But they, in their rage, do in a manner pull him out of his throne and chair of a state, and cast him down to the ground, who is here in earth God's vicar and chief minister, and of whom only next unto God dependeth all the wealth and felicity of this realm, as it would soon appear, if he were missing, which God forbid, and all the realm should bewail. Verily, when I consider with myself their unjust desire in revenging and the king's majesty's gentleness in suffering and pardoning, methink I see the accustomed order of things to be clean turned and changed upside down, for Solomon saith, A king's anger is like the roaring of a lion. But their sovereign lord doth not roar against them, which notwithstanding have grievously offended and provoked his anger, but rather doth fawn upon them and use them gently. Contrarywise, they, which ought to be as gentle and meek as lambs, whose part it were either to hold their peace and not open their mouths, or else to speak very mildly and lowly, do now roar and make outcries like most cruel lions, the which thing, how justly they do it, God's vengeance, except they take heed, will speedily declare. One thing there is which, after all, I think necessary to be added hereunto, and that, in mine opinion, is the head and beginning of all these tribulations. For the gospel of God, now set forth to the whole realm, is of many so hated that it is reject, refused, reviled, and blasphemed, and by those which have received the same, and would be counted to be great favourers thereof, yet it sustaineth much injury and reproach, and by their occasion is ill spoken of. For the great number of them, pretending a zeal thereunto in their lips and not in their hearts, counterfeit in godliness in name but not in deed, live after their own pleasure like epicures, and so ungodly as though there were no God. And what is it that St. Paul calleth the having of God's truth in unrighteousness, if this be not it? These, having more knowledge of God than they had before, and receiving a taste of the heavenly gifts, notwithstanding retain their old vices in their corrupt manners and dissolute conversation, being nothing amended but rather paired. Which thing, being in this case, what other thing should we look for than the severe and terrible judgment of God to make us an example to all them that abuse his word, since by repentance we will not be amended, nor by the pure word of God be healed? that thereby all men may learn how abominable it is before God, his name to be so dishonoured and the doctrine of the gospel so lightly esteemed. The heathen poet could not wink at such men, but with his pen rubbed them on the gall, which, pretending holiness, so dissolutely did live. And shall God's judgment leave them unpunished, which, always having in their mouth the gospel, the gospel, reasoning of it, bragging of it, yet in their conversation live after the world, the flesh, and the devil, which, as St. Paul wrote unto Titus, confessing God with their mouth, deny him with their deeds. But such as rejoice and brag in such things utterly deceive themselves. Whoso listeth to read the histories of the heathen people and greatest idolaters, he shall not find among them all any region, people, or nation that was so scourged by God, so oft brought into servitude, so oft carried into captivity, with so diverse, strange, and many calamities oppressed, as were the children of Israel. And yet they bragged and gloried that none other nation, but they only had the law of God, their rites and ceremonies of God, God's promises and his testaments. And so it was indeed, nevertheless, St. Paul writing to the Romans doth most sore rebuke and reprove them, saying, Thou art called a Jew, and dost trust in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and allowest the things that be best, and are informed by the law, and thinkest that thou art a guide to the blind, a light to them that are in darkness, a teacher of them that be ignorant, a doctor to them that be unlearned, which hast the true form and knowledge of the truth by the law. But yet thou which teachest another, teachest not thyself, Thou preachest that a man should not steal, yet thou stealest. Thou sayest that a man should not commit adultery, but thou breakest wedlock. Thou abhorrest images, and yet thou dost commit idolatry by dishonouring of them. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking of the law dishonourest God, for the name of God is ill spoken of among the heathen by your means. Thus the apostle St. Paul, charging the Jews, chargeth us also, which with our mouths say that we have received the word of God, and yet our conversation is contrary and ungodly. Why then do we marvel if we suffer these punishments for our dissimulation and hypocrisy?
For God useth first to begin and correct his own family, then if he should suffer this amongst us unpunished, should not he be thought to approve sin, to be a favourer of the wicked, and the God of unthrifts and lewd people? The church of God, most dearly beloved brethren, ought not to be reputed and taken as a commonplace, whereunto men resort only to gaze and to hear, either for their solace or for their pastime. But whatsoever is there declared of the word of God, that should we devoutly receive and so earnestly print in our minds, that we should both believe it as most certain truth, and most diligently endeavor ourselves to express the same in our manners and living. If we receive and repute the gospel as a thing most true and godly, why do we not live according to the same? If we count it as fables and trifles, why do we take upon us to give such credit and authority unto it? To what purpose tendeth such dissimulation and hypocrisy? If we take it for a Canterbury tale, why do we not refuse it? Why do we not laugh it out of place and whistle at it? Why do we with words approve it, with conscience receive and allow it, give credit unto it, repute and take it as a thing most true, wholesome and godly, and in our living clearly reject it? Brethren, God will not be mocked. For this cause did God so severely and grievously punish the Jews above all other nations. And since our cause is the like and the same, the self-same ire and displeasure of God is now provoked and kindled against us. The empire of Rome never appeared to be in worse case or in a more troublous and unquiet state than when Christ's religion was preached and received among them. Whereupon arose neither few nor small complaints of the heathen, ascribing all these adversities unto the receiving of the gospel and the religion of Christ, to whom the godly and learned fathers and martyrs made answer that it was not long of Christ's doctrine and religion, which teach things most virtuous and godly, that such calamities did ensue. But it was long of the corrupt execution and negligent observation of the same religion. For our Lord did say, The servant which knoweth his master's commandment, and doth it not, shall be sorer punished, than he which knoweth not his master's will, and offendeth by ignorance. Whereby it is evident, as the word of God, if it be godly received, and with all the heart embraced, is most comfortable, and of most efficacy, strength, and virtue. So otherwise, if it be trodden under foot, rejected, and despised, or craftily under the cloak of dissimulation and hypocrisy received, it is a compendious and a short way unto destruction. It is an instrument whereby the punishment and displeasure of God is both augmented and also more speedily and sooner brought upon us, as we have most justly deserved. If we will consider the histories of the books of the kings, we shall no time find more prophets among the people of Israel, nor the light of the word of God more spread abroad everywhere than it was a little before the captivity and destruction of the same by the Babylonians. A man would think that even at the same time God had set up a school of holy scriptures and doctrine, then were the heavenly prophets in all places and to all men declared. But because so great knowledge of God and of his doctrine, no good fruits did follow. But daily their living and conversation went backward and became worse. The said miserable destruction and captivity did ensue. And yet a worse captivity and misery fell upon the same people when most perfect knowledge of God was offered unto them by the coming of Christ. What time the Lord Jesus Christ himself did preach there, his apostles did preach there, yea, many other disciples, evangelists, and doctors did preach there, whose preachings and doctrines, when they would not receive, nor fruitfully and condigningly accomplish and execute, then sprang up so many dissensions, tumults, and commotions, that at the last they were brought unto utter subversion and destruction in the time of Vespasian and Titus. Of the chances of the Germans, which in a matter have suffered the same, because it is so lately done, I need not much to speak. It is yet before our eyes and in present memory, so that it needeth no declaration in word. These things before rehearsed have I for this intent and purpose spoken, that we should acknowledge and repute all these seditions and troubles, which we now suffer, to be the very plague of God for the rejecting or ungodly abusing of his most holy word, and to provoke and entice every man to true and fruitful repentance, and to receive the gospel which now by God's mercy and the good zeal of the king's majesty and his counsel is everywhere set abroad, not feignedly and faintly as many have done, nor stubbornly and contemptuously to reject it and forsake it, as many others do nowadays, not knowing what it is, but thankfully to take and embrace it at God's hand, and with all humbleness and reverence to follow and use the same to God's glory and our benefit. Ye have heard now, as I suppose, the chief and principal causes of these tumultations. Now shall I show you by examples of times past what plagues of God remaineth for them that stir up seditions, unless they repent in time, and cease from their shameful and ungodly enterprises. 
The children of Israel in the desert did oftentimes seditiously use themselves against Moses, but always did follow great plagues of death, so that this was the end of it, that 620,000 which came out of Egypt all died and were slain, and no more came to the land of Canaan but two persons only. How miserably Korah, Dathan, and Abiram perished, making of sedition, the Holy Bible manifestly and at large declareth. Miriam seditiously used herself against her brother Moses, and was she not suddenly stricken with a leprosy, of the which she had perished if Moses for her had not made intercession to God? Absalom, against his father King David, was seditious, but was he not miserably hanged by the hair in a wood by the punishment of God? Seba and Adonias, for their sedition, lost they not both their lives? In the rebellion made against Nebuchadnezzar in the time of the prophet Jeremiah, which instantly dissuaded them from their fury, they, little regarding his admonition, went down unto Egypt, where at the last they were all destroyed. Did not the tribe of Ephrathah make a commotion against Jephthah their judge? But were they not all miserably slain, therefore? If I would recite and add hereunto all the histories of the heathen, which declare the miserable end of seditious persons and rebellions, I should be more prolix and tedious than this present time doth suffer. Wherefore, I shall think it sufficient for this time to bring unto your remembrance the great destruction of the rude and homely people which not so many years ago chanced to rise in Germany. By and by, after that, the word of God began there to shine and flourish, of the which were slain within the time of three months, above an hundred thousand persons. And what followed further thereof? Great dearth of victual, great hunger and penury. But methinks that I have not done my office and duty until I have showed also the remedies to appease God's wrath and to avoid his plagues. And to show you the sum in few words, the only help and remedy is repentance. For other medicine and preservation can I give you none by God's word, but that which Christ did preach and declare unto the world, and which also his faithful messenger John the Baptist, coming before to prepare his ways, did also teach, saying, Repent you and amend, and the kingdom of heaven shall come unto you. And on this wise did our Lord Jesus Christ instruct his disciples, to whom he gave commandment specially to preach repentance and remission of sins, when he sent them forth into all the world to preach in his name. The effect of sin is to put us away from God, the very wellspring of all goodness, but by penance we return again to him from whom we were gone and departed by sin, that, as we went from God and ran after worldly things, being inflamed with insatiable desires thereof, so by penance we return from worldly creatures unto God the creator of all things. And what mutation and change can be more comfortable or more to be desired than this? By repentance we be sorry for those things which greatly pleased us before. We forsake those things which we much made of before, not without great contempt of God and violation of his most holy laws. Wherefore, since repentance doth bring so many benefits, that whereby we be returned unto God, that we be altered into a better mind, that we bewail those things which we before unjustly loved, who doth not manifestly perceive that it is the only refuge and anchor of our health and salvation? And for this cause is penance so much commended unto us, both of Christ himself and of St. John and of Christ's apostles. And why doth God forbear and so long defer to make punishment upon sin? Surely because he would have us to repent and amend. And why doth he many times strike so sore at length those that continue in evil doings? Because that with the rod he would constrain to repent and amend such as by gentleness and long suffering wax worse and worse. If God did not tarry for us, looking for our repentance and amendment, we should have perished by God's righteous judgment long before this time. If God by and by should have punished offences, we should not have had Peter among the apostles, the church should have lacked that elect vessel Paul, yea, we all long ago had been destroyed. And if God should have suffered us any longer, being so evil as we were, peradventure we should have forgotten God and died without repentance. Wherefore the thing that God so much desireth of us, and hath provoked unto, first by long suffering and now by sore punishing, that is true and godly repentance. Let us consider well in our minds how many ways God doth call and allure sinners to penance. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, after they had transgressed God's commandment, he called them unto him, he rebuked them, he sharply punished them, to endure again to repentance. And after, when all things in the earth were corrupted by the sins of man, God commanded Noah to build an ark, to save him and all that were righteous, that only the wicked might be drowned throughout all the world. And for what purpose was the ark so long in making, but for a long preaching and warning of the world to repent and amend? 
How oft is it read in the book of Judges that the children of Israel were given over unto the hands of heathen princes, that they should be punished by them, and by punishment repent and amend. It is an extreme impiety and madness to think that God is cruel and delighteth in the punishment of his people, but for their amendment. For so did the Marcionists and the Manichees blaspheme God, which for this purpose did accuse him of cruelty and unmercifulness, that thereby they might take away all credit from the Old Testament. But we do acknowledge that God did therein show his great mercy, that the Israelites, admonished by afflictions, whom no speaking nor writing could move, might by repentance return again to God. Also the great slaughter that the other tribes of Israel suffered of the tribe of Benjamin came of none other cause, but that they being converted by penance might at the last obtain the victory. Furthermore, the prophets sent of God did most earnestly persuade all men to repentance. The godly king David was no otherwise healed than by repentance, and the prophet Elijah was sent to Ahab, king of Israel, to call him to repentance. And by the same Manasseh, king of Judah, did obtain remission. By the selfsame repentance did his father Hezekiah obtain prolongation of his life. The king of Nineveh, with all his people, by the means of repentance, had God merciful unto them. The great king Nebuchadnezzar, after that he had repented, recovered not only his former state, being changed from a beast to a man, but also was restored to his empire and kingdom, which before he had lost. By the same means did Peter obtain remission of his abjuration and denial of Christ. By the same Paul, a persecutor, became an apostle. Mary Magdalene, at the feet of the Lord, taking repentance, was absolved and remitted. And the thief on the cross, by this same remedy, obtained salvation. This did the apostles persuade unto them that received their preaching, as it appeareth in the Acts of the Apostles. This did Peter propound unto Simon Magus, this did Paul commend unto the Corinthians, and almost to all other to whomsoever he wrote, and did both often and diligently beat it into men's heads. This we must receive as the first part of the gospel. This God requireth of all offenders, if they will be reconciled unto him. Wherefore, now let us repent while we have time, for the axe is laid already at the root of the tree to fill it down. If we will harden our hearts, and will not now be repentant of our misdoings, God will surely strike us clean out of his book. Hitherto ye have heard of the profit and commodity of repentance. Now shall ye hear what it is, and of what parts it consisteth. And to declare it plainly and grossly unto you, it is a sorrow conceived for sins committed, with hope and trust to obtain remission by Christ, with a firm and effectual purpose of amendment, and to alter all things that hath been done amiss. I have described unto you this heavenly medicine, which if we use, God hath promised by his prophet, that if our sins were so red as scarlet, they shall be made as white as snow. But God's word hath thus much prevailed among us, that in the stead of sorrow for our sin is crept in a great looseness of living without repentance, in the stead of hope and trust of remission of our sins is come in a great boldness to sin without the fear of God. Instead of amendment of our lives, I see daily everything waxeth worse and worse, so that it is much to be afraid that God will take away from us his vineyard and bestow it to other husbandmen, which will till it better, that it shall bring forth fruit in due season." We be come to the point almost that Jeremiah spake of when he said, The people spake not, that was right. No man would repent him so much of his sin that he would once say, What have I done? Every man ran after his own way as a horse runneth headlong in battle. They have committed abominable mischief, and yet be they nothing ashamed, nor know the way to be abashed. These words of Jeremiah may well be spoken of us this present time. But let us repent in time without further delay, for we have enough and overmuch already provoked God's wrath and indignation against us. Wherefore let us pray and fall down and lament before the Lord our Maker, for he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his fold. Today, if we hear his voice, let us not harden our hearts, as the people did in the desert. For of continuance in evil living there is none other end to be looked for than eternal damnation, but of repentance and perfect conversion unto God, the end is perpetual salvation and everlasting life. And if we do not repent in time, at the last we shall be compelled to hear this terrible voice of damnation, Go ye wicked into everlasting fire, which is prepared for the devil and those that be his. Then there shall be no remedy, then no intercession shall serve, then it shall be too late to come to repentance. Let us rather repent and turn in time and make intercession unto the Lord by his Son Jesus Christ. Let us lament for our sins and call for God's mercy, that when Christ shall come at the last day, we may hear these words of him, Come to me, you that be blessed of my Father, and take possession of the kingdom which my Father hath prepared for you. 
And now with this humble prayer let us make an end. O Lord, whose goodness far exceedeth our naughtiness, and whose mercy passeth all measure, we confess thy judgment to be most just, and that we worthily have deserved this rod wherewith thou hast now beaten us. We have offended the Lord God, we have lived wickedly, we have gone out of the way, we have not heard thy prophets, which thou hast sent unto us to teach us thy word, nor have done as thou hast commanded us. Wherefore, we be most worthy to suffer all these plagues. Thou hast done justly, and we be worthy to be confounded. But we provoke unto thy goodness, we appeal unto thy mercy, we humble ourselves, we knowledge our faults. We turn to thee, O Lord, with our whole hearts, in praying and fasting and lamenting and sorrowing for our offences. Have mercy upon us, cast us not away according to our deserts, but hear us and deliver us with speed, and call us to thee again according to thy mercy, that we with one consent and one mind may ever more glorify thee, world without end. Amen. End of A Sermon Concerning the Time of Rebellion by Thomas Cranmer Martin Luther's Declaration to His Countrymen by Martin Luther This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Distractions increasing through Germany when things seemed to tend towards tumults and insurrections, for the Boers had, here there is a lacuna in the text, taken up arms, Luther, in a published writing, warned all to abstain from sedition, for although some terrible and present danger seemed to hang over the churchmen's heads, yet he thinks that it would be nothing or not so great as to overturn all their power for a self greater misery. Here there is a lacuna in the text their heads, and that that would come to pass which after Daniel, Paul, if foretold, that their tyranny should fall by no human power, but by the coming of Christ our Saviour and the Holy Ghost, and that this was the foundation of his opinion, and these views he never greatly resisted them who attempted to bring about their distraction with war, and that he certainly knows that they endeavour in vain, and although happily some few churchmen are... Here there is a lacuna in the text... Yet this butchery will not take away all of them, and that they now tremble and run up and down, and that he heartily wishes that they may tremble more and more, if perchance they may repent of their offences, but that the wrath of God is kindled, and that formerly they were troubled with the danger of their lives, and now of their estates, but take no thought how to be reconciled to God, nay, secure in all things, despite so good admonitions, and almost laugh at the denouncing of God's wrath. And although they have reason to fear nothing worse, yet since the present condition of affairs require some declaration of my advices, I will freely speak my mind. And first of all, it concerns the magistrate to provide that their people receive not any damage, and to endeavor that religion be not blemished with false doctrines. This is their duty, and that they ought to use all the power they have to God's glory and the people's safety, but because they do far otherwise, and hinder each other, and some to maintain false doctrines, that those princes shall not escape unpunished. This is not my counsel that papists should be opposed with arms, but that the magistrate should bind them to their duty, and should in this exercise their power and authority, and should not strengthen their boldness and impiety, neither with their clemency or dissembling. But as for the common people and unskilful multitude, that they must gravely be warned that they take not up arms unless with the consent of their prince, for otherwise they will lose their labor and God will take vengeance on them. Neither shall so great a sin be atoned with so light a punishment, but that the magistrates go on so slowly and negligently and suffer so great indignities and are not a whit moved with so open injuries and scoffs of the churchmen. This falls out through God's permission." that he himself might revenge this business, and pour out all his vengeance on them. And though happily this should break forth into tumults, and God suffer himself to be satisfied with so gentle a punishment, yet these ways of sedition are not only not commendable, but unprofitable also, for there is no reason in sedition, and it commonly falls out the innocent principally suffer, and that none that raiseth tumults are excusable, although their cause be just, and when a popular tumult is once up, good and honest men must needs perish together with the ungodly and wicked. Therefore we must have an eye to the prince, and so long as he stirs not, we must not attempt anything privately. 
for all sedition thwarts God's commandments, who hath commanded that all the differences of private men ought to be ended by law. And since sedition is nothing else but private revenge, and no man doubts but God disallows and hates it, and that this present sedition is raised by the devil, the enemy of mankind, who, not abiding the light of the truth, stirs up sedition amongst men that profess the gospel, that he might bring into hatred and disappraise the truth restored us by God's blessing for some years past, as if it came not from God, and seemed to give occasion to so great evils, as our adversaries exceedingly brag hereof, yet their judgments are to be slighted and I wholly contemn them. I have neither written nor spoken anything to kindle any sedition. Now, for them which ask and object what then must be done, and how far must we suffer these indignities, the prince conniving and dissembling, they must follow this rule. First acknowledge their sins, with which God, being angry, hath permitted this churchman's tyranny to be so lasting, and to wander so far that this so cruel and wicked power is the wage of our sins and ungodliness, which... If we would have taken from us, we ought principally to reconcile God to us by amendment of our lives. Then, with fervent prayer, desire God's assistance against the power of the Pope, following David's example, who besought God often that he would break the power and pride of the ungodly. Lastly, we must make famous the doctrine of the gospel, and manifest to the whole world the imposture of the papists, that their errors being discovered and the truth received, men would esteem at naught and contemn whatever proceeds from them and that this is the best means to weaken their powers. Nothing at all is gained with force and arms, and for the most part it falls out that they are rather strengthened by war. But if Christ should be compared with the person of the Pope, then it would appear what's the difference betwixt the light of the sun and darkness, and what a blessing God hath conferred upon us by making a passage for us to the knowledge of himself, removing all rubs out of the way, and then at last will all their power and credit decay. This may be showed in my own example, who have more troubled the pontifical power than any violence or force of arms could do, and therefore no other sedition is to be wished for, and that the preaching of the gospel alone, now revived with Christ's assistance, will be powerful and sharp enough to destroy the popedom. Hither we must fix our eyes and mind, neither look any whither else. This is not my work wherein I am conversant, for so great a weight exceeds the strength and measure of man's wit, that the gospel hath spread so far, and hath wholly exceeded my expectation, and therefore doubt not, but he which hath laid the foundation of the work, hath given the increase, will bring it also to an end, and period, although all our enemies resist and oppose themselves against us. When the devil saw all other his attempts in vain, but took himself to a new course, and raiseth men to sedition, that he might hinder men from falling from his own, and the Pope's government, but he will not bring to pass what he endeavours, and twill come to pass that more and more twill be weakened by the preaching of the true doctrine, we must persevere in that doctrine with all care and diligence, and declare how little men's decrees avail to salvation. Satan, now seeing the decay of his kingdom, nices tumult, and assays to hinder the growth of the gospel by sedition. Tis true, I confess, that those princes, which will not suffer the preaching of the gospel, which press and oppress their people many ways, are worthy to be dethroned by God, for they are inexcusable. And although this be so, yet you must be careful to keep your consciences pure and blameless, otherwise you will lose both body and soul. Neither ought you to consider how great your forces are, or how much your adversaries are to be blamed, but how just and lawful the cause is you maintain. Take therefore careful heed. Neither believe all sermons, for Satan, under pretense of the gospel, hath raised up at this time many seditious and bloody teachers. Truly I will freely and sincerely counsel you as I ought. Tis your part to mind and hearken to him that rightly counsels you. Neither, though many speak evil of me and rail at me, am I moved thereat. It is enough if I can snatch some from God's vengeance. I regard not the other crew, and as they contemn me, so neither on the other side do I fear them. But, to come to the purpose, you challenge indeed the name of God, and ye call yourselves a Christian company, and brag you will follow that law God hath ordained. But without doubt you know God's name is not to be taken in vain, nor safely, for God hath threatened such a punishment which waits on you, for you do not will in this business." He that drowned the world, that destroyed Sodom with a fiery rain, will easily overturn you also, whatsoever your strength is. But it may be easily demonstrate that you falsely pretend the name of God in your actions, therefore we may clearly judge of the issue, for he deceives not, that said, They that take the sword shall perish with the sword. They to it who boldly of themselves take upon them the power of punishing, notwithstanding, 
Paul commands every soul to obey their princes reverently and with fear. What will you answer to this, who fain you will follow the prescript of God's word, and yet in the meanwhile ye take the sword and resist your prince, whom God has set over you? Is not this to take God's name in vain? But you object the prince so behaves himself that he is not to be endured, for he takes from us the doctrine of the gospel, and in all other things so oppresseth that he cannot more. Grant it is so, yet notwithstanding all this, war and sedition are not to be raised, for it belongs not to every one to restrain evils, but to him alone to whom is given the power and might of the sword, as the scripture plainly speaks, to whom is given the power and right of the sword, as the scripture plainly speaks. Besides, not only laws, but the law of nature, too, imprinted in us, show that it is not lawful for any one to be jury and judge in his own cause, for we are all naught and wholly blinded with self-love. But it cannot be denied that this your tumult and sedition is a private revenge, because you take upon you to be judges in your own cause, and endeavor to revenge those injuries you think are done you with your own power. But this your dealing is against the law of God, the law of nature and justice itself, and since this is so, you cannot by any means defend this heinous crime, for if you have any warrant from God for these doings, you must needs declare it by some notable miracle. But here it falls out as Christ saith. You see clearly what is to be blamed in others, but observe not how much impiety there is in your own cause. The magistrate, you say, deals unjustly, but you much more unjustly who contemning God's commandment. Here there is a lacuna in the text. One another's right who leave nothing at all to your prince, for what is left to him when ye take away his power. I appeal unto yourselves. Which, think you, is the worse of the two, he that takes away from a man a great part of his goods, yet leaves something, or he that, having taken away the goods, takes away his life also? The prince takes from you your estates, he doth unjustly, but you take away his power, wherein consists his whole fortune, both of body and goods. Therefore you are worse than he." But you will say, we neither desire his life nor estate. Believe this, he that will, I will not. Whosoever takes away from any one, the chief part will not fear to take away the residue that depends thereon. But be it as you say, let him enjoy his estate, let his life be safe, that which you have done already exceeds all measure. When you have spoiled him of all power, you yourselves will be lords paramount. Weigh this within yourselves, I beseech you, if this your course be commendable and must prevail, there will be no judgments, no magistrates, and it shall be lawful for every one privately to do to any one according to his own will and lust. Neither can we look for any other fruit from hence than killing and plundering one another. For as every one thinks he is injured by another, so will he revenge that wrong as he pleaseth. But if this be unjust and ought to be endured in no person, much less ought it to be granted to any multitude of men assembled together." or if it be granted, it is to be borne in each person. What? In this your company, if things should come to that liberty, that every one should defend his own cause privately, I pray you, what would you do? Without doubt, he should be compelled to appear before the commonplace of judgment established by you. What excuse have you then, which tear asunder justice, and reject your prince, whom God himself hath set over you? This law whereof we speak is imprinted in all men's minds and is reverenced even by the most barbarous people, for otherwise all things would be tumultuously carried. Which did you observe diligently, yet were ye not herein much better than the Turks, or such kind of people ignorant of our religion, for to undergo public trial and obedience to the prince makes not up a Christian? For very necessity compels us even against our wills hereunto, since, therefore, you violate this law of nature, you are far worse than the heathens. So far are you from being worthy of the name of Christians, which title, since you arrogate to yourselves and wrong God's name, being unworthy of the name of Turks, since you violate the law of nature. How then will ye stand in the sight of Christ at the day of universal judgment? Look to it again and again, what teachers you have, for fear I left some bloody teachers have crept in among you, who drive you on with sermons, that, having your aid, they might invade both power and sovereignty, careless wholly of your estates and salvation. God commands that all revenge should be left to him. Scripture commands us to obey even bad governors. Therefore we must obey, else you shall raise sedition, which at length will fall on your own pates, for God will not suffer this licentiousness to escape unpunished, and while ye seek for liberty, lose your life, goods, and soul." God's wrath is hot against you, and the devil, the enemy of all men's salvation, hath sent false teachers amongst you. 
Beware therefore and repent. Now shall I speak of Christianity and gospel, since you take this name upon you. Tis fit trial should be made what manner of law yours is. And first, Christ commands us not to resist evil, but to him that strikes the one cheek, we must reach the other. To him that takes away our coat, we must give our cloak also. That we should bless and do good to our enemies. To the same purpose are many places in holy writ. But now see how this your course answers Christ's command. See whether your teachers have led you. Tis a Christian's part to suffer, take up the cross, not to resist, not to revenge, not to strike with the sword. But what like this is seen in you? Very hard is the Christian profession, and few perform that which indeed they ought, which, that it may the better be understood, I will give you an example of that law whereof we speak. Peter, that he might defend his lord and master, smote the servant of the high priest. Did he not do it on good ground? Since they did not only seek Christ's life, but did take from his disciples the gospel, whereon their salvation did depend, viz. by taking away their master Christ. But you have not yet suffered so great an injury. But what doth Christ the while? He commands Peter to abstain from defence, deeply sentencing those that take up the sword without their prince's consent, and execute private revenge. What doth Christ when he is nailed to the cross? When he is forbade to teach as God the Father had commanded, he bears patiently, relying wholly on God the Father, and prays unto him for his persecutors. You must tread in these footsteps, or lay down that glorious title. But now, since you take up arms, you shall not obtain your desires, and your weapons shall fall out of your hands. And now will I speak somewhat of myself. The whole world opposed me mightily, and yet notwithstanding, by how much their opposition was more vehement, by so much did my doctrine spread the wider. How so? Because I did nothing violently, I raised no tumult, I was not desirous of revenge, but the civil magistrate I reverenced and honoured them with my writings as much as in me lay, and what was most principal, committing all to God, I did acquiesce in my power. Thus, therefore, have I been preserved to this day, though the Pope and my adversaries gnash their teeth at me, and my doctrine hath spread to many people. But you proceed too violently, and, whilst you think you promote the work, conceive not how much you endamage it. These things are spoken to this purpose, that you lay aside from you the name of Christians, though ye maintain the best cause. Yet, as we showed before, it is neither lawful for a Christian man to fight against, nor resist an evil prince. The title, therefore, and name of Christians I neither grant nor give you. Neither would I hereby excuse your princes, for they do many things unjustly, I acknowledge, yet nevertheless this your action is far removed from the profession of the Christian name. But if you shall willfully keep that name, and under this colour shall shadow your cause, I profess myself your enemy, because under pretence of the gospel ye do that which plainly crosseth the doctrine of Christ." Therefore I pray God that he would look on you afar off and overthrow this your course. I shall thus pray, though I had rather you should so demean yourselves, that it might not be needful for me to pray thus against you. They which are true Christians do nothing violently but suffer and pray as the holy men of all times show by their example. For this is the only saving way and brings greatest quiet to the conscience. But you can expect no blessing from God. Indeed, it may come to pass that God, winking at it, you may find some success, but at last all will turn to your own destruction. Ye ought not to force anything from the magistrate, for that's against justice and the law of nature. The places of scripture quoted by your teachers are neither fully nor faithfully cited, and being more nearly eyed, make not for you but against you. This, you principally say, the gospel is taken from you, but it cannot be that any one should be driven therefrom, for it is not tied to any certain place, but freely wanders and is spread throughout the world, as that star which shone to them that came from the east, showing them where Christ was born and lay. Tis indeed in the prince's power to forbid any one to come where the gospel is taught, but tis in our power too to forsake our country and to pursue this doctrine in other countries." Any place itself is not to be kept or seized on by you, but must be resigned up to the prince or lord, and we must go somewhere else as Christ teacheth. 
As for the first demand concerning the choosing of ministers, tis well, if you proceed orderly. For if the prince were donor of the goods wherewith the ministers are maintained, then tis not lawful for the people to bestow it on any one. But first the prince is to be desired to set over a pastor. If he refuses, the people may choose and maintain one at their own charges. If the prince permit not this, then must the chosen pastor fly, and he that will with him. If you do otherwise, you commit sin and injury. And this is my opinion and counsel, men and brethren, which you desired of me. Now tis your part, since you write, you will obey the testimonies of Scripture to apply your minds thereunto. But do not so soon as these things shall be brought unto you. Here there is a lacuna in the text. As if I were become the prince's flatterer, as if I taught truly, but first weigh the whole matter and the reasons urged, for certainly your business is handled, but especially beware of those teachers that stir you up. I know all this kind of... Here there is a lacuna in the text. They lead you to a steep, that they may get honours and estates by your danger. End of Martin Luther's Declaration to His Countrymen by Martin Luther A Treatise or Sermon of Henry Bullinger Concerning Magistrates and Obedience of Subjects by Henry Bullinger This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. War is a thing pertaining to the sword which is given of God to the magistrates. For so I declared in my last sermon that this sword in the magistrates' hands hath two uses— other to punish trespassers, or else to repel and destroy our open enemies with all such other like rebellious and seditious citizens and subjects, whatsoever they be. But here cometh a doubt in many men's heads whether it be lawful for magistrates to keep war. And I marvel that men can be so blind in a thing so evident, for if it be lawful for magistrates by God's law to punish trespassers, thieves, and murderers, whosoever annoyeth the commonwealth, whether they be few or many, that is no matter, as I declared to you yesterday, by the same law likewise, is it lawful for them to invade and pursue with arms rebels and seditious citizens, or any, for any enemy, whosoever intend the same by the colour of war, that thieves and murderers to practice within the realm. Truth it is that the divine prophet saith, prophesying of us Christian men, they shall turn their swords to mattocks and their spears to scythes, for Christian men keep peace with all men, and utterly avoid all fighting, for so do they to other, as they would be done to themselves. But for because all men be not of one nature, but many perturbers, wicked murderers, and oppressors be mixed amongst honest and quiet citizens, as cruel wolves amongst simple sheep, therefore doth God permit from heaven the sword to the magistrates for the defence of the innocents, Neither is it ever read in any place, but that we lawfully may oppress and destroy wolves, boars, bears, and all such beasts which be noisome to men or cattle. And why then is it not as lawful, with war and violence, to withstand the wicked force of violent murderers, seeing that all such murderers, robbers, barbarous enemies, seditious citizens, do little or nothing differ from wild beasts? Certes, the scripture calleth them with no name than beasts." To this also agreeeth the common sense of nature. Here too also the doctrine of religion and faith agreeeth. If it be possible, saith the apostle, so much as in you lieth have peace with all men, revenging not yourselves, note so much as in you, he saith, and if it be possible, for or else it followeth after, that the magistrate beareth not a sword for naught, as who should say, for such manner of persons as do malign and disquiet, honest and quiet men, which would fain live in rest and cannot. Here too also agree the examples of the most holiest men that ever were, which did war for the defence of their country and of innocence, as I declared to you out of St. Paul to the Hebrews, when I showed you in the fifth commandment what duty every man owes to his country. Here too will I annex certain places out of St. Augustine, disputed against Faustus Manichaeus, 51.20.175. Neither yet, saith he, let a man abhor or marvel at the battles done by Moses, for in them also he followed God's commandment, not for any eagerness, but for obedience' sake. For... 
When he was enforced thereto by God, he exceeded not in rigor, but only recompensed things worthy to men's deserving, and brought fear upon such as were well worthy. For what thing can a man reprove in wars, because men do die, which must die once, whereby peace may follow? To put blame in this is not a sign of religious men, but of timorous persons. The pleasure in hurting, outrageous in revenging, an unplacable stomach, wild rebelling, greediness to get dominion, and such like, these be they which be worthily reproved in war, and not only reproved, but also punished. Against the violence of our adversaries, good men may rightfully war, either by God's law or by any commandment of superior powers, being in such vocation, where their powers other commandeth any such thing, or bindeth them to obedience. Or else St. John Baptist, when the soldiers came to him to be baptized, asking what they should do. He might have answered them again, Cast away your harness, renounce your warfare, strike no man, wound no man, overthrow no body. But because he did see them in doing these things in warfare, to be no murderers but ministers of the law, neither revengers of their own injuries but defenders of public wealth, he said to them, Strike no body, wrangle with no man, be content with your own stipend. But because the Manichees be wont to despise and blaspheme John, let them hear our Lord Jesus Christ himself commanding the same stipend to be given to Caesar, which John advertised the soldiers to be content with all. Give unto Caesar, saith Christ, the things which are Caesar's, and unto God those things that are God's. For therefore be tributes paid, whereby wars may be waged and soldiers maintained for necessity of war. So he doth worthily also commend the faith of the centurion, saying, and I am a man set here under powers, having under me soldiers, and I say to him, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doth it. We see he commendeth this faith, therefore, but he biddeth him not to forsake the wars. Hitherto also pertaineth the chapter following, 75 and 76, etc. But here I am content to spare you, and not to overburden you with too prolix reciting of sentences. Thus much... Have I spoken hitherto, for that, that it is lawful for magistrates to war? And upon this we gather that subjects likewise may lawfully and without reprehension go and fight in warfare when they be commanded by the magistrates so to do. But if it be so that the magistrates' causes do set upon to slay the innocent and unguilty persons, I have declared in my former sermons, in this case the magistrates' commandments are not to be obeyed. Therefore let the magistrates take heed, lest they abuse their authority, and although it be lawful for the magistrates to keep war for just and necessary causes, yet is war a most dangerous thing, and bringeth with it heaps of infinite troubles. And thus be such men punished diverse times, whom no gentle admonition can move, albeit many innocent persons, where such be punished among. Now many times it happeneth that soldiers forget themselves and break all good order, provoking the mighty anger of God upon their heads, what kind of mischief is in all the world, but it is used in war, or what kind of misery is there that is not here? First by war springeth dearth and scarcity of all things. For the ways be stopped, the torn trodden down, towns set on fire, victual destroyed and wasted, all occupations and merchandise cease, both rich and poor decayeth. In war the most valiant soonest destroyed, the towards they retire and save themselves, whilst greater afterclaps do fall upon them. The most vile ruffians most advanced, which abuse men more like beasts than other. All is full of mourning on every side. Widows bewail, fatherless children lament and be destitute. Great riches provided for need to come, clean spoiled. Whole cities set afire, virgins and unmarred maidens defiled. All shame, all honesty set aside. No reverence to age, all manner of right, all manner of right, all laws unregarded. All holy religion and studies clean underfoot. Vile vagabonds and desperate dravels rule all the toast, and therefore in Scripture war is called the scourge of God. This scourge doth God lightly infer upon incurable and obstinate despisers of his word. For this cause was the city of Jerusalem subverted with all the whole nation of the Jews. For as the Lord saith, they did not know the day of their visitation, but rather they did shed the blood of the Lord's apostles, so bringing upon their own heads all the blood shed from first Abel the just unto Zechariah. The Canaanites for murder, idolatry, incest, and for abominable lechery were utterly devastated. The Moabites, as Isaiah saith, perished for their cruelty in clemency and proud despisings of the poor. The Ninevites did infest other nations with unjust wars. 
wherefore they were served in like measure. Again, of other countries, as we read in the prophet Nahum, Micah, in the sixth chapter, declareth that God sendeth war to the unjust for their avarice and fraud using. In Jeremiah, arrogancy and pride. In Isaiah, riotousness, excess and drunkenness are noted to be the causes of war. Furthermore, the incommodities of war do cleave so hard to realms and public wheels that they cannot afterwards be removed or shaken off when we would, neither by human policy, nor leagues, nor riches, nor defense, strength, nor power, as we may see in Obadiah. Only the sincere and hearty conversion to God remedies this, as Jeremiah, in the fifth chapter, do testify. This true conversion to God standeth first in the confession and knowledge of our own wickedness, then in a severe faith to have remission of our sins by grace and merit of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, in a perfect hatred and renouncing of cure former iniquity, in study of justice, innocency, charity, and all other virtues, finally in continual prayer and oration. Again, to some a man shall see war bringeth much profit, utility, and innumerable riches, with no damage or little at all. Such was the battle of the Israelites against the Canaanites, Joshua being their captain. I would not hear the commodities of war should allure any from justice and equity, for so many times it happeneth that while magistrates think to have a just occasion to war against other and to punish offenders, God, of his privy justice, returneth the same occasion upon themselves in provoking them, whereby their sins may be punished of them whom they intend to persecute. Examples we have manifest in scriptures. The eleven tribes of Israel proclaimed most just war against the Benjaminites, thinking to revenge the wicked fact committed by certain lewd lossels, with which lossels the whole tribe took part, communicating with their ungraciousness. Yet were they put to the worst and foiled of the wicked sort. The Israelites went about to expel the violence of the idolatrous Philistines under Eli, their priest. Yet were they overthrown in battle and the ark of God carried away into the cities of idolaters. So the good king Josiah was slain of the Chaldeans, because the intent of God was to scourge the people with such evils which he would not the good king to behold nothing so deserving. Whereupon this note is to be learnt, that the verity of religion goeth not by the victory of any nations, or by overthrow, as though the religion were the better, whose part had the upper hand, and the worst religion, whose part had the worst. For religion always must be sequestered from the person and respect of men, which for diverse causes be diversely visited of the Lord. All these things admonish us. The magistrates had need of much and great fear of God in taking up or in laying down their wars, lest perchance in flying the smoke they fall into the fire, or, while they study to eschew one harm by eschewing thereof, to purchase to themselves many more and greater. Wherefore it is requisite that princes first before all things do thoroughly consider the causes of their wars, now there be many causes and sundry, but this likely the greatest. For other the magistrate is enforced, seeing his holds and muniments in his realm to be invaded with siege, then he must needs help and repulse his enemy. For it were too much unfaithfulness to forsake so disloyally his cities and fortress in such extreme peril. Or else the magistrate, by reason of his office, is constrained to attempt war against uncurable persons, whom the sentence of the Lord doth condemn, and biddeth to beat down utterly without all pity. So as Moses did war against the Midianites, Saul against the Amalekites, of this manner be all such kinds of war, wherewith men be oppressed, which by the uncurable malice of theirs will needs perish, and make others perish with them also, which reject all justice and equity, all set on mischief, and so stubbornly continue." Such were the Benjaminites, when they were destroyed with sword and fire. Such be nowadays these obstinate and seditious traitors, troublers of public society, as was on Absalom and Seba the son of Borcas, which be mentioned in the second book of Samuel. Here too appertain also such wars achieved against idolaters and oppressors of Catholic faith, for true religion's sake. They be in a wrong dream, which think no war to be attempted for religion." The Lord restrained Peter striking with the sword. 
Truth, I grant, he restrained him as an apostle. He forbade not the magistrate the oversight of religion, but that he might defend the verity of our faith. If the magistrates may lawfully defend viler things as liberty, goods, bodily honesty, and life, etc., how much more may he defend greater things, yea, which be the greatest things of all? For what can be greater than true religion? Upon this we have an express commandment of the Lord in Deuteronomy. For the Lord commandeth the city under what magistrate soever he be, which defileth from God and his worship, to let upon with war and utterly to be subverted if it be stubborn. Now if the magistrate so be commanded to war against them that do deceiver from him, verily then it is not unlawful to rescue the church by war, in case any barbarous prince come upon it with open war, to seduce it from true religion to error. Joshua went about to expunge the Reubenites only for an altar erected against the word of God. Judas Maccabeus doth fight for the people of God against the Gentiles and King Antiochus, his soldiers, whose purpose was to vanquish the Jews' religion, which then was only true, and to place in the stead of it superstitious Gentilite. So Paul doth commend the captains, which through faith withstood the incursions of foreign enemies, and Paul himself had a conflict in Cyprus against Elymas, a false prophet, whom he also stroke with blindness, and his reason followeth that he did it for religion's sake. Wilt thou not cease, saith he, to subvert the straight ways of the Lord? Against the same Paul there were fourteen men conspired, which thought that if he were taken out of the way, a great part of Christ's religion were abolished, and their judicial religion set up again. But Paul here playeth not the sheep, nor turneth not the other cheek to them, but was earnest and solicitous to ask his defence, and that not of a Christian magistrate, but a Roman centurion. Neither showed he himself anything grieved thereat, when seventy horsemen and four hundred footmen were prepared for him in battle array to conduct him from Jerusalem to Antipadria. Thus was Paul the elect vessel preserved by an armed garrison of Roman soldiers. Concerning the Armenians, suffering great violence of Maximinus the emperor, Eusebius so writeth in his ecclesiastical history. Here there is a lacuna in the text. The Armenians, saith he, here there is a lacuna in the text. A people kind and friendly to the people of Rome, what time they should be constrained of Maximinus the emperor to change the state of Christian religion to the which they were all given to, into worshipping of idols, and to venerate devils for God, being his. Here there is a lacuna in the text. Before waxed his great enemies, and of their own accord took upon them with open might of war to withstand his wicked constrainment, and so kept him hard. This saith Eusebius, therefore the magistrates may lawfully defend their subjects and true religion against idolaters. Or else another cause is which is much like, some foreign and barbarous adversary doth fly upon thy subjects, doth spoil them, and invadeth them, as the cruel wolves do the sheep, when not only thou hast not provoked them with any injuries, but moreover hast offered them right reasonable conditions of peace, then ought the magistrate to stir it like a lion to preserve his people against the assaults of such malicious murderers. Example we have of Moses fighting against the kings of the Amorites, Aradius, Sion, and Og. Example we have of King Jehoshaphat fighting against the Ammonites and inhabitants of Mount Seir, Example we have also in David, resisting against the Scythians, coming upon him with war. Fourthly, it is lawful for the magistrate to fight in the defense of his confederate friends and aiders, for why may not a magistrate be at confederacy and league with other nations, so it be not in matters against the word of God, in case they be justly oppressed with violence? So did Joshua deliver the Gibeonites from siege, and Saul the Cistans of Jabesh-Gilead, warring against Naash, a prince of great tyranny, for which causes wars may lawfully be attempted of magistrates and princes, and the soldiers do well, which herein obey their powers, yea, and die gloriously and in a good state, and in so dying for religion, for God's law, for their country, their wives and children. Therefore all such as enter into war and travail in the same must not set their eye either upon filthy lucre, nor voluptuousness, as they lightly do when jeopardy is past, but justice, peace, public tranquillity, and the defense of truth and innocency must be all their mark that they shoot at, so that the wicked sort being conquered, the victory got, and their enemies either repulsed or destroyed, true religion may flourish in judgment and equity, 
the church may flourish, divine laws, right institutes and ecclesiastic ordinances may flourish, studies and good arts may prosper, the poor may be seen to, the widows and succorless children may be helped, that men may live in rest, may serve and praise God, both aged persons, chaste maidens and honest matrons. To this mark ought all our eyes, both of mind and body, to be directed. These things had our valiant forefathers in their sight whensoever they made any war against the wicked for their ecclesiastic and public right, as Abraham, Moses, Joshua, David, and other noble captains, also our progenitors before us, to whom, and to all such other valiant soldiers, perpetual fame and lord ought to be given in the congregation of saints. But to the other towards and sluggish soldiers, wicked, covetous, blasphemers, riotous, and light ruffians, and betrayers, which by their sluggishness, riot, lechery, and impiety destroy many noble realms nowadays, and many flourishing cities, to such be continual rebuke, and God himself hath cursed such wicked caitiffs for ever. Therefore no war is lawful except it be against our adversaries and misordered rebellers. Unjust wars be such as be made against our own fellows, or men fattles, or in whom we see hope of amendment. Also unjust wars be they, which be not inferred after a due manner, or for any urgent cause. All manner of ways ought to be assayed trust before we come to war. You must not seek to take in other men's bonds or limits nothing pertaining to your right. You must not oppress the liberties of other nations, neither yet of your own. Such effects, which seduce the mind, are not here to be followed as greediness of dominion, avarice, desire of bribes, envy, or any such other like to these. War is a remedy but dangerous, a help but pernicious, much like to the cutting off of members, in case thy hand be on fire, and so thy arm be in danger to be burnt, and afterwards the whole man likewise. Yet dost thou not cut away thy hand straightways, unless thou see, prolonging all manner of ways, no other help to be. So neither is war to be set upon, but where there is no other remedy. So yet that princes remember, they do nothing which after will be too late. For just wars be not repugning to God's word, insomuch that it describeth to us the laws of warfare and ministereth to us many goodly examples of wars of wise and worthy captains. In Deuteronomy 20 we have laws of wars profitable and necessary, so clear that they need no exposition. Many other common rules also we may gather out of Scripture, as this principally and above all things let religion be observed in the camp. Just laws, no less, ought to be kept in the midst of wars, as in the midst of cities, the soldiers let them keep them in due order, with all honesty, justice, and holiness. For this proverb is of the devil, not of God, that some do say, In der arma enim silent leges. Laws keep silence in war. The chief captain generally let him be chosen a godly man, just, holy, valiant, sapient, and lucky, as was Joshua, David, Judas, Maccabeus, Constantinus, Theodosius, Maskelsa, and many other. Let there be appointed to him an army of tried men, for in choosing of soldiers great circumspection is to be had, that they be not a company of weaklings, unskillful warriors, unfaithful blasphemers, wicked wretches, drunken gluttons, and beastly bellies. Victory goeth not by the multitude of men, but by the grace of God and by godly soldiers. It is an old proverb, where is a multitude, there is confusion. Great and innumerable hosts do but cumber and destroy themselves. Experience and examples of the old time teach this sufficiently. Again, such warriors as will take no pain to be lukish lovers be greatly to be discommended. Therefore, let ever a Christian warrior be doing something, let him be courageous, faithful, painful, obedient to his captain, must never let slip occasion well practised in the fates of war, not tender but hard, not cruel and fierce, but grave and gentle according as time doth serve. The thing that may be saved let him not destroy, but above all other, especially let him not forget continually to pray unto God, both in jeopardy and out of jeopardy. Let him begin all things in the Lord, and without the Lord let him attempt nothing. In misfortune he must not be discouraged, in prosperous success let him not be exalted, but give thanks to God, and use his victory with mercy. Let his victory only stand in God, and not in himself. Let him seek for nothing more than for defense of his country, of laws, of religion, of justice, and of innocence. Some here will marvel, I dare say, that I require these things of soldiers, which are wont in times past, to be required of religious and professed men. As those soldiers were not also religious and professed to Christ, 
or as though only they may be profane and wicked, as indeed many of them be. But what fruits, I pray you, come of this side, we be overcome of Turks, we be a mocking stock to all nations, whole kingdoms perish and be subdued to Muhammad's law, and we be daily entangled in great perplexities, what manner of soldiers in time past were chosen to war out of the church of Christians, it appeareth by one memorable history of Tertullianus writing thus to Scapula. Marcus Aurelius, also warring in Germany, through the prayers of Christian soldiers made to God, obtained rain in great drought. And what droughts can any man say, but were stopped through our prayers and fastings? Then they also which cried to their great God, in the name of Jupiter, did give testimony to our God. Thus much saith Tertullian. The same history doth Eusebius also more largely express in his Ecclesiastic, Book 5, Chapter 5, saying, It chanced, saith he, Marcus Aurelius, the brother of Antonius the Emperor, had war with the Germans, and Sermitans, the story witness, that his host was in great danger for drought and dryness, and as he was consulting and seeking what to be done, he found certain Christian soldiers in the camp, which when they kneeled down, as our fashion is, and prayed to God, Suddenly, against all expectation, rain poured down. Their thirst was quenched, their enemies driven away with lightning and fire. This same story is also written in the monuments of the Gentiles, but that it came by the prayers of Christians they make no mention thereof, as which give little credence to all other miracles of Christian men, Tertullian so doth write it plainly to come by them. So doth Apollinarius also a Greek which saith, moreover, that the same army for the great miracle showed in it was called of the lightning Fulminia by the emperor himself. Tertullianus addeth, moreover, that the epistle of Marcus the emperor was a brood, where in this miracle is signified more evidently. Thus much hath Eusebius, whereby we may see how Christian soldiers in time past not only were all bent to prayer, but also full of all justice and holiness of life. It is evident that St. James saith, The prayer of the just doth much avail. Elijah was a man as we be, and he prayed, and by the heaven gave rain, and the earth gave his fruit. Wherefore it is manifest that the old soldiers then were religious and devout men, but our soldiers, because they be far from all religion, yea, enemies to true religion, therefore instead of victories they bring away overthrows both of men and cities. And so the citizens be well and worthily served, for that they put their confidence in such wicked warriors, which is even as much as if they should put their confidence in very devils, whom these almost exceed in all filthiness, cruelness, and all wicked arts. Examples of holy and just war, of holy and just captains, we have abundant in the word of God, and almost innumerable. Abraham, our predecessor, armed with a small host, doth set upon four the most mighty kings, or robbers of all the world, doth overthrow them and drive them away, restoreth his own men with their goods, giving thanks to God, the author of such an incredible victory. Moses with Joshua doth throw down about thirty and nine kings, doth punish wickedness sharply, do place their people in their land promised of God. The judges of Israelites did keep worthy wars against the ethnics and infidels, and in them did assuage the tyranny of the wicked, with which tyranny they oppressed the children of God, and restored the people to their liberty and religion. Here cometh also Samuel, a worthy prophet, amongst the noble captains of God's people. Jonathan, the son of Saul, was a noble captain, a notable example of godliness. Who was ever a more excellent captain than David? He conquered the Philistines, the Ammonites, and the Syrians, and a great part of the East with his wars, both revenging injuries, restoring again liberty, and putting away innumerable evils from the people of God. And yet, he that did all this is called a man after God's own heart, yea, and the father of our Lord Jesus Christ after the flesh. In the posterity of David ye shall find notable warriors and singular captains, Abias, Asas, Jehoshaphat, Amaziah, Josiah, Hezekiah, and many others. Judas Maccabeus, amongst all other, is not the unworthiest, which stood so valiantly for the laws of God, for God's religion, and for the people's right, and at length was slain in Asia for the religion and the people of God. It needeth not to add here to the examples of Constantinus, Gratianus, Theodosius, and other pure saint princes. Of these, and such other, St. Augustine in his book, De Civitate Dei, book 5, hath written abundantly, and Orosius likewise in his history, 51.7, from the 28th chapter unto the end.
This I think sufficient for good magistrates. Thus far I have entreated of war, how magistrates ought to use themselves, and concerning the use of the sword, whereof also I have spoken somewhat in my sermon upon the fifth commandment. These things being thus concluded, now we will discuss whether it be lawful for Christians to bear office or not, and especially for the occasion of certain furious Anabaptists and new devisers of new-found commonwealths, which all egg against us that it is not lawful for Christians to be magistrates, because Christians do not contend in the market, neither do kill any man, neither seek any their goods taken away, neither revenge their annuities. And although these places of theirs be answered unto sufficiently, yet I bring here succinctly certain arguments whereby a politic and Christian man against the furious dreams of the Anabaptists may understand, if he be called to office, that he may and ought to serve God well in keeping and well using his office. For whereas they feign no manner of defense to be lawful by the gospel, they be far deceived, for the verity saith otherwise. For what things soever be ordained of God to the health and safety of man, they be so seeming to a Christian man using them well and applying himself thereafter, that if he refuse them he is no true Christian. For the greatest charge of a Christian is to set forward with all industry the safeguard and wealth of men. Now the magistrate is ordained of no man but of God himself to the safeguard and protection of men. As expressly it is witnessed by the prophets and apostles, and Paul especially, and Romanus, chapter 13, Whoso doth not see, then, but a Christian may laudably bear the office of a magistrate. Furthermore, no man will deny, I think, that belongeth to every Christian man, to declare his faith not only with words, but with the works of justice and mercy, to see for the public peace and tranquillity, to follow justice and equity, to defend widows, the fatherless, and expressed. Neither ought he to neglect occasion, place, or any such means, whereby he may exercise such benefits upon his brethren. Therefore it is not unknown that a Christian may be a magistrate, for the office of a magistrate is to execute judgment and justice, and to maintain public peace. For it is out of doubt, and proved before that Moses, Samuel, Joshua, and David, and other more, are not to be excluded from the name of Christians, that seeing they were magistrates, why may not Christian men as well nowadays bear office? In the New Testament many noble men be commended, which were in rule and authority, Neither yet did they renounce their office because of religion. Of Joseph of Arimathea, thus we read in Luke, Behold, there was a man called Joseph, a centurion, St. Mark saith a senator, a good man and just, and he consented not to their counsel and doings, born in Arimathea, a city of the Jews, which also did look for the kingdom of God. Note here what a great commendation is given him. Joseph is a centurion, or a senator, and that an honest senator, he did sit in the council house and amongst these judges which condemned Christ, but because he consented not with them, he is excused guiltless from the blood. The same also is notified to be a good man and just in the number of them which looked for the kingdom of God, that is, in the number of Christians. And for all this was he yet a centurion or a senator and dwelled in the city of Jerusalem. A Christian, therefore, lawfully may bear office. Here, too, may be brought examples of the Queen's Chamberlain of Ethiopia, Actum 8 of Cornelius the Centurion, Actum 10, of Erastus the Warden, or Steward of the city of Corinth, Romans 16 to Timothy 4. But I would, the Anabaptists, would prove that, with Scripture, which they object, that these being converted after did lay down their robe and sword, for we have proved it before by St. Augustine's word upon the answer of John Baptist to the soldiers, which was also a Christian preacher, that after they were baptized, yet notwithstanding, were not deposed from their office, neither had any such commandment of John to forsake their warfare. And other objection they have, because the Lord did withdraw himself, what time the people intended to make him king, which thing he would not have done but to give example to all Christians of humility and to command in a manner never to suffer any public administration to be put upon them. To this they add the sayings of the gospel, My kingdom is not of this world. Item, the kings of the earth reign over them, but you do not so. Truth it is, the Lord avoided the people. But how following the way that was not right? neither intending to do the will of God, but blinded with carnal effects, and seeking such things as were pertaining to belly cheer. For because he fed them wonderfully, therefore they thought him a meat king for their purpose, which could feed his subjects with much fare and no cost. 
Besides this, our Lord came not to bear rule in earth after the fashion of this world as the Jews imagined, thinking that Messiah should come like Solomon, here to reign, and as Pilate feared. Therefore said the Lord, Well, my kingdom is not of this world, for he ascended up to heaven, sitteth on the right hand of the Father, having all kings subjected to him, and all the world, in the which now he reigneth by his word and spirit, which also he shall come to judge at the last day. And although Christ denieth his kingdom to be of this world, yet he never denied but that kings and princes of the world should come into his church, in the which they should serve the Lord not only as men but as kings and princes. For kings cannot serve the Lord as kings, otherwise than by exercising that wherefore they be made kings. And unless Christian kings might remain in their office and govern kingdoms after their rule and laws of Christ, how could Christ be called the King of kings and Lord of lords? Therefore... Where the Lord said, The kings of the earth do reign over them, but you do not so. He spake this only to his apostles, striving for superiority, as though he would say, Princes ranging in the world be not put down from their thrones and seats by my doctrine. Another objection they have, because the Lord did withdraw himself, for my doctrine doth not abolish policy, office, nor magistrate in the world or in the church. The magistrate shall reign, but you not so, you shall not reign. Ye shall be not princes, but teachers of the world and servants of the church. Thus in few words have we answered to the objections of the Anabaptists, which we have confuted also in other places. Hitherto I think it sufficiently declared that a Christian man not only may, but ought also to bear rule and office, if it be rightfully offered unto him. But before we knit up this disputation, we will touch now briefly what is the office of subjects, what every one oweth to his magistrate. First, it is the part of subjects to have a reverent and honorable estimation of their princes and powers, and so to reverence them as God's messengers and ministers, also outwardly to exhibit such homage unto them as every man's country requireth. It is a foul thing if subjects unreverently should behave themselves to their magistrates, but a false and a light opinion once conceived of anything, doth soon bring a contempt of the same. Therefore here be to be gathered certain open testimonies of the scripture, whereby to engender into every man's mind a due estimation and reverence towards his magistrate. Here now all princes and superstitious must take heed, lest through their unseemable and dissolute life they bring themselves into contempt, and so by their own default lose all their authority amongst the people. Truly God himself disdaineth not to call princes and rulers by his own proper name, even gods. The places be Exodus 21 and Psalm 82. The apostles called them the messengers and ministers of God. The places be Romans 13, 1 Peter 2. Who will not magnify with all reverence gods and God's ministers, through whom he worketh salvation to the people. He that rejecteth the messenger rejecteth him which sent him. Whoso honoureth the messenger, seemeth to bestow his honour most upon the sender. Also saith Solomon, Proverbs 16, Divination is in the lips of the king, therefore his heart doth not transgress. And Ecclesiastes 8, It is my part to observe the commandment of the king, and to have regard to the oath of God. Item, Proverbs 24, My child, fear God, and fear thy king, and keep no resort with these slanderers. For their perdition shall rise quickly. St. Paul likewise, Whosoever saith he resisteth the higher powers, resisteth God's ordination, and they which shall resist that shall receive to themselves judgment. Concerning this matter I have entreated also upon the fifth commandment. Then let the subjects pray for the princes and magistrates, that God may grant them sapience, prudence, fortitude, temperance, justice, due severity, meekness, and other virtues, to lead them in his ways and preserve them from all evil, that we may live peaceably and honestly in this world. This doth St. Paul require of his subjects, 1 Timothy 2 and Jeremiah 29. Many be slothful and negligent in this part, and that maketh them some time to be pinched, and feel that they would not, and worthily, for if they would do their duty in praying for their magistrates earnestly, they should have better. In the old church, what a fervent study they had to pray for their magistrate, the words of Tertullianus, in his Apology, chapter 30, doth well declare, saying, Let us pray always for all rulers and kings and emperors, that they may have long life, a quiet reign, a safe house, valiant soldiers, faithful counsellors, honest subjects, a peaceable world, and whatsoever man or emperor or king would have obtained. Subjects also ought to obey the laws of magistrates, if they be good and equal, 
and so to obey them, that it be with all holy reverence and hearty religion, as obeying not the laws of men, but of God's ministers. For Peter biddeth us be obedient for the Lord. And Paul saith, subjects must be obedient not only for displeasure, but also for conscience' sake. That is, we must obey our magistrates not only for fear, lest we be punished for contempt and disobedience, but lest we sin against God and our own conscience condemn us. We declared before in the fifth commandment, by diverse testimonies and examples of scripture, that we be not bound to obey the commandment of magistrates in things unlawful and against the word of God. The apostles and Christians of the primitive church, who would rather be imprisoned, banished, spoiled, devoured of beasts, slain with sword, burnt with fire, and hanged, than to obey wicked and unlawful commandments. The blessed martyr and bishop Polycarpus, answering to the under-consul of Rome, said, Our doctrine is, saith he, to princes and powers, such as be of God, to give honour, such honour as is not contrary to the rule of our religion. And John Chrysostom to Gainham said, It is not lawful for an emperor, which is the maintainer of godliness, to attempt anything against the commandments of God. Finally, subjects, let them give to the magistrate tribute, yea, their bodies and life also, when need is, for the defense of their magistrate and country, as I declared in the fifth commandment, the Lord expressly commandeth in the gospel. Give to God those things which are God's, and to the emperor the things which are the emperor's. Whosoever be slack, niggardly, or anything drawing back in this part, they be greatly to be reproved. Tributes be due to the magistrate as the reward of his labor, and as the sinew of public utility and quietness. For what man ever goeth to war upon his own charge and stipend, every man liveth upon his labor, which he sustaineth. The magistrate doth labor, the prince doth labor in governing the commonwealth and keeping peace. He omitteth his own private business at home, whereby else he might provide for himself. Therefore it were against all reason if he should not be maintained with public charges. Also it is requisite that kingdoms and public wheels, be well appointed with sufficient riches to aid them withal in wars, in dearth, in fires, and other calamities, in reparations, or in repelling of greater dangers. Here I speak nothing now of public buildings as of keeping up the walls, fortresses, trenches, ditches, havens, brigs, byways, fountains, conduits, the court hall, the marketplace, with many other. There be also public officers of justice, as sergeants, herods of armies, watchmen, and diverse such more, where, as if money be not present, how can any kingdom and commonwealth stand long? Therefore they which deny tribute deny the due stipend of men's labor, yea, and seek the subversion of the commonwealth. They which be slack and unlustful in public labors and works do sin not against one ruler, but against the whole body of the commonality. And commonly it is so seen such listles and lither laborers little to be blessed of God and seldom to thrive. Yet magistrates and princes here must be advertised to love their subjects committed to their faith and tuition, to spare them as gently as they can to bear with them, and not to pinch them with too importunate exactions. This may be done if they will be temperate, and abstain from all superfluous excess and pride. Let a good prince thus consider himself how unequal it is for his court to overflow all, with all excess and superfluity, and all his other cities and subjects to be pinched by the belly at home. Let rulers of realms remember, tributes, taxes, and customs to be public and not private goods. God hateth polars and extortioners, God abhorreth unmeasurable exactions, taxes, or tolls. God doth execrate tyrannies, still piling the people. He doth bless gentle and moderate princes." The just concord of subjects availeth more in peace and out of peace than money unjust, and stronger is the realm with less abundance and more concord betwixt the superiors and inferiors than with infinite treasures where magistrates and subjects do not agree. This is no lie, common experience testifieth the same. Thus much, good audience, have I entreated concerning magistrates upon the occasion of the sixth commandment, Thou shalt not kill, declaring as briefly as I could under your charitable audience, why magistrates be ordained of God, what is their duty to their subjects, what is the duty of subjects to them. Now let us prostrate our supplication to God, that of his clemency he will so grant both to the magistrates and to the subjects, that they may both walk worthy to their vocation. God grant. Amen. End of A Treatise or Sermon of Henry Bullinger Concerning Magistrates and Obedience of Subjects by Henry Bullinger
A Brief Treatise Concerning the Use and Abuse of Dancing by Peter Marta Vermeili. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Brief Tract Concerning Dancing Collected Out of Master Dr. Peter Marta by Master Masonius. Dancing, as Plato saith, is said to be of rejoicing, for that it is a certain testimony of joy and gladness. And Servius interpreted that verse of Virgil, Omnis quam chorus et sosit cominantur ovantes, whom all the company of dancers and fellows followed rejoicing, saith the same to be a singing and leaping of them that are of one age. But from whence this should take it beginning, there are diverse opinions. Some suppose that men, beholding the motion of the fixed and wandering stars, invented this, thereby to represent that variety of the motion. Others think that it rather sprang first of religion, because among the ancient ethnics no sacred things were well nigh done without dancing. And they lead their dancers from the left to the right side of the altar to show the turning of heaven from the east to the west, then return they from the right side to the left, to signify the course of the movable and unmovable stars, which thing peradventure Virgil meant when he said, Instavrantque chorus mixtique altaria circum. They begin to dance afresh one with another round about the altars. Also Salage, the priests of Mars among the Romans, were had in great estimation, and there be that refer the original hereof to Hero Siculus, the tyrant who, as they report to establish his tyranny, forbade the people mutual communication, by means whereof it came to pass that the men of Sicilia began to express their minds and thoughts by becks and gestures of the body, which afterwards grew to an use and custom. But whether this be so or no, dancers in the old time were not estranged from religion, albeit afterwards they were applied to public and common rejoicing. Besides this, there was another kind exercised by young men in martial affairs, for as much as they were commanded to leap and make much gesture and signs of mirth in their hands, to the end they might be readier and apter for battle, when the cause of the commonwealth so required. This manner of dancing was called pyrakia, and because it was used in armour, armed hereof mention is made in the civil laws, that is to say in the digest of punishments, f de poenis el ad damnum. And sometimes young men, when they trespassed, were not forthwith adjudged to die, but either to hunt in the theatre or to dance in their armour, and they were called piricari. Another kind also there was, which was appointed for pleasure only and lavishness, called of the Grecians. Here there is a lacuna in the text. Moreover of them that expressed by the gestures of their bodies the meaning of their minds, writeth Lucianus in his Treaty of Dancing, and likewise Athenius, which came to that pass at length that Demetrius Sinicus, in derision, called this counterfeit dancing a vain thing and nothing worth. Whereupon a worthy dancer, who then was had in honour at Rome, desired him that he would but one only time behold him, and then that he would judge and report whatsoever pleased him. He came to the theatre, the counterfeit began by his gestures to express the common fable of Mars and Venus taken in adultery, wherein in such sort he showed the sun disclosing Vulcan knitting nets, Venus all ashamed and Mars humbly entreating, insomuch as Demetrius astonished cried out, I not only see, O man, the things thou doest, but also hear them, for by thy hands thou seemest to speak unto me. At the same time, as it happened, there appeared to Rome the kings of Pontus, who, when he had seen this dancer play his gestures in the theatre, afterwards willed to demand of Nero the thing he chiefly wished to be bestowed upon him. He asked the gesture, whereat Nero, marvelling, seeing he might have requested other things of much more value, inquired the cause of his request. He made answer, because I have many nations under my subjection, whom without an interpreter I cannot understand, and eft sons it falleth out that interpreters declare not faithfully enough my words unto them, nor again theirs unto me, but this fellow by his gestures will declare all things most faithfully. Plato, in his third book of laws, maketh two manners of dancers, the one warlike, which above we named Pyrrhachia, and other peaceable, which he termeth placible. The unclean and filthy kind I omit to speak of, because it is manifestly condemned by the laws. The exercise in harness, and that which was showed by signs, may serve to some use in the commonwealth, but to our purpose they pertain not. 
Wherefore, of the peaceable and placable sort, shall somewhat be said in this place, how far forth it may be lawful, when for rejoicing's sake it is used. This kind of exercise seemeth to me of its own nature, neither vicious nor to be prohibited, for as much as agility and nimbleness of the body is the gift of God, and if there be added some art that the body be moved with decency, just pace and comeliness, I see not why it ought to be reprehended, so it be done in due season, moderately, and without offence. For as it is lawful to sing and use singings to give thanks to God and celebrate his praises, so likewise moderate dancing to testify our joy and gladness. David, doubtless, danced openly before the ark. The maidens renowned his victory over Goliath with dancing and singing. Miriam, Moses' sister, when Pharaoh was laid along and slain, danced with other women and sang a song of triumph and victory. Wherefore, since holy men and chaste women have used dances, we cannot say they are faulty of their own nature, but as they are nowadays done, that men should dance together with women, they be intolerable, for that they are the nutriments and provocations of lasciviousness and voluptuous pleasures. Miriam, Moses' sister, traced not with young men, but apart with women, neither David with women, nor the maidens who honoured his conquest with young men, but by themselves. Now they, that with all their mind and might love God, it is not enough for them to observe his commandments, unless they cut off also all occasions whereby their observations may be impaired. But our dancers are most evident occasions of transgressing the divine law, Snares they are, and stumbling blocks, not to the doers alone, but to the beholders also, for they stir and inflame the heart of men, wicked enough otherwise from their very beginning, and what with much ado and industry is to be repressed, that the flickering enticements of these light leapings raise and stir up. Verily, if a man would take counsel either of himself or of experience, or of reason, he shall find the luster of the mind not a little to be kindled, and set on fire by these sights, and he shall perceive men with wave of their goodness, and women with eclipse of their chastity return home. Furthermore, perils are rather to be taken heed of than nourished, for as Solomon saith, who loveth peril shall fall thereunto. But some man will object that dancings, insomuch in damaged manners, and kindle lust, cometh to pass by rashness, and by antecedent means, and judgment ought not of everything to be given according to those which come by chance, but according to these things that are here in themselves. Some are found so chaste and pure that they can with a chaste and pure mind see these sights. I grant it may sometimes so fall out, but take this with you, all accidents not to be of the same condition. Some there are which very seldom happen, some either way which of their nature may be as well present at anything as absent, and some which for the most part are wont to fall out. These last in each thing ought to be most diligently considered and regarded, neither must we respect what may, but what was wont to be done. Aristippus danced in purple, and thereof accused, excused himself that thereby he waxed never the worse, and that he could even in the niceness and delicacy retain a philosopher's mind. But such sayings are not to be hearkened unto, because, as Demosthenes saith, and is cited of the lawyers, we must not consider what a man doth now and then, but what is accustomed to be done for the most part. Imagine a man to be so chaste that he may not be moved with these allurements, yet in the meanwhile how are the people provided for, and the multitude seen unto? For the integrity and uprightness of some one or other... Shall we suffer all the rest to remain in danger? But so will some man mutter, Take away sermons and sacraments, For many hear sometime the word of God to their own condemnation, And to their own condemnation may eat and drink the holy mysteries. Here is it necessary to be known that some things make for men's salvation, And are commanded by the word of God, Which by no means ought to be taken away. Some things again are indifferent, Which if we see them tend to hurt, are not tolerable. Concerning sermons and sacraments, we have the law of God that we should hear and receive them. Touching dancing, there is nothing commanded. Wherefore, these are not to be compared together. But by this means, say diverse, are many honest marriages made. It may be so otherwhile, notwithstanding for my part, it could never sink into mine head, that I would wish matrimonies to be by these means contracted, wherein the nimbleness only and beauty of the body are respected. There are other means far honester. Let us use them. And as for these scarce, honest, and chaste, let us leave them. Weigh we with ourselves that although sometime honest marriages be gotten by dancing, yet a great deal oftener adultery and whoredom are wont to ensue of these sights. 
we should follow the footings of our godly fathers, who now and then used dancing, yet chaste and moderate, the men by themselves and the women by themselves. By these dances testified they the mirth of their minds, sang they praises to God, gave they thanks unto him for some singular benefit received at his hands. And as for the confused dances of men and women together, we read them not in the Holy Scripture. But our men will say, Who would dance after this sort? These things, while they utter, they bury themselves what they seek for in this pastime. Hither flock the effects of dancing recorded in Matthew, how the daughter of Herodias skipped in the king's feast. The king took pleasure in her, whom without shame he could not openly gaze upon, for it was a most evident token of the forbidden marriage and whoredom, for Herod had taken unto him the wife of his brother and mother of this damsel. Of that dance it followed that John was beheaded. Many are misgrieved with us, that we cry out upon dances as upon things evil of their nature and prohibited. We again make answer that things ought not always to be measured by their nature, but by the disposition and abuse of our flesh. Wine, we cannot deny of itself, is good. Yet is it not administered to the sick of the fever, not in that it is evil. Yet is it not administered to the sick of the fever, not in that it is evil, but in that it agreeeth not with the body so affected. In Exodus, when the people made to themselves a golden calf, which they might worship, they sat down, they ate and drank, and they rose up to play, in which place to play seemeth to be nothing else than to dance. But that I may not seem singular and alone in these my sayings and censure, I will annex certain testimonies of the forefathers. Augustine, in the sixth chapter of his book against Petillion, saith, Bishops were evermore wont to punish vain and lascivious dancers, but nowadays there be many bishops not only present at the dances, but dances themselves with women, so far are they from correcting this vice. The same Augustine, while he expoundeth those words of the thirty-second psalm, upon an instrument of ten strings, I will sing unto thee, those ten strings he maketh the ten commandments, and when he had said somewhat upon every one of them, at the last he cometh to the Sabbath, of which it is written, Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. I say not, saith he, that thou shouldst be so drowned in delicacy, as the Jews are accustomed, for better it is all day long to dig than to dance on the Sabbath. Chrysostom in the 56th homily upon Genesis, in treating of Jacob's marriage, marriage, quoth he, have ye heard, but no dancing, which there he calleth diabolical, and many more matters hath he in the same place, which make for us. And among all the rest, he writeth how by dancing the bride and bridegroom are corrupted, and the whole family defiled. Again, in his 48th homily, thou seest, saith he, marriages, but dances thou seest not. For at that time they were nothing so wanton as they are in these days. Diverse other things hath he in the 14th of Matthew, where reciting Herodias dancing to the people, among the rest, he saith, nowadays Christians deliver not half their kingdom, nor another man's head, but their own soul into destruction. And he addeth, where this lascivious dancing is set up, there danceth the devil together with them. In the council of Laodicea we find written that it is not convenient for Christian men to dance at marriages. Let them dine and sup discreetly and moderately, giving God thanks for the benefit of matrimony. In the selfsame council it is also written, Let not clerks approach the theatre, or matiages to gape after pageants. They may be at marriages, but after the singers and harpers be come in, who serve for dances, arise they and depart, lest by their presence they may seem to allow and approve that wantonness. In the Council of Illidan, holden under Symmachus and Hormista, Popes and King Theodoric, the same is decreed that Christians should not dance at weddings. In the Council of Aristoran, which was under Pope Deus Deat, this seemeth to be restrained to clerks, for there is there a proviso that no clerks might in the feast either sing or dance, as if to others it were after a sort lawful. Of the same opinion are the schoolmen of the divines in the third sentences, Distinction 37, who refer these restraints unto the holy days. Richard of the middle village accounteth it a most grievous sin to dance on the holy days, as though on other days it might be permitted. But far weightier is the judgment of the fathers and sound counsels than these men's, who hurtfully set at large those things which are to be kept in, seeing they have with them the hazard of souls, and not the hazard only, but the slidings and falls most grievously to be lamented. And yet these men seem to borrow this their sentence, whereby they deny dancing on the holiest days of the civil laws, in the code forsooth, in the title of holy days and law holy days. See, tit deferius el dies festus. 
We let at liberty vacation on the holy days, but we will that men be restrained from inordinate delectations, and therefore it shall not be lawful on the holy days to use dancings, whether they be sensual or prepared for sensuality. Aemilius Probus, in the life of Epaminondas, saith that singing and dancing among the Romans were smallly regarded, when among the Grecians they were had in great estimation. Salust, in his Catalinaria, weigheth that Sempronia, a certain lewd and lascivious woman, was trimlier trained up in singing and dancing than beseemed an honest matron, and in the same place he calleth these two instruments of excess in carnal pleasure. Cicero, in the third book of his offices, is of this mind that an honest and virtuous man will not dance in the common concourse of people, though he might thereby become the greatest heir in the world. And in his oration, which he made after his return to the Senate, he termed in reproach Aulus Gabinus, his adversary, O Trixi Dancer. It was laid in Lutius Morena, his dish as a fault, that he danced in Asia. With the same also was King Deotarus hit in the teeth. Cicero, for Marina, answers that no sober person danceth either in solitariness, either in an honest and moderate banquet, except he be out of his wits. The same Cicero, in his Philip, among other vices, upbraided Antonius with dancing. It appeareth furthermore that the men of the East and West were not of like disposition, they being of a merry mind and nimble bodies, so much the more delight in dancing. For, to let others pass, David danced in open sight. And they which now travel to us out of Syria testify the Christians which inhabit those regions upon the day of the Lord's resurrection and likewise upon other famous festivals come to the church with harps and harmony, singing psalms and dancing together. For those spirits of the people are quick and quiver, for the spirits of our countrymen are heavy and lumpish, yet for all that they report that they dance discreetly and modestly, the men and women one from another. Finis. End of a brief treatise concerning the use and abuse of dancing by Peter Marta Vermili. A treatise, How, by the Word of God, Christian Men's Alms Ought to be Distributed, by Martin Busa. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Matthew 6. When thou givest thine alms, let not the trumpets be blown before thee, as hypocrites do in their synagogues and streets, to have praise of men. To the reader, because in these days, like as not many years since, many lusty and sturdy persons be suffered to beg, men counterfeiting horrible diseases and infirmities sit by the common ways craving alms, Diverse go about Westminster Hall and other places with gloves under pretense to gather for the marriage of poor maidens, but indeed to have wherewith to couple with harlots or to riot at dice, and some crafty hypocrites, no friars in coats but more subtle than friars in manners, under colour to relieve and maintain orphans, poor widows, poor scholars, and other, gather much but put all into their own purses, or bestow little, and that after their own fantasy, and not indifferently to every one as his need requireth, and God's word prescribeth. And so by all these means and many other good men's charities be utterly abused. I thought it very necessary to set forth in English the mind and opinion of the reverend father and excellent clerk, Master Martin Busa, touching the right giving and distribution of alms, and provision for the poor, declared in his book entitled De Regno Christi, made for the most blessed King Edward, which, if good people will follow, no doubt but all these kind of subtle thieves shall be forced to give over their occupation, and hypocrisy itself will shortly lose one of the principal feathers of her wing. And if they will not, let them take heed that, whilst they go about with their painted charity to get a little vainglory, they purchase themselves at length by maintaining the lewd, everlasting damnation. But I have a good hope that many err by ignorance, who, being rightly instructed, will show themselves conformable to God's will, and do as he commandeth, whereby they may find at length his merciful favour. Farewell. The Order of the Provision for the Poor Almighty God, that setteth up the humble, and pulleth down the proud, that giveth riches, and taketh it away, plainly commandeth his people, that they should not suffer any to lack among them which commandment, 
the primitive church of Christ at Jerusalem kept with all reverence and devotion, whereby was such abundance of alms given by good men as relieved every man's necessity, and so among them there was not one that was not provided for. Afterward, that this provision and gathering for the poor might be the better looked unto and continue, the apostles, inspired with the Holy Ghost by consent of the whole congregation, appointed to that ministry seven men of honest report and fame, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom on whom they laid their hands for a sign of their admission. And so this ordinance and provision for the poor was very devoutly observed, till Antichrist, with his floods of wickedness, overflowed the Church of Christ. Those that were called to that holy ministry were named the deacons of the church, who, albeit they ought to be assistant to the elders of the congregation in the conservation and execution of the discipline of Christ and the administration of the sacraments, yet their chief office and duty was to keep the names of the poor in the congregation of the Christians, to know every man's life and behavior, and the common arms of the faithful to distribute to every one as much as was sufficient for his necessary relief. For those that may get their living by their labor and travail, and will not, ought to be put out of the church. He that do thee not labor, let him not eat, saith the apostle. Since then it is the commandment of God to relieve the poor and needy, and to see that none lack. All such as mind fully to receive the kingdom of Christ, ought to labor earnestly that this ordinance be restored into Christ's church. For those that have the goods of the world, and see their brethren lack, and have not compassion on them, The love of good doth not dwell in them, and so also neither the kingdom of Christ is in them. And all those that hear Christ and the Holy Ghost will endeavor and labor to ordain and do all good things in such order and manner as they know the Lord and the Holy Ghost hath appointed. And since it is manifest that God earnestly forbade that his people should suffer any to beg among them, and that his goodness also ordained that the poor should be looked unto by certain chosen men in the church, and that good men's devotions should be distributed to every needy person as his necessity requireth. It is without all doubt that all those pray without devotion, let thy kingdom come, which to their power do not bestow all their endeavor, that this manner of providing for the poor be restored into the church, which the Lord himself commanded and the Holy Ghost in the primitive church ordained. By the which means it shall be prevented that these wicked begging houses and subtlety of hypocrites shall not take from the needy members of Christ the alms that is due to them, nor ambition of man's praise and thanks, nor vainglory shall defile the right office of alms, which evil, how much it ought to be eschewed, Christ very plainly taught, when he commanded, so to give alms, as the left hand may not know what the right hand doth. This may best be done if every man put into the common chest or box of the church to the use of the poor, as much as he may spare of that God giveth him. For when every man himself will distribute his own alms, first the institution of the Holy Ghost and the lawful communion, company, and fellowship of saints is broken. Besides, the alms due to the little ones of Christ, and so to Christ himself, is given oftener to the unworthy than to the worthy, for every man cannot know and try such poor people as he meeteth suddenly, and also such as be not meet to have alms, come better instructed to beg, yea, as it were, to wring out the alms of a man's purse with painted words, than those to whom it only ought to be given. Moreover, when a man giveth alms with his own hand, he doth hardly put out of his mind the desire of men's thanks and vain praises, which vain reward, when he receiveth of men, he may not seek for the true and perfect reward of God. And finally, when it is most certain that such as give themselves willfully to the trade of begging, be given and bent to all mischief. What other things do they that nourish them than maintain and increase the greatest pestilences and destructions of a commonwealth? Wherefore, all such as have wisely written how commonwealths should be well governed have thought that such persons were not to be suffered in a commonwealth, and certainly men ought to be ashamed and lament when this right manner of provision for the poor is restored in many countries which yet be under Antichrist, such as vaunt they have received the gospel of Christ and profess to be of his kingdom, be slack to restore it, yea, be hinderers of it, seeing it is an ordinance of Christ's religion so necessary and so wholesome. To conclude, whosoever doth not carefully endeavor as much as he may to restore this holy ordinance of the provision for the poor as the Lord hath commanded and the Holy Ghost ordained, 
he doth plainly bear witness of himself that he doth not indeed know nor perfectly desire Christ and his kingdom, how much soever in words he boasts of Christ and his kingdom. The means to restore into the church the right kind of giving and distribution of alms and provision for the poor. It is most requisite that all magistrates and governors that desire the promotion of the kingdom of Christ and the wealth of those they govern do procure that this godly provision for the poor and needy be restored, even as the Holy Ghost hath set forth unto us in the second, fourth, fifth, and sixth of the Acts of the Apostles. For without it there can be no true fellowship or communion of saints. This may be done after this sort, first that every church have his deacons for the provision and oversight of the poor, as before is said, men of good report and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, and so many of them as the multitude of the people and of the poor shall require. Their office is contained in these points. First, they ought to make diligent search how many poor indeed be in every congregation that ought to be provided for by the congregation. For it belongeth to all congregations of Christ, not only not to maintain lewd persons in their wicked idleness, but also to banish them their company, who, when they may by their own honest labor maintain themselves, will not labor, but live inordinately consuming the sustenance that is due to the needy and poor of Christ. And against such persons this rule is to be kept, he that laboreth not, let him not eat. That commandment also of the Holy Ghost touching widows ought to be expounded also of all needy. If there be any faithful man or woman, saith the Holy Ghost, that hath widows, let him provide and minister unto them, and let not the congregation be burdened, that they which are right widows may have enough. So likewise those that have any needy under them, whether they be their kinsfolks, servants, or otherwise joined to them by any special cause, ought to minister to such persons necessaries for their livings, if they be able to do it, and to spare the congregation, as it may be the better able to maintain and keep those that have no kinsfolks, masters, or friends that will or can provide for them. All men's minds ought to be moved with this fearful judgment of the Holy Ghost. If there be any man that doth not provide for his own, and specially for them of his own household, the same hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. For unto those that God hath by any special means joined together, this the second principal commandment, wherein all the law is contained and fulfilled, doth chiefly belong, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. For those whom God coupleth and joineth together by the band of kindred, affinity, household, or any other particular means, he maketh them thereby above all other neighbors. 1. The first point, then, of the office of the deacons of the poor is that they make diligent search, who lack indeed and be not able to relieve their own lack, then who counterfeit a need, or with idleness and riot make themselves needier, and finally, who have such neighbors that can or do take the care to provide for them. Such as the deacons shall find, that neither can get their own living, nor have of their neighbors, that do relieve them, their names, with the manner of their need and behavior, they ought to write in a particular book, and certain times to visit them, and to call them unto them, that they may the more certainly know how well and virtuously they use the arms of good people, and what things from time to time they need. For as nothing will suffice the wicked and lewd, neither have they any measure or truth in begging, so the good and shamefast do cover and dissemble their need, and think everything too much that is given unto them by the congregation. But the Holy Ghost hath appointed and ordained the manner and end of distribution of alms that none should lack, and every one should have as much as is sufficient for his honest relief. And who cannot see even by this one thing how necessary it is for congregations to have such deacons for the poor, that not rashly but most diligently search out and certainly know the state of every one that asketh the help of the congregation, whether and what thing he lacketh and how much is to be given to every one for his necessary relief. Besides, whether they have any friends that be able and ought to relieve them, for such ought by the congregation to be forced to relieve their own, and thereunto, as in the execution of the rest of the discipline, the deacons ought to be assistants to the ministers of the word and elders. 2. The other point of the office of deacons is to keep whatsoever cometh to the church for the use of the poor, and thereof to distribute to every one that needeth as much as shall suffice to live a godly life in the Lord, and to keep a perfect account of their doing, which they must yield to the ministers of the word and the elders, procuring, after the example of the apostle, honest things not only before God but also in the sight of all men. Wherefore the Holy Ghost requireth that such deacons should be of good report among the people of Christ, 
For as men be desirous of money, so upon the least occasion they suspect evil of such as have the distribution of common money. Besides the poor that have not learned by the Spirit of Christ to be contented, whether they have plenty or do suffer need, be very suspicious and full of complaints, and therefore that such deacons should be of the greater authority among the people of God, and the better credit given unto them, the ancient churches appointed unto them the next degree after the elders, and admitted them to be aiders in the holy ministry of the administration both of the word and also of the sacraments. And he Christ made this office, as he did all other ministries, nothing at all, but to serve for a vain pomp, as at this present day there be very few that think the deacon's office to be any other thing than to serve the bishops and priests at mass, and to read the gospel, which things were appointed to this office only at the first, that whilst they provided for the poor, and did help to execute the discipline, they should be of the greater authority, and have the more credit among the people of God. For the oversight of the possessions belonging to the churches, and to gather the fruits, revenues, and rents of those things that were given for the relief of the poor, certain were appointed, who were called subdeacons and bailiffs, that the deacons might first give themselves to the right distribution of such things as were gathered for the relief of the poor, so as every one might have what was convenient indeed to live to the Lord, then to see that those that were relieved by the congregation did live to serve God, and finally, to further this discipline among other Christians, whose life and behavior they ought the better know and try by the reason of gathering relief for the poor. This kind and manner of gathering and distribution by the deacons and subdeacons was observed till and in the time of Gregory, the bishop of Rome, as appeareth in many his epistles. And albeit the deacons of the church be never so honest and wise, Yet can they not provide for the poor, unless they have wherewith to distribute to the poor, and therefore it belongeth to the magistrate to see that churches have sufficient to relieve the poor. In time long past, the fourth part of all revenues that either belonged to the spirituality by their possessions, or came to it by good men's gifts and oblations, was taken for the relief of the poor. Besides, many virtuous princes and good men made hospitals and houses for the relief of the poor, some for such as were whole of body, and some for such as were sick some to keep infants, and some to comfort strangers and banished men. But all these, in continuance of time, through the wicked monks and priests, were converted from those godly uses, and turned to the maintenance of their own bellies, pleasures, and pride. They passed neither of the founders' good minds, nor the laws of magistrates, but blinded poor men, making them believe that more profit should come both to quick and dead, if those godly arms were bestowed on masses and such like ungodly trish-trash. Then, if Christ therewith should be fed in the hungry, refreshed in the thirsty, comforted with lodging in strangers and the harbourless, clothed in the naked and visited in the sick and imprisoned. Wherefore, it is the part of good magistrates to provide that such things be brought to their right uses. And besides, it is convenient that some taxes be set on rich spiritual promotions for the relief of the poor, instead of the fourth part of their revenues, which by so many canons was limited to the use of the poor. Moreover, let those that be not worthy to have the arms of the church and of good men should take it from those that be worthy and indeed needy. Good magistrates ought to renew and put in execution that law of God and of the emperor Valentinian, which forbiddeth that any man be suffered to beg, and commandeth that those that be able to labor should be forced to labor, and that such as be not able to labor should be kept as our brethren and members, every one in the congregation where he dwelleth and that this may be the better done, commandment ought to be given, that every man maintain such as be of his own household, or otherwise properly joined to him if he be able, and that every city, town, and village do maintain such poor people as their friends be not able to keep, and not suffer them to wander abroad. And because it may be that some town or village is so poor that it is not able to relieve all the poor thereof, that such also be not left unprovided, it is very requisite that in every shire, certain godly and spiritually wise men be appointed, who may send such poor people from the places where they cannot be relieved to such congregations where they may be sufficiently relieved. For all we Christians be together members by the which name the congregations of the Gentiles in the time of St. Paul, and at his exhortation, did confess that it was their duty to relieve the congregations in Jewry that suffered great hunger and famine. Furthermore, because through our corrupt and always disobedient nature to God, we continually loathe the ordinances and commandments of God, and after our own lust and fond judgment, we desire to follow other means and ways than God hath appointed. 
there will be some that, notwithstanding this most holy provision for the poor, will not put their alms into the common chest or box of the Lord, but will rather give their alms with their own hands, if they be minded to give any at all. Such men's pride must be met with, not only by a law of the magistrate, but also by the discipline of the church. By a law to make them give double to the Lord's chest, if they be found to give anything privately to the needy. And by the discipline of the church, that if any give nothing into the Lord's chest, he be warned of his duty by the ministers of the church according to the word of God, whose admonition, if they stubbornly contemn, that they be taken for ethnics and publicans. For, albeit, if it be left to every man's will, to offer to Christ his Lord, to those of his little ones, as much of his goods as he will, yet no man may be suffered, contrary to the express commandment of God, to come always with an empty hand into the presence of the Lord, and utterly to despise the ordinance of the Holy Ghost, for the provision of the poor, yea, as much as in him lieth, to subvert it by his private distribution of alms. And here will man's wisdom, which always vaunteth itself above God's, object that it is unnatural that men's hands should be shut to the faithful, that they may not give at their pleasure to such as they perceive indeed to lack. For a man shall find among the poverty very good men, who be ashamed to ask the alms of the church, have they never so great need. Hereunto this is to be answered, first that no man's hand is so shut by this law, but that he may open it to whatsoever poor he will and is able, but by this law, according to God's commandment and the ordinance of the Holy Ghost, this is prevented, that the children of God may not give it the enemies of Christ, these that either lack not or else be willfully in need, those things that they owe to the little ones of Christ, which lack indeed. For it is not possible, as I said before, that any private man should so certainly search out the disposition of the poor as those that be appointed to that office by the church and daily be exercised with all diligence therein. And God doth not keep his gifts and increase of his Holy Spirit from such as he hath chosen and called to so great ministries of his church. Besides, admit that every man know certainly his needy neighbors, yet it is far better that every man send such poor people that ask his relief, be they never so holy and virtuous to the deacons of the church to receive of them, for otherwise others shall take example by him to distribute also their own alms, and so oftentimes to such as they know not, and be not worthy of Christ's alms, who can beg more boldly and craftily than the poor indeed. We ought to take wonderful heed, lest the least hole in the world be opened to our natural pride, to be wise against God, and to swerve a hairbreadth from his commandments and ordinances, either to the right hand or to the left. If any be ashamed to go gladly to the whole company and ministry of the deacons, let him declare his poverty to one of the deacons, or if he be loath to do this, then let such as know his need and godliness show it to the deacons and get necessary relief for him. Notwithstanding, no Christian man be he fallen from never so great riches to poverty, from never so high degree to the lowest, ought to be ashamed of the cross of Christ and the wholesome remedy that God hath provided, much less ought Christian men be loath to receive relief of their need at the Lord's hand by the ministry of his church, by whose most just and no less wholesome judgment for them they be come to such poverty and base degree of life. Howbeit it pertaineth to the deacon's office not only to have respect to every man's poverty, but also of the weakness of their minds, and with such wisdom and liberality to help every man's necessity that they lay on no man troubled with poverty the trouble also of shame, nor that they bring any that have in time past been well and liberally maintained to such scarcity and scantness of meat and clothing as they be not able to suffer, albeit such relief were sufficient to another that hath been so used." The commandment of the Holy Ghost ought in this point to be considered, that there be so much given to every one as is necessary to lead a good and godly life. And it is manifest that as all men be not of like strength of body, nor have been brought up after one kind of living, so some ought to have more, some less, some finer, some coarser, meat, apparel, and other necessaries. Which thing, St. Gregory, considering, when the noblemen and women were spoiled by the Lombards, he gave unto them very liberal pensions for their relief, of the goods of the church, and therefore Christian magistrates ought to make this law, first that no man be suffered to beg, but that every man do maintain and keep his own household, kindred, and allies, if he be able to do it, the judgment whereof ought to pertain to the ordinary magistrate, and that such as be destitute of such help be maintained by the city, town, village, or congregation where they dwell. If any city, town, village, or congregation be not able to maintain the poverty thereof, 
that then, by the discretion of the chief governor of the country, such poor people be sent to some richer congregation where they may be relieved. Another point of this law ought to be for the election and appointing of deacons, as is aforesaid, and that they be, by their oath, enjoined diligently to search out what things every man needeth, and that they, faithfully to their power, give it to them, and to make an account of their receipts and payments to the ministers of the word and elders. The third point, that it be forbidden to give alms privately, and that all men be exhorted that they will rather, according to God's commandment and the ordinance of the Holy Ghost, commit their alms to the church, and to the ministers appointed for that purpose, then, after their own natural pride, distributed themselves, contrary to God's word and the institution of the Holy Ghost. The fourth point is that they cause to be restored for the relief of the poor such gifts as were offered by our elders to Christ, if any yet remain. And the fewer of those gifts shall be found remaining, the greater pensions to be set on rich benefices for the relief of the poor in recompense of the fourth part of the revenues of all churches that is due by so many canons. The fifth point, that great pains be set on them that shall blaspheme this most holy institution of the Holy Ghost, or that shall go about to pull any man from it. And if any man shall think anything to be corrected in the deacons and the provision for the poor, that he first warn the deacons thereof, and if they will not follow his reasonable warning, that he declare the matter to the minister of the word and the elders, that in all things the authority of God's word may be of force, and the wicked pride of men who can allow nothing that is ordained of God may be resisted in every place and in time. And so it may be the easier obtained of the people of Christ, whereby the little ones of Christ may so liberally be provided for, as we may at length joyfully hear, Come ye blessed of my Father, and receive the kingdom that is prepared for you from the beginning of the world. I was hungry, and ye gave me to eat, etc. And it is not enough for the liberality of Christians to give only meat, harbour, and clothing to such as be in extreme necessity, but also they ought liberally to give of the gifts God hath given them, wherewith godly maidens marriable, who for lack of dowry remain long unmarried, may be in time married, and coupled with honest men, and also that witty children that lack friends may be brought up to study, to serve in Christ's church. Besides, good Christians that lack wherewith to exercise their crafts may be therewith holpen, partly by gift, partly by loan, as there may come profit of their arts, and they may be the better able to nourish and bring up their children for the Lord, and to make them profitable members of the commonwealth. For it is not enough for the congregations of Christ to provide that men may only live, but that they may live to the Lord for a certain and mutual profit between themselves and of the church and commonwealth. And therefore all congregations ought to provide that all those that be baptized in Christ be virtuously brought up from their childhood and taught good arts, that every one, according to his portion, may bring forth somewhat to profit the commonwealth and to declare himself to others a true and profitable member of Christ. An addition. There be that deny not the office of the deaconry in the church of Christ to be ordained by God, but say such office is not of necessity. For there be some congregations where all men be wealthy, and there is no poverty, and so no need of the deaconry. That it pleaseth them so gently to grant the office of the deaconry to be the ordinance of God, they deserve no thanks. For if they should deny it, they must other confess, St. Paul erreth, or St. Paul would say they err. For besides, he teacheth what men ought to be called to be deacons in the church of Christ. He saith plainly that God ordained and constituted in his church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, Thirdly, teachers, then those that do miracles, after that, those that have the gift of healing, helpers, governors, and diversity of tongues, under which name of helpers, as a general word for all men that may do good in the church of Christ, the office of the deacons, according as the interpreters on that place agreeably do testify, as it is in the acts mentioned, is contained. Now where they say there may be a church without poor, and so no need of deacons, so may it be said, There may be a congregation wherein all may be learned in God's word, and therefore no need of preachers and teachers. But what a fond kind of argument is it to reason of things that may be as though they were, to allege things that be only in utopia, as if they were common in every country, to magnify their own uncertain sophistry and to neglect the certain doctrine of God, who, foreseeing all things, as well to come as present, said, ye shall always have poor among you, and therefore ordain this ministry in his church of necessity, not for a time, but forever to continue, to have the oversight and care of the poor, because there shall be poor forever. And albeit God in some particular congregation doth so bestow his benefits, as many be rich and few poor, 
Yet will he not that they shall have their respect only to the poor in the same congregation, but also to such as be in other congregations, as appeareth by those of Macedonia, Archaea, and Corinthus, who, according to the doctrine of St. Paul and their duty, sent their charity to Jerusalem for the relief of the saints and poor brethren there. Some again say, Why may not every man appoint his own almoner or chamberer? to distribute his alms, so the poor be provided for, it forceth not how or by whom it be done. Albeit this objection be before sufficiently confounded by Master D. Busser, yet it may be added that such objections proceed of affection and private gain, which may do much with worldly men, and not of a zeal to advance God's glory. For Christian men that seek to serve God their Lord and Master, and not their own commodity and affections, when they know his will, pleasure, and ordinance, search no further, but as good subjects and servants, by all means labor to do and fulfill the same. They dispute not why God hath ordained or commanded this or that, nor think this might be otherwise done than God hath devised, or that he hath done, is not of necessity. They know his will and pleasure, declared by his word, is an unchangeable law, whereunto nothing may be added or diminished, but ought to be obeyed of all his servants, that he hath made nothing in vain, but, as he is the very wisdom itself, and foreseeth what is best for his, so hath he most wisely and most necessarily ordained this ministry of the deaconry in his church. Yea, they be most certain, that, as there be in man's body diverse members, not all of one sort, but some more profitable than some, and yet all requisite and necessary to make a perfect body, so in the church of Christ there be diverse members, ministries and vocations, preachers, teachers, elders and deacons, etc., who, albeit they be not of like authority and degree, yet be they all requisite and necessary to the edifying of a godly and perfect church of Christ. Neither will any of Christ's servants thrust himself, not being lawfully called, into any ministry or seek to come into it by the window, as thieves and murderers do, but will tarry till he may enter by the door, till he be ordinarily called of the church of Christ, as Stephen and the rest of the deacons in the primitive church were. For all good men will fear, lest, when they either do anything contrary to God's ordinance, or meddle with that, whereunto they be not ordinarily called, the plague of God will fall on them, as it did upon the like by just judgment in time past. Nadab and Abihu, the children of Aaron, took their senses, put a strange fire therein, and offered to God, but because they did it contrary to the ordinance of God, the fire came from the Lord and destroyed them. Uzzah, because he set his hand to stay up the ark of the Lord, that it should not fall, albeit the deed simply considered was good, yet because he meddled with that office whereunto he was not ordinarily called and appointed, God plagued him with death. King Uzziah, because he would be busy in other men's vocation, offering incense to the Lord's, which pertained to the ministry of the children of Aaron and not to his, was stroken with leprosy. The wise man saith in the Proverbs, There is a way that seemeth to a man just and right, but the end bringeth to death. When men leave the ways of God and occupy their busy brains about things besides or contrary to God's word, they fall at length clean from God and become godless. Therefore men ought to take heed and to leave their uncertain fantasies and cleave unto the certain word of God, whereunto whosoever leaneth cannot stumble, whosoever followeth cannot err, and he that walketh therein shall at length come to the eternal kingdom which is prepared for all such as love and follow God. Remember the poor, and God will remember you. Forget the poor, and God will forget you. End of a treatise, How, by the Word of God, Christian Men's Alms Ought to be Distributed, by Martin Busser. Of the Lawful and Unlawful Usury Amongst Christians, by Wolfgang Musculus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Preface Amongst other evils of this present time, also pestilent usury is so far grown, and towards the vengeance of God, that I may think it altogether in vain to speak anything against it, yea, though it were spoken with much earnestness and singular endeavour. For we have known by experience that this evil did then specially increase when, as in our time it began to be openly blazed and reproved by the preachings and writings of godly learned men, that almost even as the disease of the canker after cutting groweth and spreadeth more hurtfully than afore, so after just and deserved reproving is this become uncurable and most noisome. 
wherefore I might well be thought to lose my labour, and, as it is said by a proverb to wash tile stones, if I were not bonden by promises and forced by letters of my brethren. Therefore, that I may in any wise keep promises and please my brethren, I will so far speak of usury as may be profitable unto them that be godly, and as yet not so much infected with this pestilent disease as is past all hope. I know at what times and by what persons there have been disputations concerning usury, not only in Germany, but also in the schools of other countries, but I will not meddle with scholarly shreddings that be as fast entangled one with another as the nature of usury itself is enwrapped together. But I will simply utter those things which are meet to be spoken without any cumbrous contention. First I will tell what usury is, and then that it may be seen... If it can be lawful unto Christians, I will confer it with the doctrine of Christ and with the profession of Christian religion. Of the lawful and unlawful usury, Wolfgang Musculus. What is usury? Lest any man might accuse me as a maintainer of usury, I will bring a definition of usury, not now devised of myself, but long ago set forth by them whose godliness in Christ's church hath gotten such authority as cannot be rotted out by usurers or by their defenders. Jerome, upon Ezekiel, in his sixth book, doth write thus, Some men think usury to be only in money, the which thing godly scripture foreseeing doth take away the overplus of everything, so that you mayst not receive more than thou hast given. Also other, for money put to usury, are wont to take little gifts of diverse sorts of things, and they do not understand that the scripture calleth usury and overplus, whatsoever thing it be, that they take more besides that which they did give. These be Jerome's sayings. Ambrose of Naboth saith, Many fleeing the precepts of the law, when they have delivered their money unto Merchants do not exact usury and money, but of their wares they take in value as of usurers. Therefore let them hear what the law saith, Thou shalt not take usury of meats, nor of any other thing. Therefore meat is usury, and apparel is usury, and whatsoever cometh to the stock is usury. And what name soever thou wilt give it, usury it is. So saith Ambrose, Augustine also, upon the thirty-sixth psalm, defineth usury after this sort. If thou commit usury to a man, that is to say, if thou lend thy money, of whom thou lookest to receive anything more than thou hast given, not only money, but anything more than thou hast given, if it be wheat, if it be wine, if it be oil, if it be any manner of other things, if thou look to receive more than thou hast given, thou art an usurer, and in that to be disallowed. Thus saith he, Therefore, according to these men's sayings, usury is not only to take, but also to hope and look for anything besides that which is called the stock, that is to say, besides that which is given, under what name soever it be cloaked. For the change of the name doth not take away the wickedness of the vice which abideth. And it is evident in the eighteenth of Ezekiel that that is usury whatsoever is taken besides the stock, when, as the prophet saith, he lendeth nothing upon usury, he taketh nothing over. For, as D. Kimi doth well declare, what it is to lend upon usury, it is expounded by that which followeth, where it is added, he hath taken nothing over. And so is it read in the twenty-fifth of Leviticus, Thou shalt not take of him usury, and anything over, but thou shalt fear thy God. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, thou shalt not give thy meat to receive more over. Also, Caesar's laws in the book of usury, in like manner call usury whatsoever is taken besides the stock, howbeit they suffer the use of it after a sort, of the which we shall speak afterwards. It is called usura in Latin, because of the use of money a certain recompense is received, whereby there returneth some vantage unto the usurer. The Grecians call it tokon, as a childing or generation of the money stock. In Hebrew it is named neshech, of biting, because at the last it biteth him which payeth vantage. Thus much is now said to show what usury is, whether usury be lawful or not. We do seek here to know not of usury, of usuries which the Jews do use, of which no man doubteth, but that it is unlawful and abominable and in no wise to be suffered, but of simple usury, by the which more is taken than given, whether it be much or little, whether it be done in money or in other things. 
For this usury some men suppose not to be unlawful of itself, but accept it to be made unlawful by unlawful circumstances. I deny not that there may be found a kind of usury which is not unlawful but profitable, such as that usury which is called earth usury, by the which much more is received than was by sowing to the earth committed. This usury doth he give which giveth unto all men all things, and yet notwithstanding hath nevertheless. That usury is so given that it hurteth nothing the giver, and much profiteth the receiver, and is not to be condemned of covetousness, but rather by reason of great good will and excellent well-doing is much to be praised. Behold, here is a kind of usury for the lawful, profitable, and godly, by the which Abraham and Isaac became rich, by this sometimes thirtyfold, sometimes sixtyfold, and sometimes an hundredfold, without sin is both given of God and also received of man. This usury did our forefathers much use, which now is reckoned vile, and forced to give place to the damnable usury of money. And there is an other certain usury, by the which, without any sin, a man may take an hundredth for one. This Christ himself, in the stead of his father, as a surety, doth promise unto his faithful, saying, And every one which shall leave house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or sons, or fields, for my name, shall receive an hundredthfold, and possess life everlasting. Matthew 19. Behold another, and a heavenly kind of usury, unto the which we be called, and not feared from it. But, I pray you, see how many there be, which set their minds to the gathering of heavenly riches, with so great gains. By these examples of usury is it proved not to be unlawful of itself to restore more than thou hast received, or else to receive more than thou hast given, but whether the same sort of usury which in our time hath the upper hand, and of the which at this time we speak, have the same reason, that the usury of the earth, or the heavenly usury hath, by the which God himself is the greatest usurer of all other, this now must be spied with simple and pure eyes." They which defend customable usury do devise many things which they may show forth, and whereby they may be bold to say that it is not unlawful. They bring the law out of the book called the Codes in the treatises of users, by the which is permitted, yea, ordained the hundredth and the half of the hundredth, etc. And they think that the authority of the civil law maketh that which they do, either not to be usury, or if it be usury, not to be unlawful usury. We answer that the lawmaker was forced of necessity not to defend usury, but to set some stay of exceeding covetousness, the which thing the text of the law itself proveth, for it taketh away great hurtfulness of usury, and appointeth certain measures over the which nothing may be claimed. His desire was without doubt that such charity might prevail among Christians as should leave no place unto usury, but for because that covetousness did grow past measure, he judged it needful that it should be kept in by lattices or rails, and therefore he cut away the hurtfulness of usury even unto the midst of it. Wherefore the law doth not maintain usury and make it lawful, but rather witnesseth that charity among Christians was waxen cold, and most filthy and abominable covetousness grown so far that it must be kept under by the authority of the emperor. And so, as the law of divorce made by Moses did not excuse the Jew afore God, which used the law as to be guiltless of breaking wedlock, likewise this civil law doth not make usury so lawful that a Christian man may use it without offence afore God. As Christ spake unto the Jews of the law of divorce, it was not so from the beginning, and for the hardness of your hearts Moses did suffer a bill of divorce, and so sent them back unto the first beginning of lawful wedlock, unto the which they ought to conform themselves. Even so, in this case, or cause of usury, we Christians must look unto the pureness, beginnings, righteousness, and equity of Christian religion, which is to be seen, Matthew 5 and Luke 6, and we must not look unto the civil laws, for they are not made for Christians which have no need of civil laws, to the end that they thereby should be stayed from their covetous desire, lest that they break and leap over the border of measure, for they are so guided by the spirit of love that they love their neighbor heartily, and are ready to bestow upon him not only their money, but if need be even their life also. Whereas this love prevaileth, there can be no place for any covetousness, 
nor there is no reason or cause for any such laws to be established by the which covetousness may be measured. Wherefore the mind of the lawmaker was not to maintain him which in lending requireth usury, but to provide for him that borroweth, lest that because he is oppressed with need he should be forced to borrow money, and then by the unsatiable covetousness of usurers he should be utterly pilled and spoiled, when as charity is so cold that he can find none that will lend freely without usury. Wherefore that law made by a Christian emperor concerning usury is a plain proof that love of neighbors was waxen cold, the great shame of the Christian name, and so it is far from excusing of usury in any such sort as to make it lawful. Christians are in case partly by the inward guiding of the Holy Ghost and partly by the light and authority of God's word to be called from all those things which displease God, so that they need not by any constraint of emperor's laws either to be forced or feared. Civil laws do not forbid all things that be unlawful afore God, and what things they forbid not those things they punish not. Howbeit thereby it cannot be proved that all things are lawful afore God, which are not forbidden unto us by civil laws. They do not forbid anger, indignation, impatience, envy, hate, pride, evil lusts, covetousness, and such other as the apostle calleth the deeds of the flesh, and saith that they do shut out of the kingdom of God all those that have such minds. Wherefore no man that doth any such thing is therefore excused afore God, because he is not condemned by any civil law. Again, the civil laws do not command all those things that are requisite unto true righteousness. No civil law commandeth faith, hope, love of God, and thy neighbor, patience in adversity, gentleness, meekness, lowliness, and modesty, etc. Whereupon, notwithstanding, no man should suppose that he is not bounden unto these, because that if he be otherwise disposed, he is by no civil laws condemned. Furthermore, they suffer some things for certain causes which that notwithstanding afore God be unlawful and by God's word are condemned. They do suffer them not as in themselves right and lawful, but that worse things may be shut out and displaced. So thus far also they suffer usury that a measure of covetousness may be limited. They do not punish whoredom, nor take not away the stews, yet thereby no whoremonger is excused afore God, nor that of the apostle is not made of none effect. Hebrews 13, wedlock is honorable and holy, but whoremongers and adulterers the Lord shall judge. Likewise, all those threatenings which in holy scripture condemn usurers be not therefore made of none effect, because they be not condemned by civil laws, but the end of civil laws is to be considered, and we must not think that they are made to make men righteous afore God, but to keep men somewhat in a tolerable order, living together, and that the malice of man should be restrained within some border. These would I knit up in few words for an answer unto them which by the pretense of civil laws do so defend the usury of our times that they deny it to be unlawful afore God. How a man should lend according to the doctrine of Christ. For as much as in this place we demand whether that usury be lawful or unlawful, not afore the world but afore God, and that therefore the pretense of civil laws or of any ordinances of man can have no place in this question. The cause of Christian profession constraineth us to hear even Christ, God's Son, and to learn out of his mouth how Christians should lend and not sin in the sight of the Lord. For of this ought we to be well persuaded that no thing can be lawfully done which striveth against the doctrine of our Saviour. Wherefore we must consider how usury agreeeth with Christ's word. But first I do protest that I speak not unto the children of this world, but unto faithful men, which be persuaded that the doctrine of Christ is so godly, and containeth such a rule of true godliness and righteousness, that all they must needs displease God, which do not heartily yield and apply themselves unto it. Matthew 5, thus we read, Look not from him that would borrow of thee. And Luke 6, Lend, looking for nothing thereof. If you shall lend, from whence ye hope to receive, what thanks have you? For sinners lend unto sinners, that they may receive like. By these words Christ did teach his, how they ought to behave themselves in this case. He putteth a difference betwixt them and the children of this world. First he commandeth that they do not deny him that would borrow. Understand so, that there be ability for to lend. For he which hath not himself, how can he be able to lend unto others? He doth not permit and suffer unto his which have the substance of this world, 
a liberty to lend or not to lend. That is to say, he showeth that there are strangers from the kingdom of God and from true righteousness belonging unto the children of God, which deny to lend unto him that needeth and asketh. Therefore he warneth his that they do not that if they will belong unto him and be in the number of God's children. This commandment the children of this world do not acknowledge, nor are not thereto forced by civil laws, but they will be at liberty to lend or not to lend, and they do not think that they sin if they do deny him that asketh, when as they may help him. Wherefore, if we have pleasure in the profession of Christ's religion, we must take heed to be otherwise minded than they be. It is a sin great enough if we deny our help unto him that would borrow, but truly it is far too much if, like as infidels, we do not believe any sin to be done of us, when, as upon a brother that would borrow, we do not best owe the duty of charity, as though those were trifles that Christ saith, Deny not him that would borrow of thee. They say, These are no commandments but counsels. Unto the Jews it is commanded plainly, Deuteronomy 15, after this manner, if one of thy brethren, which dwelleth within the gates of thy city, in the land which the Lord thy God shall give unto thee, come unto poverty, thou shalt not harden thy heart, nor pull in thy hand, but thou shalt open it unto the poor, and lend that which thou seest he needeth. How then can it be that Moses' law should have more perfect righteousness than the gospel of Christ, and that we may freely do? Here there is a lacuna in the text leave undone the work of here there is a lacuna in the text which thing was not free unto the Jews and then also if it had been spoken instead of a counsel deny not him that would borrow of thee how is it meet for Christians that Christ's counsel so earnestly given they may cause to be taken up or down to or fro and to think that it being condemned shall not be punished he saith I speak unto you which hear therefore they that will be hearers of Christ, are bound to obey his counsel, and they cannot wind themselves from it without sin and loss of their salvation, even as the sick cannot neglect the counsel of the physician without the damage of their health. But in the 25th of Deuteronomy, it is manifest that they sin contrary to God's will, which deny a brother asking to borrow. Lest that, saith he, he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it become sin unto thee. Afterwards Christ prescribeth unto his how they ought for to lend. Lend, saith he, looking for nothing thereof. The which many so understand that no profit, no lucre, no gain, besides that which was lent, should be looked for and received. And this is that which is specially required of him which desireth to keep his hands clean from unpure usury. But that is not the full meaning of Christ, which requireth of us by this place that we also lend unto them of whom we cannot hope to receive anything at all, which doth sufficiently appear by the words that he addeth when he saith, If ye shall lend, whereof ye hope to receive again, what thanks have ye? For so sinners do lend unto sinners to receive like. See, he saith not to receive usury, over plus, somewhat besides the sum that was lent, but to receive like. Wherefore also here he putteth a difference betwixt his and those that do not belong unto him. For he requireth his not only to lend without profit, seeing that sinners do that sometimes, but also with their own damage and loss of lent money to help their neighbor and brother, and so to lend that they may purchase unto themselves favor of God. Therefore here is a difference to be made betwixt the heathen and the Christian. The heathen lendeth first unto those that be able to restore that which they have received, then unto those which sometimes have lent or be able to lend, thirdly unto friends and kindred, fourthly unto those of whom some kindness may be looked for. By these kinds of lending sin is not committed, howbeit as yet the righteousness of the kingdom and spirit of Christ is not expressed. Wherefore they that be Christians do thus lend, first unto them that be not able to restore, then unto them that never did lend anything, nor cannot give again. Thirdly, not only unto friends, but also unto enemies, not only unto kinsfolk, but also unto others and strangers. Fourthly, whereas no thanksgiving, much less any recompense, can be looked for, and in doing these things they declare themselves to be indeed his children, which bringeth forth his son over the good and the bad, and reigneth upon the thankful and unthankful, which also Christ requireth of his, saying, that ye may be the children of your father, etc. Bring therefore 
unto this rule of Christian righteousness those which lend upon usury, and see how far they be from the rule of Christ's word, which is so set unto all Christians, that except they do conform themselves unto it, they ought to be reckoned among sinners, and not among God's children. Yea, they be not so just as sinners, for so much righteousness is attributed unto sinners, that they lend without usury, and that they desire to receive nothing in the stead of lucre, but only that which they did lend. Therefore, by this conference, we, which look unto the righteousness of Christ's kingdom, unto the prescription of Christ's word, and unto the profession of Christian religion, may easily judge how unlawful usury is unto them which have yielded themselves unto Christ, and would be taken to be Christians. It is not belonging unto us to judge others. It belongeth to a Christian to answer to his profession, and not otherwise to judge of things, whether they lawful or unlawful, but according to the prescription of Christ's doctrine, and not so to behave himself in the trial of righteousness as afore a worldly judge, but as in the sight of God, that he may be quit of unrighteousness. Wherefore, agreeably with Holy Scripture and Christ's words, we conclude that that usury which marvellously in this last time hath grown in the church of Christ is not lawful but damnable and very far from the profession of Christ's righteousness. How wicked a thing usury is to be seen in itself any man may easily judge except only such men as think the savour of lucre to be sweet, of what thing soever it is gotten, the eyes of whose minds be utterly blinded with the love of covetousness. First, the vice of covetousness hath ever been judged most vile not only amongst Christians but also amongst heathens, and that is the rot of usury. Take away the love of money and covetousness, and we shall have no usurers in Christ's church. Secondarily, who doth not see how wicked a thing it is to hunt for gain, gotten by the labor and sweat of others? For usury which is given cometh not of the care and travail of the usurer, but of him that payeth fuenus vantage. Thirdly, this is far from equity, that the usurer, without any loss or danger of his money, receiveth lucre, so that he is in danger of no damage, whatsoever chance of the dice cometh. But the miserable man which payeth usury is forced to bear the loss of misfortune and chance. He hath all the hurt that happeneth. The usurer hath no thing but the gain that is taken and the stoke that is saved. Fourthly, this is also, moreover, that how great usury and how many years soever the debtor payeth, yet notwithstanding the whole stock remaineth and is nothing lessened or worn by occupying. But how sore these things do grieve the mind and decay the ability of the payer, I need not to give any advertisement, seeing by experience the thing is evident. When he that is in such case perceiveth that this pestilent evil cannot be overcome, then, being utterly discouraged, he forsaketh wife and children, and leaveth what other goods soever he hath unto the unsatiable violent covetous usurer. So, 1 Samuel 22 we read that they did which oppressed with debt conveyed themselves unto David an exile. Such sights, when as magistrates wink, godly men behold daily afore their eyes with sorrow and sighing. And that which is most grievous in the same season, when as such usurers ought to have no place among citizens, then do they enjoy honours in the church and in the city. But the usurer replieth, It is, saith he, common in every man's mouth, he that is willing hath no wrong. I send for no man, I force no man to take money of me. They come of their own accord, they take my money, and do not ask it of any other condition, but only of usury. What do I in this case offend? Let them leave me my money to myself, if the damage of usury be so grievous unto them. I answer, these are the sayings not of a Christian man, but of a very heathen, yea, of him that hath no mind of man. Need is a sharp shaft, these wretches, forced by need, come unto thee, of whose wretchedness thou cruelly and filthily takest thy advantage. The usurer replieth again. But when, as they conceived money of me upon condition of usury, they were glad and did give thanks, what injury can this be which causeth gladness and thanksgiving? I answer that these wretches rejoice and give thanks not because they do feel a benefit, but because they suppose that by this damage of usury they may ease the grievous necessity which doth oppress them presently. Surely they desire rather simply to borrow money than to take it upon usury. But for because so great inhumanity prevaileth that they can nowhere find such liberality as lendeth freely, they are glad to take money upon usury. But this kind of gladness at the last turneth into greatest heaviness. 
and when they flee from Charybdis, they fall into Scylla, from the Roke into the Gulf. Chrysostom doth well compare this gladness of taking usury money under the biting of a serpent called Aspis. For even as he, which is bitten of the Aspis, doth gladly fall asleep, and by the sweetness of deadly slumber dieth, because in sleeping the poison passeth to every member, so he that taketh money of the usurer is presently glad, as though he had a benefit, howbeit usury, having speedy passage to all that he hath, turneth all into debt. And Cato the elder, being demanded what it was to take usury, answered, The same that it is to kill a man. Thirdly, they which seem to have some taste of Christ's gospel do bring that, not by thee which they may amend themselves, but by that which they would cloak their ungodliness. But all the sum of the law and the prophets, as Christ witnesseth, standeth in this, that what I would should be done unto me, the same I do also unto others. Unto myself I would wish no other condition, but for one hundredth florins to repay every year five. What sign is it for me, then, to take so much of others? For I myself take upon this condition so oft as need is. So many I give to others, and again so many I take of others. I answer, it is most ungodliness to abuse Christ's word, which are so compared to maintain not covetousness, but brotherly love. Thou, as is evident, dost the same to those which thou requirest of others. If thou do this of a charitable spirit, set thyself in the place of the poor and needy, and clothe thyself with the affection of his need, thinking what thou, being in his case, wouldst that the rich should do unto thee whether that they should lend unto thee with usury or without usury. Undoubtedly thou wouldst rather without usury, for that should be more profitable unto thee than if thou shouldst be burdened with chargeable usury. Wherefore that saying of Christ, Do unto others as thou wouldst that others should do unto thee, that must thou understand to be so spoken as what thou wouldst wish do unto thee, being in such case as thy neighbor is, the same must thou do unto him, with the same friendly loving affection, with that which art minded towards thyself. Search thine own conscience, and judge indifferently whether thou mayest say truly that thy poor needy neighbor is so loved and helped of thee, as thou placed in his case wouldst be loved and helped of others. Wherefore, seeing thou canst not truly say this of thyself, what availeth it deceitfully to dally with the saying of Christ our Saviour? Also thou givest usury unto others, and takest of others. I hear this, and I beseech thee, tell me for what cause thou givest, and for what need. For the same, for the which they do give, of whom thou takest? No, no, they bear the damage of usury forced by need. Thou bearest no damage, but for hope of greater gain, not for need, but for covetousness. Givest five for an hundred, to gain ten, fifteen, twenty, and thou so givest and takest as many sacrificing priests are wont to offer a halfpenny to keep up in the church the gains of offering, and to provoke the people to offer by their example, and by the way for laying down one penny they take up ten. So very well do usurers and simoniacs agree, because they are both carried by one spirit of covetousness. Fourthly, when, as the usureth feeleth himself in a strait, and seeth no way to defend usury, he turneth towards other arts, and saith, If usury be such a thing, and I do sin if I take, then I know what I will do. I will lend no part of my money unto any man. I will keep it unto myself, lest that I should be an usurer. I answer, This is that escaping of usury, for the which the emperor's laws would not utterly forbid usury. Wilt thou keep thy money to thyself? afore the court of the world that is lawful, but it is unlawful afore the court of Christ, by whose commandment thou art bound, not to deny him that would borrow of thee, but to lend, looking to receive nothing. Wherefore, if thou doest either of these, thou declarest thyself not to be a Christian. Whether that thou withdraw lending unto thy brother, who asketh when thou art able, or whether that thou so lend as to take again, thou sinnest alike, both against Christ and against thy next brother, if thou lend nothing at all, thou sinnest not in usury, howbeit that rot of usury, which is covetousness, thou nourishest in thy heart, and art a transgressor of Christ's word. If thou lend upon usury, then thou sinnest against the commandment of Christ, and to be short, as much as lieth in thee, 
thou destroyest thy neighbor as well by not lending as by lending upon usury. If thou withdraw lending, thou art worse than a heathen sinner, for sinners do lend unto sinners that they may receive like. If thou do lend for usury, so art thou worse than many heathen, which by the law of nature keep themselves from that vice. Fifthly, the covetousness of the usurer will reply after this manner, If I lend without usury, that which is mine own cannot be restored unto me, for the poor hath nor so much that he may render again the whole sum. But if he shall give every year a certain usury, then some part of my money shall be restored unto me. I answer, Thou knowest the poverty of thy brother to be so great that he cannot render the borrowed money. Why then dost not thou yield unto the words of Christ? By the which, Luke 6, he saith, And your reward shall be great in heaven, and ye shall be the children of the Most High. And Luke 14, And it shall be rendered unto thee in the regeneration of the righteous. How dost thou receive nothing, when, as for earthly gain, here there is a lacuna in the text, which lasteth ever, shall be rendered unto thee. Therefore this pretense is utterly contrary unto Christ's religion, which teacheth even therefore to do good unto the poor, because he hath nothing to give again, that the heavenly reward may be purchased. And thou, even for the selfsame cause, wilt not lend unto the poor, because he hath not so much as to restore that which he hath received of thee. Therefore, either thou dost not believe that Christ's promise is true, or else thou dost more desire temporal gain than eternal, earthly than heavenly. Sixthly, all that I have, saith he, I have gotten with great care and travail. Wherefore then should I bestow them upon others in vain? What is it to me that others do not so take heed unto their own as I do? What owe I unto them? I answer, Christ bestowed no small thing, redeeming thee upon the cross with his blood, and for thy sake he became poor to make thee rich. Then what is it to Christ that we take no better heed unto our salvation? And besides thee, what thou owest unto thy brother, hear the apostle, ye owe nothing unto any man, saith he, but that ye love one another, Romans 13. Thou owest therefore unto thy needy brother love, and also unto God. Thou owest thyself, and not only money. Wherefore, because Christ hath loved us, and given himself for us, therefore we ought to bestow our lives for our brethren. 1 John 3. We do much fail in this thing, that without the affection of true love we look upon the slenderness and humility of our brethren, and not rather upon the will of God and his manifest commandments. Albeit I keep in silence the unmeasurable worthiness of our free redemption. Is the poor man unworthy, unto whom thou shouldst give freely? But Christ is not unworthy, which requireth this of thee. The poor hath not deserved this benefit, Christ hath deserved it. Is not the poor able to restore that which he receiveth? Christ is able to restore an hundredfold, and to give life everlasting, as he also hath promised. Matthew 19. Sixthly, because covetousness is the most toughest wrangler, the usurer, as yet replieth, saying, how should I live, how should I provide for me and mine, if I must so lend that I receive nothing? I answer, it is said of the Lord, First seek the kingdom of God and the righteousness thereof, and all these shall be cast unto you. And the Gentiles seek all these things. Therefore neither doth this... Here there is a lacuna in the text. Waywardness belong unto Christians, neither ought we to fear lest that by helping needy brethren we do not well provide or see to our own things. For thus we read Proverbs 11, Some distribute their own and become richer, some catch that which is not their own and be ever in need. The soul which blesseth, that is to say, which doth good, shall be filled with fatness, and he which giveth drink shall be satisfied with drink. And Isaiah 58, Break unto the hungry, saith he, thy bread, and the needy and wanderers lead into thy house. When thou seest the naked, clothe him, and do not despise thy flesh. When, as thou shalt have poured forth thy soul unto the hungry, and refreshed the afflicted soul, then shalt thou be as a watered garden, and as a well of waters that never fail. And the apostle, 2 Corinthians 9, He hath dispersed and given unto the poor, and his righteousness abideth forever. He which ministereth seed unto the sower will also give bread to be eaten. Therefore a faithful man should not fear falling into poverty by helping them that be poor. Howbeit, I would not damn it, if the apostles' saying might have place, so that the abundance of the rich should help the lack of brethren. 2 Corinthians 8 But if of necessaries there were not so ready giving unto others, 
that might be tolerable, so that the weakness of faith be not excused but confessed. But who can allow this in the Church of Christ, that in so great riotous waste of all things lack, is not feared, but whereas that neediness of brethren should be relieved, there it is feared. If we followed that, here there is a lacuna in the text, rule which is written, 1 Timothy 6 after this sort, having what to eat and wherewith to be clothed, let us be contented. Little place should remain unto this fear. Nature, as he saith, is sent away with a little, but gluttony beggeth unmeasurably. See the honest labor be exercised, idleness avoided, riotousness laid aside, and the abuse of all things shut forth, and we shall be without care under the protection and providence of God, and there shall be no need to fear the necessity of penury. Now, when as so great costs are bestowed upon proud and beautiful buildings, upon riotous apparel, upon all manner of dainty meats, howbeit I speak not of innumerable other things not necessary, what marvel is it that poverty is feared if the gain of usury should fail? Surely he must stand in need of many things, which feedeth and clotheth those that be his most deliciously and gorgeously. He standeth in need of many things, which is purposed to leave great riches upon his heirs. He that needeth many things useth also many means, by right and by wrong, to come to his purpose. These things being taken away, it will not seem very hard, neither to cast away these detestable usuries, neither by any means to succor needy brethren. Of the usury of them which give their money for usury, either unto merchants or unto princes. Hitherto we have considered that usury by the which the poor is bonden unto the rich, and the goods of the bare and needy are supped up, and of that kind of lending by the which Christ commandeth us to succor needy brethren. Now must we speak of those which have money by inheritance or gotten otherwise, and lend it unto rich men, merchants or princes, upon condition to receive every month or every year some usury, the stock in the meantime abiding whole to be restored when they will call for it. Here springeth a question, what sin is committed in this kind of usury? They say, neither is burdened, neither is he that getteth, nor he that taketh usury, but by good provision they have both profit. He that giveth usury doth use his stock well, and gaineth so much of it, that without any loss he can give usury. On the other side, he that taketh usury of his money, he gathereth as it were, a yearly fruit without any decay of the stock, which by these means he may reserve whole unto his heirs. When, as therefore here is no hurt, how can here be any sin against charity? And there be none, how may this usury be called unlawful? I answer, that this must needs be granted, that there is not so great sin in this kind of usury, as in that by the which usury is taken of the poor, which cruelty is forbidden not only by the laws of Christ, but also by the laws of nature. For it is plain cruelness to seek after lucre out of the labours and calamities of the poor. Wherefore this usury, of the which we shall speak now, differeth much from that which by no means can be tolerable. Howbeit, in the mean season, it is not to be supposed that there is nothing which can be reproved in the usury of rich men. For the righteousness of a Christian man doth not rest in that he doth burden no man in any bargain or business. Wherefore we must see which be the circumstances of this usury, for the which it may not be commended. First, this I suppose is sure, that there is in both, as well in him that giveth, as in him that taketh usury, a respect of private profit. For neither the one, for brotherly love, lendeth out his money unto a rich merchant, but for to receive of it yearly or monthly gain. Nor the other is so ready to give usury, as he would give it, if he could keep it with his own advantage. For... As he saith, the love of money groweth as much as the money itself groweth. Notwithstanding, he giveth usury without wrangling, lest that he should be forced to restore the whole stock, or to be noted of evil credit. There be many notable examples of this matter. Therefore, seeing that the rot also of this usury is the love of private profit, I do not see how it can agree without blemish unto Christians, which ought to be furthest from love of private profit. Let no man seek those which be his own, saith the apostle, but those which belong unto others. The love of private profit with the loss of others is so evil that it ought not to be suffered amongst the Gentiles, and to gape for gain, although it be without damage to others, yet is it a thing of itself that ought to be far from Christians, even as to live delicately and idly, although a man do so live, not hurting nor hindering others. 
Wherefore, as they sin which live delicately in the houses of princes, of noble and rich men, albeit they feel or perceive no hurt of it, so a Christian man sinneth, coveting private profit, albeit he go so about it, that he seek for his own gain, not of the need of poor men, but of the wealth of the rich. Moreover, he that taketh usury must take good heed whether he serve his own lack of belief or not. For it is not enough for a Christian man so to deal with his neighbor that he cannot complain, but he must also consider what faith he hath towards God, and how all things which he doth agree or disagree with sincere faith. And to come to the trial of this matter, let him think in himself, which taketh usury, that it is better to take to himself his own money and to put away the gain of usury. But if he fail in faith, then shall he soon fall in these thoughts. If I should live not upon usury but upon the stock, it could not sufficiently discharge my necessary expenses throughout all my life, and then what could be left after my death unto my children and successors? Whereupon should they live if I should spend all? But these be thoughts not of faith, but of mistrust, and arguments of a mind so given to usury, that he supposeth no way can be for him to live if he must forsake usury. But they make this objection, that the Lord must not be tempted, as though it were a tempting of God by sure trust, according to God's word, to hang upon his providence, and to forsake that kind of living, in the which men live idly, seeking by usury to have all things necessary. If it be a tempting of the Lord not to live upon usury, what excuse is there for so many godly fathers, prophets, apostles, and others, both of the Old Testament and of the New, as did rather suffer poverty and hunger than embarrass vantage of usury? Doth Christ teach this to tempt the Lord, when he commandeth them not to gather treasure unto themselves, and to lend, looking for nothing thereof? To tempt the Lord is to trust unto the Lord, whereas nothing is promised of the Lord, and to neglect the trades of living and doing which he teacheth, and to use other. But I find nowhere that the Lord hath promised to nourish and keep us by usury in idleness. Wherefore, this is rather a tempting of God to live in idleness, and also to consecrate children unto idleness, and then to trust that money yielding yearly usury can be able continually to give them enough, lose through not only for necessaries, but also for superfluous pleasure. Wherefore, also their reason is but vain, which to cloak their usury say, When, as for usury, I do commit my money of trust unto others, then do I let it forth to danger. For it may chance that the merchant which useth my money about his merchandise business, either by misfortune or else by his own negligence, fall into poverty, and so my whole stock be lost. Wherefore, while fortune favoreth, it is not far amiss that I take usury of him, so is the usurer tossed in uncertainties, and casteth his goods into jeopardy, far unlike unto them which, trusting to God, occupy themselves honestly. Gaiman has also jeoparded their money in uncertainty, and yet no wise man doth allow the love of gamining in a Christian man. After this sort, when, as they will not be such as tempt God, they confess by word and deed that they cast their money into uncertain success and dangers, when they let it forth for usury, and so they tempt God. Thirdly, thou shouldst consider how that rich merchant or prince behaveth himself, which payeth thee usury. Thou thinkest it is a sufficient excuse for usury that he is not so poor as by paying of usury to hinder himself. But if thou make a good reckoning, thou shalt perceive besides these other things to be considered. But if he labor by the abuse of thy money to get riches, either into pride and riot, or else unto the practice of tyranny and wars, to lay waste and oppress other countries, and also his... Here there is a lacuna in the text. Then, I pray thee, how canst thou glory that thy taking of usury is blameless, seeing that for it thou art made to serve other men's sins in making thy money subject unto such men's lusts? Thinkest thou that thou mayest freely let out thy money unto any use, so that it be done to thy known gain? Is not money let out of usurers the greatest cause of riotousness daily increasing in this our age, of pride more than is amongst the heathen, of shameful idleness of many thousands, of so many bloody wars and spoiled subjects? If thou be a Christian man, how canst thou keep no reckoning of these things? There is, as it were, a certain conspiracy betwixt them that give and them that take usury, for they lay their labors together whereby they serve on either side, their own gains or affections, and so they join together one with the other to commit sin. 
It is a heavy thing if any man alone and by himself do sin, but how much more weighty ought it to be thought, if any man for private gain do so bestow his diligence towards his neighbor as to nourish him also in his naughtiness. Fourthly, also, this is to be considered, how this kind of usury letteth the works of charity. As concerning that money which that usurer hath unoccupied, and needeth not to be bestowed upon any necessary household affairs, that it do not remain idle and unfruitful, but that he may take some profit of it, he supposeth that it ought to be let out unto some use. Therefore he letteth it forth unto usury, and this way he thinketh that he doth well provide for his own profit. But I beseech you, when shall he, being of this mind, help his neighbours round about him, that be poor and needy? That which he taketh up of usury he appointeth partly unto necessary uses, and partly unto the gain of usury, to increase his stock yearly by such gains as he can get. Whereof can a man think that he will give unto the poor? Whereof will he freely and without usury lend unto the poor that asketh, of that of the which he findeth himself and his? No, I suppose, wherefore should I give, saith he, unto others that which I need myself? Paul saith, that your abundance may fill up their want. Here is no abundance, all that I have is necessary. I must take heed to beautify this estate which I received of my ancestors. I must regard my name and my honor. I must, as mere is, keep my wife and children not beggarly and barely, but liberally. Here is need not of a little and common sum of money, but of a great and notable. Will he give of that which he appointeth unto usury? No, no. These he thinketh be holy things, not to be touched. What then remaineth but that in such a man that works of charity be suppressed by diligence to get money, especially if this usury be thought not unlawful, so that a mind possessed with love of money can be nipped with no feeling of sin, but as in a lawful matter thinketh there is no danger. And so we hear these answers, when as anything is asked to be borrowed of such men, I would lend, say they, if I had money in a readiness, but at this time I have no money, wherefore he must be content, albeit so I lend nothing. So they neglect and excuse a deed of charity, but why have they no money at hand? Therefore, because part is appointed unto household and daily charges, part to enrich and increase the stock, and hereof we see it cometh off to pass that they which be so minded upon usury do not out of hand pay the hire which they owe neither unto smiths, neither unto tailors, neither unto shoemakers, but suffer it certain years to grow into great sums, lest that they should be constrained to cut off any portion of money belonging either unto usury or unto the family. Howsoever those workmen unto the which they be indebted, in the meantime be at home with need oppressed." What thing can be devised worse than this is? Therefore, if those be well weighed, which I have heretofore recited, that is to say, how this usury is the, here there is a lacuna in the text, of private profit, and serveth incredulity and mistrust unto such abuses as money let out unto usury serveth, and how that the deeds of charity be destroyed by desire to gain money, I think that it is evident enough that this usury which is exercised amongst rich men, as though it were lawful, cannot be allowed of them which know what is required of the professors of Christian religion, which bear such a badge of brotherly charity and of contempt of riches earthly, that without them they cannot be counted to be Christians. Of the Usury of Widows and the Fatherless They that be tutors either of widows or of the fatherless, move here a question concerning such money as is not their own, but remaineth by inheritance unto widows and orphans, whether it be lawful for them to let out that money unto usury, and deliver it to be used of them, which without their own hindrance may yearly repay some usury. They say the money is not ours, but we be trusted with it. That which we do is not for our own gain, but for the widows and fatherless. Wherefore we are not in this to be blamed, as though by taking usury we seek our own, for we seek not our own but the profit of others, widows and fatherless, and so we fulfill the work of charity, and we do as we are bonden by promises unto them. I answer, I know that this was a custom amongst our fathers, afore pestilent usury had defiled the church, and that was permitted unto widows and orphans which was permitted unto none other. All usury was called evil except that of widows and of the fatherless. At the last all the gates were opened unto this evil and gain of usury granted to any man. 
But how well widows and orphans were provided for, the corruption of the times following doth evidently witness. There could have been brought no evil more noisome into the church of Christ, by the which afterward the goods of widows and fatherless began miserably to be wasted. For when, as the fire of usury hath eaten up all the wealth of a family after the death of the father of the family, what remnant remaineth unto widows and fatherless that may be let out unto usury? Should it not have been better for the provision of widows and of the fatherless, if liberty of usury could nowhere have had any place among Christians? Now, because gain of usury is crept in under the pretense of widows and orphans, unto them cannot come of the usury of these times any so great gains as hurt and hindrance that is sprung out of that sufferance of our ancestors. Furthermore, it is evident enough by reason of that sufferance that usury was not therefore suffered unto widows and fatherless, because it was lawful. For if it had been taken as lawful and faultless, wherefore should there have been any sufferance and permission but for that which was unlawful unto others, was thought that in such sort it might be suffered unto widows and fatherless, when, as charity, the mother of all liberality, began in the church not only to wax cold and fruitless, but utterly dead and vanquished. But, and if the apostle's precept concerning widows, 1 Timothy 5, had been kept, certainly they might fare better and more Christian-like have been provided for than by sufferance of unlawful usury. If a young woman were a widow, she should be occupied with some honest labor, and being of a base stock, she should be either a waiting or a bondservant unto her ancients until such time as God did give good occasion of convenient marriage. If she were old, she should live simply of her own, so long as her own goods did last, and after that they were spent, she should be found of her kinsfolk, or if they were not able, then should she live upon the church's goods according to the custom of the apostolical church. When, as at the beginning of the growing of the church, by faithful contributors, church goods were laid together, how were they then disposed? They were divided according unto every man's need, and were not let out unto usury for gains. That simplicity did well agree with faithful Christianity, and did much commend that charity by the which badge Christ's scholars are known. But now in this usurer's world and season how faithfully the need of widows and fatherless is provided for, it is by over many examples daily declared. Howbeit that usury might easily be suffered, by the which it is thought that the need of widows, fatherless, and poor hospitals be provided for, if the confused heap of other usuries and unlawful bargains might be utterly taken away, either by the authority of God's word amongst them that will be taught to fear God, or else by the power of the magistrates, which ought, in these assemblies summoned by the emperor, not to be least regarded, if, as is pretended, so there be indeed any seeking of the reformation of Christ's church." Wherefore, it is hardly to be wished that if all usury cannot utterly be banished out of Christ's church, yet at the least that this usury be not suffered, by the which the substance of poor men be miserably, contrary unto Christ's charity, pilled and piked, yea, supped up and devoured. I mean that usury which the rich doth require and take of him whom he knoweth to be unable to bear the hindrance of usury, and unto whom, through the affection of true love, according to the sentence of Christ our Saviour, he ought either by giving or lending to stretch forth his hands, not to spoil but to help. Against this kind of usury the canonists have appointed certain penalties besides God's punishment, which the usurers deserve. First, that they be noted of infamy, with infamy of the law, and that also by the civil law as well as by the canon law. Furthermore, that they be not admitted unto the communion of the church. Thirdly, that they be embarred of burial belonging unto Christ's church. Fourthly, that their testaments and wills be of no effect by any law, with many others such kinds of just penalties. But these have remained in papers, and in the mean season, usurers in the church have honours, with unlawful gotten goods, and such unshamefastness hath prevailed unpunished, that many magistrates, princes, and other great personages do give liberty unto the Jews in their dominions to exercise not only simple usury, but also that which is named usury of usurers, and they do not only give license, but they also let out houses and bargain with them for certain exaction, what they shall yearly pay for liberty to exercise usury, and most unrighteously they force their subjects to be bound to pay such usuries. And here is settled that bishop-like correction which pardoneth ravens and plagueth doves. But here we make an end of this consideration of usury, for as I said of the first it might well be thought great folly 
to be much occupied in such a matter that, being like unto the gout, can be helped by no hands of any surgery. This evil is waxen so big that after the admonition of many good men it is become uncurable, for it hath corrupted even the crowns of the heads of those which ought by their authority to have withstand such corruption, and to have kept and ordered the other lower members in the trade of true righteousness. It is Christ's saying, If the salt be unsavory, what shall be seasoned therewith? Also ye are the light of the world. If the light which is in you be darkness, how great shall the darkness of the body be? There remaineth nothing else but that we look for the hand of the Lord, which soon shall remove out of the church all kind of corruption. The Lord come at once and deliver his. Amen. End of Of the Lawful and Unlawful Usury Amongst Christians by Wolfgang Musculus The Life of Michael Servetus by James Waddell Alexander This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The burning of Servetus has been the favorite theme of all the enemies of Calvin and Calvinism. When all other arguments have failed, this has been resorted to, as if even admitting all the allegations of his worst foes, the reformer's doctrine were hereby in any degree invalidated. Papists, errorists, and infidels have here joined their forces and united in the outcry against their common scourge. Thousands who have never gone into one historical source or consulted one authentic document have ventured to pronounce upon the case. In an affair not only perplexing as to the extent and remoteness of the testimony, but difficult from its involving the nicest questions of jurisprudence, we find men totally ignorant of both the facts and the law, adventuring conclusive judgments. Learned authors have gone out of their way, in the midst of scientific disputations, to inform us that Calvin burned Servetus. And among the ranks of all who dislike sound doctrine, the clinching argument for these two hundred years and more has been Calvin burned Servetus. If, for the sake of argument, it should be conceded that John Calvin did in very deed counsel, procure, and effect the execution of this wretched Spaniard, very little would be gained by those who are most interested in establishing the charge. For as a mere historical incident, it is by no means solitary. It stands as one of a hundred parallel cases. The prominency which it has obtained is due to the eminence of the actors, but chiefly to the enmity indulged towards the doctrines of the reformer. If it were not for this, one might well suppose from the frequency, urgency, and heat with which the charge is reiterated that it was a signal, peculiar, and unparalleled phenomenon of persecuting intolerance, that it was opposed to the acknowledged principles of the age in which it took place, that it fell under the rebuke and detestation of all the victim's contemporaries, that so atrocious an act of cruelty was reprobated by the leading papists, or certainly by the leading reformers, that it was unexampled in the history of the reformed churches, that Germany, Switzerland, France, and England were pure from any similar enormity, and that it was the last flagrant eruption of a vindictive crater long since extinct. Let it be repeated, even if it were true that John Calvin did extend the torch to the injured servitus, the foregoing suppositions might seem natural when the fact is dwelt on and rehearsed by every stripling theologist who chooses to run a tilt with the shade of a hero, or every physician, lawyer, or declaimer whose tongue blisters at uttering the name of a predestinarian. Every student of history knows that every one of these suppositions is a falsity, that the age was an age of persecution in which the church, still retaining many scales of popish prejudice, was purblind to the rights of conscience, that persecutions for heresy were universal, and punishment of heretics practiced in the freest countries under heaven, that this deplorable event was in perfect agreement with the principles of the statesmen and theologians of that day, that when the humbling fact occurred, it was approved and upheld by the very reformers whom it is attempted to exalt above Calvin in this comparison, not excepting the gentle Melanchthon, that similar executions before and after blacken the history of the church in Germany, Switzerland, France, and even England. Moreover, every competent historian is informed that the excellent Cranmer lies under the same or worse imputations, and that a multitude of hapless men and women fell under the secular arm for spiritual offences before the principle of liberty of conscience was established. The human mind comes slowly to the acknowledgment even of great and seemingly plain truths, 
and there is no one of the grand fundamental principles of our own enlightened age which men were so slow to receive as this of the rights of conscience. Hence, and let the remark be pondered in this investigation, never was it fully and distinctly recognized as a principle in any government until the time of Roger Williams and the settling of Rhode Island. And when this good but eccentric man wrote against the bloody tenant of persecution for cause of conscience, it was one of the pilgrim race, it was John Cotton of Boston, who published, in accordance with the spirit of the whole age, his bloody tenant washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. Were it then conclusively made out that Calvin acted the part of a determined persecutor, while we should both lament and blame, as we do in the case of Cranmer and the Puritans, we should not be astonished, nor should we renounce the man or his system. To expect anything else would be to expect unparalleled exaltation above the age in which he lived. And while we do accord, as the Reformed churches cheerfully accorded, to this wonderful servant of Christ a great precedency among his brethren, while we stand amazed at the progress which one gigantic soul could make through the corruptions of popery and the corruptions of partial reform to great purity and light in doctrine and polity and even political science, yet we esteem him human and consequently imperfect and freely grant that in some points he was involved in the same shadows with his coevals, and that one of these was the point in question. Calvin and Servetus were both prominent men, hence the notoriety of the transaction. Of all living Protestants, there was none so much revered by his friends or so much hated by his trembling opponents as the legislator of the Reformation. And of all the brood of heretics which infested the rising church, the most dreaded was Michael Servetus. He was, says the mild Coleridge, a rabid enthusiast and did everything he could in the way of insult and ribaldry to provoke the feeling of the Christian church. It is our object in the sequel to give a fair statement of the facts in the case not to plead for persecution or to vindicate this instance of it, not to exculpate Calvin from all participation in it, but to furnish the lover of truth with data from which to form a judgment, to stop the mouths of ignorant or malicious calumniators, and to show in what relation the reformer of Geneva stood to this transaction. Michael Servetus was born at Villa Nueva in Aragon in 1509. He called himself Villa Nueve, or Villa Novius, from this place, but is said to have declared himself a native of Todel in Navarre. At the age of 14, he is reported to have understood Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and to have been imbued with the knowledge of philosophy, mathematics, and scholastic theology. M. Simon, however, says, It is evident by this author's books that it cost him a great deal of trouble to write in Latin, and Servetus himself, in the second edition of a book, says, Quod autem ita barbarus confusus et incorrectus prior liber proderit imperitie meae et typography in curie ad scribendum est. At the age of fifteen he went to Italy in the suite of Charles V, whom he saw crowned at Bologna. At this time the seeds of anti-Trinitarian doctrine began to germinate in Italy. The Sosini and their fellows were then rising. It is believed that Servetus, under these influences, adopted his peculiar tenets. The late Dr. McCree expresses his belief that the anti-Trinitarian opinions, which spread there so widely, were introduced into Italy by means of his writings. From Italy he went to Germany, and thence to Switzerland, and at Basel held a conference with Oculampadius, with whom he disputed about the Trinity in 1530. He then repaired to Strasbourg and conferred with Capito and with Busser, the latter was so far overcome with indignation at the impieties of Servetus as to say from the pulpit that he deserved to be put to death. Such was the error and blindness even of one who was surnamed the moderate reformer, an error and blindness caught from his Romish education. Before he left Basel, Servetus had prepared a book in which he attacked the orthodox faith respecting the Trinity. This he left there in the hands of Conrad Rauss, a bookseller, who sent it to Hagnau as it was a dangerous business to print it. The author followed his manuscript and published it at the second named place in 1531. He published a second of like contents in 1532. The former of these was entitled De Trinitatus Erroribus Libri Septem Per Michaelem Servetum alias Reves ab Argonia Hispanum. Scarcely a copy is known to be extant. Morsheim says that both this and the dialogues are barbaro descendi genere conscripti. 
The second work was entitled Dialogorum de Trinitate Libri Duo de Justitia Regni Christi, Capitula Quatuor per Michaelem Servetum, etc. In this he retracts all that he had said in the preceding, not as being false, but imperfectly and carelessly and ignorantly written. These works were so largely circulated, especially in Italy, that, as late as 1539, Melanchthon felt himself bound to write a caveat against them to the Senate of Venice. Servetus passed his time in Germany until 1533, but then, finding himself without adherents and awkwardly situated, from his ignorance of the language and particularly desirous of studying mathematics and medicine, he went to France. Here he sought notoriety both as a scholar and an author. He studied medicine at Paris under the instruction of Silvinus and Fernel, and was graduated Master of Arts and Doctor of Physic by the university. Beza relates that in this city, as early as in 1534, Calvin opposed his doctrines. After taking his degrees, Servetus professed mathematics in the Lombard College. During this period, he was preparing an edition of Ptolemy's geography and several medical works, being meanwhile in warm contests with the medical faculty. We next find him at Lyon, with Frelin, a publisher, whom he served as corrector of the press. After various excursions, he settled at Chalut, and there practiced medicine. Bozek, the noted enemy and slanderer of Calvin, and who wrote a memoir for the mere purpose of blasting his character, accounts thus for Servetus's leaving his settlement. This Servetus was arrogant and insolent, as those have affirmed who knew him at Chalut, where he lodged with La Riviere about the year 1540, but was forced to leave that place on account of his extravagancies. From Chalut, he returned to Lyon. Here, he fell in with Peter Palmer, Archbishop of Vien, following him to his see and enjoyed a harbour in his palace. While at Vien, he worked at a revised edition of Pagnin's Bible, which he furnished with notes abounding in crudity and depravity of doctrine. By the intervention of the printer Frelin, he opened a correspondence with Calvin. The manner in which Servetus conducted himself in this may be seen in his published letters. Calvin chose to break off all communication with a man who treated him with perpetual arrogance, and from this time Servetus never ceased to vituperate and oppose the reformer. Servetus wrote a third work against the orthodox faith, and after several ineffectual attempts elsewhere, had it printed at Wien in 1553. This was his famous Restitution of Christianity. Attempts have been made to show that it was Calvin who caused information to be lodged against Servetus with the ecclesiastical authorities. After a careful examination of the authorities and a full citation of all the witnesses on both sides, M. Chofbi pronounces the charge to be wholly without proof. If it were true, it could show no more than that Calvin did what no good citizen of that generation would have denied to be a praiseworthy act. That Calvin communicated the evidence on which this process was founded, he expressly denies. And this denial must be credited, for, as he says, it is utterly against every presumption that he could correspond with Cardinal Tournon, one of the chief persecutors of the Protestants, and accordingly his virulent foes, Meimburg and Bosek, never hint at such a charge. It is agreed, however, that process was instituted, and the issue was a sentence that there was not as yet sufficient evidence for an imprisonment. On a second examination, the Inquisition seized his person by a finesse, and by a finesse quite as allowable, Servetus escaped from them, June 17, 1553, and betook himself to the Lyonus. The process went on in his absence, and according to the usual course of popish trials, resulted in condemnation and sentence that he should be burned alive in a slow fire. This was executed on his effigy and five bales of his books. The unfortunate author, after thus flying from Wien, wandered in places where historians cannot trace him. If Calvin is to be credited, four months elapsed before he arrived at Geneva, where he was arrested, tried, condemned, and executed. There is great diversity of statement in the different accounts as to the length of time he remained at large and the manner of his being apprehended. According to the most unfavorable report, he was discovered at divine worship on the Lord's Day, and his presence was made known to the magistracy by Calvin himself. That this was done, if done at all, from personal enmity rather than mistaken zeal for a code of laws against heresy, which all the world then approved, is only asserted, can never be proved, is by no means probable, and will be rejected by impartial history as the conjecture of prejudice. Such writers as Gibbon and Roscoe have vented much bitter crimination on this pretended motive, 
We may ask with a late eminent historian, is it not with justice that it has been surmised that philosophers who not only iniquitously resolved to try men of the 16th century by rules and principles scarcely admitted before the 18th, but greedily receive every calumny or insinuation that false witnesses can utter against them, and indulge in the most extravagant invectives in setting forth their misdeeds, had they themselves happened to live three centuries back, would not have been content to smite only with the tongue or the pen, but would eagerly have grasped the sword or the torch. We have conducted this brief narrative thus far without any account of the opinions charged against this unhappy fugitive. As we approach the critical and final act of the sad drama, it becomes proper to state, calmly and from the best sources, the nature of those tenets which rendered him obnoxious to the laws and let no one undertake to discuss this subject who is so ignorant of history as not to know that in this day and throughout Christendom heresy, especially when joined with blasphemy, was a capital crime. In the noonday of civil and religious freedom a child may detect the fallacy of the argument that heresy, which slays the soul, should have as dire a penalty as murder, which slays only the body. But the Roman Catholic, the Protestant, and the Socinian of the sixteenth century assented to this argument. According to the standard of the times, Servetus was a heretic. The following sketch of his published opinions is very far below their enormity, for details are purposely omitted. The authorities may be seen at great length in the Life of Servetus by M. Chauffepierre. Such is the jumble of inconsistent crudities in the works of this writer that it is impossible to refer his tenets to any existing title in the nomenclature of error. He was not a cool speculator, but a hasty enthusiast. At the same time, he was furiously opposed to many of the doctrines always regarded as fundamental in the Church of Christ. It was not the favorite dogmas of Calvin, as some ignorantly or maliciously assert, which this heretic made it his business to impugn. It was not predestination, special grace, perseverance, or any of the tenets for which the Reformed churches particularly contended, which were assaulted in his works. His shafts were aimed at more vital parts, the very nature of God, the Trinity, the Incarnation, and similar foundations of our holy faith. He was at once a pantheist, an anti-Trinitarian, and a materialist. Not content with philosophizing about the personality of God, he maintained that God is the universe, and that the universe is God. According to him, God is the infinite ocean of substance, the essence of all things. Not only the devil is in God, as also depraved spirits, but hell is no other thing but God himself. As God is the principle and end of all things, so they return at last to him, and in going into eternal fire, demons shall go to God himself. But it was the doctrine of the Holy Trinity that he set himself chiefly to impugn. In his first book he was more cautious than in those which followed. The doctrine of the earliest was nearer to Sabellianism than to anything else. We have the authority of the ministers of Zurich for saying that he often called the Trinity of the Orthodox a triple monster, a three-headed Cerberus, imaginary gods, and finally visionary and three-headed devils. That he reviled Athanasius and Augustine as Trinitarians, that is, atheists, to enlarge upon his other errors and heresies respecting the creation, the immortality of the soul, regeneration, etc., would be unnecessary. Our object is not to detail the vagaries of an enthusiast whose works indicate a perversion of mind almost amounting to insanity. Still less is it our wish so to represent his pestiferous errors as to convey the idea that it was right to visit them with secular penalties and a cruel death. We reject the opinion, nor is it a merit in any one to do so at this time, when all reasonable Christians do the same. But we only mean to show that the tenets of Servetus were such as might naturally lead even good men in the twilight of religious liberty to recognize the duty of surrendering him to the secular arm. That Calvin so thought is not surprising, as we have the fullest evidence to make it probable that any one of the prominent men of the age, whether churchman or laity, whether Romanist or Protestant, would have held the same opinion. Accordingly, as soon as Calvin discovered that Servetus was in the city, he used means to have him apprehended. The words of Calvin are, he thought perhaps to pass through this city. Why he came hither is not known, but seeing that he was recognized, I thought it right that he should be detained. It was necessary that the prosecutor should be personally held in durance while the process was pending, and Calvin used the intervention of Nicholas de la Fontaine, a student belonging to his household. Great reproach has been cast on the reformer for this step, as if it had been his intention to shun the appearance of being active in the affair but he declares most fully the contrary. 
I declare frankly that since, according to the law and custom of the city, none can be imprisoned for any crime without an accuser or prior information, I have made it so that a party should be found to accuse him, not denying but the action laid against him was drawn by my advice in order to commence the process. In our account of the trial, we follow Chauffepierre, in whose impartial statement are found abundant extracts and references to authentic documents, of which most are beyond the reach of American students and therefore need not be expressly cited. Servetus first appeared, August 14, 1553. Lafontaine adduced in evidence the printed books and a manuscript which was owned by the author, though it had been several years lying in the hands of Calvin. On the 15th, the examination upon the same articles proceeded. On the 17th, La Fontaine and a certain German named Caledon, who is now associated with him in the prosecution, produced letters from Oculampadius and passages from Melanchthon showing that Servetus had been condemned in Germany. They likewise cited further passages of a heretical character. On the 21st he appeared again, and after the course of the ordinary investigations had proceeded, he conferred or disputed with Calvin on certain questions respecting the Trinity. This conference, however it may have been misrepresented, was not contrary to the prisoner's interest. Indeed, it should seem that his abettors complained that there was not sufficient license allowed for frequent disputations. The judges then ordered that the books which Servetus required for his answer should be brought at his expense, and that he should retain those which Calvin had cited. On the 22nd, Servetus sent a letter to the syndics and council, entering a plea to their jurisdiction, maintaining that it was unchristian to institute a capital prosecution for religious opinion, declaring that the ancient doctrine allowed merely the banishment even of such as Arius himself, and praying that he might have an advocate. The reader, while he weeps over the prejudice which could disregard pleas so reasonable, will remember that even in England, long since the Reformation, prisoners have been denied counsel to plead their cause before a jury in any felony, whether it be capital, within the benefit of clergy, or a case of petite larceny. On the 28th, new articles of accusation were brought forward, and among other offences he was charged with the Anabaptist error about the power of the magistrate. During these protracted investigations he persisted in avowing his tenants, and his determination to avow them, unless he should be convinced. Even when charged with his indecent railings and dreadful blasphemies, he made no excuse. I confess, said he, I have written so, and when you shall teach me otherwise, I will not only embrace it, but will kiss the ground you walk on. In the meantime, information had most unnecessarily and ungenerously been sent to Wien of the arrest of Servetus. On the last day of August, an officer from that city appeared before the Council of Geneva with a copy of their sentence and a request that the prisoner should be remanded to them. It was left to his choice, and as was most natural, he rejected the harsh proposal and pathetically besought that he might be judged by the magistrates of Geneva. Hitherto we find nothing in the conduct of Calvin inconsistent with the standard of belief and feeling at that day. It is melancholy to observe how this important circumstance is overlooked by those who, from a hasty induction of mistaken facts, attribute to personal malice the whole of his conduct. Let it never be forgotten that the proceeding of a democratical city and a judicial council is one thing, and the ministerial and subordinate act of their pastor and teacher another thing. And even though the latter might willingly appear in the case as prosecutor, witness, or expounder of theological opinions, we are not to charge him with every enormity of the syndics and council, especially as it is a matter of history that the faction which was at that juncture dominant in the Council of Geneva was opposed to the reformer. Plainly unjust it is, then, to repeat for the thousandth time that we are at liberty to consider every act of that body as emanating from Calvin. This charge of vicious and vindictive interference has been repelled by several impartial historians. Calvin, says M. La Roche, never came into the court but when he was commanded, and there he did nothing but by the order of his master. Upon every emergency, it seems, they had recourse to divines, to consult with them, to confer with prisoners, to direct interrogations, to make extracts, examine answers, and many other things of this kind. I believe, in the station this pastor of Geneva was in, they were afraid of transgressing, if they did anything without him. But why represent him as an impertinent hypocrite, who intruded himself by his office in this affair, or as an implacable enemy who earnestly solicited Servetus's death? And here it is but fair to let the defamed reformer speak a word for himself. The extract is from his French works as cited by La Chapelle. I will not deny but that he was made prisoner upon my application, 
but after he was convicted of his heresies, everyone knows that I did not in the least insist that he should be punished with death. And as to the truth of what I say, not only all good men will bear me witness, but I defy all malicious men to say it is not so. The proceeding has shown with what intention I did it. For when I and my brethren, I mean all the ministers of the gospel, were called, it was not owing to us that he had not full liberty given him of conferring and treating with the articles wherein he has erred in an amicable manner with us. It was on the first day of September that the judges again availed themselves of Calvin's aid in procuring an extract of offensive propositions in the very words of Servetus. These were thirty-eight in number. They were put into the author's hands that he might answer, explain, or retract. He wrote a reply, and this in its turn was answered by Calvin. The answer of Calvin was likewise delivered to Servetus, who made notes upon it. The reader who would pursue the subject into its lesser windings may find all these documents among Calvin's opuscula. A consultation of these will do more to show the virulence and headstrong fury of Servetus than any second-hand statement. About a fortnight was spent in these proceedings. On the 15th, Servetus petitioned that his cause might be referred to the Council of 200, in which body, it should be observed, the sovereignty of the Commonwealth resided. It is believed, says the cautious Chauffeur, that this request was suggested to him by Calvin's enemies, who contributed as much, and even more than he, to Servetus's destruction. Believing himself well supported, he observed no measures with Calvin or his judges. If he had the least modesty or discretion, I doubt not, but he might have brought himself off. But flattering himself with a triumph over Calvin, by the credit of the party which opposed this reformer, he was the victim of his pride and prejudice. This is the only way of explaining his constant conduct at Geneva, in all respects so different from his behaviour at Wien. The hopes of Servetus from the city faction must have been strong as we find him on the 22nd of September petitioning that Calvin should be punished as a calumniator. On the 10th of October he made a new request from which it appears that his situation in the prison was very miserable. It is common to charge the persecution of Servetus upon Calvin alone and the undiscriminating compilers of our biographical dictionaries without adducing an authority dogmatically declare that the reformer of Geneva acted out of his mere personal hatred. It is glaringly false. It is not for us to say how much false fire mingled with the zeal of Calvin, but we are well informed that not only he but all Protestant Europe looked upon it as one common cause of truth. From what has been already said, it is plain that the case was not precipitately issued, and, at the point of time which our sketch has reached, the magistrates of Geneva determined to consult the Swiss cantons. For this purpose they sent to them the restitution of Christianity with Calvin's papers and the prisoner's answers, and requested the opinion of the Swiss theologians upon the subject. The unanimous reply was that, the magistrates of Geneva ought to restrain Servetus, and to prevent the spread of his errors. Painful as the conclusion is, it cannot be evaded that the judgment of John Calvin was simply the judgment of all the Helvetic Christians, too nearly allied, alas, to the popish errors from which they had half escaped, but palliated by the circumstances. M. de Alwerden, the great authority of Mr. Roscoe, in his hasty and petulant censures, pretends that Calvin kept back from the press all these letters except the one from Zurich, but the letters are happily extant to give triumphant refutation to the slander, and whoever reads them will conclude with La Chapelle that all the churches of Switzerland agreed to punish Servetus capitally, since they all concurred in testifying their utmost abhorrence of his heresies and requiring that this outrage should not be left unpunished. Beza was, therefore, not falsifying when he wrote that the issue was ex omnium enim heveticarum ecclesiarum sententia, the prisoner himself showed a degree of confidence in these authorities by the appeal which he is known to have made to the churches of Zurich, Schaffshausen, Bern, and Basel. What were the replies of the Swiss magistrates to this reference from Geneva? Those of Zurich used these terms. In confidence that you will not suffer the wicked intention of your said prisoner to go further, which is entirely contrary to the Christian religion and gives great scandal and insult and the ministers still more decisively, the holy providence of God has now offered an occasion for cleaning you from the suspicion, i.e. of fostering heresy, of this evil, that is, if you shall be vigilant and diligently take heed that the contagion of this poison spread no further, which we doubt not your excellencies will effect. 
The magistrates of Schaffhausen referred the question to their ministers and sent the reply of the latter, which ends thus. Nor do we doubt, but that of your remarkable wisdom, you will repress the attempts of this man, lest his blasphemies eat, as doth a canker, still more extensively into Christ's members. For to set aside his ravings by long argumentation, what would it be but to rave with a madman? The magistrates of Baza, proceeding in the same way, replied by their ministers, But if he persevere incurably in the perverseness which he has conceived, let him, in pursuance of your duty and of the authority granted you by the Lord, be so coerced that he may no longer be able to molest the church of Christ, and lest the last things be worse than the first. The magistrates of Bern wrote, We beg of you, not doubting, but you are thereto also inclined, that you will take proper measures, that sects and heresies, as these are, or such like, be not sown in the church of Jesus Christ, our only Saviour. Such was the unanimous answer of the Swiss magistrates, and we think the fact worthy of repetition, as being very important in its bearing on the whole affair, that Servetus, after a protracted examination and defence before the Senate, and after the consistory or ministerial body had laboured to confute and reclaim him, appealed to the Swiss churches, and this before the said consistory had given their official opinion as to the question whether the positions which the Senate considered as proved amounted to heresy and blasphemy. On the 26th of October, sentence was pronounced by which Servetus was condemned to be burned alive. Calvin informs us that Servetus, two hours before his death, sent for him and asked his forgiveness. Calvin reminded him, with all mildness, that sixteen years before he had endeavoured, even at the risk of his own life, to reclaim him, and that it had not been through his fault that Servetus had not by repentance been restored to the friendship of all religious persons. He also endeavoured to have the mode of execution changed to one less barbarous. Chatillon, otherwise called Castellio and Castalio, a declared enemy of Calvin, accused him of having smiled when the heretic passed the window from which he was looking. There is no other alleged proof of this unlikely story. M. La Roche, who elsewhere deals harshly with Calvin, and treats this as a wretched calumny. Servetus was accompanied to the stake by Farel, and so far maintained his characteristic obstinacy that he would scarcely allow Farel to ask the prayers of the people. Thus miserably perished this unfortunate and wicked man by a cruel death on the 27th day of October 1553. During the whole trial, the contumacy and recklessness of the prisoner were remarkable. Especially did he seem to make it his aim to irritate and sting his great opponent Calvin. In the notes already mentioned, which Servetus appended to Calvin's confutation of his arguments, he endeavours to goad the latter by every name of insult which could be foisted in. Cain and Simon Magus and murderer are ordinary terms, and in the course of a few hundred lines we have counted instances of the lie direct, menterius, to number of forty-six. Yet the replies of Calvin are comparatively mild. He deals with his opponent as if he scarcely thought him balanced in mind, and when sentence was pronounced it is notorious that he used his influence with the judge to procure a mitigation of the punishment, but without effect. Having now reached the close of the direct narrative, it only remains to ask whether, on reviewing the transaction, there is reason to attribute to Calvin any motives of personal rancor or any principles of action in the matter of persecution which were not prevalent in his age. Torrents of obloquy have been poured upon his memory, sometimes by Unitarians, who naturally befriend this great Unitarian, sometimes by Papists, who forget that Calvin's sins were the mere sequela of a distemper caught amongst themselves, and sometimes by Episcopalians, who know that, for one servitus, they can number many victims of the like misguided zeal in their own borders. We have from the outset conceded the cardinal fact, namely that Calvin was instrumental in bringing Servetus to trial for heresy, and thus, if you please, to execution. But we shall ever maintain that it is grossly unjust, without the shadow of proof, to charge this act to motives which are not charged in a multitude of similar instances. It was scarcely so much the fault of the man as of the age. At this time of day, a Protestant can scarcely picture to himself the horrid image raised in the mind of our forefathers by the name heretic. A heretic was then, as M. La Chapelle well says, a monster of horror, an emissary of hell, an enemy of God and man. This is the notion of common people among the papists to this day. Judge then how they would talk of a heretic when heretics were almost as rare in Europe as the phoenix in Egypt. 
Did they consult the canon or the civil law or theological standards? Heretics were excommunicated persons, poisoners of mankind, public pests, guilty of high treason, against both human and divine governments, a treason capital in the first degree. These principles were assumed as self-evident in parliaments and courts of princes by popes and republics. In the Reformation, a sun had arisen on the world, but the mists and fogs of a long night still mantled the horizon. The doctrine of persecution was a papal innovation which lingered after theological errors had been dispersed. It was found in the laws of the empire and in the fathers of the church, whose authority had scarcely yet been shaken. Hence we can pity even more than we blame the inconsistency of the Protestants who, escaping from persecution, became persecutors in their turn. To every calm inquirer into the history of religious liberty, the injustice of singling out this case will appear most glaring. It is Calvin's tenets which exasperate the minds of his calumniators, else Servetus had lain in oblivion along with Joan Botcher and George Van Parr. The great standing charge against Calvin is one which it is hard to answer simply because it is without any proof. It is that the reformer was actuated by long-cherished resentment and private hate. M. Chauffepierre has the candor to admit that even if this could be proved, it would be a question whether he did not take advantage of the rigor of laws which he believed to be just. But it cannot be proved. It is, as Mr. Scott observes, unsupported and even contrary to evidence and is requisite to the solution of none of the phenomena of the case. The opinion of Calvin is now seen to be erroneous, and the act which he approved is condemned as cruel. In this we heartily concur. But the opinion and the act were approved by those very reformers and divines whom it is pretended to bring into a most favorable comparison with the reformer of Geneva. Let us lay open the truth on this point. It may be new to certain revilers, at least it may stop the mouth of presumptuous slander. Bullinger, the reformer of Zurich, writes thus, I do not see how it was possible to have spared Servetus, that most obstinate man, the very hydra of heresy. And in writing to the divines of Poland, he says, All among us in these churches who preach Christ and true religion consider as just the capital punishment of a blasphemous and incurable man who derided and abused the whole system. Peter Martyr likewise expresses his opinion that it was the duty of magistrates and princes to serve God by punishing heretics and blasphemers. Melanchthon, who is usually cited and honoured as the mildest of the reformers, thus speaks of this affair. I affirm that your magistrates have acted justly in putting to death a blasphemer after a regular adjudication. This should be weighed by all such anti-Calvinists as, in their addresses to the popular mind, try to play off the moderate Melanchthon against the cruel Calvin. But it is lamentably true that this is not a solitary effusion of Melanchthon's feeling in regard to the point in hand. M. de la Chapelle cites another instance little known from the history of one David George, in which it appears that a translator of George's work, in which the existence of the devil was denied, was threatened with prosecution and imprisonment by the reformer himself. Archbishop Cranmer, even setting aside his own example, held that Servetus ought to have suffered death. And Bishop Hall gives his formal opinion that in the transaction Calvin did well approve himself to God's church. This list of authorities might be greatly increased, but it is needless to exemplify further the prevalence of a sentiment which dishonors the Christian church while it destroys the malicious sophistry of controvertists who would make one good man the scapegoat of a whole generation. It is abundantly made out, therefore, that even if Calvin were responsible for the condemnation, specific sentence, and actual execution of a heretic, as we have shown he is not, he only shares this responsibility with Melanchthon, Bullinger, Peter Martyr, Cranmer, Hall, and the leaders of the Lutheran and Reformed churches. The case might be safely left at this point, but we will go further and evince by authentic records that the instance was not singular. One might suppose, from the angry zeal with which it has been blazoned as the sinister plot on the escutcheon of Calvinism, that this act of intolerance stands isolated, flaming forth with the horrors of a beacon on a hill. It is not so. All who have the smallest pretensions to historical erudition know that it is not so. There are noted examples of heretics being punished in different Protestant states. Let persecution, we exclaim with M. Chauffepierre, be blamed and let the execution of servitors be condemned. We subscribe to the whole, but let us not make it peculiar to Calvin, 
to have been under the prejudices of his age. More than 60 years after Calvin's death, we find the same judgment taking effect at Geneva in the case of Nicholas Antony, who was burned for heresy in 1632, in despite of the remonstrances of the ministers who desired the execution to be suspended. Again in 1652, by virtue of the same ecclesiastical code, though not on the same charge, one Chauderon was hanged for witchcraft. And we are only repeating the words of the liberal Chauffepierre, Mr. Gibbon's best authority, when we say, How many vexations have the Presbyterians suffered in England under the reign of James I, Charles I, and Charles II? I find under the reign of the first... Neil, Bishop of Winchester, caused to be hanged one Whiteman, a dogmatizer of that time, that King, Bishop of London, condemned one legate to be burnt for heresy, who was executed in Smithfield, and Peter Gunther of Prussia, a farrier by trade, was beheaded at Lübeck in the month of October 1687 by the consent of two universities because he would not own the divinity of Jesus Christ. It is surprising that certain writers of the Episcopal denomination should have the effrontery, as they have sometimes had, to charge the death of Servetus on presbytery. This event has by some of them been attributed to the gentle sway of presbytery. This is very weak argument and very desperate policy, not to dwell on its dishonesty. The nobler minds among prelatists have seen that common justice and the good faith of history alike repudiate the base insinuation that the common cause of Protestantism is wounded by it, and that this sort of argument, even if it should avail to tarnish presbytery, would overwhelm prelacy with contempt. We reject it, and our cause needs it not. In the noted and prominent case of Cranmer, we scornfully reject it. The meanness of charging one good man with the sole offence, when all the age were in like condemnation, we shall condemn wherever we find it. And it is only as a specimen of impotent malice that we cite the following observation of Mr. Lebas, the compiler of A Life of Cranmer, an observation written as if to divert attention from the case of George Van Parr, which he had just related. Everyone knows that Servetus was burned not merely as a heretic but as a blasphemer, that the distinction might be sufficient to satisfy a man like Calvin may not be very surprising, for what is known of his vehement temper would almost justify the suspicion that he had lived in the age of St. Dominic. He might have sat most conscientiously in the chair of the Inquisition. As if most studiously to cut off the wretched Calvin from all benefit of the plea he had just made for the Archbishop. That plea we acknowledge as valid and judicious, but we lament the ignoble prejudice which appended a gratuitous and false insinuation against the man whom that very Archbishop delighted to honour. Melancholy indeed, but true it is that Cranmer was concerned, at least as much as Calvin ever was, in bringing to the stake not one blaspheming heretic, but not less than four persons of whom two were simple women. This is recorded by such Episcopal historians as Stripe and Burnett and Fox. He did it in his ignorance, and we may well weep over the story, but let no one who affects to weep wipe away his tears to eject contumely upon a brother reformer found in the same offence. It was Cranmer who procured the death, such are the very words of Joan Botcher and George Van Parr, and who, when the pious Edward VI, with tears, hesitated to sign the death warrants, added his own persuasions. Even Mr. Labas says, with regard to Joan Botcher, that he fully acquiesced in the proceeding can hardly be doubted if we are to credit the story so confidently told by his ardent admirer Fox, and not contradicted by any contemporary writer, namely that all the importunity of the council could not prevail on Edward to set his hand to the warrant, that Cranmer, upon this, was desired to persuade him, that even then the merciful nature of that princely boy held out long against the application, and that, when at last he yielded, he declared before God that the guilt should rest on the head of his advisers. Let this suffice for the abuse of these events by Episcopalian writers. We are so far from accusing Episcopalians in general of this disingenuousness that we believe there are multitudes of the well-informed and sincere whose sentiments are expressed by one of their own writers as follows. So far was the Church of England and her chief divines from countenancing that unbecoming and absurd treatment with which the name of this eminent Protestant is now so frequently dishonoured, 
that it would be no difficult matter to prove that there is not a parallel instance upon record of any single individual being equally and so unequivocally venerated for the union of wisdom and piety both in England and by a large body of the foreign churches as John Calvin. To this we might add the able and learned arguments of the Reverend John Scott of Hull, whose conclusions are in every point identical with our own. That the case is different in many of our popular historical works and in the articles of biographical dictionaries, patched up from these by mere compilers, will surprise no one who recollects that, in our day, history has too often fallen into the hands of sceptics. Roscoe makes it his especial care to vilify the reformers. We may safely leave his allegations to the triumphant answer of Mr. Waterman. Gibbon, as we need scarcely say, found it to suit the purpose of his life to degrade the memory of a leading Christian. But be it noted that the authority chiefly relied on in the preceding details and from whose truly cautious statements we have not seen occasion to vary in a single instance is Chauffepierre, the continuator of Bale's dictionary, whose narrative Gibbon pronounces the best account he had seen of the transaction. Other writers affected by no predilections in favour of presbytery have had the patience to study and the honesty to adjudicate this perplexing case with different results. Among these, we name the late Samuel Taylor Coleridge, an independent thinker, a laborious reader of authorities, and a professed enemy of Calvinism. His opinion is as follows. What ground is there for throwing the odium of Servetus' death upon Calvin alone? Why, the mild Melanchthon wrote to Calvin expressly to testify his concurrence in the act, and no doubt he spoke the sense of the German reformers, the Swiss churches advise the punishment in formal letters, and I think there are letters from the English divines approving Calvin's conduct. Before a man deals out the slang of the day about the great leaders of the Reformation, he should learn to throw himself back to the age of the Reformation, when the two parties in the church were eagerly on the watch to fasten the charge of heresy on the other. Besides, if ever a poor fanatic thrust himself into the fire, it was Michael Servetus. He was a rabid enthusiast, and did everything he could in the way of insult and ribaldry to provoke the feeling of the Christian church. He called the Trinity triceps monstrum et cerborum coendum tripartitum, and so on. This is sensible and just, and what might be expected from a philosopher and a scholar. For such an one, no declamation without proof will be sufficient, but the careless, the prejudiced, and the wicked, and especially those who hate the doctrine of special grace, and Calvin as its triumphant modern defender, will still avoid a laborious investigation and repeat in willful ignorance the refuted slanders of their predecessors. This rooted enmity to the theological system called Calvinism is the true source of the unjust invective against the reformer's conduct in this affair. If not, why are the similar and even worse offences of other great men altogether omitted, or, if not omitted, mentioned with every phrase of extenuation? It is Calvinism, it is the doctrine of Paul and of Augustine, which has caused this peculiar exacerbation of zeal. And after all, many seem to be ignorant of the history of this hateful scheme of opinions. It is acknowledged by Mr. John Scott, himself an Episcopalian, in the work already named, that Luther, Melanchthon, and Zwingli at an earlier period of their lives at least, held the doctrines of election and predestination, which have subsequently been denominated Calvinistic. Nor did those high doctrines, says he, originate with these persons. They held them in common with eminent writers who had preceded them and were members of the Roman Catholic Church, and they would, I apprehend, have been able to support some of their boldest positions by the authority of St. Augustine himself. Why, then, is all the odium of these obnoxious doctrines to be accumulated upon the devoted head of Calvin, who had never been heard of in public life, even at the latest period referred to? It is our confident expectation that in proportion to the increase of biblical study and the culture of mental philosophy among good men, there will be a return to these very doctrines, and that the works of Calvin, as we already see in Germany, will rise again in the estimation of the Church, and that his character will be pondered, as one of the noblest models of the theologian, the expositor, and the reformer. When this day shall come, the calumnies of his foes will find their due level. And though no man will ever vindicate his opinion or his practice in this instance any more than the exploded whimsies of the astrologer or the alchemist, pious Christians will accord to him the praise of Bishop Andrews that he was an illustrious person and never to be mentioned without a preface of the highest honour. Meanwhile, that the enemies of the reformer's memory ponder the testimony of Arminius himself. 
In a letter only two days before his death, he says, After the Holy Scriptures, I exhort the students to read the commentaries of Calvin, for I tell them he is incomparable in the interpretation of Scripture, and that his commentaries ought to be held in greater estimation than all that is delivered to us in the writings of the ancient Christian fathers, so that in a certain eminent spirit of prophecy I give the preeminence to him beyond most others, indeed beyond them all. In closing this article, we are happy to be able to say that two elaborate memoirs of Calvin may soon be expected. One is understood to be preparing by Mr. Henry, pastor of a church in Berlin, and great pains have been taken to gain information from unpublished manuscripts and other documents existing at Geneva. The other biography is that which was left by the late lamented Dr. McCree, and which will be made ready for the press by one of his sons. From the biographer of Knox and Melville, everything which the case admits may be expected. End of The Life of Michael Servetus by James Waddle Alexander A Dialogue of Polygamy by Bernardino Ochino. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Dialogue of Polygamy between Telly Polygamus and Ochinus. I desire your advice which because I conceive you are both able and willing to afford me, therefore it is, I address myself unto you. Ochinus, I am indeed willing, provided it be within the reach of my understanding and ability. Telepolygamus, In the first place I beg of you that you will faithfully promise to keep my counsel. Ochinus, I am content, if I may do it without dishonouring God. Telepolygamus, I have a wife not suitable to my mind, so that I cannot love her, and, as far as I can perceive, she is both barren and unhealthful, and I find myself so disposed that I cannot want the company of a woman. Also, I desire to have children, both for posterity's sake and that I may instruct them in the fear of God. I could indeed keep a concubine or two, but my conscience will not suffer me. Also, I could falsely charge my wife with adultery and so put her away, but in so doing I should both offend God and blemish mine own and my wife's reputation, which I will not do. I could also poison her, which is a thing I abhor. But a thought is come into my mind to take another wife, so as to keep her that I have already, notwithstanding, and I conceive God has put this into my mind, and that I am thereunto called by him. My desire, therefore, is that you will tell me whether, according to the word of God, I may lawfully do it. Ochinus. In doubtful cases, it is fit to take advice, but the case is clear that a man ought not to have more wives than one, because the condition of marriage is such that it cannot be between more than two. Telepolygamus. How can you make that appear? Ochinus. God, at the beginning, made out of Adam only one woman, and gave her to him, signifying that he ought to have but one, and that matrimony ought to be only of two persons. If he would have had a man to have more wives, he would doubtless have made him more, especially at the beginning of the world, where propagation was more necessary than ever afterwards. Telepolygamus. I conceive this argument is of small validity. God gave to our first father Adam one wife, therefore it is unlawful for any man to have more. Achinus. If it had been the will of God that he should have more... He would have given him more, especially in the state of perfection wherein he was pleased to put him. Telepolygamus. A bare act of God, without any precept added thereunto, does not oblige us to imitate the same, for if so, then we are bound to wear coats of skin, because God so clothed our first parents, and it were unlawful to wear cloth or silk, for your argument would always be of force. God clothed them with skins, and he could have clothed them with cloth or silk, if it had been his pleasure that men should be so clothed, if an act of God alone do bind us as much as a precept, so that God's giving Adam one wife only were as much in effect as if he had said to him, I will and command that every man have one wife only, it would follow that not only it should be unlawful for a man to have more wives than one, but that every man that did not take a wife, it being in his power so to do, should sin, which is contrary to the doctrine of St. Paul. Achinus. You must understand that Paul is not contrary to God. For 
in that God gave only one wife to Adam, it was all one as if he had said, I would not have a man to have more wives than one, and it is my pleasure that he have one, unless I shall call him to a single life and give him the gift of chastity, and that is the intent of Paul. Telepolygamous. And I, for my part, must say that when God gave Adam one wife, it was as if he had said, It is my pleasure that a man shall have one wife, if either he shall want the gift of continency, or I shall call him to a married condition. It is also my pleasure that I shall have no more, unless he stand in need of more, or I shall call him to more, which is at this time my condition, who stand in need of, and am called to marry another. Achenus. That a single life is pleasing to God, the word of God shows but we are not thereby taught that he is pleased men should have more than one wife, Achenus. Nay, verily, both God's word and the saint's example do reach the same, as we shall show by and by. But go to, suppose it had been God's pleasure that every man should have so many wives as it was possible for him rightly to govern and instruct together with their children. How many wives must he have given Adam, thereby to signify his pleasure in this point? Achenus. You suppose that which cannot be, seeing the having more wives than one is repugnant to true matrimony. Telepolygamous, you have not yet made it clear to me that to have more wives than one is repugnant to marriage, otherwise than by saying that God gave one to Adam. Let us now suppose he had given him more. Doubtless from that first institution you could not prove that a man ought not to have more, nay, it would follow of necessity that a man might have more. How many wives, therefore, in such a case, had it been necessary for God to give Adam to signify his pleasure in this point? Achenus. Two would have been enough. Telepolygamus. Now then, if that action of his had been a precept, as you say, it would have been unlawful for men to have had more or less than two wives, which, nevertheless, would not have been answerable to his will, seeing his intent was that they should have as many as they could govern. We must therefore confess that by a bare act of God, no command being added, we are not obliged to the imitation thereof. Otherwise, it would be a sin for a minister to celebrate the Lord's Supper unless the communicants were just so many in number as the apostles of Christ were when he instituted the same. Achenus, although it does not necessarily follow that because God gave one wife to Adam, therefore it is unlawful for a man to have more, yet it is doubtless a very probable argument to persuade, and urges strongly, though it be not altogether compulsive. Telepolygamus. Nay, verily, it urges not at all, since it may be said that God gave one wife to Adam, not to show that his will was that every man should have but one wife, but that the rest of mankind, being born as well of one mother as one father, might love one another so much the more. Also that Eve, being made of the rib of Adam, might be a figure of the Holy Church, the only spouse of Christ. Achenus. Go to, let us come unto the words of the text. Do you not think that Adam was moved by divine instinct when he said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife? Telepolygamus, without doubt. Achenus, do you not see how in saying he shall cleave to his wife, not wives, he teaches us that a man is to have but one? Telepolygamus, very good. When God commands a man to love his neighbor, does he oblige him to love one or more? Achenus, all that are his neighbors. Telepolygamus, that's false, for he says, thou shalt love thy neighbor, not thy neighbors. And therefore, whoever loves one of his neighbors has fulfilled that command. Achenus, Christ, when he said, thou shalt love thy neighbor, spoke it in this sense, as if he should have said, thou shalt love everyone that is thy neighbor. Telepolygamus, so likewise Adam, when he said, he shall cleave unto his wife, did intimate that he should cleave unto everyone that shall be his wife, and therefore... Here there is a lacuna in the text. Not be proved by those words that it is unlawful for a man to have more wives than one. Achenus, but what will you say to those following words of his, and of them twain shall be made one flesh? For he does not say of three or four. From these words it is doubtless manifest that God would not have marriage to be made between more than two. Telepolygamus, Adam says not that of them two shall be made one flesh, but they shall be made one flesh. Achenus, but that was his meaning, as plainly appears from the words of Christ, who, citing the said speech, says that God by Adam declared, they too shall be one flesh, adding, moreover, this following clause, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Telepolygamus, it is as if he had said, the husband shall love every one of his wives as if she were the same flesh and the same body with him, and so likewise shall every wife love her husband. Achenus, but God said, 
they too shall be one, therefore they cannot be three or four. Telepolygamous, you were in the right if he had said, they too only shall be one. And therefore, as this argument is of no force, Christ said, if two of you on earth shall agree about a thing, they shall obtain what they ask. Therefore, if three or four shall agree, they shall not obtain the same. So is this no good inference. God said, they too shall be one flesh. Therefore, if there be three, it is no true marriage. Okinus, it is impossible for more than two to become one flesh. Telepolygamous, in the primitive church, there were not only two believers, but they were in great numbers, having nevertheless one soul and one mind, and you believe, if a man had diverse wives, he could not become one flesh with them. If a man, while he cleaves unto an harlot, becomes, as Paul says, one body with her, although he have a wife, should he not much more become one flesh with her, if he should make her his wife? Achenus, say what you will, to have more than one wife is a thing filthy, dishonest, and quite contrary and destructive to the holy state of matrimony. Telepolygamous, and yet you know that Abraham had more wives than one, as also David, and many other men under the Old Testament, who, in case it had been unlawful for them to have more than one wife, they should have sinned in marrying diverse women, and the children which they had by all their wives, excepting the first, should have been bastards, because not begotten in lawful matrimony. Achenus, I will sooner grant all that you have said, than I will allow, or grant it lawful for one man to have more than one wife. Those ancients were holy men, yet did they sometimes sin. They were sinners, as being born of Adam, as appears in the example of David, and they should have deceived themselves if they had denied themselves to be sinners. Telepolygamous. That they sometimes sinned, I shall easily grant, but I will never yield that they continued in their sins till their day of death, which nevertheless they did, in case it was unlawful for them to have diverse wives. Whence it would follow that they were all damned, as those who die while they keep a concubine. As for us, we cannot hold them for saints, seeing we know not for certain that they ever repented. When David had committed those same acts of adultery and murder, because he was one of God's elect, God sent his prophet to him to reprove him, as also when he numbered the people, contrary to the command of God. Credible, therefore, it is that if to have diverse wives had been contrary to the law of God, God would have used the like proceedings towards him that he might not be damned. But though you read the whole Bible over, you shall never find that God has forbade the having of diverse wives. And yet, if it had been a thing unlawful, Moses would never have dissembled the matter. Moreover, the scriptures tell us that David was a man after God's own heart, and that he was obedient to all the Lord's commandments all his life long, save in the matter of Uriah. So that, had it been a sin to have diverse wives, seeing that also had been sufficiently known, the author would have accepted it, or he must doubtless make himself a liar by saying that David committed only that sin of homicide under which his adultery is comprehended. Again, how could that be true, which God said to David when blaming him for his unthankfulness? He told him that he had given him many wives, which, questionless, must have been all whores except the first, and so it had not been God, but the devil, that gave them unto him. Moreover, you shall find that God made a law that if any man had two wives, the one beloved and the other hated, and had by them diverse children, the eldest of which was the son of the hated wife, it should not be allowed the father to make the son of his beloved wife his heir, now it might fall out that the beloved wife might be his first wife, and so it should come to pass that, though the husband had children by the latter, sooner than by the first, yet they should be bastards, if your opinion be true, and born of an whore, and therefore ought not to be heirs. It is therefore clear by the word of God that all the children are legitimate, though sprung from diverse wives, by one and the same husband, and that therefore not only the first, but the following marriages are lawful, seeing God did both approve and bless them in those holy men, the first fathers of the world. Achenus, the first thing which you say follows from my opinion, that all which died, having many wives, should be damned, I answer, if they are dead, not having divorced all save their first wife, or without repenting of their sin, they are all damned. But as many of them, as are saved, did repent, and put away all but their first and lawful wife. Telepolygamous, but it is not apparent that ever any did that. And yet, if your opinion were true, mention ought to have been made thereof in the Holy Scriptures, that we might know and understand that to keep diverse wives is an abominable thing. Achenus, it was already known that men ought not to have more wives than one, because God had commanded that the husband and the wife should of two become one flesh. Telepolygamous, it is not likely that it was unlawful to have diverse wives, and that the unlawfulness thereof was known, and Abraham and Jacob and David and other worthy persons like them should nevertheless marry more wives than one. Okinus. 
that's a good one. As if many holy men in ancient times did not sin, though they knew what they did was unlawful. Telepolygamous, but they did not continue to their lives end in those sins, as those that married more wives than one did. Oginus, I told you before that if they were of the number of God's elect, they did at last repent. Telepolygamous, but we ought no longer to reckon the patriarchs, for example, sake, to be saints, seeing we are assured that they sinned in having many wives, but we are not assured of their repentance. Oginus, true, unless the word of God assures us that they were saints, as we know, for example, sake, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be saints, because Christ said that many should come from the east and from the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now I conceive that, as Moses, because of the hardness of their hearts, suffered the Jews to put away their wives without just cause, so for the same cause he suffered them to have sundry wives, that is to say, he did not forbid or hinder it, nor punish the same by any law enacted in his commonwealth. But it follows not, therefore, that they did not sin in God's sight, and that they did not deserve punishment unless they repented. Telepolygamous. That thing is permitted which is neither punished, nor hindered, nor forbidden. Truly, I will not say Moses sinned, if to avoid a greater evil and to comport with the hardness of the Jews' hearts, he permitted them to have diverse wives. That is to say, he did not punish or hinder them, but if he permitted them, so as not to forbid them, I cannot but say he sinned. For Moses ought to have expressly forbidden that any man should have more than one wife, which, because he has not done, we must needs confess that it is not a thing unlawful. Oginus The having of many wives was then, as it is now, so apparently filthy, dishonest, and vicious that it was needless for Moses to forbid the same. Telepolygamous. And it was not apparent that adultery was a thing filthy, dishonest, vicious? Yea, much more than the having of many wives, and yet he expressly forbade adultery. And in case it had been unlawful to have many wives, he ought to have forbidden that, so much the more expressly by how much the unlawfulness thereof was less manifest than the unlawfulness of adultery was. Is it not a clear case that homicide is unlawful, and yet he forbids that? In a word, what are the Ten Commandments but an expression of the law of nature? Aquinas, it may be said that God might remit the transgressions against the second table because he is above, not only all creatures, but his own law, and peradventure he might remit the same to all mankind born before the death of Christ, and consequently be willing that they might have more wives than one without sin. And so it comes to pass that those under the Old Testament that had many wives did not sin, and under that consideration God might give many wives to David, though it may also be said that he gave them to him that is permitted him to have them, inasmuch as he neither hindered nor punished him. Telepolygamous, that it is lawful to keep more wives than one, if your opinion be true, is clear from the word of God, who said that two should be made one flesh. But that God did so far remit of his laws that men should not sin in having more does not appear in the word of God. That opinion, therefore, of yours has no foundation. Aquinas, if you consider well, you shall find that Lamech, a very wicked man, was the first that had two wives. Other holy men that preceded him, knowing the will of God, had only one apiece. Telepolygamus, as if that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not more holy than those very men you speak of. But in the first place, I cannot tell how you came to know that Lamech was the first man that had two wives, although he be the first man whom the scripture mentions to have two. But as this is a vain argument, the scripture nowhere mentions that Cain had more than one son, therefore doubtless he had no more. So as vain is this which follows, it is nowhere in scripture recorded that those men that lived before Lamech had more wives than one, therefore none of them had above one wife. Moreover, where it is said that Lamech had two wives, it is not charged upon him as a sin, but seems rather to be set down as a thing pleasing to God that a man should have more wives than one, seeing by them he gave Lamech such ingenious sons as proved the inventors of arts, both delightful and profitable. Neither can I see how you came informed that Lamech was so wicked a man as you talk of. Achinus, God plagued him by suffering him to fall into the sins of murder and desperation only because he married two wives. But I cannot see either that he was a murderer or fell into despair. Neither does the scripture teach any such thing, if it be rightly interpreted, or if the scripture had intimated any such thing, which I do not grant. Yet does it not thereby appear that God suffered him so to slip because he had married two wives? Aquinas, but we may conjecture that his having two wives displeased God, seeing his murder is presently after mentioned. Telepolygamus. In the first place, I have already told you that, by the words of that text, 
if they be rightly understood, there is no signification made that either he was a manslayer or in desperation, and if such a thing were intimated, it does not therefore follow that his plurality of wives was the cause thereof, or that God was offended with him therefore. Inasmuch as presently upon the mention of his two wives he commends their sons, as if he would give us to understand that he approves of plurality of wives. Add thereunto that nothing ought to be affirmed or avouched in the church of God as necessary to salvation if it cannot otherwise be known save by conjectures only. Okinus, seeing I cannot convince you out of the Old Testament, I will try what I can do from the New. Telepolygamus, you are in an error if you think the Old Testament is not sufficient to teach us all things necessary to salvation. If therefore that be the cause you betake yourself to the new, you are deceived, seeing, as Paul writes, all scripture of divine inspiration is profitable for reprehension, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be made perfect, furnished for every good work. Now clear it is that Paul in that place speaks of those scriptures in which Timothy was exercised from a child, and because the New Testament was not then written, you must be forced to confess that Paul in that place speaks of the Old. The Old Testament, therefore, is profitable not only to assert the truth of such things as are necessary to salvation, but also to confute falsities, and consequently to render a man perfect. For which cause Christ, speaking thereof, said, Search the scriptures, for in them is found... Here there is a lacuna in the text. Life. Okinus, perhaps some things are forbidden to us in the New Testament which were not forbidden to them in the Old. Telepolygamus, in moral matters, verily, whatever is unlawful and to us forbidden was in like manner ever more forbidden to them, and whatever was allowed and commanded to them, the same is in like manner allowed and commanded to us. God was equally the author of the Old Testament as well as of the New, nor was he ever contrary or unlike himself. Okinus, that was allowed to those under the Old Testament because of their imperfection, which is not allowed to us in whom carnal desires ought to be much more mortified. Telepolygamus, you take that for granted, which you have not proved, viz. that it is unlawful to have more wives than one. Moreover, you are deceived if you think that it is a bad thing to have one wife, but worse, to have two. For as the act matrimonial in him that has one wife is a thing not in itself evil, nor repugnant to those actions that are necessary to salvation, no more is it to have two wives, provided a man have a call from God to marry them, and be moved not by the impulse of the flesh, but of the spirit, that he may have children and bring them up in the fear of God, his wife likewise doing the same, whence it follows that he may be as perfect that has two wives as he that has but one or none. Nor had Abraham, because he had diverse wives, less faith, hope, or charity than priests, monks, or friars that have none. Conjugal chastity is as well the gift of God as that of a single state. For this cause, Paul said, every one is endued with his own gift from God, some one way, some another. Okinus. In that place, the apostle exhorted the Corinthians to a single life, and that for no other cause but that a married estate has many encumbrances attending the same. Inasmuch as married people, being entangled with worldly affairs, are not so free to pray and preach up and down and do good to others as single people are. Now, if so be the having of one wife, do bring so many impediments, any one may soon conjecture what the having of diverse wives will do, and therefore to have more wives than one is unlawful. Telepolygamus, you are in error if you think that the mind of Paul in those words was that marriage was a stop to men's journey to heaven so that married people could not be saved. For then that which God said would not be true, viz. that it was not good for a man to be alone, but it would rather be an excellent thing to be alone, and to marry a wife, the worst thing in the world, because in so doing a man should sin. Moreover, I add, that not only a married man may be saved, as well as a bachelor, but be as perfect as he, inasmuch as he may attain as great perfection in faith, hope, and charity as the other. And if he cannot personally perform some external works which the single man can, as hindered by his married estate, yet he may in mind perform the same, and that is it which God regards. Aquinas, though matrimony do not hinder a man from going to God, yet the having of more wives than one does. Telepolygamus, how prove you that? Aquinas, from Paul, who, speaking of bishops, says he would have them to be the husbands of one wife, meaning that they should have no more. It is therefore unlawful to have more wives than one. Telepolygamus, nay, rather when he tells them by name that they should have one, lest having more they should be too much distracted with worldly business, it is easy to see that he allows other men to have more. Aquinas, some do thus interpret the mind of Paul. A bishop is to have but one wife, that is, say they, one church for his spiritual spouse. 
telepolygamous. Many reasons show that to be a false opinion. First, because Christ is only the spouse of souls and bridegroom of his church. And if we, that are ministers, be his friends, we ought, with John Baptist, as the friends of Christ, the only true spouse of souls, to send them to him, their bridegroom, and not to draw them to ourselves. The churches, therefore, of Christ are not the bishop's spouse, and if they were, as the husband is superior to his wife, so should they be to their respective churches, against which Paul writes to the Corinthians when he says, We are not lords over your faith, or over you by reason of your faith. The church, therefore, is not Paul's wife. I confess, indeed, that one church is enough for one pastor, and he does no small matter if he can govern that well. In the ancient times of Christianity, one church sometimes had diverse pastors, as appears from the epistle to the Philippians, in which Paul salutes the bishops, which were at Philippi, whereas nowadays one bishop has many churches. Moreover, when Paul says a bishop ought to have one wife, he speaks of the manner of him that was fit to be a bishop. But if he be yet to be chosen, he is no bishop, and therefore has no church as yet that might be called his wife. Hereby also it is manifest that by wife he did not mean church, because presently, almost after those words, he makes mention of his children, commanding that he govern his family well, and have his children subject to him with all reverence. For if a man cannot govern his own family, how can he oversee the church of God? In that place, therefore, he speaks of a wife and not of a church. Aquinas. Some say that Paul in that place forbids such men to be chosen bishops who have had diverse wives, though not at one and the same time. Telepolygamus. But I do not conceive that Paul counted it sin after the death of a man's first wife to take a second, for as much as he himself says that after the death of the husband the wife is free and may, without blame, marry another. So far it is from being unlawful for a man after the death of his wife to marry another. Okinus, they say it is a shameful thing when a man's first wife is dead to marry another. Telepolygamus, if you weigh the matter rightly and follow not the opinion of the blind vulgar people, you shall find that the matrimonial act is as free from turpitude as the actions of eating and drinking, nor would God have commanded matrimony if it had been evil, which nevertheless he did when he said increase and propagate. Okinus, I condemn not matrimony, but the iteration or repetition thereof. Telepolygamus, the second matrimony is as true and valid as the first, and therefore you cannot condemn the iteration of matrimony, but you must with all condemn matrimony itself. Take an example. A young man marries a wife, she dies a few days after, he is somewhat incontinent, or is again called to a married condition. Who knows not that he is, according to the precept of Paul, seeing he cannot contain, ought to take another wife. Hokinus, unless second marriages were filthy and unlawful, Paul would never, speaking afterwards of widows, have commanded such to be chosen as had only one husband. Telepolygamus, think you that Paul was superstitious? Hokinus, I do not think he was. Telepolygamus, if a young widow, somewhat incontinent, had asked Paul's advice, what think you Paul's answer would have been? Hokinus, that she should marry again according to his own doctrine. Telepolygamus, it is not therefore unlawful to marry again. Why then should Paul reject such widows as had had more husbands than one? For it was possible that some widow, having had diverse husbands, might be holy and honest, the nay which had had but one. Also it might fall out that she which had had diverse husbands might live but one year with them, whereas the rest, that had never more than one, might have lived with him thirty or forty years. In such a case, truly, I cannot see why they should be more worthy to be chosen than she." I do therefore believe that the mind of Paul in that place was this, that such widows were not to be chosen that had had many husbands, that is to say, who being divorced had married again, their former husbands, who divorced them being yet alive, for either they were divorced upon a just ground, and then it was not fit they should be chosen, or upon an unjust ground, and so the matrimony remained good, having never been violated, and then the divorced woman had sinned if she married to another." by which means it came to pass that all women divorced were infamous, not only such as married to other men, but such likewise as abstained from marriage, and especially amongst the Gentiles, whom were not wont to divorce them, save for some fault or vicious quality. Paul, therefore, did never condemn those women, who, their former husband being dead, married another, nor did he forbid them to be bishops, who, their former wife being dead, married another, which, notwithstanding, the superstitious papists observed, because they understood not the meaning of Paul. Though a man have kept diverse whores, they make him a bishop, but if his first wife being dead he marry another, they will not. Whence it comes to pass that matrimony amongst them is of worse report than fornication, adultery, incest, sacrilege, sodomy, and all imaginable abominations. 
This is therefore the mind of Paul, and this will make the third opinion, as has been said of widows, that he who has had diverse wives because he divorced one ought not to be made a bishop. For if he divorced her unjustly, he ought not to be a bishop in that regard. If justly, yet the infamy of his wife redounding upon himself, for that cause, Paul would not have him to be a bishop. Howbeit, I like not this opinion, for he does not say he must have been, but that he must be the husband of one wife, for he says he must be unblamed, viz. as the husband of one wife, as he expressed it a little afterwards touching deacons, and writing to Titus about bishops. Achenus, because of bishop in regard of the public office he beareth, as also the deacons have to do with all persons, not only with men, but also with women, to avoid suspicion, Paul would that they should be married, and this perhaps might be the meaning of those words. Also it may be that Paul, foreseeing the superstition of the papists, who would forbid the marriage of bishops that they might be without excuse, he said they ought to be blameless and to have a wife, but that they should have no more than one, he did not say. Or he shows that a bishop ought to have a wife, that is, he ought to be content with her and not have anything to do with other women, which is as if he had said that he ought to be honest. Telepolygamus. The mind of Paul is this, that it is lawful for the generality of Christians to have many wives, but for bishops to only have every man one, not because it had been a sin for them to have more, but because the duty of bishops being to labor for the salvation of others, he feared lest multiplicity of wives should be a pullback and hinder them from performing their office as they ought to do. For this cause he would have them to have but one, nor is it therefore unlawful for other men to have more. Yea, verily, while he forbids bishops and deacons to have more than one, he closely allows it to other men. Nor is it likely Paul would have forbidden bishops to have more wives than one, had it not been the custom of those times for them to have more. It was therefore in the New Testament forbidden to bishops to have many wives, as it was in the Old Testament forbidden to kings, not because it was in itself unlawful, but lest kings whose office was of greatest consequence, being distracted by their wives, should be corrupted, as it happened to Solomon. For if Adam, when he had but one, was notwithstanding perverted by her, it is easy to conjecture what might happen to kings if they should have many. Yet do I believe, nevertheless, that as in the same place he forbade kings to have many horses, that is, too great a multitude, lest he should put his trust in them, rather than in God. For otherwise they were allowed to have many horses, even so they were... Here there is a lacuna in the text. Forbid to have many wives, seeing David, a most holy man, had many, but that they should not have an immoderate multitude, especially such as were heathens and worshippers of false gods. To return, therefore, to our business, it is not credible that Paul feared lest Timothy should choose for bishops such as were Gentiles or Jews not baptized. They were therefore in the church of Christ, and among the Christians such as had more wives than one. And because from among them a bishop was to be chosen, he would not have him choose one that had diverse wives. But if to keep more wives than one had been contrary to the law of God, as you say it is, and the first wife only were right and true, the rest harlots, it is not credible that the Christians would have baptized anyone that had plurality of wives unless he had put away all saving his first. And if that had been the practice, it had been in vain for Paul to command that he that was to be chosen bishop should be the husband of one wife, seeing Christians out of the number of whom the bishop was chosen had but each of them one apiece. But this I much marvel at, that many who have sometimes written and do believe that to have more wives than one is repugnant to the divine law, both moral and natural, and yet, in expounding Paul, they say that he is writing to Timothy, warns him to take heed that he choose not a bishop that had a plurality of wives, whence it follows that seeing election was not to be made of any out of the church of God, that there were in God's church such as had more wives than one, and consequently counted it not unlawful to have more. Otherwise, if they had counted it unlawful, as they did not baptize or admit unto the Lord's Supper any man that kept a concubine, unless he would forsake her, in like manner they would not have baptized nor admitted to the supper, nor suffered amongst them such as had many wives, unless they would divorce all save the first. Achenus, but what do you say to Paul, who wills and commands that every man should have his own wife? For in saying his own wife he excludes wives. Telepolygamus. Some say his meaning is, let every man have his own wife, that is, his own, not another man's, and nor only one. As if some father, making show of his daughter, should say, this is my own daughter, not denying that he has more daughters, that are likewise his own. Achenus. In the same place, the same Paul commands that the wife have her own proper husband, that is to say, such a wife as is proper to him alone and not in common with other wives. 
whence it follows that as a woman ought to be proper to her husband and not to belong to other husbands, so the man ought to be appropriated to his first wife and not common to others. Provided you will, as you ought, expound the words of Paul, so as he may not contradict himself. Telepolygamous. Paul does not there dispute whether an husband may have plurality of wives or no, but his intent is to show that such men as have not the gift of continence should take them wives, and that women, in the like case, should marry. Hokinus. Is it possible that you should not see that plurality of wives is repugnant to the matrimonial contract, in which the man grants his wife and the woman, her husband, an honest use of their respective bodies forever. For which cause also Paul says that neither the man nor the woman have power over their own bodies, but each of one another's. And in case a man have given the honest use of his body to his wife, he can no longer give it to another, because he has already given it to the first. Telepolygamous. Yes, by the permission of the first he may, as Abraham did when by the permission of Sarah he married Hagar, and consequently by permission of the first and second he may marry a third, which is true of other men as well as Abraham, especially the wives being instructed that it is no sin for their husbands with their consent to marry other wives. Okinus, do you believe that David, when he married Bathsheba, did it with consent of his other wives, and that others who married diverse wives did so likewise? Telepolygamous, Suppose they did not, yet were not their marriages the less true and lawful, for it was then a thing commonly known, and confirmed by example, that it was lawful for a man to have many wives. Therefore, when a man, by marriage, gave the use of his body to his wife, he did not so totally give the same as to bereave himself of all power to give it to other wives also, which the wives knew well enough by the public custom then in force, and thereunto the wives did silently give consent, seeing their husbands married them, with this condition being understood. Their marriages, therefore, were good and lawful. Hercinus, an husband cannot marry a second wife without detriment of his first. It is not therefore credible that wives did in their hearts consent that their husbands should marry others. Telepolygamous, it is possible that my wife may prove barren, in which case it is her duty to consent that I should take another. Yea, and of her own consent to exhort me thereunto, as Sarah did of old. And if she would not approve thereof, this will of hers were unjust, and so it were lawful for her husband to marry another, contrary to her unjust mind. Also, when a woman is with child, and sometimes after she is brought to bed, seeing she is then unfit for procreation, as also when she is old and sick, her husband may, without injury to her, have to do with another wife. Yea, though a man's wife were sound and fit for generation, yet she ought to take it in good part, if enjoying the company of her husband at some certain times, as it is with other living creatures, she leave it free for him to enjoy the carnal acquaintance of his other wives. Hokinus, do you think it lawful for one wife to have many husbands? Telepolygamous. No. Hokinus. And yet there are sick men as well as sick women. Also, a woman is able to have to do with more men than a man can with women. Whence it seems more just for one woman to have diverse husbands, or at least less unjust, than for a man to have many wives. Telepolygamous. Nay, rather, since matrimony is chiefly ordained for procreation's sake, and a man having many wives may in a short time have many more children than a woman which has a plurality of husbands, it is more equitable that a man have many wives than that a woman have many husbands. But the chief causes why women may not have many husbands, and yet men may have many wives, are these, first of all, because if women should have many husbands, there would follow great disturbance and confusion in the world, for seeing no husband could certainly know that his children are his own, he might always suspect that they were some other husbands rather than his, and consequently he would not bring them up, nor instruct them, nor take such care for them, as now he does, knowing they are his own, though born of diverse wives. Perhaps also, being unassured that they are his own, he would not make them his heirs. Another cause why it is lawful for men to have many wives, but not for women to have many husbands, is this. The husband is his wife's head, and has authority and command over her, as being her superior, for which cause he may have diverse wives, provided he can well rule and instruct them. Nor is it a monstrous but a comely thing for to have many members in one body, though there be but one head. But if the body should have many heads, it would be a monster. So for one husband to have many wives is not monstrous, but for one wife to have many husbands is monstrous. And therefore, as there would be dissension and discord, If in one body there were many heads, and they should be of contrary minds, as might well happen, so would there be discords, perturbations, and great inconveniences, if should have plurality of husbands, seeing it might happen, that they should will things contrary, and command their wives to do them. Okinus. 
If we regard discords and inconveniences, we shall find they have been sometimes exceeding great because one man has had two wives, as we see in the example of Sarah and Hagar, Leah and Rachel, Hannah and Penina, and others. Amongst her were continual dissensions, which I conceive God did therefore suffer to show that he was not pleased that one man should have more than one wife. Telepolygamus. Although among the firstborn and other brethren many times grievous discords have arose, as appears in Cain and Abel, Esau and Jacob, and many others, it is not therefore displeasing to God that fathers should have many sons, as also between mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law, though there is many times little quiet, yet is not matrimony therefore displeasing to God. In like manner, although among diverse wives of the same husband, there has seldom been good arrangement, yet cannot either marriage in general or marriage of sundry wives be condemned, but only those wives who were not so well disposed as they ought to have been. Achenus. Christians ought in this life to be condemners of pleasures and to have more of the spirit than those men had which lived under the Old Testament, and therefore, though they had many wives, one apiece ought verily to content us. Telepolygamus. I have already declared and told you to cohabit with plurality of wives is no unlawful thing, and that it may consist with the greatest degree of faith and perfection, and therefore I cannot tell you how you can be assured that some Christians are not called by God to cohabit with diverse wives, as well as some Jews of old were called by him thereunto. Achenus, say what you will, to have more wives than one is a thing filthy and dishonest. Telepolygamous, there are two things which bring you into that error. The first is custom, for if it were the custom for men to have more than one, it would not seem to you blameworthy. Another is a feigned kind of holiness, which makes the having more wives than one seem to you unlawful, though it be no whit repugnant to the holy scriptures. Yea, and those that have more wives than one are wont to be more grievously punished than they should be if they kept a thousand concubines. Achenus it is hard for one man to content one woman, and you would have it lawful for him to have more. Telepolygamous, an husband is not obliged to satisfy all the carnal desires of his wife, but such only as are moderated with reason. Achenus, under the Old Testament, when there were few men in the world, it was peradventure expedient for men to have more wives, but now the world is full of people, it is not expedient. Telepolygamous. In the first place, you know not whether men, if they had more wives, would have more children than they have, or, if they should beget more children, as is very likely, how know you that the fruits of the earth will not suffice to afford them all that should be necessary for their livelihood and all other occasions? For the same God that gave increase of men would likewise supply plenty of... Here there is a lacuna in the text to nourish and maintain them, but suppose he were assured they should perish with famine, yet the souls of men are of so great price that we should no ways hinder their existence, especially if we be called thereto by God, as those holy men of old were, who had plurality of wives. Achenus, in these days a Christian ought not to have a plurality of wives, for if no other cause at least to avoid the offence which might thence arise, seeing all Christians do account the having of more wives than one to be a most filthy and diabolical thing. Telepolygamous, even as, although men should account matrimony an unlawful thing, yet ought you not to be moved with their offence taken thereat, but to marry, if need were. So ought you to marry more than one, if need be, or you be called thereunto by divine impulse. Achenus, a single man might indeed in such a case marry to avoid fornication, although men should be therewith offended, especially being called by God thereunto. But he that has one already needs not marry another, nor will God thereunto call him. Telepolygamous. Nay, verily, if his wife be sick or other impediments shall happen, so that he cannot enjoy her and be incontinent, he must of necessity to avoid fornication marry another. Add hereunto that God does not call men to marry only for the avoidance of fornication, but chiefly for propagation, as of old he called Abraham and other holy men. Okinus. Shall I make it clear and manifest to you that the having more wives than one is a thing forbidden? Christ says, if any man put away his wife, save for adultery, and shall marry another, he commits adultery. But if a man might have more wives than one, he should not commit adultery, as Christ says, whether he put away his former wife or no. Telepolygamous. No man can expound those words of Christ better than Christ himself, who, in another place explaining the said words, says, 
Whosoever shall put away his wife save for adultery causes her to commit adultery, that is to say, he gives occasion to his wife, so unjustly being put away to commit adultery, for the wife, being by that means deprived of her true husband, cannot marry any other, her former husband living, but she shall commit adultery. Christ does not therefore say, if any man put away his wife, not for adultery, and marries another, he commits adultery, but that he gives occasion to the repudiated wife to commit adultery. Achenus, both Matthew, Mark, and Luke record that Christ said, if any man put away his wife and marry another, he commits adultery, that is to say, by marrying that other. But if his intent was to show that by unjustly putting her away, he gave her occasion to commit adultery, it had been sufficient to have said, if any one put away his wife, not adding, and marry another. Christ, therefore, by those words of his in the fifth of Matthew, did not intend to explain that passage, which is recorded in the nineteenth chapter of the said evangelist. Only he said, if any put away his wife, not for adultery, he makes her commit adultery. But in the 19th of Matthew, he says another thing, viz. that if he marry another in the same kind, he commits adultery, because the first was his wife, and he ought not to have more than one. Add hereunto that the words of Christ in his Sermon upon the Mount were uttered before those were, by which he answered the Pharisees when they asked him whether a man for every cause might put away his wife. Those former words, therefore, cannot be an exposition of those who were spoke afterwards. Telepolygamus. Whether the latter words were an exposition of the former or no, it satisfies me that his meaning is one and the same in both places, viz. that if any man put away his wife without just cause, he occasions her to commit adultery. And as for those words which in the nineteenth chapter are added over and above, Christ added them to show that a wife unjustly divorced, if she marry another man, commits adultery, though at the same time her former husband marry another wife, seeing the first matrimony is not void, but remains in force. His meaning, therefore, is this. If he put her away unjustly, though he marry another, yet he gives her, that is put away, occasion to commit adultery. Achenus, this interpretation of yours is so forced and strained that it is in danger of breaking. Moreover, we may see in creatures irrational that their males have their females, with whom alone they couple, as we see in the birds, and much fitter it is for men, especially Christians, to have the like. Telepolygamus, that is true only in such like creatures whose propagation is not very needful to the maintenance of the life of man, but if you observe, you shall find that one cock has many hens, one bull many cows, and so in other creatures which are profitable to mankind. If therefore God has ordained for the commodity of mankind that one cock should have many hens, much more has he ordained that one man should have many wives for the propagation of men whom he so highly prizes and so dearly loves. Achenus. If none of those live creatures you speak of were gvelt, and they should all converse together, you should find every male with his proper female, and men ought to do the same much more. But now, many of the males being gvelt and separated, if none of those live creatures you speak of were gelt, and they should all converse together, you should find every male with his proper female, and men ought to do the same much more. But now, many of the males being gelt and separated, if one male couple with diverse females, it follows not, therefore, that it should be lawful for one man to have many wives. God put into the ark of Noah just so many males as females to show that every male ought to have only his own single female. Telepolygamus, if there were in the world as many men as women, I confess it were expedient that every man should have his own single wife, but seeing the number of women is greater, I conceive it fit that one man have many wives, for it is not in vain that God makes more women. If there were in the world, for example's sake, only three hundred women, and as many men, and every man should have one woman, they could not so soon propagate their kind, as if of six hundred, four hundred were women, and two hundred men." every one of which should have diverse women. For this cause, therefore, God ordained that the number of women should be greater than the number of men. The life of one man equals that of two women. Achenus, in the first place, I do not believe that you know there are more women in the world than men. Perhaps it seems so to you, because commonly we rejoice at the birth of boys and grieve at the birth of girls. But though there be more women born into the world, yet they live not long, for the most part, by reason of the more tender constitution of their bodies. Add hereunto that many more men perish than women by wars, shipwreck, and the sword of justice. That reason, therefore, does not prove polygamy or plurality of wives. 
Moreover, the love of carnal society is a most violent passion, and if a dishonest love cannot endure a rival, much less can that which is honest. Telepolygamous, holy love rather extends to all, even our enemies. Hokinus, Jacob was an holy man, and he loved barren Rachel more than fruitful Leah. So also Elkanah loved Hannah that was barren more than Penina that was fruitful. Solomon also said that his beloved was one. It is therefore an hard thing to share out a man's love amongst many wives, which notwithstanding must be done in polygamy. When a man has but one wife, mutual love is better preserved than if he had more, and if any falling out happen, reconciliation is more easily made. Where there are many wives, there are diverse understandings, diverse constitutions, distractions, and discords. Telepolygamous, if there were a call from God, there would be his blessing. Polygamy is no enemy to charity, and therefore if any man should have plurality of wives and love were wanting between them, that were not the fault of polygamy, but of the said wives. Achenus, if the filthy love of an harlot is oftentimes the cause that a man is content with her alone, much more ought the holy love of wedlock work the same effect. Telepolygamous, we see that filthy love is more effectual in some persons than holy love is in others. As also, in like manner, superstition produces more good works in some than true religion in others, all which comes to pass by the instinct of Satan. Achenus, that plurality of wives is a thing contrary to natural reason, hereby appears, in that all nations have always abstained therefrom, as from a thing unlawful. Telepolygamus, you know that the light of nature, that is to say the law which is imprinted in the hearts of men, is the gift of God, and that it is just, and that the law of Moses is not contrary thereunto, but an explanation thereof. For if the law of Moses were contrary thereunto, God would be contrary to himself, seeing both proceed from God, or rather both are one and the same law. And therefore, if plurality of wives had been contrary to the judgment of right reason, neither would Moses verily have dissembled the same, neither would those most holy patriarchs have used the same, nor would God have borne with it, God by Moses commanding the Jews that when they came into the borders of the Gentiles they should not imitate their vices, would have named polygamy among other vices, if it had been unlawful, and he would have forbidden the same by Moses, which nevertheless he did not do. We nowhere read that ever God punished any man for having plurality of wives, nor that he ever did by his prophets threaten such as had many wives. If you would have the manners of the Gentiles to be your rule and law, you shall find amongst them much wickedness. And whereas you said that all nations abhorred polygamy, that is false, as appears by the Jews. Also Cremes had two wives, if we believe Terence also. Here there is a lacuna in the text. As Salust relates... In a word, Socrates himself, who, notwithstanding, was the wisest of men, and had much of the light of nature. Hokinus, even wise men sometimes do amiss. Telepolygamus, never any man condemned or reprehended Socrates for having two wives, although for other things he hath been condemned. What needs many words, polygamy, was used as a good thing and very profitable to mankind by furthering propagation, not only among the Jews, but also among the Persians and the Turks likewise. Only in Europe has it been hateful, in which Europe vice has abounded, if not more, yet not a whit less, than in all other parts of the world. Nay, and in the days of old, polygamy was commended, even in Europe. Only they would not have in one house many mistresses to rule the family, which was a thing convenient to avoid confusion. Achenus, I will never confess that it is a good thing to have many wives. Telepolygamus, that is because you conceive it is an unlawful conjunction, and you are overpowered with an old custom among the vulgar, which in tract of time has won the favour of the common people and the magistrates, by which it comes to pass that the common opinion prevails more with you than the truth itself. Achenus, but what do you say to the imperial laws which are against you? Telepolygamus, in what place? Achenus, first of all, the emperors Diocletianus and Maximinus do forbid polygamy in these words, that no man within the jurisdiction of the Roman Empire can have two wives, seeing also of the edict of the praetor, such men are branded with infamy, which thing a just judge will not suffer to go unpunished. Also, in the same code, that man, doubtless, that has two wives at once is accompanied with infamy. Telepolygamus, the authors of the first law, as you say, were Diocletianus and Maximinus. The other is taken out of a certain rescript of Valerianus and Gallienus. Achenus, it is sufficient that being emperors they had power to make laws. It is to be observed that in their days the condition of matrimony in the heathenish empire was such 
that any man might put away his wife for light and frivolous causes and keep concubines without any shame. Howbeit they had neither the name nor authority of wives. The emperors therefore thus decreed, not because they thought polygamy was unlawful, seeing they allowed many lawful concubines, but they judged it fit that only the first should have the title and authority of a wife, especially seeing they might divorce her if she pleased them not. Achinus, but we see that concubines were forbidden by the Emperor Constantine. Telepolygamus, if you well weigh his words, you will find that his intent was that it should be unlawful for him that had a wife to have concubines, not that it was wholly unlawful, but he might not have them with him, that is, in his own house, where his wife dwelt, viz. to avoid brawlings, discords, and contonations, but out of his house he might have as many as he would. Moreover, the Roman Emperor Valentianus, having the same authority and power, did not only permit such as had wives to keep concubines, but many wives also at the same time in the same house, all dignified by the same name and of equal authority. And Valentianus himself at the same time had diverse wives, and thereby the law of Valentianus, which was afterwards made, the former law of Constantine, was abrogated. Achinus, but Justinian in his code makes no mention of that law of Valentianus. Telepolygamus, yet that law of his was doubtless published, as appears by the histories. Add hereunto that besides Valentianus, it is apparent that Constantinus also, the son of Constantine the Great, had many wives. Clotarius also, king of France, and Heribertus and Hypericus, his sons, had plurality of wives. I add, here there is a lacuna in the text. And Charles the Great, of whom Urspagensis witnesseth that they had more wives than one, yea, and Lotarius, and the son of Lotarius, as also Anolphus, the seventh emperor of Germany, and Frederick Barbarossa, and Philippus Diodatus, king of France, and many more. Nor will I deny that it is a wicked thing to do as some do, who, having wives, leave them, travel into strange countries, and marry others. But I speak of such as take care of both their wives, and are thereunto called by God. Achinus, you suppose that which never was in the world, viz., that any man should be called by God to have two wives. Telepolygamus, even as Abraham, Jacob, and many others were called by God thereunto, so may we. Nor do I see why they had more need of this remedy than we, nor why it was rather their duty to beget and bring up numerous progeny than ours. Achinus, Constantine will not have men to keep plurality of wives, nor will the emperor that now reigns. Telepolygamus, tell me what is just and fit, and not what men will. The law of nature is unchangeable, and if in the days of Abraham it was agreeable to reason to have plurality of wives, as a thing honest and just, otherwise we may assure ourselves Abraham would not have married above one, and therefore we must confess that it is at this day a thing fit and just, and so it was in the days of Constantine, for though he were an emperor, yet could he not make that to be unjust which was just in itself. Doubtless that ancient church of Christ had the knowledge of divine matters, and yet neither that church nor the emperors of those times did condemn or punish polygamy. But men had rather seem to be good than be so indeed, since they are so great haters of plurality of wives, but not of adultery. Finally, to condemn polygamy is for a man to prefer himself before God, who never condemned the same, and to strive to be more perfect than he. I spare to say that... I may not allow of the laws of the emperors in cases of matrimony, seeing they refer the business to the ecclesiastic laws. Achinus, if you will be tried by them, I am victor. Telepolygamus, bring one canon that makes for you. Achinus, in the times of the fathers, polygamy was accounted so filthy and so notoriously and manifestly abominable that they did not think fit to condemn it by words. Telepolygamus, but I, for my part, am verily persuaded that those fathers of the ancient church were contented with the canon of Paul, who would have the ministers of the church to be contented with one wife, not because it was in itself unlawful to have more, but that they might the better execute their office, but he allowed others to live according as they found themselves inwardly moved by God. Achinus, and yet plurality of wives was forbidden in the third and seventh Neo-Caesarean council. Telepolygamus, I say it was never forbidden, neither in them nor in any other. Achinus, sure I am, they ordained a penalty for polygamists, which they would never have done unless they had counted it unlawful to have more wives than one. Moreover, they forbade all priests to be present at the marriage of him that would have more wives than one. Telepolygamus, true, but they did not forbid polygamy itself. Achinus, they forbid it sufficiently when they ordained punishments for it. 
telepolygamous. Though you read all the councils over, you shall never find polygamy forbidden. Nor can that be said to be the reason, because they conceived it was forbidden in the Holy Scriptures, for neither is it forbidden, as we have shown already, and in the 17th canon of the Apostles it is decreed that a man having two wives should be removed from the episcopal and priestly function and from all other ecclesiastical offices. But if the authors of those canons had seen that polygamy was repugnant to the Scriptures, to charity, and the common good of mankind, they would have excommunicated such as had two wives, nor would they only have kept them from the communion, but they would also have punished them grievously. But those apostolical persons, as Paul had done before them, did only forbid the ministers of the church to have more wives than one, not as if it were a thing repugnant to common honesty, but because it would draw them away and divert them from spiritual exercises. But because afterward men began by little and little to turn aside from the right way, so that many now fell to account marriage unlawful, they were not ashamed to write that a man's first wife being dead, it was adultery and not marriage to take another, touching which matter you may see what Gratian writes. So also Jerome and Tertullian interpret that saying of Paul and the apostles as if his intent had been that he which had two wives, though one after another, might not be a minister in the church of God, as also he that married a widow or a divorced wife, which is observed at this day by those most holy men, so reverence the papists, who notwithstanding create men of extraordinary and noted filthiness for their bishops. But mark what I shall say, the life of a courtier and a soldier is not sinful in itself, but many may be called by God to embrace the same, and yet in the twelfth canon of the Nicene Council it was decreed that those men should be severely punished who, having left the wars, should become soldiers again, notwithstanding in those times war was seldom made, saving against idolaters and infidels. In like manner, though they decreed penalties for such as had second wives, yet is not bigamy therefore sinful, nor does it follow, but that many may by divine instinct be called thereunto. There are many such canons, especially concerning matrimony, which want amendment, nor are we tied by any canons but such as have their foundation in the word of God. The fathers have many times erred as being men, and sometimes swerving from the rule of God's word. Moreover, we ought to believe that Paul taught the Ephesians for example's sake, and the rest of the churches, all things necessary to salvation, as himself testifies, and yet he taught them not that any were to be tied to one wife excepting ministers of the church. Achenus. He might therefore peradventure do that to the intent that others, by their example, might by little and little be brought to practice the same. Telepolygamus. In the first place, that which you say is not founded upon any word of God, without which it seems to me an impious thing to bind men's consciences. Moreover, Everything that is convenient for bishops ought not to be propounded as an example for all to follow. Achenus, yet it is much to say that the church has erred for the space now of a thousand two hundred years in punishing bigamy. Telepolygamus, that error is not to be attributed to the church of God, but to men who in the church have as much erred in forbidding priests to marry, yea, and I would have you to take notice that the Neo-Caesarean Council decreed not that the second wife should be divorced, nor that the second was no true marriage. Achenus, the council declared that sufficiently by decreeing penalties for such as had two wives. Telepolygamus, Augustine judges that man to sin, who, having made a vow of chastity, marries a wife, and yet he accounts it true marriage, and that it ought not to be made void. This argument, therefore, is of no force. The council enacted penalties for such as had two wives, and therefore the second was no true marriage. Moreover, Though above a thousand years are past since penalties were enacted against such as had two wives, yet is it not above four hundred years since that decree was first received by the Italians, Spaniards, and Germans, for it is but an humane constitution, and the bishops would have exclaimed against Valentianus for his plurality of wives, but that he had the holy scriptures on his side, and notwithstanding they reprehended such as had more than one wife, as Augustine and Boniface did, as persons that seemed overindulgent in the flesh." They did not therefore excommunicate them or reckon them for such as could not be saved. Ambrose was a very sharp reprover of sin, yet we do not anywhere read that he reproved Valentianus for having two wives. Yea, and the said Ambrose, reprehending Justinia, his second wife, for being an Arian, must have reproved her also for being no true wife, but a concubine, which notwithstanding he did not do. It is likewise recorded that Leo V when he heard that a certain bishop in Africa had two wives, he only decreed that by reason of the words of Paul he should be degraded from that honour, but not that he should put away his second wife, or be otherwise punished for having two. 
Gregory likewise, Bishop of Rome, writing to Boniface, who was sent into Germany to teach Christianity an hundred and twenty years after the Nativity of Christ, beseeches him to take care that such as had many wives and all were dead save one might content themselves with her alone and marry no more so that he exhorts men to shun plurality of wives, just as he should exhort them to embrace a single life, which can be understood of none, but such as are called by God to such a kind of life. The true ecclesiastical canons which oblige us in their observance are such as have their foundation in God's word. But to go, read the epistle which Gregory the Third of that name, Bishop of Rome, wrote to the foresaid Bonifacius. There you shall find him right to this effect. If any man have a wife, which by reason of some bodily infirmity cannot afford her husband due benevolence, he shall do well to abstain from her. But if he cannot contain, for that is a gift of God not given to all, it is better that he should marry another wife than burn, provided he allow his first wife all necessary maintenance. Than which, what could be expressed more clearly? Achinus, all that you can say, though you talk till doomsday, will never make me think it fit and lawful for a man to have more than one wife. Telepolygamous. Suppose there are more women than men. What shall the poor women do in this case? Achinus. They must do just as the men should do, in case there were more men than women. Viz. Pray to God to give them the gift of continence. Telepolygamous. In case a man is by God called to a married condition, and hath not the gift of continence, to live a single life, it would be in vain for him to pray to God that he might have the gift to live without a wife, for in my opinion he would never obtain his request, seeing God calls him to marry. Achinus, the whole world has believed that plurality of wives is unlawful, nor can any man have more than one wife without giving the greatest offence imaginable, which all men ought to shun. Moreover, it is the will of God that we obey our magistrates, and they are so far from consenting to polygamy that they will put him to death, that shall have more than one wife. Telebolygamus, but not if he have many concubines or whores. If any man, being moved by divine instinct to marry diverse wives, and it should be no sin so to do, if he married them, it were a scandal taken, as the schools speak, and not given. Also he might, to avoid scandal, marry his second wife privately. Achinus, but such things are hardly practicable. And if he should be often seen in company of his second wife, men would take offence, as supposing her to be his concubine. I shall therefore continually exhort all men to avoid polygamy, and truly I exhort you to do the same. The papists themselves do vow to live single, and shall we that are regenerate, spiritual, and evangelical men marry more wives than one? Telepolygamous, just, and how honest that single life of theirs is, All the world takes notice. The law itself condemns barren matrimony. So far is it from not condemning voluntary and barren single life. Now I speak expressly of such as have not the gift of continency, nor are called to a single life. The Romans did punish such as lived single and rewarded those who by abundance of children did augment the commonwealth. And Lycurgus also and Ulpianus decreed the same. Now what more blessed a thing can there be than the preservation of humankind, which would wholly perish were it not for marriage? A man cannot transmit to posterity a more honourable memorial of his name than by leaving behind him children, virtuously educated. And what greater folly can be imagined than under a show of holiness to shun holy matrimony as a thing profane, which notwithstanding has been ordained by God, is dictated by nature, persuaded by reason, confirmed by Christ, praised by authors, sacred and profane, commended by the Lord, approved by the consent of all nations, and whereunto we are invited by the examples of good and holy men. What more barbarous and inhumane than to loathe matrimony, the desire whereof is implanted in us by nature? What more unthankful to the common nature of the world and mankind than not to beget children, as our ancestors and parents have begotten us? For my part, I make account that such men are murderers of as many as they might have begotten, in case they had embraced matrimony, unless peradventure they are carried by a divine impulse to live single. Questionless, it is a kind of manslaughter, not only by medicaments to cause abortion and barrenness, but also without very just cause to shun marriage." Achinus, I do not condemn matrimony, namely the having of one wife, but the having of two or more. Telepolygamus, but what advice will you give me? Achinus, that you marry no more wives, but pray to God for the gift of continence. Telepolygamus, what if he will not give it me? Achinus, he will if you pray in faith. Telepolygamus, what if he neither give me the gift nor faith to ask it? Achinus, if you shall then do that... 
to which God shall incline you, so that you be sure you are led by divine instigation, you shall not sin, for it can be no error to obey God. Other advice I cannot give you, and therefore I bid you farewell, and promise you that I will seek God in your behalf. Telepolygamous, and that is it which I beseech you to do, that I may not offend God, but that I may give him all honor and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. End of A Dialogue of Polygamy by Bernardino Aquino An Epistle Both of Godly Consolation and Also of Advertisement by John Calvin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An epistle both of godly consolation and also of advertisement written by John Calvin, the pastor and preacher of Geneva, to the right noble Edward, Duke of Somerset, before the time or knowledge had of his trouble, but delivered to the said Duke in the time of his trouble, and so translated out of French by the same Duke. To the Christian Reader that nothing is more odious or detestable afore God than the disobedience of subjects against their kings and governors may partly, by most open testimonies of Holy Scripture, evidently appear, and partly by this argument be manifestly proved that it hath never yet unto this day, neither in God's elected people, the Israelites, nor yet in any other commonweal, either heathen or Christian, escaped without most grievous plagues and punishments, Yet nevertheless, so merciful a God he is, of so long sufferance, so loath to strike, and so desirous of man's amendment, that it hath pleased his divine majesty, ere he will take extreme vengeance for tumultuous disobedience of the people against their heads, to give many sundry kinds of warnings for us to be whereby. First he hath now in these last days raised up many godly preachers who cease not daily to publish, as it were, God's proclamation in this behalf, plainly declaring to all the states and degrees what their duty is. He hath provided many godly exhortations and treatises daily to come forth to the same effect and purpose. Yea, and lest any man should think that he will dally in such a matter, he made us the last summer here in England to feel a little touch of his sharp rod, by the king's regal sword, being a most evident token of his great wrath and indignancy, on against all rebels and seditious murmurers. God hath of his infinite goodness not only made little England strong enough to withstand all foreign pursuance, if we hold togethers and agree well among ourselves, obeying the king and magistrates as we ought to do, but also by many undoubtable tokens hath declared that he mindeth, as it were, to make his habitation and dwelling place here among us, of purpose to be our sure defence and protection, if we will receive him accordingly. But in case we will be so hard-hearted as willfully to refuse the grace of his gospel, most mercifully and most fatherly offered unto us, it cannot be doubted nor avoided, but that the extreme plagues of God's wrath and vengeance will at length light upon all such as either of an ungodly heart will swell and strive against the grace and truth of his word, which he hath sent among us, or else of a malicious frowardness will repine and murmur against their heads and rulers. Wherefore, thou hast here set forth unto thee, good Christian reader, an epistle of John Calvin, written in French, unto the right noble prince, Edward, Duke of Somerset, and sent hither into England, immediately upon the late commotion here in this realm. And by this epistle it may to the godly reader very well appear how tenderly God of his goodness doth embrace us, and doth, as it were, set us in his own lap, minding to keep us safe from all perils of outward enemies, under the shadow and sure defence of his own wings. He declareth himself so mercifully to provide for us, if we will gladly and willingly receive his grace and stand therein, that he maketh them careful for us that never were in England, nor never had to do with us, saving only that, as the nature and property of Christian charity is, they wish and daily pray that we may have grace so to use ourselves, that the blessing of God, which he hath so plenteously poured upon us, may not through our unthankfulness be taken away again, which for as much as it so is, let not us be less careful for ourselves than other strangers be. Let us not have received the grace of God in vain. Let us stand in the truth and cleave to Christ's gospel, and by the same let us practice, as it teacheth us, to obey quietly and willingly our rulers and governors by him appointed, which, if we do, 
He will so defend us with his almighty arm that all foreign enemies, whatever they be, shall either be unable to do us any scathe or else shall be turned in their hearts and of eager enemies shall become our earnest friends and followers, which thing God grant. To whom be all honor and praise world without end. Amen. The Epistle of John Calvin My Lord, Although God hath given unto you singular prudence, magnanimity, and other virtues requisite to the place wherein he hath ordained you, and in the affairs that he hath put in your hands, yet nevertheless, forasmuch as ye do esteem me for a servant of his Son, whom above all ye desire to obey, I am certain that for the love of him you will gently receive that which I write unto you in his name, as indeed I pretend no other end but that in following that that you have begun." you might more and more advance his honour unto the time that you shall have established his reign in such perfection as it may be known in the world. And also you shall know that without advancing anything of mine own fantasy, all that I write shall be drawn out of his pure doctrine, if I considered not other causes than the dignity and greatness where ye be. There were no means for a man of my quality to write unto you, but forasmuch as you refuse not to be taught of the master, the which I serve, but rather you prefer to all the rest the grace that he hath given unto you, to be one of his disciples, I think that I have no need to make unto you any long excuse or preface, because I find you sufficiently disposed to receive all that shall proceed of him. We have all to render thanks unto our Lord God and Father, in that he will be served of you in so excellent a work as in setting forth again by your means the pure and true rule of his service in England, and in causing the doctrine of health to have place, and to be there faithfully published for all them that will hear the same. And for that, as he hath given unto you such virtue and constancy to pursue it unto this time against so many temptations and difficulties, and for that also that he hath strengthened you in blessing all your devices and labors for the prospering of them, they be things that stirreth all true faithful men to magnify his name. But in the meantime, because that Satan ceaseth not to raise up by all ways new combats, and that it is a thing of itself so hard as there can be nothing more hard than to cause the word of God peaceably to rule amongst the people, the which of their nature are given to lies. And forasmuch as there be so many circumstances which in these days impeach the course of the same, and above all that the superstitions of the Antichrist, having taken root of so long time, may not easily be taken away from their hearts, methinketh you have great need to be confirmed by holy exhortations, and I doubt not, but that experience teacheth you to feel the same, which shall be the cause to make me to proceed the more frankly, because that my purpose, as I believe, shall be conformable to your desire. And albeit that my exhortations shall be superfluous, yet I am sure that you will bear with the good zeal and affection that stirreth me to do it. Wherefore, according to reason, I believe that the necessity which ye feel shall cause that the same shall be a great deal the better received. Howsoever it shall be, I beseech you, my lord, that it may please you to give me the hearing in some advertisements which I intend briefly to declare unto you, hoping that when ye shall have heard it, at the least you shall find some savour for to be recomforted, and to take a great deal the better courage to continue the holy and noble enterprise in the which God hath appointed you to be employed unto this present. I doubt not, but the great troubles which happened unto you not long ago have been unto you very hard and annoyous, and most of all for that many might have taken occasion of slander, forasmuch as they were moved in some part under the shadow of changing the religion. Wherefore it cannot be, but that it hath been unto you a very hard assault, as well for the cares which might come unto you, as also for the mutinies of the maligners and ignorance, and also for the fear and trouble of the good. Truly the brute that I have heard afar off, hath caused me to have great grief in my heart, unto such time that I did know that God had begun to put some remedy. Nevertheless, for that, that they be not yet all pacified, and that the devil may renew them again, you shall call to remembrance that, that the holy story reciteth of the good king Hezekiah, that is to say, at such time as he had abolished the superstitions in Jewry, and reformed the state of the church according to the law of God, that then he was so oppressed of his enemies that he was very likely to be a lost and desperate man. It is not without cause that the Holy Spirit notably expresseth that such afflictions happened unto him immediately after he had established the true religion in his perset order. 
for it was very likely that as soon as he went about to set forth the glory of God, he should not have his realm peaceable. So all faithful princes and governors of countries be advertised by this example, that the more they shall employ their labor to put out all idolatry, and procure that God be truly worshipped as he ought, the more their faith shall be proved by diverse temptations. God suffereth it, and so will have it, to declare the constancy of his and to exercise them that they should have regard to an higher thing than this world. In the meantime the devil also doth his office, intending by all covert and hidden means to destroy the good doctrine, because he cannot openly attain to his desire. But following the admonition of St. James, who saith unto us that in considering the patience of Job we must take heed to the end, we must also cast our eyes upon the end which was given to the said good king. As God succored him in all his adversities, so in the end he remained victorious. Considering that, and forasmuch as his hand is not now any shorter than it was then, and that he hath at this day in so great recommendation the defense of his people, truth and verity, as ever he had, doubt ye not, but that he will help you, and not only for one time, but in as many temptations as he shall send unto you. If the most part of the world resist the gospel and likewise enforceth themselves with all rage and violence to impeach and hinder the setting forth thereof, we ought not to think it strange, for it is the unthankfulness of men which ever have been and shall be to recoil when God approacheth to them and also to stumble against him when he will charge them with his yoke. Moreover, for that of their nature they be given to hypocrisy, they may not endure to be brought to the light of the word of God, which discovereth their infamy and shame, nor to be drawn out of the superstitions which serveth unto them as hiding places, for to give them shadow. It is then no new thing, if there be great contradiction, when one goeth about to bring them to the pure obedience of God. And also we have advertisement of our Lord Jesus, the which saith to us, that he hath brought the sword with his evangel. But this must not astonish us, nor make us worse willing or fearful, for in the end, when men shall have well mutinied and put forth all their malices, they shall be confounded in a moment, and shall overthrow themselves with their own violences. It is true, as it is said in the second psalm, that God shall not but laugh at their stirrings, that is to say, that in dissimulating he shall leave them tormented, as the thing touched him not. But for all that, in the end they shall be always driven back of his power, of the which, if we be armed, we have a good, perfect, and invincible munition against all conspiracies, whatsoever the devils may procure against us. And in the end we shall know by experience that, as the gospel is the messenger of peace and of the reconciliation between God and us, so can he as well for us pacify men, and by this means we shall find that Isaiah hath not said in vain that when Jesus Christ shall reign amongst us by his doctrine, the swords shall be converted into plowshares, and the spears into scythes. In the meantime, albeit that the malice and rebellion of men are the occasion of sedition and mutinies, which riseth against the gospel, yet nevertheless it behoveth us to take heed to ourselves, and to know that God chasteneth our faults by them, which otherwise cannot but serve to Satan. It hath been an ancient complaint that the gospel was the cause of all evils and calamities which happened unto men. Indeed, we see by the histories that not long after the Christianity was spread in all places, there was not almost a corner in the world which was not horribly afflicted. The motion of the wars was as an universal fire lightened in all countries. The floods in the one side, the pestilence and famine in the other, and horrible confusion of order and policy in manner that was likely that the world should be clearly overturned. We have also seen in our time, since the gospel hath begun to be abroad, many miseries, so that every man complaineth that we be in an unhappy world, and there is very few that feeleth not the weight of the burden. Now in feeling such blows we ought to regard the hand of him that striketh us, and we ought also to think wherefore. The cause which moveth him to make us so to feel his scourge is not very dark or hard to understand. We know that his word, by the which we will keep us in health, is an inestimable treasure, and in what manner of recompense is it received of us. Wherefore then, seeing we esteem not much that which is so precious to speak of, it is reason that he take revenge of our ingratitude. We also hear that Jesus Christ said that the servant, knowing the will of his master and doing it not, is worthy of double chastisement, for because that we be so slothful to obey the will of our God, 
which hath been declared unto us more than an hundred times heretofore, we ought not to think it strange if he be more sharply angry with us, seeing that we be more inexcusable. When we cause not the good seed to increase and profit, it is reason that the thistles and thorns of Satan groweth to prick and torment us, because that we give not to our Creator the obedience that is due unto him, it is no marvel that men arise against us. As I understand, my Lord, you have two kinds of mutinies which be risen against the king and the state of the realm. The one be fantastical men which under the colour of the gospel would put all to confusion. The other be obstinate people in the superstitions of the Antichrist of Rome. Altogether deserveth well to be punished by the sword that is committed unto you seeing that they quarrel not only against the king, but also against God, which hath placed him in the seat royal, and hath committed unto you the protection, as well of his person, as of his majesty and regal estate. But the principal means is to do as much as is possible to cause that they which savour the doctrine of the gospel, to the intent to stick and cleave unto it, should receive it with such humbleness and fear, that they may forsake themselves for the service of God. For they ought to think that God will reveal all to the intent that they shall profit more without feigning in his word than they have done before. These mad folks that would the world should return into a confused and disordinate liberty be subordinated by Satan for to slander the gospel, as that it should not engender but rebellion against princes and all disorder amongst the peoples. Wherefore all faithful ought to be sorrowful. The papists, willing to maintain the filthy abominations of their Roman idol, show themselves open enemies of the grace of Jesus Christ and of all his ordinances. The same also ought to grieve the hearts of all them which have good zeal, wherefore they ought to think altogether that these be scourges of God which he sendeth to them. And wherefore? But only because that they make none account of the doctrine of health as they ought to do. Wherefore the principal remedy for to appease such seditions is that they which profess the gospel do truly repair to the image of God, for to show that our Christianity causeth not dissipation in the human life, and give good proof and trial of their soberness and temperance, that we, governed by the word of God, be not men unruled and without a bridle, and by their good and holy life stop the mouths of all evil speakers. For by this means God, being appeased, shall retire his hand." And in the place that this day he punisheth the slanderers for the contemning of his word, he shall bless their obedience in all posterity. Likewise, that all the nobility and lawyers govern themselves rightly and in all humility to the obedience of this great King Jesus Christ, making holy homage unto him without feigning of soul and body and all that they have, to the intent that he correct and abate that togancy and folly of them that would ties against them. Lo, this is the means how princes of the earth ought to reign in serving Jesus Christ, to the end that he may have sovereign authority amongst all, both great and small. Wherefore, my lord, inasmuch as you have the regal estate of the king, your nephew dear unto you, and in great recommendation, as you show very well, I pray you, in the name of God, to employ your principal care and vigilancy, that the doctrine of God may be preached with strength and virtue, for to bring forth his fruit and not to leave for any respect to pursue a full and an entire reformation of the church. And the better to declare unto you my mind and intention, I will divide the whole into three points. The first shall be the means to instruct the people well. The second shall be the taking away of the abuse that hath been of long time. The third, with diligence to correct vices and to keep so good order that the slanders and disorders may not have such place as the name of God should be blasphemed. As to the first, I mind not to declare unto you what doctrine ought to have place, but rather I give thanks to Almighty God that besides that he hath given unto you the light of his pure knowledge, he hath also given unto you good counsel and discretion to cause his pure verity to be preached, so that, God be thanked, you be not to teach what is the true faith of Christian men and the doctrine that they ought to receive, seeing that by your means the purity of the faith is restored, that is, that we believe and take God for the only governor of our souls, that we keep his law for the only rule and spiritual government of our conscience, and not to serve him after the foolish invention of man. Also that according to his nature he will be served in spirit and in purity of heart. Of the other part, knowing that there is not but all evil in us, and that we be corrupted in all our knowledge and affections, on that sort, that our souls being despaired in ourselves be like a bottomless pit or world of iniquity. 
and having taken away all presumption of our wisdom, dignity, or power to do well, we may have recourse to the fountain of all goodness, which is Jesus Christ, receiving that which he giveth us, that is to say, the merit of his death and passion, to the intent that by that means we may be reconciled unto God, that being washed with his blood, we should not fear that our faults should impeach or hinder us to find grace before his celestial throne, that being certain that our sins be freely pardoned us by virtue of his sacrifice, we shall put therein our trust and assurance for to be ascertained of our health, and that we be sanctified by his spirit in giving ourselves to the obedience of the justice of God, that being fortified by his grace we shall be vanquishers of Satan, the world and the flesh. Finally, that being members of his body we fear it not, but God will take us for his children, and that we may have confidence to call unto him as our Father, that we be advertised to bring to this end all that is said and done in the church, it is that being retired from the world we may be lifted up to heaven with our head and Saviour. Wherefore, seeing then that God hath given you the grace to restore the knowledge of his doctrine, which hath been so long buried by the Antichrist, I leave to keep you with longer purpose. And that which I have touched of the manner of teaching is only for that the people may be rightly instructed, and for to feel that which the apostle said, that is, that the word of God is a sword, cutting with two edges, piercing the thoughts and affections under the marrow of the bone. I say this, my lord, for that I think there is very few lively preachings within the realm, but that the most part reciteth, as by lecture, I well perceive the necessity that constraineth you thereunto. For first you have not, as I think, your pastors so good and apt as you desire and wish, wherefore it is needful for you to supply that lack. Secondly, there might chance to be many light spirits, which would peradventure leap beyond their bonds, sowing some foolish fantasies, as many times they do in new things. But all these considerations impeacheth not, but that the ordinance of Jesus Christ ought to have his course as in preaching the gospel. Now this preaching ought not to be dead but alive, for to teach, exhort, and reprehend, as St. Paul saith to Timothy, yea, in such sort, as if an infidel enter, he may be wounded, overcome, and taken, as the same Paul saith in another place, for to give glory unto God. You know also, my Lord, how, as he speaketh of the liveliness that ought to be in the mouths of them which will approve themselves good and faithful ministers of the gospel, that they ought not to have or use words of rhetoric, intending thereby to be in greater estimation, but that the Spirit of God ought to sound in their voices for to work in virtue. All the dangers that are to be feared ought not to impeach the Spirit of God to have his liberty and his course in them in the which he hath distributed of his grace for to edify the church. It is true that in the meantime it is good and expedient to stop the lightness of fantastical spirits that taketh too much license, also to shut the gate of all curiosities and newfangled doctrines. But the best and most convenient means such as God hath showed unto us is that first there be a some resolute of the doctrine that all ought to preach, the which all prelates and curates should swear to follow, and that none be received to any ecclesiastical charge, but he promised to observe the same concord and union. After that, to have a formal and common instruction for to instruct the young children and ignorant people, which should make them acquainted with the true doctrine, in such wise that they may discern it from lies and corruptions, which else might be brought in. To the contrary, believe, my Lord, that the Church of God shall never be conserved without catechism, for it is as the seed to be kept that the good grain perish not, but that it may increase from age to age. Wherefore, if you desire to build a work of continuance to endure long and which should not shortly fall in decay, cause that the children in their young age shall be instructed with a good catechism that may learn them briefly and according to their small capacities to know wherein consisteth the true Christianity. This catechism shall serve for two purposes, that is to say, for an introduction to all the people, for to profit well in that which shall be preached unto them, and also to discern in case any presumptuously would attempt to set forth strange doctrines. In the meantime I say not, and also necessary to bind and restrain the pastors and curates to a certain form written, for to supply the ignorances and simpleness of some of them, and also the better to show the conformity and concord of all churches. Thirdly, for to bridle all curiosities and new inventions, such as desire nothing but to run riot, the said catechism, as I have before rehearsed, shall serve and 
be a good bridle for such folks, and also in such short order is to be given in the ministering of the sacraments and in the public prayers. But in the meantime, you must take heed that such policy destroy not the strength and virtue that ought to be in the preaching of the gospel, and that you employ your labor as much as you possibly can, that there be good trumpets which may enter into the deepness of the hearts, for there is danger that ye shall not see great profit of such reformation, how good and holy soever it be, unless that even at once with it the power and virtue of good preaching be displayed and set forth together. It is not without cause that it is said that Jesus Christ shall strike the heathen by the scepter of his mouth and shall destroy the evil by the spirit of his lips. It is the means by the which he will overcome us in destroying all that which is against him. And for that cause the gospel is also called the kingdom of God. Also, albeit that the ordinances and statutes of princes be good helps to advance and maintain the state of Christianity, so likewise God will declare his sovereign virtue in the spiritual sword of his word with it, setting forth the same by his pastors. And to the intent I would not long trouble you, my lord, I will come to the second point which I have purposed to show unto you. It is to abolish and clearly to take away the abuses and corruptions that Satan hath mingled heretofore with the ordinances of God. We know that under the Pope there is a bastard Christianity which God shall disallow in the last day, forasmuch as at this day he hath condemned the same by his word. If we desire to retire the world from such perdition, there is nothing better than to follow the example of St. Paul, who, willing to correct the evil that the Corinthians had joined to the supper of our Lord, said unto them, I have received of the Lord that which I have given unto you. Of that we must gather one general instruction to return to the right and natural commandment of God, if we will have a good and an approved reformation of him. For so many minglings as men have set up of their own inventions, there be so many infections which turn us from the holy usage of that that God hath given us for our health. So to, here yeah, there is a lacuna in the text, of half the branches of such abuses, it cannot bring again the things in perfect and pure state, because that we then shall have always a Christianity counterfeit. I say this for that, that some, under the color of moderation, be of opinion to suffer many abuses without taking them away, and they think that it is enough to have taken out the root of the principle. But contrarywise, we see how much the seed of lies is fertile, and that one grain of that is sufficient for to fill all the world within three days, as men be inclined and given unto. Our Lord teacheth us otherwise, for when David speaketh of idols, and saith, that their name shall not pass by his mouth, to the intent to declare unto us what horror and detestation we ought to have them in. And if we consider well how much we have offended God in the time of our ignorance, we ought to be doubly remembered for to eschew the inventions of Satan, who hath provoked us to do such evil things, using them as allurements which serveth not but to seduce the poor and simple folks. On the other side we see that, albeit men be sufficiently warned of their faults and errors, and be advertised of them as much as is possible, yet nevertheless they be so hardened that no man can attain to the perfect end. Then, if there shall be left unto them some dregs to remain, it shall be a nourishment of much more and greater obstinacy, and a coverture to hide all doctrine that may be propounded unto them. I confess that it is convenient to observe some moderation, and that to great extremity is neither good nor profitable. Likewise, it is convenient to use the ceremonies according to the grossness of the people, but it may not be that that which is of Satan and of the Antichrist should pass under that color. It is for that cause that that holy scripture praising the kings which did destroy the idolatries, not having plucked away altogether, nevertheless gave unto them a mark for that they had not destroyed the chapels and places of foolish devotion. Wherefore, my lord, seeing that God hath brought you so far forth, I pray you continue without any exception to the intent that he may approve you the setter forth of his temple, in such wise as the time of the king, your nephew, may be compared to the time of Josiah, and that you may set all things in such state as there shall rest nothing to him but to maintain the good order which God shall have prepared unto him by your means." I will allege unto you an example of such dregs which peradventure may rest to be a little leaven, the which in the end will make the paste sour. They do in your country some kind of prayer for the dead when the communion is received, 
I know well it is not for to avow the purgatory of the Pope. I know also that it may be alleged by ancient custom to do some remembrance for the dead, to the intent to join together all the members of the body. But there is a preemptory argument to the contrary that the supper of Jesus Christ is so holy a thing that it ought not to be defiled with no inventions of men. Moreover, that in praying unto God we ought not let slip the bridle of our fantastical devotion, but to keep that rule which St. Paul did give unto us, that is, that we take our foundation of the word of God. Wherefore, such remembrance of recommendation is not convenient to the order of the good and due prayer, and it is an evil addition to the holy supper of the Lord. There is other things which peradventure should be less blamed, which nevertheless is not to be excused, as the ceremony of the cream and unction. The cream hath been invented of a foolish fantasy by them that contented not themselves with the administration of Jesus Christ, and that they would counterfeit the Holy Spirit by a new doctrine, as though the water were not sufficient enough for that. And that which is called the extreme unction hath been retained by a foolish affection of them that have will to follow the apostles, having not the same gift that they had. For when the apostles did use the oil upon the sick, it was for to heal them by miracle. When the miracle ceased, the figure ought no more to be used. Wherefore it should be a great deal better that the things should be so parred off again, as they may be most agreeing to the pure word of God, and may serve to the edifying of the church. It is true that we ought to bear with the weak, but that is for to strengthen and bring them to greater perfection. That is not to say that in the meantime we ought to please fools which desire now this and now that, and know not wherefore. I know the consideration wherefore many are troubled. It is that they fear that too much alteration cannot be borne with, principally when one will have regard of his neighbors, with whom he desireth to nourish friendship and amity. A man would gladly gratify them in dissimulating many things. This ought to be borne with in worldly affairs, where it is lawful to yield one to another, and to give some of our right to buy peace. But it is not all one of the spiritual governance of the church which ought to be ordered according to the word of God, in that it is not in our liberty to yield in anything to men in respect of their favor. Likewise, there is nothing that displeases God more than when we will by our human prudence, moderate or temper, or reform or set forth or draw back anything against his will. Wherefore, if we will not displease him, we must close our eyes in respect of men. As to the dangers that may happen, we ought to eschew them as much as we may, but not in declining from the true and right way, for we have his promise that he will assist us in walking the right way so that it resteth not in us but to do our office in recommending to him that that shall follow. And for that occasion the wise of this world may be times void of their hope, for that that God is not with them, when they trust not in him and in his help in searching by means which he condemneth. If then we will have the virtue and strength of God on our side, let us follow simply that he saith unto us, and above all we ought to keep this general rule that the reformation of his church is the work of his hand, Wherefore, it is necessary that in this matter men suffer themselves to be governed by him, the which, whether it be in restoring or in keeping his church, will most commonly proceed by a marvellous and strange means and ways, unknown to men. Wherefore, to restrain this reformation that ought to be divine by the measure of our wit, and to make that which is celestial subject to the earth and the world, is against all good reason. By that I exclude not the wisdom which is very requisite to observe all prophecy and good means, and not to exceed either on the one side or the other in any extremity for the winning of all the world to God, if it should be possible. But it is needful that the wisdom of the Spirit should rule and not of the flesh, and that having examined the mouth of the Lord we require of him that he will be our guide and conductor sooner than to follow our own wits." And when we shall require it in that sort, it shall be easy for us to exclude many temptations that may stay us in the midst of the way. Wherefore, my Lord, as you have begun to reduce Christianity unto his perfect state in England, and not in trusting of yourself, but to be maintained by the hand of God, as unto this day ye have felt his mighty hand, doubt ye not, but that he will help you unto the end. For if God maintaineth the kingdoms and lordships of infidels that be his enemies, by much more reason he will take into his guard them that be obedient unto him, and do take him for their superior. 
I come now to the last article, that is, to punish vice and to reprove slanders. I doubt not, but there is good laws and lawful statutes within the realm of England for to keep the people in honest life. But the great disorders and enormities that I see in the world constraineth me to desire you to take also the care that the people be kept in good and honest discipline, and above all, that ye have the honour of God in good reputation to the intent to punish such crimes of the which men accustomably make none account. I say it for that, that sometimes thefts, robberies, fightings, and extortions shall be sharply punished, for that in those men be offended, and in the meantime whoredoms, adulteries, drunkenness, and blasphemies of the name of God be suffered almost to things lawful and of small importance. Contrarywise we see in what estimation and detestation God hath them in, for he declareth unto us how much his name is precious, and in what estimation we ought to have it, and yet it is by us, as it were, torn in pieces and trodden under our feet. Wherefore, out of doubt, he will not leave unpunished such injuries and dishonour. Yea, and moreover the scripture showeth us that by blasphemies a whole realm is infected. As touching adulteries, it is a great shame unto us, which profess the name of Christ, that the pagans have observed greater rigour in punishing thereof than we do, of the which we many times make but a laughing game, when the holy marriage that ought to be a lively image of the holy union that we have with the Son of God is defiled, and that the alliance, which ought to be most stable and indissoluble, is unjustly broken. If we take not those things to heart, it is a sign that we have no great care nor love of God. Touching whoredom, it may well suffice us that St. Paul doth compare it to sacrilege, forasmuch as by the same the temples of God, which is our bodies, be profaned and defiled. Item then that the whoremongers and drunkards be banished from the kingdom of God in such wise that it is defended unto us to keep company with them. Wherefore it followeth that they ought not to be suffered in the church, and this is the cause that so many tribulations be this day upon the earth, for insomuch as men pardoneth such enormities, it must follow that God must take vengeance. Wherefore, my Lord, to the intent to prevent his wrath, I pray you to hold the bridle short, and cause that they which heareth the doctrine of the gospel prove themselves to be Christian men by the holiness of their life. For as the doctrine is the soul of the church for to give it life, so the discipline and correction of vices be as the sinews for to maintain the body in his force and strength. It is the office of bishops and curates to take good heed to the same, to the intent that the supper of our Lord be not polluted by folks of slanderous and dishonest life. But considering the authority which God hath committed unto you, the principal charge returneth unto you for to set others in the right way, to the intent that every one discharge themselves of their duty and cause that the order which is established be duly observed. Now, my lord, following the protestation that I have made here before, I will not excuse myself any longer, neither of the prolixity of my letters, nor of that that I have liberally declared that I had in my heart. For I trust that mine affection is known unto you according to your wisdom, and as ye be exercised in the Holy Scripture, you see of what fountain I have drawn all that which is herein contained." Wherefore, I do not fear that I have been tedious and importune in declaring unto you, to the best of my power, the good desire that I have, that the name of God may be daily by you more largely glorified, for the which I pray to him daily, praying that it may please him to augment his grace unto you, confirming you by his Holy Spirit in a perfect and invincible constancy, maintaining you against your enemies, having you with all your household in his holy protection, and doing that you administer happily the charge that is committed to you so that the king may have occasion to give thanks to his Lord God, for that he hath had such a governor in his young age, as well of his person, as also of his realm. So I make an end, my lord, having me most humbly recommended unto your grace, the 22nd of October, in the year of our Lord, 1549, your most humble servant, John Calvin. End of an epistle, both of godly consolation and also of advertisement, by John Calvin. The epistle of John Calvin, whether it be lawful for a Christian man to communicate or be partaker of the mass of the papists without offending God and his neighbor, or not, by John Calvin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The man to whom ye gave commission required us to write your advice how ye might keep you from staining yourself 
among so many spots of superstitions, as in the stead of the pure and true service of God, have gotten place in the church there with you. As for me, I suppose it shall be sufficient to declare you my mind briefly, also not hiding from you what other men do think in the mean season, considering that there is some variance in this behalf. The same that other men would either deny or wink at, stand I at no doubt to affirm, namely that I utterly do not subscribe unto their opinion, so that at the least by this my simple confession ye may understand that it shall be far from all feignedness whatsoever I will say. But this one thing will I heartily pray you, that in hearing me speak of variant ye will not be sore offended, as though ye might have no thing of us, but that is wrapped with controversies. For as ye shall hear, there is very little variance between us. They, pondering how dangerous a thing it is to snare men's consciences in religion, dare not condemn aught no unlawful that may by any means be excused. Moreover, when they consider how many grievous ways they be oppressed on every side, which live in that captivity of Babylon, they must needs favour them in some things, lest that, if they should be too importune upon them, it might utterly discomfort such as else have a good zeal and be endued with a right fear of God. But I contrariwise do hold that it cannot be too straitly kept, which the Lord hath bound by his word, and that the godly ought not to flatter themselves in evil things, lest they be careless in remaining therein. Nevertheless, I do not deny, but that both the same their reasons are very good, they also grant me gladly mine objection. But it cometh to pass, I cannot tell how, that while they are too fervent upon their considerations, methink they are too merciful, they also judge me too cruel, while I remit nothing. Verily, there is nothing that I am more loath to do than to swerve, how little soever it be, from the mind of such men as the whole church hath worthily in high estimation, and whom I privately have in reverence with all my heart. Only of their goodness let them grant me this, to receive nothing against the judgment of my conscience. First, without any controversy, we all agree in this, that a Christian man is bound not only to worship God spiritually in his heart, but also to testify the same outwardly. For as God hath consecrated our soul together with the body unto himself, so should his glory appear in both, as St. Paul saith. They do but fable, therefore, that affirm it to be sufficient if a man keep the pureness of religion inwardly, and that God regardeth not outward things, so that the mind remain whole. And yet... Notwithstanding, we do not require of every one an open confession of his faith, but that a godly man nevertheless endeavour himself to profess that worship of the only God and Christ which is commended unto us in his word. Again, we have not appointed this profession with certain limits, save only that every man, according to the measure of his understanding, faculty, and as occasion is offered him, do in any wise apply himself to sanctify the name of God. Wherefore in this matter we must handle more with exhortations than with determinable rulers. For as the faithful neither may nor ought to be constrained to any certain rule, so do they favour themselves too much, if, but in part only, and that slenderly, they use the worship of God, and follow not still upon it continually, and with diligent labour as long as they live. Let every man therefore be diligent and constant in forcing himself, and let him not leave off till he have specially persuaded himself in this, that he omit no occasion of glorifying God. But one thing we affirm precisely, that they which receive such usages as are notable in manifest ungodliness do swerve from that profession of faith which all Christian men owe unto their Lord, foreseeing that the Lord hath instituted ceremonies whereby we may be exercised toward the sincere worshipping of him, verily, like as in practising the same, we testify ourselves to be the worshippers of the living God, even so in using such other as have the appearance either of idolatry or superstition, we both dishonour the name of God and defile ourselves. For they finally remain undefiled, that neither bow their knee unto Baal, neither kiss his hand, nor swear with their tongue by any other name than by the name of the living God. In these things we do not vary. But when we come to discern ungodly usages from such as be good and according to religion, there we somewhat vary. Wherein yet I grant them this, that some usages there be, which either came up of a little superstition, or else are degenerate into some superstition from their good original, the observing whereof were not to be reprehended if it lacked superstition. As, for example, 
They that first lighted candles at the table of the Lord swerved somewhat from the pureness of the gospel, bringing in a ceremony which yet being good was at the coming of Christ abrogated with other parcels of the Jewsdom. Yet the same affliction of comeliness, as fond as it is, when it proceedeth not to ungodliness, there is no offence of God in observing it. Other things were well institute, which through abuse are swerved from their truth, which I permit the godly also to observe, so that the abuse be not fallen to manifest idolatry. Nevertheless, as conserving them both, it were verily to be desired that they were either wholly abolished, or else plainly that they were reformed. But because that lieth not in a private man's hand, let him not refuse to follow the custom received in his church, which custom by right he had rather were taken away or else reformed. Let him not refuse it, I say, if he be brought to it by necessity. But as long as he may without offence, let him refrain from it, that by his rare using thereof he may declare that he doth not greatly allow it. Here now I am constrained to descend from certain learned men, whom I else esteem as fathers, because that among this sort they reckon the high mass and certain other such ceremonies, for they esteem it to proceed of the supper of the Lord, though it be diversely stained and polluted. And yet do they not deny, but that the opinions which are of it be wicked and against God, such as a godly heart ought to abhor. Nevertheless, they judge that a private man is to be excused, which, while he may not have the supper of the Lord purely ministered, doth not refuse it, torn and rent as it is. But I cannot be brought to esteem it for the supper, though the authors thereof do colour the name of it never so much. For Jeroboam also would that the calves which he set up should seem to be instruments of the Jews' religion, and the same verily was done contrary to the Lord's commandment, so that it was no more lawful to offer there than to do sacrifices unto the idols of the heathen. Considering, therefore, that I esteem the Mass for a very abomination, which after no otherwise is decked with the name of the Holy Supper, than as an angel of Satan transfigureth himself into an angel of light, I cannot see under what pretense a godly man, being illuminated with God's word, may have it in reverence as a pure ceremony of God. For over and besides that, it is manifest that Christ, with the holy ministration of his supper, is there had in derision. A devout conscience will not presume to apply unto it the promises that were given unto the supper. Neither availeth the excuse which some men bring in, that a godly man, and such one as feareth God, cometh not save only to be partakers of the prayers and sacraments with the faithful, but abhorreth from all the ungodly acts which there are executed, and in the secret affection of his heart doth hate the things that he openly cannot improve, for he only avoideth idolatry that refraineth from the sacrifices of idols. The Mass, verily, is an idol set up in the temple of God, when thou therefore art at it, thou standest before the simple and givest very evil example, for they think thou worshippest whatever abomination is in the mass. I will stand no longer in this matter, when Paul to the Corinthians doth sufficiently declare that he is a partaker of the cup of devils, which although he do it without conscience of superstition, only by outward example meddleth with profane usages, and moreover, that he is guilty of blood because he confirmeth the error of the ignorant by his example. Whereas it is alleged that there with you the church is whose communion is not utterly to be excluded, that argument also is easily dissolved, for the church is taken sundry ways. Therefore, according to the diverse estimation thereof, we must prudently discern after what sort the church of yours is to be reputed. As for me, verily, I believe that the Catholic Church is scattered abroad in all such places as are kept under through the tyranny of the Pope, foreseeing that the Apostle doth testify that God cannot repent him of his calling, as he gathereth of the Jews, that they shall never depart wholly from the grace of God, which are ones received into the inviolable covenant. Even so, may we reason now that among all nations, to whomsoever the Lord hath appointed the eternal covenant of the gospel, the power thereof remaineth still, Yea, they have baptism, also a scale of the covenant, which can yet, through the unthankfulness and unfaithfulness of man, cannot the will of the Lord be hundred, but it must forth, wherefore we conclude that the Lord hath always had, and yet hath, his elect, whose salvation is sealed with such a seal of baptism, as is neither vain nor without any undoubted strength. 
and because baptism is a sacrament of the church, the Lord would that the calling upon his name and some appearance of the ministration should still remain there. But as concerning the very proper beauty of the church, such as is expressed unto us in the scripture, that do not I acknowledge to be the congregations of the papistry. The church is it whom Christ commanded to obey and hearken unto, but why, even because it is the pillar and establishment of the truth. As for those, they are the nests of errors and heresies, which by all means go about to overthrow the word of God and set up idolatry in the stead of God's true worship, yea, all kinds of abomination in the place of true godliness. Finally, I judge her to be such a shape of the church as was among the Israelites, after that Jeroboam had set up a temple and the calves contrary to the word of the Lord. For wickedly all things were perverted among them, yet for the honor of circumcision the Lord vouchsafed to grant the people the name of a church, and therefore by Ezekiel he called them his children that came of them. But would not the prophets therefore have granted that any man might have worshipped in Bethel under that pretense because the church was there? Thus ye see now how far we agree and how great diversity is between us. This do certain and godly men require of a Christian man as well as I, first that he serve God with the inward pureness of his heart, and then with outward exercises of godliness to testify the worship of the Spirit. This profession do we think to consist in two parts, in the confession of the tongue and in holy observances. In declaring your faith we can prescribe you no measure, but that according to your vocation ye seek all occasions that the name of God may be sanctified by you. But specially ye must labor to have your household well taught in religion. For the Lord, in making you ruler over your children and servants, hath not only put you in trust with them, that ye should govern them in their duties of civility, but also to bring them up in godliness. Touching the second part, we think thus, that all such ceremonies as do contain either manifest idolatry or open ungodliness are contrary to the profession of that religion which a godly man is bound unto. Wherefore the worshipping of images and selling of masses, that a man should buy them with money, and such other like things, we plainly disallow. And in this are not godly and learned men against me, that it is also a Christian man's duty to eschew those ceremonies which sprang of error and covetousness, and saints' holy days, where there is nothing that resembleth or is like the holy antiquity of the church, but many things are there profane and impure. For the word of God is there shamefully and miserably perverted, and prayers there be, which are either fond and unsavory, or else full of blasphemies. Under the same kind do we comprehend pardons, brotherhoods, or fraternities, holy water and such like, whose beginning hath not been allowable, and the abuse, yea, the very use of them, doth plainly rob God of his honor. Now have we to speak of such as to pertain nigh to the keeping of the communion of Christian fellowship, concerning the which my conscience will not suffer me to be of like opinion with those right, virtuous, and excellent men. For they judge that men ought not to forsake the communion of a congregation wherein the covenant of the Lord remaineth, and where his name is called upon. Their counsel is therefore that men, specially on the Sundays, do participate with them in prayers, because that then commonly the people assemble for this intent to call upon God, and the prayers which are made be the more pure because they are of the old church. They counsel men also to be present at the Mass as at the Lord's Supper, which, how wonderfully soever it be defiled, deformed, rent asunder on every side, corrupt and polluted with wicked opinions, yet by means of the certainty of God's promises it remaineth the supper for the faithful. Nevertheless, in the mean season they enjoin two things, that, as oft as a Christian man goeth to the Mass, while he himself may not reform the abominations that there appear, he... Here there is a lacuna in the text. Of God by his prayers a reformation thereof. And that then to his poor, as occasion requireth, he doth his diligence, that he seem not to consent into idolatry. Nor to such rites or usages as do rob God of his honor, but that he may be perceived to seek God and his pure worship, and utterly to refuse all such things as are contrary to his gospel. A certain godly and learned man addeth moreover, how that he wisheth that the same person, whosoever he be, should communicate at the table, whereby he may the better testify that he seeketh there the supper of the Lord. 
But I would wish verily with all my heart that the servant of Christ should reverently take whatsoever he seeth there appertaining to his Lord, so that he defile himself with any uncleanness, notwithstanding because I see no way whereby the filthiness of Satan might be separated from the holy ceremonies of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, I can in no wise suffer the outward exercises of religion to be had in such price that the temple which is dedicated unto God should be stained with idolatry. Wherefore, if ye can there use the things appertaining unto Christ, so that ye join yourself to no wicked and ungodly ceremonies, I will gladly grant it you. Else I can in no wise be brought to give you leave, for to do that which in my judgment is clearly against the profession of a Christian man. How then will ye say, Must I not then other change my dwelling, or else despair? That do not I so precisely require. Nevertheless, my desire is that ye daily call yourself unto an account, and cast with yourself earnestly how far from rendering unto God the worship that ye owe him. And this may ye bemoan the misery of your captivity unto him, which only can amend it, and entreat him by your continual prayers that he will restore liberty unto his people, and renew his holy city, wherein pure and sincere sacrifices of praise or thanksgiving may be offered up unto him. For it is no small scourge of the Lord that ye are constrained to serve strange gods, Therefore must ye neither minish it with vain consolations, nor favour yourself in so great infirmity. Wherefore, see that ye have always in mind what miserable case ye stand in, that ye may with the more earnest desire go about to be rid of it. Such an humble mind will not the Lord forsake, but either make some way of final deliverance, or else succour you through his mercy. Farewell, the Lord bless you and your household. Amen. Laus Dei. End of the Epistle of John Calvin, whether it be lawful for a Christian man to communicate or be partaker of the mass of the papists without offending God and his neighbor, or not, by John Calvin. Wycliffe's Opinion of the Papacy by John Wycliffe this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Dr. James's Apology or Defense of Wycliffe This controversy about the supremacy or primacy of the Pope being the very soul and life of popery may be resolved into sundry questions. 1. Whether the Pope be supreme judge upon earth in all causes and over all persons. 2. Admit he were so, whether he may intermeddle with the affairs of kings and princes. 3. Supposing that also, whether he be of that temper and making that he cannot err in his final conclusions. 4. And lastly, whether he be antichrist or no. 1. Wycliffe, supposing the donation of Constantine, which afterwards was proved a counterfeit, for a while held that the Pope was to be consulted in the greatest points of religion, that he had a plenary and full power of himself, and that he did incur the crime of paganism who did not obey his mandates. But what of all this? Was Wycliffe a papist? No, verily, for, first, this plenary power was built upon a rotten foundation, which afterwards fell to the ground of itself. Two, it was given to the Pope only for to edify, not to destroy or demolish the Church. Three, it was so limited that he could do nothing against the law of God or against the law of reason. Lastly, if his laws did go contrary to Christ's laws, an inferior might and in conscience ought not only to disobey him but to reprove, correct, and contradict him, as Paul did withstand Peter unto the face. Further, he grants the Pope no greater authority or superiority over his brethren than Peter and Apollos had over their new converts, whom he excludes flatly from any such sovereignty, taking away all honor from them and giving it to Christ Jesus, to whom all knowledge, all love, all duty, from all Christians is to be ascribed, so far that no creature is to be acknowledged, loved, or honored, but Christ, or in respect of Christ. Neither is it possible, as he thinks, for any Catholic to be so unadvised or inconsiderate as to follow the Pope's fiat. Let it be done, when he that spake, and it was done, shall say, No. For this verse can be true of no earthly man, but of our blessed Saviour, Christ Jesus. This is my will, this I command. My will, for reason good, shall stand. 
Finally, he was condemned as an heretic for denying the Pope's supremacy, therefore he cannot well be accounted of the Romish Church. 2. The Pope's civil dominion or right in temporal estates. This question Wycliffe doth everywhere determine against the Pope, for the king and his regality, and that of set purpose in an especial treatise of civil dominion, strengthening his opinion plainly out of the fundamental laws of this land with great judgment and knowledge. 3. That the Pope may err is shown plainly throughout all Wycliffe's works, where he proves that the Pope is of that nature that he may err, that one whom men call Pope may err, not only in manner and conversation of life, but also in doctrine and articles of the creed. He may sin, and no man in the world easier or more grievously, and indeed they have erred and been infected with foul heresies. Yea, he thinketh it to be likely that all bishops of Rome for three hundred years and more before his time were fully heretics. 4. Whether the Pope be Antichrist This Wycliffe proves by comparing his doctrine and manners with Christ's, chiefly in his book of the seven deadly sins, telling us that forasmuch as through his decrees God's commands, by his commandments Christ's commandments, by his decretals Paul's epistles, by his canon law the canonical scripture, was vilified, nullified, utterly defaced and debased, a fault for which he is bold to tax him in sundry passages of his work. He pronounces of him absolutely that he is potissimus antichristus, most especially antichrist. The quotations are from Wycliffe's writings. End of Wycliffe's Opinions of the Papacy by John Wycliffe Some Account of the Life of John Wycliffe, D.D. Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The state of England during the latter part of the 14th century presents many causes for painful reflection. Luxury and pride characterized the higher classes while the lower orders were involved in misery and vice abounded among all ranks. Contemporary historians ascribe much of this dissoluteness of morals to the civil wars of preceding reigns whereby the land was desolated and the bonds of society relaxed. The internal peace of the country, it is true, had become more settled, but many causes united to prevent moral improvement. A long course of foreign victory inflated the national pride, the wealth that accrued to individuals from successful welfare, with the habits acquired thereby promoted luxury and dissipation among the higher ranks, further stimulated by the introduction of new articles of expense through an increasing commerce. Meanwhile, the people in general were exhausted by calls for pecuniary supplies and personal aid to carry on foreign hostilities and the feuds and oppressions of powerful barons with the constant plundering of bands of robbers for many years suffered to exist with impunity caused much misery among the lower orders whose sufferings led to the insurrections in the early part of the reign of Richard II. Such in reality was the state of England in the days of Wycliffe as depicted by the analysts who lived near his time, although general historians engrossed by military details and political events dwell but slightly upon these painful circumstances. Another cause tended much to produce and to perpetuate an unhappy state of society, for the soul to be without knowledge is not good, and those were days of ignorance and mental darkness. Some symptoms of a revival of learning appeared, but as yet little progress had been made in science. The subtleties of the schools retarded all advances in useful knowledge, while the improvement in fine arts were made subservient to luxury rather than beneficial to the general character of the age. But ignorance as to spiritual truth was the greatest and most serious evil. The main object of those who called themselves ministers of Christ was to enslave the minds and to plunder the property of the people committed to their charge. They kept from them the truths of the gospel and sought to be reverenced as beings superior to their fellow men while they indulged every debasing appetite. The corrupt and depraved state of the popedom at that period is admitted by every historian. It is described as literally a hell upon earth. 
To the papal power, every ecclesiastic in Europe was compelled to look for authority and direction to exercise the duties of his charge, and we may easily imagine what was the general character of those to whom the popes and their counsellors delegated the exercise of that paramount authority they had assumed. Ignorance as to scriptural truth was, of course, considered by such priests as the best safeguard of their authority, but though the Church of Rome has maintained that ignorance is the mother of devotion, we know that such a source will yield only blind, superstitious feelings strongly opposed to true religion. The instruction given to the lower classes at that period tended to harden them in ignorance and vice. They committed their spiritual concerns entirely to the priesthood, or, if the conscience refused to be silenced in this matter, it was diverted to the practice of austerities and will-worship, equally destructive to the soul. The few virtues of that age were not Christian virtues, they were founded on the romantic notions of chivalry, faint glimmerings of light which only served to make the surrounding darkness more visible. At best they were deceptive, leading the pilgrim from the way to real peace." Only a small number of persons had been preserved from the corruptions of the papacy, but they, even in the darkest times, had exercised some influence upon Europe, though subjected to the most bitter persecution. A few individuals also, who were distinguished for mental powers, as Grossest and Bradwardine, had borne testimony in England against the usurpations and crimes of the papacy, while others had begun to perceive that the conduct of the priesthood when examined by the rule of scripture, was altogether anti-Christian. The circumstances already noticed should be kept in mind when we enter upon the history of Wycliffe. The demoralized state of the nation made it ripe for sufferings. In Israel of old, when luxury and wickedness abounded, prophets were sent to warn the people of approaching judgments and to point out the way of salvation. So in England, Wycliffe and others were raised up to bear faithful testimony to the truth and to denounce what must be the end of the practices which then prevailed. When we recollect the state of England and the crying evils which called for exposure and reproof, we shall be satisfied that Wycliffe was not an ambitious or a revolutionary spirit, as some have described him, but rather a prophet as Jeremiah, weeping day and night for the slain of the daughter of his people, hearing the voice of the Lord, Shall I not visit for these things? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? One deeply impressed by such feelings could not be indifferent to the sacred office, nor should he be judged by estimates of what appear to be the duties of a minister of the gospel at the present period. We may consider England at that period as in many respects resembling Judah in the days of the son of Hilkiah. Like him, Wycliffe was called from the priesthood of the land to bear testimony as a prophet before kings and rulers, and like him was unavoidably implicated in the political events of the times. And though visitations were not sent upon England to the same extent as those inflicted upon Judah, yet the painful scenes exhibited in the civil wars of the succeeding century show that famine and the sword came upon that land, and that the people were punished for the fruit of their doings. National crimes will bring down national judgments. Warnings are sent previously to desolations, but when the voice of the Lord speaking by his faithful ministers is disregarded, execution will assuredly follow. It was so in the period referred to. The wickedness and profligacy of England in the 14th century were extreme. The awful and certain consequences were plainly exhibited by Wycliffe and his associates. Many, there is good reason to believe, sought the things which concerned their peace, but the nation at large persisted in evil courses and persecuted to death the witnesses of the truth. The calamities which followed have been but feebly depicted in the pages of history. The particulars of individual suffering are forgotten amidst details of martial enterprise. May England not forget the innumerable mercies she has since then received. May the warnings of faithful ministers of Christ not again be despised, and may our national sins never again arise to such a height as to bring national judgments upon our country. John Wycliffe was born about the year 1324 at a village of the same name a few miles from the town of Richmond in Yorkshire, where his ancestors had resided from the time of the conquest. The family were respectable and possessed considerable property, but continued the advocates of those superstitions which their relative earnestly labored to remove. It is probable that in consequence of the change in his views he was estranged from his own family, 
Under feelings of this nature, he would be led to use the language of one of his tracts, in which, speaking of the errors into which worldly-minded parents often fall, he says, With much travail and cost they get great riches and estates and benefices for their children, and often to their greater damnation, but they incline not to get for their children the goods of grace and virtuous life. Nor will they suffer them to retain these goods as they are freely proffered to them of God but hinder it as much as they may, saying, if a child yield himself to meekness and poverty, and flee covetousness and pride from a dread of sin, and to please God, that he shall never become a man, never cost them a penny, and they curse him because he liveth well, and will teach other men the will of God to save their souls. For by so doing the child getteth many enemies to his elders, and they say that he slandereth all their noble kindred, who were ever held to be true men and worshipful. In those days, next to the danger and reproach of being a heretic, and nearly as great, was the being accounted a friend or relative of one suspected of heresy. All the memorial which remains of the history of Wycliffe's youth is that his parents designed their son for the church, and his mind was early directed to the requisite studies. He was entered at Queen's College, Oxford, an institution then recently founded, from whence he soon removed to Merton College, the most distinguished in the university at that period, when the number of scholars had recently been estimated to amount to 30,000. Wycliffe's attention appears rather to have been directed to the studies suitable for his profession than to general literature. As Fuller observes, The fruitful soil of his natural abilities he industriously improved by acquired learning. He was not only skilled in the fashionable arts of that age, and in that obtruse, crabbed divinity, all whose fruit is thorns, but he was also well versed in the scriptures, a rare accomplishment in those days. Dr. James enumerates various writers by whom he considers Wycliffe to have been grounded in the truth. He doubtless learned much from the fathers, and was considerably indebted to Grosses and Bradwardin, but his writings show that his religious principles were mainly derived from the Bible. His perusal of the scriptures and the fathers rendered him dissatisfied with the scholastic divinity of that age, while the knowledge of canon and civil law, then requisite for a divine, enabled him to discern many of the errors of popery. His writings also show him to have been well acquainted with the laws of his own country. The four fathers of the Latin Church, Jerome, Ambrose, Augustine, and Gregory, are continually quoted by him so as to show his intimate acquaintance with their writings. Augustine in particular he seems to have valued next to the scriptures. It will not be forgotten that Luther derived much instruction from the writings of that father. The acknowledged ability of Wycliffe as a scholar led his adversaries to accuse him of evil designs rather than of ignorance, while his friends gave him the title of the Evangelic Doctor. Even Knighton states that he was second to none in philosophy. Wycliffe's mind must have received deep impressions from an awful visitation of providence which occurred in the middle of the 14th century. Europe was shaken by a succession of earthquakes. Shortly after, it was ravished by a pestilence, the effects of which were more rapid and extensive than at this day we can easily conceive. More than half the people of this and other lands were swept away. The alarmed survivors reckoned the mortality far higher. That Wycliffe was deeply impressed by this awful event appears by his frequent references thereto, when he is sounding an alarm to a careless and profane generation. Under a strong feeling that the end of the world approached, he wrote his first publication, a small treatise entitled The Last Age of the Church, in which he describes the corruptions which then pervaded the whole ecclesiastical state as the main cause of that chastisement which Europe had so lately felt. Early and deep impressions of this nature evidently tended much to strengthen and to prepare the reformer for the arduous course he was shortly called to pursue. That his mind had been led to look to the only true ground of support is evident from a passage in this tract, wherein he speaks of Christ Jesus as having entered into holy things, that is, into holy church, by holy living and holy teaching, and with his blood he delivered man's nature. As Zechariah writeth in his ninth chapter, Thou verily with the blood of witness, or of thy testament, hast led out from the pit them that were bound. So when we were sinful and the children of wrath, God's Son came out of heaven, and praying his Father for his enemies, he died for us. Then much rather shall we be saved." Now we are made righteous through his blood. 
Thus we find Wycliffe in his thirty-second year, respected for his scholastic acquirements, deeply impressed with the importance of divine truth, awakened to a sense of the divine judgments, enabled already to break through the bands of superstition and in possession of that hope which alone can afford refuge for a guilty sinner. We shall now see how these preparations fitted him for the contest and led him to the encounter in which he was called to engage. The first circumstance which summoned Wycliffe to this conflict was a controversy with the mendicant friars. Some of them had settled at Oxford in 1221, where they attracted much notice by their professed freedom from the avarice of the monastic fraternities in general and by their activity as preachers. They introduced many of the opinions afterwards adopted by the reformers, for a time saying much in opposition to the papal authority and in support of the authority of the Bible. But their errors and encroaching spirit soon appeared, so that Grostus, Bishop of Lincoln, who for some years had favoured the friars, at length deeply censured their conduct. Their zeal to proselyte youths at the universities to their orders, Armagh, called forth vigorous opposition from Fitzraff, Archbishop of Armagh, who, in a petition to the Pope in 1357, affirmed that the students of Oxford were reduced on this account to 6,000, not more than a fifth of their former number. In 1366, a parliamentary enactment ordered that none of the orders should receive any youth under the age of 18, also that no bull should be procured by the friars against the universities. Similar disputes then prevailed in the University of Paris. The objections alleged against the mendicants, as stated by Wycliffe, may be thus summed up. They represented a life inertly contemplative, as preferable to one spent in active attention to Christian duties. They were defective in morals when discharging their office of confessors. While itineranting in the offices they assumed, they persecuted all such as they detected really traveling to sow God's word among the people. To these may be added a full proportion of every error and vice which has been charged on the corrupt clergy of Rome." Nor did Wycliffe merely expose and seek to correct these fruits of error. He showed that they proceeded from the unscriptural nature of the institutions, which evidently were opposed to those precepts of the Bible which they professed to regard. Against these mendicants, Wycliffe wrote several tracts, entitled Of the Property of Christ, Against Able Beggary, and Of Idleness in Beggary. The vices of the friars led him to consider more fully the vices of the Romish priesthood. The approval which the conduct of Wycliffe in opposing the mendicants received from the university appears from his being chosen warden of Balliol College in 1361. In the same year, he was presented by his college to the living of Fillingham in Lincolnshire, which he afterwards exchanged for Ludgershall in Wiltshire. In 1365, he was appointed warden of Canterbury Hall by Simon de Islip, the founder, then primate of England. In the instrument appointing Wycliffe to this office, Islip states him to be a person on whose fidelity, circumspection, and industry he confided, one on whom he had fixed for that place for the honesty of his life, his laudable conversation, and knowledge of letters. Islip dying shortly after, Wycliffe was displaced by Langham, his successor, who had been a monk, from whose decision he appealed to the Pope. The integrity and courage of Wycliffe are manifest from the boldness with which he continued to oppose the mendicants, both personally and by his writings, during the time his appeal was under consideration. Another circumstance assisted to call Wycliffe into public notice. This was the decision of the English Parliament in 1365 to resist the claim of Pope Urban V, who attempted the revival of an annual payment of a thousand marks, as a tribute or feudal acknowledgement that the kingdoms of England and Ireland were held at the pleasure of the popes. His claim was founded upon the surrender of the crown by King John to Pope Innocent III. The payment had been discontinued for 33 years, and the recent victories of Cressy and Poitiers, with their results, had so far strengthened the power of England that the demand by the pontiff of the arrears, with the continuance of the tribute upon pain of the papal censure, were unanimously rejected by the king and parliament. The reader must recollect that this was not a question bearing only upon the immediate point in dispute. The grand subject of papal supremacy was involved therein, and the refusal to listen to the mandate of the Pope necessarily tended to abridge the general influence of the clergy.
A measure of this description was almost unknown in the history of Europe at that day. Such claims were not lightly relinquished by the papacy, and shortly after this decision of the Parliament, a monk wrote in defence of the papal usurpations, asserting that the sovereignty of England was forfeited by withholding the tribute, and that the clergy, whether as individuals or as a general body, were exempted from all jurisdiction of the civil power, a claim which had already excited considerable discussions in the preceding reigns. Wycliffe was personally called upon by this writer to prove, if he were able, the fallacy of these opinions, nor should it be forgotten that this work did not proceed from any of the mendicant orders, but from one of those monks who were directly opposed to them. Thus it is evident that Wycliffe's former conduct was rightly estimated to proceed not from one who merely opposed the mendicants, as such, but from one who would oppose the leading errors of the Church of Rome under whatever guise they might appear. In Wycliffe's reply, wherein he has preserved the arguments of the monk, he styles himself one of the royal chaplains. He combats the assumptions of the Church of Rome, confirming his sentiments by giving the substance of several speeches delivered by certain of the lay nobility in the recent debate relative to the claims of the pontiff. We need not enter into the contents of this tract further than to quote the following declaration attributed to one of the speakers that, Christ is the supreme Lord, while the Pope is a man and liable to mortal sin, and who, while in mortal sin, according to divines, is unfitted for dominion. The extent to which such a principle might be applied is evident from the well-known wicked lives of the pontiffs, which had led to the monstrous assertion of Romish divines that the Pope, though guilty of the most heinous sins, still was to be obeyed and respected in his mandates, even those which concerned religion. The treatise concludes with a view of the future taken by Wycliffe, which has long since been fulfilled. If I mistake not, the day will come in which all exactions shall cease before the Pope will prove such a condition to be reasonable and honest. Who now in England ventures to assert that the temporal authority of the Pope is supreme, or that his ecclesiastics are exempted from the laws of God and their country? Yet such doctrines were openly maintained in those ages and still are asserted in some parts of Europe. The Parliament of 1366 also directed regulations to be observed by which the power and influence of the mendicants were limited. In the part taken by the University of Oxford during these proceedings, Wycliffe doubtless was concerned, and the attention given to his arguments on these subjects, which then so deeply agitated the public mind, must have brought his opinions concerning these scriptures and other points more immediately connected with divine truths into general notice. Thus, attention was called to those doctrines which he now began publicly to advocate. One circumstance which promoted this opposition to the papal claims was the national animosity then existing between England and France. Many of the popes, being natives of France, evinced their partiality for their own country, in which they then resided on all occasions. All these concurring circumstances led Edward III to pursue a line of conduct which certainly characterizes him as a promoter of the Reformation, at least as to its outward concerns. John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, claims notice as conspicuous among the court and family of the British monarch for the countenance and support he afforded to Wycliffe. Under his influence, an attempt appears to have been made in 1371 by authority of Parliament to exclude ecclesiastics from all offices of state. Wycliffe, in his writings, has so fully shown his deep sense of the necessity for the clergy being exclusively devoted to the duties of their spiritual functions, that we cannot doubt of his intimate connection with the prince from whom such a proposition originated. The views of Wycliffe as to the proper method of discharging the office of minister of the church will appear by the following extract from one of his early pieces entitled A Short Rule of Life. He says, if thou art a priest, and by name a curate, live thou a holy life. Pass other men in holy prayer, holy desire, and holy speaking, in counselling and teaching the truth. Ever keep the commandments of God, and let his gospel and his praises be ever in thy mouth. Ever despise sin, that men may be drawn therefrom, and that thy deeds may be so far rightful, that no man shall blame them with reason." Let thy open life be thus a true book in which the soldier and the layman may learn how to serve God and keep his commandments. For the example of a good life, if it be open and continued, striketh rude men much more than open preaching with the word alone. And waste not thy goods in great feasts for rich men, but live a frugal life on poor men's alms and goods. 
have both meat and drink and clothing, but the remnant give truly to the poor, to those who have freely wrought, but who now may not labor from feebleness and sickness, and thus shalt thou be a true priest both to God and to man. These are sentiments which remind us of the early ages of the church, and Wycliffe was not one who set forth precepts for others which he did not practice himself. Similar passages will be found in the following pages. Nor was he less earnest to enforce due respect for the ministers of religion, as will appear from the following extract. Thy second father is thy spiritual father, who has special care of thy soul, and thus shalt thou worship, reverence him. Thou shalt love him, especially before other men, and obey his teaching as far as he teaches God's will, and help according to thy power, that he have a reasonable sustenance when he doeth well his office. And if he fail in his office by giving evil example and in ceasing from teaching God's law, thou art bound to have great sorrow on that account, and to tell meekly and charitably his default to him between thee and him alone. In 1370 the papal court decided against the continuance of Wycliffe in the wardenship of Canterbury Hall. It was decreed that the inmates should all be monks, notwithstanding the express declarations of the founder, and the terms of the royal license to the contrary. The royal sanction to this sentence was obtained two years afterwards. Among the means employed by his opponents, bribery appears to have been the principal. Wycliffe was neither surprised nor troubled by this decision. He does not refer to it in any part of his writings, nor was any imputation cast upon him thereby. In 1373, Wycliffe was admitted to the degree of Doctor of Divinity. As this rank was at that time unfrequent and conferred a considerable degree of influence, it must have facilitated the diffusion of the doctrines he advocated throughout the kingdom. Many of his scholastic pieces doubtless were lectures delivered by him as a professor of divinity, to which office he was appointed in 1372. His early English writings also show how the doctrinal views and the religious feelings with which he proceeded in his new office. He was skillful in the use of the artificial logic then in vogue, and by accustoming his hearers to enter into logical and metaphysical distinctions, he taught them to exercise their mind upon inquiries, which he gradually directed to more important subjects than those usually introduced into such lectures. Among these early pieces, the exposition of the Decalogue, now in the Cotton Library, may be included. As that exposition differs from the one in the present volume, a brief extract or two may be given. Urging that love to God be shown by keeping his commands, Wycliffe says, Have a remembrance of the goodness of God, how he made thee in his own likeness, and how Jesus Christ, both God and man, died so painful a death upon the cross to buy man's soul out of hell, even with his own heart's blood, and to bring it to the bliss of heaven. He admonishes that the Sabbath not only commemorates the work of creation, but also the resurrection of Christ, and the gift of the Spirit, adding, Bethink thee heartily of the wonderful kindness of God, who was so high and so worshipful in heaven, that he should come down so low and be born of the maiden and become our brother, to buy us again by his hard passion from our thraldom to Satan. After describing the sufferings of Christ, he adds, All this he did and suffered of his own kindness, without any sin of himself, that he might deliver us from sin and pain, and bring us to everlasting bliss. Thou shouldst also think constantly how, when he had made thee of naught, Thou hadst forsaken him and all his kindness through sin, and hadst taken thee to Satan and his service, world without end, had not Christ, God and man, suffered this hard death to save us, and thus see the great kindness and all other goodness which God hath shown for thee, and thereby learn thy own great unkindness, and thus thou shalt see that man is the most fallen of creatures, and the unkindest of all creatures that ever God made. It should be full, sweet, and delightful to us to think thus on this great kindness and this great love of Jesus Christ. Vaughan observes of this exposition, we find Wycliffe zealously inculcating the lessons of inspiration on the fall of man and the consequent depravity of human nature, on the excellence and perpetual obligation of the moral law, on the exclusive dependence of every child of Adam on the atonement of Christ for the remission of his sins, and for victory over temptation, and the possession of holiness on the aids of divine grace. It appears also that these momentous tenets were very far from being regarded by Wycliffe with the coldness of mere speculation. The aid which the labors of Wycliffe received from the disputes then existing between the popes and the English government 
has been already noticed. These differences were again renewed in 1373 on the subject of provisors. The papal see had been accustomed to grant anticipated vacancies in the English church among its foreign dependents, by which ministers were appointed who were neither able nor willing to discharge the duties of their office. Various legal enactments had been previously made to meet these encroachments, and a law was passed whereby the election of bishops was rendered entirely independent of the papal sanction. In the year 1360, during the pestilence, seven English bishoprics had become vacant, all of which were filled by aliens under papal provisions, and the result of inquiry in 1376 showed that a very large number of the English benefices were in the hands of foreigners. An embassy was dispatched to the continent in 1374 to remonstrate with the papal see on this subject. Wycliffe was one of the delegates. Bruges was the place appointed for meeting the commissioners of the papal see. The proceedings, as usual in all matters of a similar nature, were protracted by every species of evasion. They continued nearly two years, while the concessions obtained were few and unsatisfactory. Wycliffe saw enough during his visit to the continent to satisfy him fully of the anti-Christian character of the papacy. He returned from this treaty, like Cranmer and Luther from Rome, more than ever convinced of the necessity of a thorough reformation in ecclesiastical affairs. He now styled the Pope the Antichrist, the proud worldly priest of Rome, the most cursed of clippers and purse carvers. We find strong expressions in his subsequent writings, but when we refer to the corruptions of the Church of Rome and to the treatment Wycliffe received from the Romish ecclesiastics, it may truly be said, was there not cause? The public attention was now awakened to the intolerable exactions of the popedom. A parliamentary remonstrance in 1376 states that the taxes paid to the Pope yearly out of England were five times the amount paid to the king, also that the richest prince in Christendom had not the fourth part of the income received by the Pope out of England. These calculations might well call forth the emphatic expression contained in the same document that God had committed his sheep to the Pope to be pastured and not to be shorn or shaven. In November 1375, Wycliffe was presented by the king to a prebend in the Collegiate Church of Westbury and shortly after to the rectory of Lutterworth in Leicestershire, at that time in the royal gift by the minority of Lord de Ferrars, the patron. He was speedily called to take a still more prominent part in public affairs. At that period, a severe political struggle existed between the Duke of Lancaster and the leading ecclesiastics, among whom Courtney, Bishop of London, and Wickham of Winchester were most distinguished. The particulars need not be detailed. It is sufficient to say that the transactions were of a complicated nature. It is only to the unbounded influence of the Romish priesthood over the consciences of men that we can attribute the popular excitement against the reformer and his friends, which the prelates succeeded in raising. Perhaps it is less easy to explain how the Parliament, which assembled in 1376 and 1377, should have been opposed both to the encroachments of the papacy and to the administration of the Duke of Lancaster. The clergy were highly displeased at proceedings against some of their number, and at this period, for the first time, we find them adverting to the doctrines of Wycliffe as calling for official interference. This doubtless was intended as an attack both upon the doctrines of the reformer and the power of his patron. In the convocation which met in February 1377, Wycliffe was cited to appear before his ecclesiastical superiors to answer certain charges brought against him for holding and publishing erroneous and heretical doctrines. A day was appointed for hearing his defence. The scene which ensued is thus described by Fox from the Chronicle of St. Albans. When the day assigned to the said Wycliffe to appear was come, which day was Thursday, the 19th of February, John Wycliffe went, accompanied by the Duke of Lancaster, also four friars appointed by the Duke, the better to ensure Wycliffe's safety, and Lord Henry Percy, Lord Marshal of England, Lord Percy going before to make room and way where Wycliffe should come. Thus Wycliffe, through the providence of God being sufficiently guarded, was coming to the place where the bishop sat, By the way, they animated and exhorted him not to fear nor shrink a whit at the company of bishops there present, who were all unlearned, said they in respect of him, for so proceed the words of my author, whom I follow in this narration, neither should he dread the concourse of the people, whom they would themselves assist and defend in such sort that he should take no harm. 
With these words and with the assistance of the nobles, Wycliffe, encouraged in heart, approached the Church of St. Paul, where a main press of people was gathered to hear what should be said and done. Such was the throng of the multitude that the lords, for all the pursuance of the high marshal, scarcely, with great difficulty, could get way through. Insomuch that Courtney, Bishop of London, seeing the stir which the Lord Marshal kept in the church among the people, speaking to the Lord Percy, said that if he had known before what masteries he would have kept in the church, he would have stopped him out from coming there. At which words of the bishop, the duke, disdaining not a little, answered the bishop again, that he would keep such mastery there, though he said nay. At last, after much wrangling, they pierced through and came to Our Lady's Chapel, where the dukes and barons were sitting together with the archbishops and bishops, before whom John Wycliffe stood, to know what should be laid unto him. To whom first spake the Lord Percy, bidding him to sit down, saying that he had many things to answer to, and therefore had need of some softer seat. But the Bishop of London, cast Eftsons into a fumish chafe with those words, said, He should not sit there. Neither was it, said he, according to law or reason, that he, who was cited there to appear to answer before his ordinary, should sit down during the time of his answer, but he should stand. Upon these words a fire began to heat and kindle between them, insomuch that they began so to rate and revile one the other, that the whole multitude therewith disquieted began to be set on a hurry. Then the duke, taking the Lord Percy's part with hasty words, began also to take up the bishop to whom the bishop again, nothing inferior in reproachful checks and rebukes, did render and requite, not only to him as good as he brought, but also did so far excel him in his railing art of scolding, that to use the words of mine author, the duke blushed and was ashamed because he could not overpass the bishop in brawling and railing. He therefore fell to plain threatening, menacing the bishop that he would bring down the pride not only of him, but also of all the prelacy of England. Speaking moreover unto him, Thou, said he, bearest thyself so brag upon thy parents, which shall not be able to help thee. They shall have enough to do to help themselves. His parents were the Earl and Countess of Devonshire, to whom the bishop again answered that to be bold to tell truth, his confidence was not in his parents, nor in any man else, but only in God in whom he trusted. Then the duke, softly whispering in the ear of him next to him, said, that he would rather pluck the bishop by the hair of his head out of the church than he would take this at his hand. This was not spoken so secretly, but that the Londoners overheard him, whereupon, being set in rage, they cried out, saying that they would not suffer their bishop so contemptuously to be abused, but rather they would lose their lives than that he should be so drawn out by the hair. Thus the council, being broken with scolding and brawling for that day, was dissolved before nine of the clock. Some proceedings having been taken by the Duke and Lord Percy which affected the liberties of the citizens, a tumult ensued on the day following. Information was brought to the Duke at the Savoy of the approach of the infuriated Londoners, the Duke being then at his oysters without any further tarrying and also breaking both his shins at a form for haste, took boat with the Lord Percy and by water went to Richmond, where the Princess Regent was with Richard the Young King. By her interference the Londoners were compelled to humble themselves and to make a great taper of wax with the Duke's arms upon it at the charge of the city, which was carried in procession and placed in the chapel of Our Lady in St. Paul's to burn before the image of the Virgin. From February to October 1377, Wycliffe seems to have been occupied in discharging his duties as rector and professor. During this interval, Edward III died. The accession of Richard II was followed by a diminution of the influence of John of Gaunt, but the opposition to the papal claims was not less decided. Amongst other subjects, the next Parliament seriously discussed whether it would not be lawful for the kingdom in case of necessity, and as a means of its defence, to detain its treasure, that it be not conveyed to foreign nations, though the Pope himself should demand the same under pain of his censures, and by virtue of obedience said to be due to him. An answer to this question would not now be considered any matter of doubt or difficulty, but at the time it was a perplexing subject. In fact, it involved most important questions, both of a civil and a religious nature. Under this dilemma, the opinion of Wycliffe was requested. In this reply, he discarded the opinions and decisions of civilians or other human authorities. He considered the proper reference to be to the principles of the law of Christ, 
the nature of the Pope's demands sufficiently indicate the result of such an appeal. The doctrines of Wycliffe were now publicly known. The ecclesiastics had not remained indifferent to the consequences as affecting their interests and their power. A number of his opinions were censured by the Pope, and in June 1377, bulls were issued, addressed to the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Bishop of London, the King, and the University of Oxford, in which the Pope required that Wycliffe should be seized and imprisoned under the papal authority, that his confession should be received, distinct information of his tenants obtained, and that he should be detained in custody until further instructions were sent concerning him. If he were not apprehended, citations were to be issued, commanding his attendance before the Pope within three months. The utmost care was to be taken to prevent the king and the nobility from being defiled with his errors. The bulls, however, were not made public till after the parliamentary proceeding just mentioned. These harsh mandates, it will be observed, treat Wycliffe as a criminal already condemned. The prelates were merely to inform themselves privately whether Wycliffe had taught the doctrines imputed to him. Such was the inquisitorial policy of the Romish ecclesiastics. The University of Oxford did not receive this bull without considerable hesitation, though accompanied by an especial letter from the Pope, lamenting that tares were suffered to grow among the pure wheat in that seat of learning, and even to grow ripe without any care being applied to root them up. Not the smallest intention of placing Wycliffe in the power of his enemies was manifested by the heads of the university. Archbishop Sudbury, however, wrote to the Chancellor, enjoining him to cite Wycliffe to appear before his superiors, and early in 1378 the Reformer attended a synod at Lambeth. The Duke of Lancaster no longer retained his political power, but the deep impression Wycliffe's doctrines had made upon the people was now apparent. Considerable crowds surrounded the place, many forced an entrance, openly declaring their attachment to the Reformer, and Sir Lewis Clifford, in the name of the Queen Mother, forbade the bishops from proceeding to any definitive sentence. On this occasion, Wycliffe delivered a written statement of his opinions, which has been unfairly represented as an artful attempt to evade the consequences of his doctrines by apologies and explanations. This is not correct. Many things had been laid to his charge, which he knew not. Some were utterly false, while other opinions he had not yet maintained. To attempt an explanation of his real views was, therefore, a proof of ingeniousness rather than of artifice and it is by no means certain that this document has come down to us without mutilation from his enemies. Yet if the whole be attended to, and allowance be made for these scholastic forms of argument, from which Wycliffe had not been emancipated, his statements will not be considered as evasive. These articles are given at length by Lewis from Walsingham, and are fully abstracted by Vaughan. If the reader finds less distinct reference than he expected to the great truths of the Christian faith, he must not be surprised. In controversy, the Romish Church has usually kept these all-important subjects out of sight, or rather they are admitted in form while in effect they are denied. The points controverted with Wycliffe chiefly related to the authority of the Pope and the powers of the priesthood. The doctrine of transubstantiation was the great subject of inquiry in the 16th century. Few, except Luther and Fox, succeeded in bringing their opponents into direct discussion upon a point which, in fact, was the main subject at issue, namely whether salvation was to be obtained only by faith in Christ, or whether other mediators and means of remission of sin were to be looked for. Of Wycliffe's explanations, it will suffice to say that so far from having made decided statements and retracted them by subsequent explanations, he repeated in his subsequent treatises the sentiments deemed most obnoxious, while he ever professed his readiness to retract if his conclusions were proved to be opposed to the faith. The papal authority at this time suffered from other causes in addition to the attacks of the advocates of Reformation. On the death of Pope Gregory XI, in March 1378, a schism took place which exhibited the Church of Rome with two, and sometimes with three, different heads at the same time, each pretending to infallibility and all denouncing curses against their opponents in most awful terms. To the death of Gregory XI and these distractions, the escape of Wycliffe from the vengeance of the clergy may partly be attributed. The general feeling of the necessity for reformation was also promoted, and Wycliffe was not wanting in exertions to expose the vain and wicked pretensions of these unchristian pretenders to infallibility. In a tract entitled On the Schism of the Popes, he made a direct attack upon the papal usurpations. Amidst these labours and persecutions, Wycliffe was assailed by sickness. While at Oxford, he was confined to his chamber, and reports of his approaching dissolution were circulated. 
the mendicants considered this to be a favorable opportunity for obtaining a recantation of his declarations against them. Perhaps they concluded that the sickbed of Wycliffe would resemble many others they had witnessed, and that their power would be there felt and acknowledged. A doctor from each of the privileged orders of beggars, attended by some of the civil authorities of the city, entered the chamber of Wycliffe. They at first expressed sympathy for his sufferings with hopes for his recovery. They then suggested that he must be aware of the wrongs the mendicants had experienced from him, especially by his sermons and other writings. As death now appeared at hand, they concluded that he must have feelings of compunction on this account. Therefore, they expressed their hope that he would not conceal his penitence, but distinctly recall whatever he had hitherto said against them. The suffering reformer listened to this address unmoved. When it was concluded, he made signs for his attendants to raise him in his bed, then fixing his eyes on the mendicants, he summoned all his remaining strength, and loudly exclaimed, I shall not die, but live, and shall again declare the evil deeds of the friars. The appalled doctors, with their attendants, hurried from the room, and they speedily found the prediction fulfilled. The scene would afford a striking subject for an able artist. While Wycliffe strongly censured the fabulous legends and crafty delusions practiced by these orders, he by no means neglected the means of usefulness they so much misapplied. He was not less distinguished as a preacher than as a theologian or a controversialist. Milton well speaks of Wycliffe's preaching as a saving light at which succeeding reformers effectually lighted their tapers. Nearly three hundred of his sermons have escaped the destruction to which his writings were subjected. The plain simplicity of their language and style show that he was not less fitted for the humble, yet important station of a village pastor than for the office of ambassador to the Pope, or to consider matters of state referred to him by the highest authorities of the land. That he was an active preacher is evident, and there can be no doubt, but that he discharged the other duties of his function according to what he had himself pointed out to be the duty of the Christian man, to visit those who are sick or who are in trouble, especially those whom God hath made needy by age or by other sickness, as the feeble, the blind, and the lame who are in poverty. These thou shalt relieve with thy goods, after thy power, and after their need, for thus biddeth the gospel. Upon the importance of preaching in all ages of the church it is unnecessary to enlarge, but certainly it was particularly important in those times when little but oral instruction could be imparted, and the invention of printing was unknown. Wycliffe's sermons are seldom to be considered as essays upon particular subjects. Frequently they are only sketches or heads of his discourses, but they are almost invariably what were then called postilles, discourses founded upon passages of scripture, the various parts of which are considered in succession. This method was most usual both in the primitive church and among the reformers who followed Wycliffe. In general, the discourses are founded upon the gospel, the epistle, or the lesson for the day, and are supposed to have been delivered at Lutterworth during the eight years he was rector of that place. They are strictly of a popular character, as will be seen by these specimens in the present volume. In one of these discourses he speaks of the labors of Christ and his apostles as teachers. They are touched upon in a manner which shows that he recommended similar proceedings in the times in which he lived, and the testimonies of historians inform us that the teachers among the Lollards went about in this manner, testifying of the things of the kingdom of heaven. He says the gospel telleth us the duty which falls to all the disciples of Christ, and also telleth us how priests, both high and low, should occupy themselves in the church of God and in serving him. And first, Jesus himself did indeed the lessons which he taught. The gospel relates how Jesus went about in the places of the country, both great and small, as in cities and castles or small towns, and this to teach us to profit generally unto men, and not to forbear to preach to a people because they are few, and our name may not in consequence be great. For we should labor for God, and from him hope for our reward. There is no doubt that Christ went into small uplandish towns, as to Bethphage and Cana in Galilee, for Christ went to all those places where he wished to do good. And he labored not thus for gain, for he was not smitten either with pride or with covetousness. In another discourse he says, It was ever the manner of Jesus to speak the words of God, wherever he knew that they would be profitable to others who heard them. And hence Christ often preached, now at meat, and now at supper, and indeed at whatever time it was convenient for others to hear him. End of Some Account of the Life of John Wycliffe, D.D., Part 1.
Some Account of the Life of John Wycliffe, D.D., Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Another still more important labor of Wycliffe claims our attention, his translation of the scriptures into the English tongue which occupied him for many years. It was completed in 1383. The first honor of this great undertaking clearly belongs to Wycliffe, and no event recorded in the annals of our land can be compared with it for importance. The attempts made by others had neither been numerous nor extensive. They were only versions of the Psalms and some other portions of sacred writ, and detract not from the labor or merit of Wycliffe's performance. A well-known passage from the historical work of Knighton, a canon of Leicester, The contemporary of Wycliffe contains evidence upon this subject too decisive not to be repeated here. He says, Christ delivered his gospel to the clergy and doctors of the church that they might administer to the laity and to weaker persons according to the state of the times and the wants of man. But this master John Wycliffe translated it out of Latin into English and thus laid it more open to the laity and to women who can read than it formerly had been to the most learned of the clergy, even to those of them who had the best understanding. And in this way the gospel pearl is cast abroad and trodden under foot of swine, and that which was before precious both to clergy and laity is rendered as it were the common jest of both. The jewel of the church is turned into the sport of the people, and what was hitherto the principal gift of the clergy and divines is made forever common to the laity. The cautious English historian of modern Romanists impresses the same opinion as Knighton, though in more guarded language. He says, Wycliffe made a new translation of the scriptures, multiplied the copies with the aid of transcribers, and by his poor priests recommended it to the perusal of their hearers. In their hands it became an engine of wonderful power. Men were flattered by the appeal to their private judgment. The new doctrines insensibly acquired partisans and protectors in the higher classes, who alone were acquainted with the use of letters. A spirit of inquiry was generated, and the seeds were sown of that religious revolution which in little more than a century astonished and convulsed the nations of Europe. In conformity to these apprehensions, the advocates of the Church of Rome have ever denounced, in terms more or less measured, all attempts to communicate to the people in their own tongues the wonderful works of God for the salvation of a guilty world. The diffusion of this light and knowledge, they well know, will certainly bring the fabric of ecclesiastical domination to the dust, and therefore the Church of Rome has ever objected to allow free perusal of the Scriptures to the laity." But a spirit of inquiry had been awakened, and Wycliffe well knew that no method could be devised so effectual for making men wise unto salvation as to supply them with the scriptures. What assistance he had in this work is not known, but it is evident that copies were multiplied with a rapidity which we can hardly appreciate at the present day. From the register of Alnwick, Bishop of Norwich, in 1429, it appears that the cost of a testament of Wycliffe's version was... Two pounds, sixteen shillings, eight pence, equal to more than twenty pounds of our present money. At that time, five pounds were considered a sufficient allowance for the annual maintenance of a tradesman, yeoman, or a curate. In the persecution under Bishop Longland in 1521, when severe penalties, perhaps death, followed the merely possessing such a work, the accusation against one man was his having paid twenty shillings for a Bible in English, probably only some detached books. This translation was made from the Latin Vulgate. Scarcely any persons then were acquainted with the original languages of the scriptures. Wycliffe took considerable pains to collect copies and procured as correct a text as possible for his version. The circulation of the English scriptures was so offensive to the clergy that in 1390 the prelates brought forward a bill in the House of Lords for suppressing Wycliffe's translations. The Duke of Lancaster is said to have interfered on this occasion, boldly declaring, We will not be the dregs of all, seeing that other nations have the law of God, which is the law of our faith, written in their own language. He added that he would maintain our having the divine law in our own tongue against those, whoever they should be, who first brought in the bill. The duke being seconded by others, the bill was thrown out. Three years previously, in 1387, a severe statute had been revived at Oxford, which is thus described in a prologue for the English Bible, written by one of Wycliffe's followers. Alas, the greatest abomination that ever was heard among Christian clerks is now purposed in England by worldly clerks and feigned religious. 
and in the chief university of our realm, as many true men tell with great wailing, this horrible and devilish cursedness is purposed of Christ's enemies and traitors of all Christian people, that no man shall learn divinity or holy writ, but he that hath done his form in art, that is, who hath commenced in arts and hath been regent two years after. Thus it would be nine or ten years before he might learn holy writ. The subsequent and more successful endeavours of the Romish clergy to prevent the circulation of the English scriptures will be noticed in the account of the followers of Wycliffe. In 1381 the troubles broke out among the commons, known as the insurrections of Watt, Tyler, and others. A very slight acquaintance with the history of England sufficiently explains the causes of these tumultuary proceedings, which were wholly unconnected with the doctrines or labours of Wycliffe, who in his writings strongly urged the due subordination of different ranks of men. Nor should it be forgotten that tumults of a far more sanguinary description and marked by deeper atrocities had about this period raged in France and Flanders, where the doctrines of our reformer were unknown. Foissart, a contemporary historian, attributes the proceedings of the English insurgents to the example set them on the continent. Other atrocious deeds perpetrated as national acts in neighbouring countries within our own recollection might be referred to, were it at all needful to show that tumults and rebellions are not the results of opposition to popery, but it ever has been a favourite plan of that church to endeavour dexterously to fasten upon its adversaries the blame which properly appertains to itself. Wycliffe's opposition to the dogma of transubstantiation is now to be noticed. This doctrine was first openly maintained in the West by Radbert, a French monk in the ninth century, but it was not fully sanctioned by the Church of Rome till the Third Lateran Council under Innocent III in 1215. So doubtful had the popes been at first respecting this doctrine that one of them feigned a revelation from the Virgin in opposition to it. One of the Saxon homilies thus states the doctrine held by the early English church upon this subject. Much difference is between the body Christ suffered in and the body hallowed to housel, the sacrament. This latter, being only his spiritual body gathered of many corns without blood or bone, without limb, without soul, and therefore nothing is to be understood therein bodily, but all is to be spiritually understood. Transubstantiation was not held by the Anglo-Saxon church, but had been introduced after the Norman conquest by Lanfranc, Archbishop of Canterbury. Wycliffe had touched upon this subject in some of his treatises, the most popular of which, his Wicket, forms a part of the present volume, but he brought his views forward with increased activity in his Divinity Lectures during the spring of 1381, when he published a series of conclusions in which he called the attention of members of the university to the subject. In these he stated that the consecrated host which we see upon the altar is neither Christ nor any part of him, but an effectual sign of him. On these conclusions Wycliffe offered to dispute publicly. In his Trialogus, Lib. 4, Chapter 7, Wycliffe represents Satan as reasoning thus respecting transubstantiation. Should I once so far beguile the faithful of the Church by the aid of Antichrist, my vice-regent, as to persuade them to deny that this sacrament is bread, and to induce them to regard it merely as an accident, there will be nothing then which I may not bring them to receive, since there can be nothing more opposite to the Scriptures or to common discernment. Let the life of a prelate, then, be what it may, let him be guilty of luxury, simony, or murder, the people may be led to believe that really he is no such man, nay, they may then be persuaded to admit that the Pope is infallible, at least with respect to the matters of Christian faith, and that, inasmuch as he is known by the name of Most Holy Father, he is, of course, free from sin. How completely had the powerful mind of Wycliffe discerned the dreadful consequences of this monstrous doctrine, which represents a piece of bread as containing the flesh and blood, and even the soul and divine nature of our blessed Lord. A convention of Romish doctors speedily assembled. The doctrines of Wycliffe were condemned, as may easily be supposed. Sentences of excommunication and imprisonment were fulminated against all members of the university who should teach as tenants, or even be convicted of listening to arguments in defense of them. This assembly was held in private. Its determination was communicated to Wycliffe while engaged in lecturing his pupils. He paused for a moment, and then again challenged his opponents to a fair discussion of the subject, declaring that if attempts were made to silence him by force, he would appeal to the king for protection. Courtney, who had been recently appointed Archbishop of Canterbury in May 1382, 
called a synod to consider respecting certain strange and dangerous opinions then widely diffused among both the nobility and the commons of England. His well-known hatred to Wycliffe sufficiently indicated the objects in view. The synod was held at the Greyfriars in London. It had scarcely assembled when the city was shaken by an earthquake, which the members interpreted as evidence of the divine displeasure at the objects for which they were then collected. But Courtney was not a slave to superstitious fears. He comforted them by putting them in mind that they should not be slothful in the cause of the church, that the earthquake in reality portended a cleansing of the kingdom from heresies, for as air and noxious spirits are shut up in the bowels of the earth, which are expelled in an earthquake, and so the earth is cleansed, but not without great violence, so there were many heresies shut up in the hearts of reprobate men, but by the condemnation of them the kingdom has been cleared, but not without irksomeness and great commotion. The assembled divines were thus reassured, and the conclusions imputed to Wycliffe were condemned as erroneous and heretical. The sentence denounced against all who should hold, preach, or defend his tenets was promulgated with the usual solemnities and addressed to all places subject to the See of Canterbury. These fulminations were communicated to the University of Oxford, but the Chancellor and many of its leading members were attached to the Reformer, and the public discourse before the University highly commended the character and doctrines of Wycliffe. The state of public affairs strengthened the efforts of the clergy. A few months before they had procured the enactment of a law by the Parliament which provided for the punishment of those who preached what the ecclesiastics denominated heresy. The preamble of the statute evidently refers to the labours of the followers of Wycliffe and to the promulgation of such doctrines as he advanced. They were extensively diffused. A contemporary historian represents every second person in the kingdom as infected with his heresies, and in Wycliffe's confession respecting the sacrament, he implies that a third part of the clergy held similar opinions. The statute sets forth that diverse evil persons went from county to county and town to town in certain habits under dissimulation of great holiness, without license of the ordinaries or other authorities, preaching daily not only in churches and churchyards but also in markets, fairs and other open places where great congregations were assembled, diverse sermons containing heresies and notorious errors, etc., etc. It was therefore enacted that all such preachers and also their favourers, maintainers and abettors should be arrested and held in strong prison till they justify themselves according to the law and reason of holy church before the prelates. This law was passed by the lords but never had the assent of the commons so that in reality it was both informal and invalid. In the following October it was revoked and laid aside but the archbishop procured letters patent from the king whereby he and his suffragans were authorized to detain all such offenders in their own prisons, and by the artifices of the prelate, the act of repeal was suppressed. This was the commencement of a series of bloody enactments, whereby the consciences of Englishmen were enthralled, and the best and holiest characters of the land were subjected to the severest persecution and most horrible cruelties. No traces of such laws appear previously on our statute book, and these notoriously emanated from the Romish priesthood, on feeling their craft to be in danger. It is evident that they proceeded not from the peculiar opinions of that day or the maxims of state policy then prevalent, but entirely from the fiend-like desire of the popish ecclesiastics to persecute for conscience' sake. Courtney, having arranged his machinery for persecution, summoned Rigg, the Chancellor of Oxford, and Brightwell, one of his doctors, to answer for their late conduct respecting Hereford and Rippington, who had advocated the cause of Wycliffe. After some hesitation, they were induced to assent to the articles lately sanctioned by the Synod. The Chancellor was enjoined to search for Wycliffe, Hereford, Rippington, Ashton, and Redmond, and by ecclesiastical censures and canonical penalties to compel them to abjure. Meanwhile, the Archbishop proceeded in his persecution of Hereford and Ashton. The former had assisted Wycliffe in his translation of the Scriptures. The latter was well known throughout the kingdom as a laborious and successful preacher of the Gospel. Wycliffe then resided at Lutterworth. In one of his sermons he refers to these persecutions, speaking of Courtney as the great bishop of England, who is incensed because God's law is written in English to unlearned men. He adds, He pursueth a certain priest, because he writeth to men this English, and summoneth him, and travaileth him, so that it is hard for him to bear it. And thus he pursueth another priest, by the help of Pharisees, because he preacheth Christ's gospel freely, without fables. 
Hereford appears to have escaped from the bitterness of death, probably through the influence of the Duke of Lancaster, but he, outwardly at least, reconciled himself to his opponents, as he was among the clergy who, in 1391, sat in judgment upon one of the Lollards named Walter Brute, though he still retained an attachment to the doctrines of Wycliffe. Rippington acted in a similar manner, but Ashton died as he had lived, a follower of the truth, before the clergy had proceeded so far as openly to bring the Lollards to the stake. The accounts respecting these men, however, are contradictory, and their enemies appear to have attributed to them greater concessions than they really made, a practice not unfrequent with the Church of Rome. Some further particulars respecting them will be found in another part of this work. The conduct of the clergy and the means they had recourse to are thus described by Wycliffe in one of his discourses at this period. Our high priests and our religious fear them, lest God's law, after all they have done, should be quickened. Therefore make they statutes stable as a rock, and they obtain grace, favour, of knights to confirm them, and this they mark well with the witness of lords, and all lest the truth of God's law should break out to the knowing of the common people. Well, I know that knights have taken gold in this case to help that thy law may be thus hid and thine ordinances consumed. Wycliffe saw the storm gathering fast while increasing age and infirmities rendered him less able to counteract the proceedings of his adversaries. He knew not how soon the blow might be struck. Thus situated, he resolved to appeal to the king and parliament in the form of a petition. This document contains opinions for which some Protestant writers have too hastily been inclined to censure the reformer without considering the situation in which matters then stood or the characters whom Wycliffe denounced as worldly priests and of the congregation of Satan. The proceedings against Wycliffe are not very clearly stated, but it appears that in 1382 a council of prelates and clergy was held in the Church of the Preaching Friars at London, as already mentioned, and a similar council was afterwards assembled at Oxford to take measures for remedying certain disorders which were extending rapidly through the whole community. Courtney, having made the requisite preparations, Wycliffe was summoned to appear that he might answer for his opinions. The Romish prelate laid his plans so as to deprive Wycliffe of the support and countenance he had hitherto received. While the nobility opposed the church on points of worldly interest, they gladly encouraged Wycliffe in his opposition, though it originated from higher sources than those of a secular nature, but at this critical period the Duke of Lancaster felt that it was his interest to avoid further hostilities with the clergy, and as Courtney had placed the matters at issue on points of doctrine, the Duke advised Wycliffe to submit to the prelates in all points of that nature. Here human aid failed the reformer, as might be expected. The world may contend upon subjects of a religious nature when interest is concerned, but not when there is reason to expect only trouble and loss for so doing. Had Wycliffe then shrunk from the contest, had he sacrificed the truth to avoid the risk of encountering his adversaries, there might have been some ground for characterizing him as a political reformer, even though the hesitation had proceeded from age and infirmity rather than from any other source but he shrunk not. The Romish historian Walsingham, who is ever desirous to cast any disgrace he can upon the reformer, represents him as equally withstanding the commands of the duke and the threats of the primate. He says that Wycliffe, in publicly defending his doctrines on the sacrament of the altar, like an obstinate heretic, refuted all the doctors of the second millenniary. Wycliffe did not consider the doctrine of transubstantiation to be a mere dogma of the schools. He viewed it as a worshipping of the creature more than the creator, and perceived all its attendant consequences of setting up will worship and other mediators than the Lord Jesus Christ. The assembly convoked at Oxford, by whom Wycliffe's doctrines were condemned, was numerous and eminent for rank and authority. He stood alone in the place where he once had delivered the doctrines of truth to approving auditories, but now he was forsaken. With the Apostle Paul he might have said, At mine answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. With that Apostle he experienced that the Lord stood by him and strengthened him, and he was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. His defense, as we have seen, was such as to demand praise from his adversaries, and his written confessions recapitulated his former views upon the subject. There were two, one in Latin, in which he argued the subject after the scholastic method, the other in English, which he drew up so as to be intelligible to the people. Courtney and his associates probably felt at a loss how to act towards the reformer. As yet they had not found any 
who resisted unto blood, nor had they arrived at the decision with which their successors put the summary requisition, turn or burn. They appear at that time to have contented themselves with terminating Wycliffe's connection with the University of Oxford. A mandate from the king was addressed to the vice-chancellor, dated July 1382, ordering the expulsion of Wycliffe and his adherents from the university within seven days. Probably the increasing age and infirmities of the reformer indicated his speedy removal from this world and inclined his enemies to suspend more violent and unpopular measures. The next proceeding was a summons from the Pope ordering Wycliffe to appear before him at Rome. He was too much afflicted with paralysis to undertake such a journey, even had it been a desirable plan for him to adopt. He addressed a letter to the Pope, professing his faith, expressing his willingness to retract any opinions which might be proved to be erroneous, and his hope that personal appearance before the pontiff would not be insisted upon. Although Wycliffe was excluded from Oxford and age advanced rapidly upon him, he did not cease to labor for the welfare of the souls of men. His translation of the scriptures was completed about this period. The greater part also of his tracts and sermons appear to have been composed during the latter years of his life. They were written out and circulated with avidity. The numerous copies of his writings yet remaining show the extent to which they must have been transcribed, especially when we consider that the Romish clergy destroyed not a few. Among these pieces is an address written against the friars, in which, commenting on the text, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, Wycliffe directs against the followers of St. Francis and St. Dominic of that day, the censures addressed to the Pharisees of Judea of old. The reformers' feelings of abhorrence at the proceedings of the mendicants had been renewed by their activity in behalf of Pope Urban against his opponent Pope Clement. Each of the popes endeavoured to stimulate his adherents to take up arms against his rival by the same promises of spiritual blessings and the same denunciations of divine wrath as had been used to obtain supporters to the crusades or military expeditions for the recovery of the Holy Land from the infidels. These military expeditions were represented as equally meritorious and were designated by the same title, while all the nefarious practices employed in support of the Crusades were employed on the present occasion. The Bishop of Norwich raised a considerable army by the bulls of Pope Urban, promising full remission of sins and a place in paradise to all who assisted his cause by money or in person. This military prelate headed his troops and invaded France, by which kingdom Pope Clement was supported. But his campaign was unsuccessful. He returned to England in a few months with the scanty remains of his army and was the subject of general derision. Against such proceedings, Wycliffe spoke boldly. He says, Christ is a good shepherd, for he puts his own life for the saving of the sheep. But Antichrist is a ravening wolf, for he ever does the reverse, putting many thousand lives for his own wretched life. By forsaking things which Christ has bid his priests forsake, he might end all this strife. Why is he not a fiend stained foul with homicide, who, though a priest, fights in such a cause? If man-slaying in others be odious to God, much more in priests who should be the vicars of Christ. And I am certain that neither the Pope nor all the men of his council can produce a spark of reason to prove that he should do this. Wycliffe speaks of the two popes as fighting one against the other with the most blasphemous leasings or falsehoods that ever sprang out of hell. But they were occupied, he adds, many years before in blasphemy and in sinning against God and his church, and this made them to sin more, as an ambling blind horse, when he beginneth to stumble, continues to stumble until he casts himself down. Several passages written by Wycliffe at this time express his condemnation of all warfare, unless in self-defense and as sanctioned by the New Testament. The scenes of slaughter, cruelty, and profligacy occasioned by this papal schism are related by historians. The danger incurred by Wycliffe in his proceedings now was greater than ever, but he pursued his course with steadfastness to the end. The language of his conduct has been well described as being to this effect. To live and to be silent is with me impossible. The guilt of such treason against the Lord of heaven is more to be dreaded than many deaths. Let the blow therefore fall. Enough I know of the men whom I oppose, of the times on which I am thrown, and of the mysterious providence which relates to our sinful race, to expect that the stroke will ere long descend. But my purpose is unalterable. I wait its coming. The stroke, however, was stayed. 
the Duke of Lancaster still acted as the patron of Wycliffe, the popes were occupied by their mutual contests, the political distractions of England absorbed the attention of all the leading characters, and Wycliffe was permitted to pass the short remainder of his days without interruption from the hand of violence. He had also a constant patroness in Anne of Bohemia, queen of Richard II, who was eminent for her piety and blameless conduct. For two years previously to his decease, Wycliffe was paralytic and had the assistance of a curate named Purvey, who partook of his master's sentiments, but he continued himself to officiate. It is said that he was engaged in distributing the bread of the Lord's Supper when seized with the last and fatal attack of paralysis. He was at once deprived of consciousness and the power of speech. After a brief struggle, his spirit left the earth and found a joyful refuge in another and a better world. He was taken ill on the 29th and died on the 31st of December, 1384. Wycliffe was buried in peace, but in the year 1415 the Council of Constance ordered his remains to be disinterred and cast forth from consecrated ground. This was not enforced until 1428, when by command of the Pope, 44 years after his interment, his bones were digged up and burnt to ashes, which were then cast into the brook hard by. Fox observes, and so was he resolved into three elements, earth, fire, and water, they thinking thereby to abolish both the name and doctrine of Wycliffe forever. Not much unlike to the example of the old Pharisees and sepulchre knights, who, when they had brought the Lord to the grave, thought to make him sure never to rise again. But these and all others must know that, as there is no counsel against the Lord, so there is no keeping down of verity, but it will spring and come out of dust and ashes, as appeared right well in this man. For though they digged up his body, burnt his bones, and drowned his ashes, yet the word of God and truth of his doctrine, with the fruit and success thereof, they could not burn, which yet to this day, for the most part of his articles, do remain, notwithstanding the transitory body and bones of the man was thus consumed and dispersed. Some further observations on this treatment of the remains of this principal reformer, with a brief account of his principal disciples, and a sketch of the measures progressively adopted for the suppression of the truths he had advocated, will be found in another part of the present volume. His writings and the doctrines he taught now claim our attention. Writings of Wycliffe Soon after the decease of Wycliffe, an English prelate stated that the writings of the Reformer were as voluminous as those of Augustine. Those which are still extant would make several large volumes and embrace a great variety of subjects. Bale, who wrote a century and a half subsequent to Wycliffe's death, states that he had seen more than 150 of his works, partly in Latin and partly in English, and that he had ascertained the titles of more than a 100 others. Many of the latter, however, most probably were only different names for pieces which Bale had seen, for amongst the manuscripts yet existing the same pieces sometimes designated by more than one title. Lewis has transcribed Bale's catalogue, noticing the pieces he was acquainted with and adding others which increased the list to nearly 300. The catalogue given by Baber is more correct. It is drawn up with much care from a personal examination of many of the works of Wycliffe and contains about 180 articles. But the list of Wycliffe's writings most useful to the general reader has been compiled by Vaughan, who with much personal labour examined the writings of the reformer yet in existence and made himself better acquainted with their contents than any other person appears to have done during the last four centuries. It is not difficult to ascertain that the principal works attributed to Wycliffe are his genuine productions. Many are expressly mentioned in the public documents intended to suppress his opinions while others possess sufficient internal evidence. Printing had not then been discovered, copies could only be increased by the slow process of writing, while his enemies were indefatigable in their endeavours to destroy them. Yet the copies were so numerous and so much valued that nearly the whole of his writings are still extant, a sufficient proof, if any were wanting, that the doctrines he taught were widely diffused and highly esteemed. Nor was this confined to England. Copies are also found in public libraries on the continent. Subinco Lepus Bishop of Prague, burned more than 200 volumes, many of which were richly adorned, the property of persons of the higher classes in Bohemia. It also appears that the greater part of the writings of Wycliffe that have not come down to us treated of philosophical or scholastic subjects, which would be little prized except by the students of that period, while the copies of Wycliffe's writings which remain seem to have been preserved by the laity. 
Many of these are large volumes which could not have been written without much labour and cost. We may suppose they were prepared under the direction of some of his powerful supporters, while their plain appearance contrasted with that of many of the highly adorned volumes written at that period shows that the contents formed the chief value of the estimation of their possessors, nor do they seem to have been the workmanship of the religious establishments of that day. In one of Wycliffe's homilies he complains of the endeavours of the clergy to prevent the circulation of the English scriptures, and adds, but one comfort is of knights, that they savour, esteem, much the gospel, and have will to read in English the gospel of Christ's life. Another and even more interesting class of the Wycliffe manuscripts are the little books written with much less elegance, but which evidently were designed for the solace and instruction of souls, thirsting in secret for the waters of life. The tattered and well-used appearance of many of these small volumes is an indisputable testimony to the correctness of the allegations in the bishop's registers of the next two centuries as to the manner in which these pestilent books were read by the followers of the truth, till, by the invention of printing, copious supplies of other religious tracts were brought forward. Wycliffe's principal work, the translation of the scriptures, has been already noticed. Copies of the whole or of detached portions are found in several public and in some private libraries. A very beautiful and perfect specimen is preserved in the Royal Library of the British Museum. The New Testament has been printed in 1731 and 1810, but being a literal reprint in the original orthography, it is only calculated for libraries. Specimens of his version will be found at page 45. As a work for popular use, Wycliffe's Bible is now, of course, wholly superseded by later translations. The Trialogus is the work next in importance. It contains a series of dialogues between three persons characterized as Aletheia, or Truth, Psoidus, or Falsehood, and Phrenesis, or Wisdom. Truth represents a sound divine and states questions. Falsehood urges the objections of an unbeliever. Wisdom decides as a subtle theologian. This work probably contains the substance of Wycliffe's divinity lectures with considerable additions. It embraces almost every doctrine connected with the theology of that day, treated, however, in the scholastic form then universal. Although very unattractive to modern readers, it was doubtless a useful and important work. As Turner observes, it was the respected academician reasoning with the ideas of the reformer. It is evident that Wycliffe wrote this work under a decided impression that his efforts for the truth were likely to be crowned with martyrdom. It was printed in 1524. Copies are rare, for this work was actively sought for by the Romanists and destroyed. A specimen will be found in a subsequent page. The following remark of Baber is but too applicable to the method in which this work is written. The scholastic theology which was taught at this period was a species of divinity which obscured the excellence and perverted the utility of that sacred science. By the introduction of this jargon of the schoolmen, philosophical abstraction and subtlety had superseded that unaffected simplicity and engaging plainness with which the primitive teachers of Christianity explained the doctrines of salvation. Thus, although Wycliffe in the Trilogus vanquished the opponents of the truth with their own weapons, it was not calculated to be a work of general utility like his more popular tracts in the English language. A good summary of the contents of the Trilogus is given by Vaughan. Only one other of Wycliffe's writings appears to have been printed at the period of the Reformation, his Wicket, a small treatise on the Lord's Supper, which will be found in the present collection. This was among the most influential of his works, as appears from the frequent mention of it in those records of persecution, the bishop's registers. His treatise of the truth of scripture is a very valuable performance. It is in Latin. Only two manuscript copies are known to exist, one in the Bodleian Library at Oxford, the other at Trinity College, Dublin. The latter is the preferable copy and is described as containing 244 large double-columned pages of nearly a thousand words in a page. It would therefore be equal in contents to a common octavo of more than 700 pages. It abounds in contractions, but is fairly and legibly written. Fox, the martyrologist, possessed a copy which he intended to translate and print. Vaughan describes this work as embodying almost every sentiment peculiar to the reformer. James made considerable use of its contents in his apology for Wycliffe, but it was neglected by Lewis. An accurate reprint with a correct translation would be exceedingly valuable. The extent of this piece wholly precluded insertion in the present collection, even in an abridged form. 
Another useful and popular work in its day was the Poor Caitiff. This is a collection of English tracts which were widely circulated. Several copies of the whole or of detached portions are in existence, but only a few sentences from its pages have hitherto been printed. This neglect has probably arisen from the little reference it contains to the controversies in which Wycliffe was constantly engaged, and to which perhaps an undue prominence has been given by Lewis and other early biographers. This valuable memorial of the Reformation will be found in the present volume. Many of Wycliffe's homilies or postiles have been preserved. They appear rather to have been written down by his hearers than to be finished copies prepared by himself. See page 24. Wycliffe's other writings need not here be mentioned minutely. His memorial to the king and parliament and objections of friars were printed by James. Some of his small tracts have been printed by Lewis and Vaughan, to whose lists of the reformer's writings, particularly the latter, the reader may be referred. Many of these smaller pieces are in the British Museum in the libraries of Trinity College Dublin and Trinity College Cambridge, in the library of Corpus Christi College in the latter university, among the valuable collection of manuscripts, The Gift of Archbishop Parker, is a volume containing many of the controversial pieces. The following note is prefixed. In this book are gathered together all the sharp treatises concerning the errors and defaults which John Wycliffe did find in his time, especially in the clergy and religious and in other estates of the world. At the period when Wycliffe wrote, the English language had begun to recover from the disuse into which it had fallen. From the time of the conquest, many French and other foreign words and phrases were introduced by the higher ranks, who chiefly used the French language, but the lower orders adhered more closely to the Saxon phraseology. Mr. Baber observes, Those of the works of Wycliffe written by him in his vernacular tongue will be perused with interest and admiration by everyone curious in the history of the English language, for Wycliffe's English will, I apprehend, be found upon strict examination to be more pure than that of contemporary writers. Wycliffe, when he wrote in his native tongue, did it not for the benefit of courtiers and scholars, but for the instruction of the less learned portion of the people. He therefore, as much as possible, rejected all strange English and was studious to express himself in a diction simple and unadorned, at the same time avoiding the charge of a barbarous and familiar phraseology. The use of English instead of barbarous Latin in so large a portion of his writings gave much efficacy to the exertions for the spiritual welfare of his countrymen. A specimen of Wycliffe's writings in their original orthography will be found in two extracts from his version of the Old Testament in the following pages. At first they will appear hardly intelligible to the reader unaccustomed to the writings of that day, but on closer examination it will be found that if the Saxon terminations, expletives, and a few peculiar words are removed, the language is, as it has been well characterized, undefiled English. In fact, very similar to the language of our rural districts at the present day. To have printed Wycliffe's tracts exactly in the form in which they were written would have rendered them useless for the purposes of the present collection. It was necessary to remove some of the peculiarities just adverted to, but further the editor had no wish to proceed, and he felt the necessity of retaining the precise words of the original whenever they would convey the meaning of the reformer to the general reader. How far the attempt has been successful, it is for those to say who may compare the present edition with the original manuscripts. He will only add that it was not an easy task for the labor and the responsibility incurred. The pieces included in this volume, which have not hitherto been printed, were copied from the originals expressly for the present collection. Many others were selected for the same purpose, but the limits of the work prevented their insertion. It is deeply to be regretted that a complete edition of Wycliffe's writings never has been printed. Such a monument is due to the illustrious individual, to whom we perhaps are indebted more than to any other for the gospel light and religious liberty we enjoy. Milton says a good book is the precious lifeblood of a master spirit, embalmed and treasured up on purpose to a life beyond life. Surely the writings of Wycliffe ought not to be suffered to perish. A much smaller sum than in many instances has been vainly expended in monumental attempts to preserve the remembrance of persons whose names in a few short years have been almost entirely forgotten, would suffice to complete a national memorial record of our great reformer, more lasting than brass. But, blessed be the Most High, when we look around in every circumstance which endears to us the Protestant faith of our land, we are reminded of John Wycliffe. To use the words of Henry Wharton, Wycliffe was a man 
than whom the Christian world in these last ages has not produced a greater, and who seems to have been placed as much above praise as he is above envy. Doctrines Taught by Wycliffe the doctrines taught by Wycliffe have been continually misrepresented by papists and often misunderstood by Protestants. They may be stated as follows. Wycliffe's faith was derived from the scriptures. He considered them as a divine revelation containing a sufficient and perfect rule of Christian belief and practice. The authority of scripture he esteemed to be superior to any other writing or to any tradition. He considered the canonical books alone as inspired. He urged that all truth is contained in Scripture, and that no record was to be allowed unless sanctioned by the sacred records. The Pope's authority or right to interfere in temporal concerns he wholly rejected, and considered that it was only to be admitted in other respects when conformable to Scripture. He maintained that the Pope might err in doctrine as well as in life. The Church of Christ he considered to be the universal congregation of those predestinated to life eternal. The Church of Rome he considered not to be superior in authority to any other. He did not allow that the Pope was head of the Church and opposed the extravagant authority claimed by the hierarchy, considering it as antichrist, whether usurped by the Pope or the clergy at large, while he strongly urged the respect due to consistent and holy ministers of the word. He urged that the clergy ought not to be accounted lords over God's heritage, but as ministers and stewards of their heavenly master. He supported the king's supremacy over all persons, even ecclesiastics, in temporal matters. He never taught any doctrine contrary to the legal rights of property. He sometimes mentions these sacraments as seven, but only lays stress upon two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Of the others he spoke so lightly as to be accused by his enemies of rejecting them. His opinion of the Lord's Supper is stated in his wicket and his confession. The doctrine of transubstantiation he wholly rejected. He approved outward worship and public assembling for that purpose, but condemned the superstitious rites of the Romish church. He disapproved the church music then esteemed, which was elaborate, often trifling, and opposed to devotional feeling. He admitted the doctrine of purgatory, that early error, but rejected the most corrupt and profitable part of the fable, that the sufferings of purgatory may be shortened by the prayers of men or the intercessions of saints. According to his statements, it was rather the doctrine of an intermediate state than the popish purgatory, which he condemns as pious falsehood. As he advanced in life, his views on this subject became more clear and scriptural. See extract from Dr. James, page 109. In Wycliffe's tract of the Church of Christ, her members and her governance, he says, The second part of the church are saints in purgatory, and these sin not anew but purge their old sins, and many errors are fallen in praying for these saints. And since they are all dead in body, Christ's words may be taken of them. Let us follow Christ in our life, and let the dead bury the dead. This widely differs from the doctrine of the Church of Rome, thus determined in the Council of Trent. The souls detained in purgatory are assisted by the suffrages, prayers, of the faithful, and most especially by the acceptable sacrifice of the altar. He allowed the memory of the saints to be honored, but only that men might be excited to imitate their example, not as objects of worship. He denied the efficacy of their mediation, asserting that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only mediator. Pilgrimages he wholly disapproved, and the worship of images he frequently condemns. The doctrines of papal indulgences and pardons he condemned in the strongest terms as encouragements to sin. He also objected to sanctuaries as affording impunity to crime. He held that absolution or forgiveness of sins belonged to God alone. He condemned the celibacy imposed by the Church of Rome upon its clergy. His opinions respecting the papacy are stated at page 184. Wycliffe is accused of wishing to deprive the Church of its property by what he has said upon the subject of tithes. His views were simply these. It is reasonable that the priest should have a suitable provision besides the mere necessaries of food and raiment. He allowed that dimes or tithes and offerings are God's part and that priests should live on them. But he urges that the principal cause for which tithes and offerings should be paid was curates teaching their parishioners in word and example. When, however, the curates were wicked and neglected their duty, he considered that the tithes might be withheld from them, though they ought to be devoted to the service of God. 
It should not be forgotten that the priesthood then taught that men should have the divine blessing in this life and heaven hereafter, if they duly paid their tithes and offerings. The reader who wishes a fuller account of Wycliffe's opinion upon this subject may refer to his biographers. He condemned the blasphemous adjurations then so common. This has occasioned his being misrepresented as asserting that judicial oaths were unlawful, whereas he expressly declares that it is lawful to make oath by God Almighty in a needful case. Of the election of grace, he thus speaks in his Trialogus, We are predestinated that we may obtain divine acceptance and become holy, having received that grace through Christ's taking human nature, whereby we are rendered finally pleasing to God. And it appears that this grace, which is called the grace of predestination, or the charity of final perseverance, cannot by any means fail. On the great doctrines of justification and merit, Dr. James quotes passages which prove Wycliffe to have taught that faith in our Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient for salvation, and that without faith it is impossible to please God, that the merit of Christ is able by itself to redeem all mankind from hell, and that this sufficiency is to be understood without any other cause concurring. He persuaded men, therefore, to trust wholly to Christ, to rely altogether upon his sufferings, not to seek to be justified but by his righteousness, and that by participation in his righteousness all men are righteous. Dr. James adds, in the doctrine of merits, Wycliffe was neither Pelagian nor Papist, he beat us down all these proud Pharisees, who say that God did not all for them, but think that their merits help. Wycliffe says, Heal us, Lord, for naught, that is no merit of ours, but for thy mercy. Lord, not to our merits, but to thy mercy, give thy joy. Give us grace to know that all thy gifts are of thy goodness. Our flesh, though it seem holy, yet it is not holy. We all are originally sinners, as Adam and in Adam. His leprosy cleaveth faster to us than Naaman's did to Gehazi. For, according to his teaching, we are all sinners, not only from our birth, but before, so that we cannot so much as think a good thought, unless Jesus the angel of great counsel send it, nor perform a good work, unless it be properly his good work. His mercy comes before us, that we receive grace and followeth us, helping us and keeping us in grace. So then, it is not good for us to trust in our merits, in our virtues, in our righteousness, but to conclude this point, good it is only to trust in God. The foregoing summary of doctrines taught by Wycliffe is taken from the statements of Baber, Vaughan, James, and Lewis, who quote passages confirmatory of every point. In their works the reader will find those references. The limits of these pages do not allow them to be inserted here in any form which could be useful. The reader should also again be reminded that he must not expect to find all these opinions clearly set forth in every part of Wycliffe's writings. Dr. James, speaking of the countenance some passages give to prayer to saints and the Virgin, observes, I am persuaded that he retracted these opinions in his latter and more learned works. If ever it be God's pleasure that his works, which were cut and mangled and scattered worse than Absurdus's limbs were in the poet, may be brought forth and set together again, that we may have the whole body of his learned and religious works, and be able to distinguish the time and order wherein he wrote, then, I say, we should receive due satisfaction on this point. Vaughan has done much to settle the dates of Wycliffe's writings and has thereby shown his gradual and satisfactory progress on several points. We must not expect to find in Wycliffe's writings a finished system of doctrine. Many of his statements, taken separately, perhaps will appear incorrect, but take them as a whole and we shall be convinced that he well merited his glorious title, The Gospel Doctor. For the variations which exist, as Dr. James observes, considering the times wherein and the persons with whom he lived, he may easily obtain pardon of any impartial reader. H. Wharton justly observes, these variations do not detract from him, they show that his opposition to Romish errors was directed by a matured judgment, and that he should not detect them all at once cannot be matter of surprise. Vaughan also has ably cleared the reformer from the charge of inconsistency or wavering. He has fairly vindicated Wycliffe from the long reiterated accusation of having concealed his opinions to escape the terrors of power. Upon the great and leading doctrine of the Christian faith, Vaughan well observes that Melanchthon could have known but little of Wycliffe's theological productions when he described him as ignorant of the righteousness of faith. He adds, 
if by that doctrine Melanchthon meant a reliance on the atonement of Christ as the only and the certain medium for the guilty, it is unquestionable that this truth was the favorite and the most efficient article in the faith of the English, as well as in that of the German reformer. It must be acknowledged that this tenant is more frequently adverted to in the writings of Luther than in those of Wycliffe, and his notices respecting it are also frequently more definite because distinguishing more commonly between the acceptance of offenders in virtue of the Saviour's death and the growth of devout affections in the heart under the influence of the Divine Spirit. But that such was the design of the Redeemer's sacrifice was not more distinctly apprehended by the professor of Wittenberg than by the rector of Lutterworth. Nor was this truth the source of a more permanent confidence with the one than with the other. In the history of the Reformation, there are perhaps no two characters more nearly allied than Wycliffe and Luther. Both looked to the Holy Scriptures as the standard of truth. For human instruction, each learned much from the writings of Augustine. The boldness of the German professor was perhaps manifested at an earlier period of life, and the situation in which he was placed more favorable to the permanency of the work wherein he was called to labor, but Wycliffe's sun shone brightest when setting, and the decided manner in which he rejected the errors of popery respecting the sacrament, while Luther never was wholly freed from their fatal influence, directed the efforts of his followers with undivided attention against the Church of Rome. Thus, when the doctrines of the gospel as taught by the German reformers were made known in England, the soil was found well prepared. Many among the lower and middle classes were informed on these points and already had received the truth. The bishop's registers prove how extensive were the results of Wycliffe's labors. The records of Bishop Longland's persecutions in 1521, see Fox, show their effect was not effervescent. This sketch of the life of Wycliffe may be closed with the public testimony given by the University of Oxford, touching the commendation of his great learning and good life. Unto all and singular the children of our Holy Mother, the Church, to whom this present letter shall come, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Oxford, with the whole congregation of the Masters, wish perpetual health in the Lord. For so much as it is not commonly seen that the acts and monuments of valiant men, nor the praise and merits of good men, should be passed over and hidden with perpetual silence, but that true report and fame should continually spread abroad the same in strange and far distant places, both for the witness of the same and example of others, for so much also as the provident discretion of man's nature being recompensed with cruelty, hath devised and ordained this buckler and defence against such as do blaspheme and slander other men's doings, that whensoever witness by word of mouth cannot be present, the pen by writing may supply the same. Hereupon it followeth that the special goodwill and care which we bear unto John Wycliffe, sometime child of this our university and professor of divinity, moving and stirring our minds as his manners and conditions required no less, with one mind, voice, and testimony, we do witness all his conditions and doings throughout his whole life to have been most sincere and commendable, whose honest manners and conditions, profoundness of learning, and most redolent renown and fame, we desire the more earnestly to be notified and known unto all faithful, for that we understand the maturity and ripeness of his conversation, his diligent labors and travels to tend to the praise of God, the help and safeguard of others, and the profit of the church." Wherefore we signify unto you by these presents that his conversation, even from his youth upward, unto the time of his death, was so praiseworthy and honest that never at any time was there any note or spot of suspicion noised of him. But in his answering, reading, preaching, and determining, he behaved himself laudably and as a stout and valiant champion of the faith, vanquishing by the force of the scriptures all such who by their willful beggary blasphemed and slandered Christ's religion. Neither was this doctor convict of any heresy, either burned of our prelates after his burial. God forbid that our prelates should have condemned a man of such honesty for a heretic, who amongst all the rest of the university hath written in logic, philosophy, divinity, morality, and the speculative art without equal. The knowledge of all which and singular things we do desire to testify and deliver forth, to the intent that the fame and renown of the said doctor may be the more evident and had in reputation amongst them unto whose hands these present letters testimonial shall come. In witness whereof we have caused these our letters testimonial to be sealed with our common seal, 
dated at Oxford in our Congregation House, October 1st, 1406. End of Some Account of the Life of John Wycliffe, D.D., Part 2.